tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a lonely lighthouse off the steaming jungle coast of French Guiana and a nightmare world of terror and violence as we bring you again in response to hundreds of requests Three Skeleton Key, starring Vincent Price. Picture this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock, 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the lighthouse rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water, gray-green scum dappled, warm as soup, and swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish, great violet schools of Portuguese man-o-war, and yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this weren't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. A wind that had smelled the slow and frightful death that came one night to this bare black rock. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went. And up. Yes, up and up and round and round, past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope, casks of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans, and up, and up and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept, and over the bunk room was the living and cooking room, and over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, big steel and bronze baby with the sun gleaming through the glass walls all about, bouncing blinding little beams off the big shining reflectors, glittering and refracting through her lenses. The whole gigantic bulk of her balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. She was a sweetheart of a light. And at night, she'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. And it wouldn't be bad, the other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. You'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind, and it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and Auguste. What a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country. Black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you, those arms were as big around as my legs. Yes, head man he was, and what word he let go was law. A silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation, the most I could ever get out of him was... Jean, I took up this profession because I don't like people. They want to talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe for once they send me somebody... Who that was Louis. And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down because August was the talkingest man I'd ever met. The talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in yes, Paris. Yes, indeed. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy, at the Grand Guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous horrible, the way we used to scare the audiences. I, 
I was hated. Yes, yes, they used to throw things and hiss and bare their teeth at me. Finally, it got too bad. I couldn't stand it any longer. I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand, yes, gave it up completely. I really did. Couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. Green Master, a big one, about a half mile off and coming down out of the north-northwest, coming straight for us. You must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Louie! Louie! Couldn't understand it. I waited for the light to come around again. Why is that? Ship headed for the reefs. Coming right up. I had the glasses out now. I couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? North, northwest. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. Yeah, the square heads. What is it? What is it? Watch north, northwest. I know. I know what it is. Huh? What? The Dutchman, the flying Dutchman. We did a play about her once. Oh, what a performance. You ghastly, gallian, hag-ridden, cursed ribbon. Must on. Shut and up, on. will you? She's laughing. Yes. Sloppy way to come about. She's derelict, that's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other. But instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? She didn't ram us, although we all expected it. But as we waited for the crash, she luffed again, caught some odd gust, and went about. We watched her the rest of those black hours, heeling and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August. You can kill the light. Right, Chief? She doesn't look so good by daylight. Think she'll ground this time? What? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? Huh? This is impossible. Absolutely impossible. What? Here. Take my glasses. They're better than yours. All right. What is it you... I had to focus, and then my breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no thousands, no mi I don't know, an endless number of enormous rats. See them? Yes, I see them. Now we know why she's derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing? Here, give me a look. Yes, give him the glasses. Take a good look, chatterbox. Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yes. Uh, she's going to turn. She better turn soon. Suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's low tide. Yes. Yes, it is. Where's all the conversation, August? Huh? Here, want the glasses again? What another look? No, no. She's still coming on. Go away! Go away! Turn, will you? Turn, I say, I pray you, turn! She's cracking up. The rats. Look, on the water. Like a carpet. They're swimming. Sure, they're swimming. 
Those are ship's rats. But they're swimming for the rocks. The door below! It's open! Come on. Down we went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared? You bet we were scared. August, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Right, Chief. But hurry! Hurry! Look! See them? No. Oh, yes, I do. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at the millions. They smell us. Here they come. Uh, Close the door. I can't, I can't. It's stuck. Here, let Look. me... Oh, move, you move. He made it. Holy... That was close. <laughs> One got in. Look, there. Get him! Watch him. He's kicking. He was as big as a tarp. Bigger. And his eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for us, starving, ravenous, and we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was, oh, believe me, I do not exaggerate, it was like fighting a panther. Got him. Yeah. We better get aloft. As we ran up the winding staircase, we passed the tiny windows of the various levels. And at every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louie, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them! Will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim, brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky, nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling, hairy snouts, and their teeth, the rats. They screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving. And we three, we stood very quietly, oh, very, very quietly in the center of the classroom under our beautiful light. And we waited. What can we do? What can we do to you? Take it easy, old man. Take it easy. I can't. I it, just can't. It won't do any... It won't do any good to stand here and shake. Uh, that's right. Anybody want a cigarette? Yes. Yes, I have one. Thank you. Good boy. We've got to keep calm about this thing. Here's a light. <laughs> they don't like the fire, do they? <laughs> Guess not. Give me another match. <laughs> you don't like that much, do you, I Don't rile them, August. <laughs> Give me some more matches. I'll strike them and strike them and strike them until they get scared and go away. They won't <laughs> go away. Not until... Finish it, Chief. Not until what? Not until they've been... fed... Take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. They could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ships rats don't drown. <laughs> no, sir, you cannot drown one of them. They're all climbing up the tower. This bunch around us is getting thicker. Yeah. Say, what's the time? Quarter six. Uh, you've got first watch, John. Right. Uh, wake me at ten. I will. Come along, August. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sunset through the rats. Oh, very pretty. I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamp. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic, wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. Then I started the rotary motor. 
life drove them mad as she swung slowly and smoothly about. She blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light, moving continually about, ever turning, ever touching, ever moving around and around, and they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light. The bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close, I dared not turn my back, but you cannot help turning your back when you're in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes. Thousands of points of blank red light blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten, but I didn't get much sleep that night, and when I came up into the gallery early next morning, there stood August, his back to me. He was bowing to the rats, waving his arms and making a speech. I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Pray, Lotte, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marechal into the nether parts. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will he not hurt turning. you. I much. stood staring at him, horror struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving no one out. August! August! Another one, a late comer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear patron. August, Move stop over it, there. Stop it. Let the gentleman be but seated. But he didn't come, stop. Come, he come went on, bowing and scraping to the rats, his it big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair down. waving about him. I grabbed him by the arms and slapped his face. He looked at me like a child. And then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below, go on. Oh, very well then. Later, my dear audience, later. Matinee today. Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes, sounds horrible. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We could get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away trying to get at our eyes. Louis was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Look at the sharks! They're eating them. <laughs> yeah, the sharks are our friends. Here, here. I'll get another bunch together. <laughs> here, my beauties. That's it. Pile of kill each other. <laughs> there they go! August joined in, too. Oh, very ingenious, August. He learned that if he spread-eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats! It went on all day. And then... I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired, and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. Couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come huh? quick! What? Well, what is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy and assured of the success of this maneuver were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, we felt the heavy body scudding against the other side as the window gave way. That ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, they can't. So what was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. Oh. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Right. 
two of them got in. Let's go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leaped to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. No! I whirled to see Louie with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand! He got my hand! That's both of them, Louie. I'll, I'll get you something to tie that up. Blood! Look at it, my... My blood, I'm bleeding! Now, don't worry about it, Louie. Here, look. I'll, I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood! Uh, there, now. It's not bad, just the flesh. And then I became conscious of another new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the wood fascinated. Even as I did, it began to give way. And a bristling, whiskery nose showed through... Louis, Louis, we've got to go up. Next level was the living quarters in the kitchen. I slammed the trap door there, too. But it, too, was wood. Uh, my blood. What are we going to do? I don't know. We'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. We made it. across the trap door exhausted while below us the rats took over the entire tower I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply our water our leather and all about us the others screamed and glared in at us swayed in a tangled mass hypnotized by the ever turning light By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. Until now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting. And the hours crawled on. I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauties? Would you? I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. August was standing by the glass, and in one hand he held a wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet, and slowly, very slowly, tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is tap just a little harder, huh? as a... I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. <laughs> day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. We had only one way of summoning them, and that was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. That night, I tended the light but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting, and the following night, I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, about midnight, the light went out. There was nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do. Nothing. From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. And when I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All about us. Watching. Waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. All waiting. And then, the rats quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. I 
And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat, showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but I was afraid. What if, what if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet, was he a passenger or crewman off watch, didn't even stop playing. They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. That's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had left us, gone back to sea on their new ship. Auguste, insane asylum, he never recovered. And Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Uh. Oh, yes. Well, that's the whole of it. And if you'll excuse me now, I must go set my traps. No, no mouse traps. No rats in this lighthouse, I should say not. Life in the lights isn't bad. But sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous, sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Three Skeleton Key by George Tadeus, adapted for radio by James Poe and starring Vincent Price as Jean. Supporting Mr. Price were Harry Bartell as August and Jeff Corey as Louis. Sound effects on Three Skeleton Key, created by Cliff Thorsness and executed today by Mr. Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Jack Sixsmith, have been awarded the best of the year by Radio and Television Life magazine. Harry Essman was at the control panel, and special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are swimming for your life in the dangerous waters off the Florida Gulf Coast about to be smashed by a launch carrying a vicious criminal who must kill you or die himself. And on shore 500 yards away, the police are waiting to arrest you for murder. And there can be no escape. Next week, we escape with an exciting tale of temptation and death on the Gulf Coast of Florida as John and Gwen Bagney tell it in Danger at Matagumba. Goodbye, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you... Escape! A patch of weeds, a boxer's biography, and a mild, lukewarm bath. They're all clues that lead the police of Jackson, Michigan, to a killer in the gangbuster story on CBS this Saturday night. It's the case of the double push to be heard on most of the same CBS stations this Saturday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the man in black. 
here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our Hollywood cast tonight is the distinguished American actor, the star of the Broadway suspense drama, Angel Street, who has recently returned to this coast to resume his film career, Mr. Vincent Price. Tonight's suspense play, which presents Mr. Price, and which is produced and directed by William Spear, relates an episode of recent years in the unfriendly Nazi capital of Berlin. The strange death of Charles Umberstein by E. Jack Newman is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the strange death of Charles Umberstein, and with the performance of Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in suspense. I was infuriated to think I had been trapped. The thought that someone had discovered my intentions maddened me to the breaking point. Nothing had slipped. Everything had run smoothly as I had planned. No evidence, not the slightest trace, nothing. And yet, I was trapped. Trapped. But why? How? Let me see. Papers in my briefcase. Train ticket. Information forwarded safely to my office. And he knew. How? 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 But he did know. I stood quietly in my room watching him, watching him, watching me, waiting for me, standing by the lamppost beneath my window, knowing, knowing he had trapped me, waiting for me. I recognized him almost immediately, Captain von Heint. Once before I had seen him briefly in Herr Miller's office, I had been working on some corrections. Herr Miller was escorting him through the plant on an inspection tour. They stopped for a moment outside my office. I glanced up as Herr Miller gestured my way through the partially open door. Well, here it was. They were talking about me. My heart stopped. He was explaining how I had been recommended by the Führer himself, my qualification. They continued on their tour. Herr Miller ex explained later when I went to his office. Aha, Umberstein, there you are. Herr Miller, you sent for me? Yes, Umberstein. This morning, when Captain von Hind and myself passed by your office, I knew it was you. You knew it was me? Yeah. Captain von Hind is head of Gestapo intelligence in this area. He was conducting a routine inspection this morning, and it was he who suggested that what? I... Well, uh, since your recommendations were by the Führer himself... And yes. Your work here has been excellent. I knew you were the man when I passed by today. My work? Huh? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 of course, not that. Uh, why, you have become one of our best men. Oh, thank you, Herr Müller. No, this is it. Yes, Herr Müller. Through various posts, we are releasing more prints on munitions areas in this country... Uh, and other countries, huh? <laughs> You are to be in complete charge of their release from the war. I understand, Herr Miller. As a citizen of the Reich, I am greatly honored that I have been given such an opportunity. An opportunity to show your loyalty. And honor. I will give you the combinations. You will see that no other person enters the war. Of course, Herr Miller. Uh -huh. uh, one moment, Umberstein. Uh, yes? I think I should tell you that a few months ago in one of the neighboring plants... The Gestapo apprehended a spy. Yes? He was working for an enemy espionage service, found in possession of certain vital documents which he had access to in his work. And uh, what did they learn from him? Well, many things. He was reluctant to speak at first, but it's difficult to hold out indefinitely. <laughs> Well, he finally gave them enough information to locate other agents who had filtered in. It was well he was detected. Oh, yes. Yeah. The uh, Gestapo is still on the alert for some of his co-workers, still expected to arrive. Of course, they are ignorant of his confession. 
and his faith. So, Herr Umberstein, I must warn you to take all the necessary steps against the possibility of espionage. We cannot be too careful. I shall be careful. In you, Umberstein, is exemplified the efficiency of the Third Reich. <laughs> my suitcase and looked down on the street. I watched him standing there. I kept asking myself, how, 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 how could he know? This Captain von Hind, how could he know? The plan was perfect, the best yet, and yet I was discovered, trapped. It was a late Saturday afternoon, and the silence of the day hung heavy in the room. Outside it was cold, very cold, but in my room it was warm, stuffy. The radiator hissed and spewed as though it were the judge of the events to come. I was almost angry at it. A radiator. It was still light enough that he might see me if I crossed to raise the window. He wasn't aware that I was in the room. I hadn't turned on the lights. Now he stood there, waiting for me to return. I lay down on the bed, smoking. My thoughts troubled by the one question, how? How? How had he discovered me? Safely, I had avoided all connections with anyone who might have a chance to spy on my work. There was not the least cause for suspicion. An established citizen of the Reich, well-recommended, pure Aryan, employed as an architect in one of the country's largest munitions plants. Certainly, there was no reason for him to suspect me, the Gestapo, this Captain von Hind, waiting to take me. Fräulein Keller. Fräulein Keller. Absurd. Oh, of course not. Not she. But could you ever trust a woman? Fräulein Keller. Did I give her any reason? Any reason at all? Good morning, Fräulein. Oh, good morning. My name is Charles Umberstein, and I am to be at the munitions factory near here. I wish to take a room. Oh? One facing the outer street, Fräulein. If you can accommodate me. Oh, I think so. Oh. We have one. It is on the second floor. Overlooks the street corner. Oh, fine. I'm glad. It, it looks comfortable here. Small and comfortable. Oh, yes. You will like it, I'm sure. Uh, I am the owner and manager here. Fräulein. Uh, Sign here, please. Of course. There you are. Thank you. Otto, would you show Herr Umberstein to his room? Yes? Yes, who is it? It's I, Fräulein Keller. Oh, just a moment. Yes, Fräulein? I I have brought you some extra blankets. Oh. You may be cold. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Fräulein. And uh, Herr Umberstein, down the street, a little cafe. You may find nice meals and a little music, too. Oh, wonderful. I am indebted to you, Fräulein. Oh, but you are my charge. I look after my guests. It is my job. Oh, that is most kind, Fräulein. Uh, Herr Umberstein, yes. I, I also dine at a little cafe. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, I hope I see you there. Yes, to you, Fräulein. Oh, yes. For your wonderful hospitality. Oh, to you, Herr Umberstein. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fräulein, it's growing late. I must be off. I have a great many things to do tomorrow. Oh, and so do I. Oh, it has been a wonderful evening. Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Here's your coat. Hi, it's growing colder now, isn't it? Oh, yes, the winter will be here soon. Too soon. Yes, but I won't be... Eh? Uh, you won't be? Oh, nothing, Fräulein, nothing. You will be here long. Certainly, Fräulein, certainly. I was just uh, wishing. Wishing? For what? Now I had done it. I would started to thinking... Perhaps she could... For what? Oh, nothing, Fräulein, nothing important. Only the hopes of every man... They become so near sometimes. They're almost reality. So? What else could I do? I had to lead her thoughts away somehow. She took the lead. You mean a woman? Yes. Yes, Fräulein. You. Oh, but 
We have known each other for such a short time. Only two weeks. That's I... true, but I've been aware of you for a longer time, though I've just met you. Oh, oh, Herr Umberstein, I... Uh, Charles. Oh, Charles? <laughs> First, I was uneasy about the whole affair. Then after a while, I, I did grow rather fond of her. She was so accommodating, and we dined together each evening, and I, I played my role to the letter. Never once did she mention my work. Oh. Fräulein Keller, what are you doing in my room? Well, I was... I, Anna, I was... You've been looking through my papers. Why? I was looking for something. But what right have you... What are you looking for? I was... Well, I well, was looking for a letter. For? A letter? What letter? One that you haven't got. I thought perhaps you might have it. Now, out with it. A letter from a woman. Very well, Charles, if you must know, I, I suspect you have not been filled with that. She I was can't... actually looking for a letter from some woman. Any woman. She didn't trust me. She didn't trust her child. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it couldn't have been Fräulein Keller. Who then could it have been? I walked over to the window and looked down at the figure who so patiently kept his vigil there. Captain von Heinz, waiting. Why? If there had been something wrong with the passport, but no, that was perfect, not the passport. All passengers will report to the train master for passport examination. Yeah, all in order. You can take your luggage to Berlin. Yeah, this way. Next. Next. Here you are. Name? Charles Umberstein. Residence? Berlin. Nationality? German. Hmm. Mm-hmm. All in order? Picture, luggage? All in order. Thank you, trainmaster. You must be careful, you know. Uh, when may I catch my train for Berlin? It should be by any moment. Next. As I stood there in the shadows waiting for my train, I, I examined my passport again as I had done a hundred times before. No one would have any reason to doubt anything so genuine as that. All passengers for Berlin! Oh, God, God, must we stand passport inspection again? Hey, yeah. The army intelligence will accommodate you on the train. Yeah, Bull. At three stops, my passport was inspected. A good test. If the passport had been suspected or investigated, it would only prove that I was Charles Umberstein. I had come by the passport through Hans. At the time, Hans was employed as an Austrian customs inspector. This gave him access to many such passports. According to Hans, there had been a person named Charles Umberstein who had suddenly disappeared in 1936. Since there had been no friends or relatives to make an inquest, well, you can see. No. No, I was Charles Umberstein. Why, I even resembled the badly scarred photograph on the identification card. From the front view, he was evidently a large man, big shoulders, large head, wore a short Prussian haircut. Yes, I certainly looked enough like the photograph. Passport was flawless. He couldn't have discovered me through that, this von Hind. Something else. What else? The plans? No, 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 of course not. They couldn't have discovered that. I merely made copies and left the originals. No, 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 not the plans. Why, Hans and I... Hans. Oh, no, no, not Hans. Never. We'd worked so well together. Oh, no, no, not Hans. A strange, silent boy, perhaps, but surely... That night in 1936, when he gave me the passport, he was our man in Austria, but... Strange things happen even to the most loyal. All set, Charles. Then I will not see you again, Hans. Until? Until I arrive, eh? I will be attached to an army ordnance division in the city. You will receive additional information on the first day of each month. From you? Yes. There's a hotel not far from the factory. Here is the address. Fräulein Keller runs this hotel. Yeah. Now, on the second floor in one corner sits a mahogany table. Yes. On it are a set of silver candlesticks. Four of them. Beneath the candlestick nearest the right. You may find your information on the first day of each month. It will be written in code? Naturally. Be very careful when you pick it up. I see. And make no effort to contact me in any other way. And can I leave anything I might learn in the same place? Is it safe? Yes. Now, 
Remember, sooner or later we are bound to be introduced, you and I. My duties with the Ordnance Division will, of course... So near and yet so far kind of thing, eh? Yeah, very far. Once inside the city, I'm Oberleutnant Hans Neumann of Army Ordnance, understand? And I am Herr Charles Umberstein, architect. Right. Well, time grows short. I must go. Everything checked. Your passport? Perfect. I even resembled the photograph. <laughs> the can't don't you think so? Yes, <laughs> not bad. <laughs> Very considerate of Umberstein to have looked this way. Tickets? Right here, through to Berlin. I report to Franz Miller in the munitions factory, produce my credentials. He's been expecting me. I haggle a little about the salary, then I accept. At first opportunity, become acquainted with MB plans. And I will see that you are highly recommended from a reliable source. Just as a matter of curiosity, Hans, who will recommend me? Oh, you needn't worry, Herr Umberstein. It'll be good, I assure you. And goodbye, Hans. Oberleutnant Neumann, if you please. Oberleutnant Hans Neumann. Well, then, my Herr Charles Umberstein, auf Wiedersehen. Wiedersehen. <laughs> Heil Hitler. <laughs> Heil Hitler. <laughs> Yes, everything Hans had said came about. I picked up my information each month at the little hotel. I left an occasional report for Hans. It was the only way we ever communicated. And then Oberleutnant Hans Neumann began to appear in Franz Müller's office. And eventually Müller introduced us. In fact, Hans was with Müller quite frequently and they dined together regularly. Hans played his part well. But one day, something was worrying him. I will wait here for you, Miller. I'll be with you in a moment. Ah, Herr Umberstein. It's good to see you again. Herr Leutnant Neumann. Herr Miller speaks very highly of your work here. Thank you. Be very careful of this Captain Van Hind. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. He looks at me very strangely. And there is something I recognize about the man. The oh, eyes I are... Yes, yes, yes. We were just chatting a moment. Uh... I've seen Van Hind somewhere before. Be very careful. And don't come with us in case they ask you. Well, well, well. You are ready? Why, yes, of course. Umberstein, uh, would you care to join us oh. at lunch? No, no, thank you. I, I have some work to do. Oh. Always working. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, then, let's go, Hans, yeah? Yeah, certainly. Oh, by the way, will Captain Von Hein be joining us today? Oh, Von Hein sends his regrets. Something is delayed. Oh, that's too bad. Von Hein, a remarkable man. No one like him in the service. No one likes you. Goodbye, Leutnant. Von Hein. Such a brief warning. Curt and sinister. Hans was frightened. He would never have taken the chance to speak to me if he had not been frightened. Something that he recognized about Von Hein. Saturday was the first of the month, and there was no information at the hotel. Hans didn't appear again to lunch with Herr Müller... Something was wrong. Something had happened to Hans. Today, I found out. Uh, we will enjoy ourselves today, eh, Umberstein? Yes. We should lunch together more often, you and I. I like good company when I eat. Good food, good company, good digestion, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> this is a wonderful restaurant that we are going to. You know, they serve Norwegian smoked salmon. That is exquisite. And, and, and cheap, too. <laughs> Nothing like these new foods we are getting from Norway. <laughs> now, I've heard of Norwegian salmon. Uh, and this is the best. Uh, you and Oberleutnant Neumann dine here often, don't Hans you? Hans Neumann, uh, yeah, we came here often, yeah. Hans Neumann will not come here for a long, long time again, I'm afraid. I, I don't understand. Uh, yeah, you don't. You remember Captain von Hein? Oh, oh, yes, the Gestapo man who was inspecting our factory a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, a most efficient man. He has apparently been observing Hans Neumann for some time. Oh? Oberleutnant Neumann is being detained by Captain von Hein, no? Was he... He was a spy. A spy? How do you know? Von Hein arrests only spies. And von Heinz never makes a mistake. The man is incredible. Was there something suspicious about Hans? <laughs> There's something suspicious about everyone to von Heinz. He himself asked me to cultivate Oberleutnant Neumann so that he could better observe his action. Yes, I, I noticed that you two lunch together very often. Uh, we lunch together at this very same restaurant you and I are going to now. That made it easy for von Heinz. Easy? Well, to study the man in leisure. 
Von Hind always wants to be certain of his quarry. And uh, uh, where is Hans now? Who knows? Who knows what happens when Captain von Hind takes a man? Don't you admire such efficiency, Umberstein? Well, of course. Yeah, well, the captain did indicate that there were others to be rounded up, too. Well, here we are. Oh, look, look, you see them in the window? Norwegian salmon. Oh, they are beautiful, so red, so delicious. Are you hungry, Umberstein? What? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, they, they do look delicious. <laughs> Captain von Heint. I looked at him out of the window again. I could see his breath now. It was growing very cold. He was well-dressed in a neatly tailored overcoat and dark hat. It was too dark to tell the exact color. The only thing I was sure of were the hands and the gloves on the hands. Heavy, thick, powerfully mounted prongs encased in a gray, tightly fitting material. Style, lines running across the back. I noticed when he lifted them to light a cigarette. What beautiful weapons. His back was to me. I couldn't help but admire the fine breadth of his shoulders and the thick, closely barbered neck. He stood quietly by the lamppost, smoking, watching his breath and the smoke battle for existence in the icy air. Once when he turned to look up at my window, the single eyeglass he wore caught the reflection of the light. I wondered how much he weighed. Carefully, I retraced each step over again in my mind. I couldn't find the flaw that made me a marked man. The absurdly easy way I had gone through Mueller's office carrying an innocent-looking bundle of blueprints. Then to the vault, the super... the superstition of copies. No one could suspect what I had done. No one had any reason to. Why? Why, then, was I trapped? Of course, he was after me waiting down there. I wondered why he didn't come up and wait in my room. Surely he didn't know I was in the room. Perhaps he had searched my room one day while I was out. But what could he find? Nothing, absolutely nothing. A passport proving I was Charles Umberstein. A monogram suitcase bearing the initials C.U. A few letters and old papers. Nothing, nothing at all. I had never talked. I had never known anyone else in service except Hans. Franz Müller was too stupid to suspect anything. Fräulein Keller... No. The passport, perfect. Only one other way. Only one other way could he possibly know. For an instant, the possible answer flashed through my brain. For a full five minutes, I watched him, watched him very discerningly. Could it be? Could it possibly be? The stillness of the street below was broken from time to time by the blare of an occasional horn and the rattle of armored cars carrying soldiers to different parts of the city. Turning from the window, I groped about in the darkness of my room, searching for the automatic I had concealed in the slit compartment of my traveling bag. When I found it, I tested the chamber. Yes, it was loaded. I jammed it in my coat pocket, and putting on my hat, I stood there by the window, watching him. He seemed very ominous, very assured, waiting for me. He must have been getting anxious with his long vigil. I watched him signal to an accomplice across the street, walking back and forth under the streetlight. I noticed something familiar. Very familiar. A bolt from off the bed, tied to a piece of cord attached to the light switch. Ah, near the radiator pipe, room enough to pass it through, the weighted end dragging the string to the lobby below. I picked up my suitcase and stepped out of the door. The hall was dark and quiet. I walked down the stairs. The lobby was empty, deserted. At the bottom of the stairs, I placed the suitcase by the door, and I crossed to the desk. Hastily, I jammed a few bills in an envelope and addressed it to Fräulein Keller. Now, as I picked up my suitcase, I could see him very plainly on the corner... He was only a few feet from the entrance. The cord with its weighted end had fallen just short of the door. I stood there quietly. He looked up at my room. I pulled the cord. He was 
startled when the light went on upstairs, searching the window for a view of the occupant. I walked to the door. As I opened it, he looked at me, looked my way, gazed at me, point blank, seemed surprised. Then assuring himself, he took a step toward me. Herr Umberstein! Herr Umberstein! Oh, you are... You are Charles Umberstein? Why, yes, I... Uh... Charles Umberstein, who entered Germany in 1936 from Austria? Uh, here's my passport. Your passport, yes. I have always wanted to meet you, Charles Umberstein. I have always wanted to meet you face to face. You know who I am? Why, yes, you are. Uh... <laughs> I wonder... You know the others I have had my men pick up. But you, I wanted to attend to personally. It's because you are Charles Umberstein. Now we will uh, just... I'm sorry, oh. my friend. He sat down hard on the curb. He looked up at me, mumbled strangely, then fell over with his head in the gutter. His hat fell off, and I saw that his hair was closely cropped. There were other people on the streets. I ran till I was out of breath. The next day, I picked up a Berlin paper on the railroad station. On the second page, I read the headline, Gestapo official murdered. Saturday, January 25th, Captain Charles von Heind, high-ranking official of the Gestapo Intelligence Service, was instantly killed last night by the bullets of an unknown assailant whom he was attempting to arrest on charges of espionage. Captain von Heind had been connected with the Gestapo since 1936. Prior to his affiliation with the Gestapo Intelligence, he had been known by his real name, Charles Umberstein. His entry into such dangerous work made necessary a complete retirement from all public life. The Reich will long honor the memory of Charles Umberstein. I wired flowers from Geneva with a card marked Sympathy, signed C.U. And so closes The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein by E. Jack Newman, starring Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of suspense. Vincent Price will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Song of Bernadette. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear. Music was composed by Lucian Marowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. This is the man in black who would like to draw your attention to the new day in time for suspense beginning next week when Cary Grant will be our star. Beginning next week, listeners in the Eastern and Central time zones will hear suspense on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern wartime and 7 p.m. Central wartime. Listeners in the Mountain and Pacific time zones will be brought their next story of suspense on Monday, December the 6th, and each Monday thereafter at 9 p.m. Pacific wartime. Don't forget suspense on Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd, if you live in Eastern and Central time zones, and Mondays, beginning December the 6th, for listeners in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, with Cary Grant, our opening guest star. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills... The master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. In a niche all his own, apart from other great tellers of tales of terror, stands the moody, dark, and devious genius, Edgar Allan Poe. 
Obscure and ambiguous, the rolling periods of his prose are not for the casual reader, no more than for the casual listener. But for sheer suspense compounded of horror piled upon horror, literature offers nothing more awful than the pit and the pendulum. The terror of the black pit would have sufficed a lesser imagination, but to this, the macabre intellect of Poe added the inescapable doom of the razor-sharp pendulum, and then piled on the rats and the moving walls of red-hot iron until the edge of the unbearable was reached. Can you take it? Can you listen through the next half hour? Try. Try to listen to Mr. Vincent Price, starring in The Pit and the Pendulum, which begins in exactly one minute. This is Bob Wright, with the answer to the greatest challenge in cigarette history. The challenge was... Can a cigarette be made that will give decidedly better filtration and also give easy draw with full natural tobacco flavor? The answer is Kent. Kent with a revolutionary new Micronite filter that gives Kent decidedly better filtration, definitely less tars and nicotine than any other leading filter brand. Kent filters best. The answer is Kent with the full, rich flavor of the world's premium quality natural tobaccos and an easy draw. Yes, of all leading filter brands, Kent filters best. Kent filters best. Tomorrow, pick up a pack of Kents with a revolutionary new Micronite filter and enjoy the most important advance in the progress of filter smoking. Kent filters best. And now... Mr. Vincent Price stars in Edgar Allan Poe's immortal story of punishment by terror, The Pit and the Pendulum. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. I was sick, sick unto death with that long agony. And when at length they unbound me and I was permitted to sit, I felt that my senses were leaving me. The sound of the inquisitorial voices seemed merged in one dreamy, indeterminate hum from which emerged the syllables of my name. Captain Jean d'Albret. Good fathers, gentlemen. We hear you, my son. Even now I have no knowledge of where I am or to whom I may be speaking. You're speaking to me, my son. I am Fra Pedro Despia, prior of the Dominicans of Segovia and Grand Inquisitor for all Spain. This, then, is the court of the Inquisition? It is. But I am a French officer. That is true. A soldier and creature of the arch-fiend, the Antichrist, Napoleon Bonaparte, who even now is at the gates of Madrid, while his general LaSalle menaces our city of Toledo itself. Nonetheless, I am a prisoner of war. By what right do you try me in this court? Let the clerk read the charges against the prisoner. Item, that on the fourth day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1808, the said Captain Jean d'Albray did wed and espouse that most noble lady, the Doña Beatriz Valdez, niece and ward of the illustrious... One moment. Excellency? This marriage was a deplorable thing, if you like, but lawful marriage, however regrettable in a case like this, is no sin nor crime. There are other matters in the indictment. Then continue, but give us nothing that is not material. Item, that on the 12th of October, 1808... The said Jean d'Albray, being in command of a battery of light artillery, did direct the fire of his guns against the holy church of Santa Marta the Innocent, and thereby, of his wicked malice, destroyed that church utterly. Captain d'Albray, is this charge true? Yes. You admit it. Good father, the church blew up, did it not? Would you boast of your sin, young man? It blew up because it was stored with kegs of gunpowder for your army. I had every right to fire on it. And that is all the defense you have to make? I tell you, I had every right to fire on it by military law. Is military law above God's law? I don't know. I did my duty. Long live the emperor! Captain Dalbray, mark what I say. No man, however great his heresy, is condemned to be burnt in the fire if he first recant and acknowledge the error of his ways. 
Do you so? I cannot. I was under orders. I obeyed them. Then Jean d'Albray, there can be no mercy, no pity, since there is no atonement. The sentence of this court, therefore, is... I had swooned in terror, yet I will not say that all of consciousness was lost in the deepest slumber, no, in delirium, no, in a swoon, no, in death, no. Even in the grave, all is not lost, else there is no immortality for man. In a moment, we continue with the second act of Suspense. But first, some big news. Long pole, new Pontiac, the pole, new Pontiac, the pole, new Pontiac is here! With a Pontiac front seat that lets you in the back seat, Pontiac automatically moves up them back just like that. Automatically, a portable radio that pulls right out and plays all alone. When you plug it back in, it's a car radio, high fidelity too. What a nice tone! Set your speed on the new speedometer. Audi automatically. If you go too fast, a buzzer goes buzz. Audi automatically. More good reasons you love the bold new Pontiac. Party automatically. The bold new Pontiac is here. And now, Mr. Vincent Price in The Pit and the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. No, even in the grave all is not lost There were shadows of memory which told me indistinctly of tall figures that lifted me And bore me in silence down, down, still down Until a hideous dizziness oppressed me at that descent into the earth There was a vague horror at my heart because of that heart's unnatural stillness then, as consciousness swam back to my wits again, darkness, a damp stone floor in darkness. Oh, Beatrice, oh, my wife. Did you call me, Jean? Beatrice, you here in the dungeons of the Inquisition? No, my poor Jean, I am only here in your imagination. Am I mad, then? No. But your brain is fevered. You only think you hear me. I hear you clearly. You won't leave me. As long as I am in your heart, I shall be here. Have they chained you to the wall? No. No, they, they've taken away my uniform. They've given me sandals and a robe of rough cloth. But I'm unchained. Beatrice, suppose... Suppose they have... Buried me alive. Have courage, Jean. You must have courage. Then tell me, tell me where you are now, Beatrice, in the flesh, I mean. In the old house by the olive grove, scorned of my people. Yes, yes, I know. Each morning I climb to the hilltop and watch for them. Yes. Sometimes I think I hear gun wheels rumble in the hills and long moving columns with the red dust rising above them. Go on, go on. First come the heavy cavalry in plume crested helmets, on their flanks wheeling like hawks, light hussars in blue and scarlet, and behind them in a glitter of bayonets as vast as light points on the sea, rank upon rank. The long gray coats and tall bearskin caps. And the old guard and the grand army. It's only a vision, my dear one. They do not come. Will they ever come, Beatrice? I cannot tell. Then 
then I must face, face what has been prepared for me. Can you stand up, Jean? I, I think so. Then walk. Yes. Walk as far as you can. Measure the limits of the cell. If this is not a tomb. Oh, I'll try, Beatrice. I'll try. This robe impedes me and the floor is treacherous with slime, but, but I'll try. I'll... Look out! Oh. Jean! Oh. I'm all right. I, I fell on my face. The robe tripped me. But... What, Jean? But my hand is in front of me. Lower than my face, but I... I feel nothing. Nothing, Jean. It's a pit. A deep circular pit, and I fell on the very edge of it. They would have had you walk into it. Yes. But you didn't. You're saved, Jean. Saved, Beatrice. Saved. My torture has been merely postponed. At last, a deep sleep fell upon me, a sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, I know not. But when I opened my eyes once again, I, I could see. Yes, see. My prison was large and lofty, its walls formed of massive iron plates. A wild, sulfurous luster, I, I could not trace its origin, lit up the dungeon and the circular pit. I could see, but... I could not move. I lay on my back on a low framework of wood, securely bound by a long fastening resembling a surgical bandage. The bandage passed round and round my body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm. With much exertion, I could supply myself with food from an earthen dish on the floor beside me. It was meat, highly seasoned, and there was no water. Beatrice. Beatrice, where are you? I am here, Jean. Your voice sounds stronger, and I, I can see you. You are weaker, my dear, and more fevered. Look, Beatrice. Where? At the ceiling of this room, 30, 40 feet up. What do you see? I see, painted on the ceiling, a figure of Father Time. Yes, but this Father Time carries no scythe. He carries instead what looks like a gigantic pendulum from an ancient clock. And the pendulum is moving. A painting cannot move. But I swear the pendulum did. It swung a little back and forth, just like a real pendulum. Beatrice, take care. Take care of what? Take care of the rats. The rats from the pit. They're swarming out in dozens. You can see their eyes glitter. What do they want? What do they want? They have caught the scent of the meat in the dish beside you. I will not give it. Go! Go away, you vermin! Au revoir, Jean. Au revoir. Beatrice, where are you going? I can hardly hear you. You are sending me away, I'm Jean. I am sending you away. My poor loved one. You can't bear to see the rats running about my feet, can you? Even when you know I'm not here. Beatrice. It is true, Jean. You are sending me away. Yes. Yes, it's true. In a cell swarming with vermin, there are others I would rather see here. I would rather see. Did you call me Captain Dalbray? Then in spirit, I am here. Go. I command you, Fra Antonio. Go! Not until I have first told you what is in store for you. Which is? Listen. Do you hear anything? Yes, yes, I, I hear something. Turn your eyes upward. Look at the ceiling. The pendulum. Aye, the pendulum. It is descended. Only a foot or so as yet. As you notice, it is not really a pendulum. No? No. Its underside is a crescent formed of razor-sharp steel. You mean... You mean... A ponderous weight, Captain Dalbray. Its movement is slow now, but soon it will take on momentum. It will swing wider and wider, and with each broad movement, it will creep a trifle lower. The steel is directly over me. Yes, above the region of your heart. How long before? You need have no immediate fear. It will not be too soon. But how soon? Who can tell? Minutes, hours days. Who can say how long it was? 
It might have been many days before that hideous blade swept so closely as to fan me with its acrid breath. Down. Still unceasingly, still inevitably down. The sharp steel flashed past within three inches of my chest. And then, only then, Beatrice, Beatrice. I hear you calling, Jean. I am here. Oh, Beatrice. Is there no hope, my dear? How can there be? Ten, twelve more vibrations and it will fray the threads of my robe only lightly as a razor in a delicate hand. There will be many sweeps down before it bites deep. I can't escape it, and yet... And yet? And yet, if only I could use my wits... You kept me away from you, Jean. You locked me out of your thoughts. If I am here only in your thoughts, why should I fear the rats? The rats? The rats? Do they still swarm here? Across the floor and over the meat platter. Yes. They have taken nearly all your food. Yes, they are ravenous. They have sharp teeth. The meat is oily and spiced. If I take what remains of it... Scatter, you vermin! Rub that meat on the bandages that hold me here. Try it, Jean. Try it. It may be too late. If I move my body of a fraction of an inch up, I... Try it, I tell you. Try. Can I stand those rats crawling across me? Can the flesh bear it? Oh, one of them has leaped on the wooden framework. Yes. Another follows. They are gnawing at the bandage. Seven, eight more sweeps of the pendulum. Does the bandage give way? Lie still, Jean. Lie still. Ten, a dozen rats now. Is death, I wonder, worse than this disgust? A dozen sharp knives could do no better. The bandage has loosened to ribbons. If you move sideways, yes. carefully, and drop to the floor. Beatrice. Beatrice, I, I, I can't move. My arms and legs are numb. There is no the power to... The steel has frayed your robe. A minute more will be too late. Try. Then with all the strength that is in me and the hatred I bear my enemies... <laughs> I'm... I'm free. See, Jean. The pendulum stops. They are drawing it back up through the roof. Each move I make is watched. You never doubted that? No. Yet with all they could do to you, they have failed twice. They will not fail a third time, my dear. <laughs> Listen. What do you hear? A groaning... A grinding as of metal. It is only the cogwheels of the pendulum. I think not, Beatrice. Why not? It seems to come from behind these iron-plated walls. It seems to shake the dungeon as a mill wheel might shake it. it... Stand up, my poor Jean. Get up off your I knees. I can't. I can't endure any more. Don't you sense even now the odor of the heated iron? Heated iron? Yes, the walls are beginning to glow red. Oh, Beatrice. I have been much humbled. But I, I won't have you see me in tears. I order you to go. Sure, in the name of yes, heaven. Yes, in the name of heaven, go. In just a moment, we continue with the third act of... Suspense. More families, far more families, use X-Lax than any other laxative. X-Lax is the preferred laxative for one important reason. X-Lax helps you toward your normal regularity, gently, overnight. Today, many doctors recommend trusted X-Lax for youngsters as well as grown-ups. That's because X-Lax gives you the relief you want, the gentle way that nature wants, without upset. When you take chocolated X-Lax at night, it does not disturb your sleep. And X-Lax is so effective that the next morning you'll be well on your way toward your normal regularity. Seldom, if ever, will you need X-Lax the next day. Little wonder that of all the laxatives made today, tablet, powder, or liquid, X-Lax is the most popular. Next time, any time that you or any member of your family needs a laxative, make that laxative pleasant-tasting chocolated X-Lax. Introductory size, only 15 cents. And now... Act Three of The Pit and the Pendulum, starring Mr. Vincent Price. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. The 
blinding heat pervaded the prison. I could draw no breath of air into my lungs. Against the loom of that fiery destruction, the thought of the pit and its coolness came like balm. Does the pit please you, Captain Dalbray? You again? Do you find its contents pleasing? Not the pit. And how shall you avoid it? Look! This dungeon has changed its shape. That is true. The walls are closing in. It was formerly a square, and now, now it, it is... it is flattening slowly towards the center to force me into the pit. Of course. It will force you along with me. Again, apparently, you must be told, Captain Dalbray, that you are speaking only to your own sick fancy. I am not here at all. Farewell. How flatter and flatter grew the red-hot walls. I shrank back. But the closing walls pressed me relentlessly onward toward the loathsome pit. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer an inch of foothold. I screamed once. I tottered on the edge of the pit. I averted my eyes. Then there was a discordant hum of human voices. And then a loud blast of many trumpets. The fiery walls rushed back. An outstretched arm caught my own as I fell fainting into the abyss. It was that of General LaSalle. The French army had entered Toledo. The Spanish Inquisition was in the hands of its enemy. Suspense, in which Mr. Vincent Price starred in William N. Robeson's production of The Pit and the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe, adapted for suspense by John Dixon Carr. In a moment, the names of tonight's supporting players and a word about next week's story of suspense. Here's good news for everyone who appreciates fine music. Heinz Soups offer you the LP record bargain of the year. The best of 57 in classical music by famous RCA Victor. It's a genuine Red Seal LP of $3.98 quality. Yet it costs you just $1 in cash and four labels from any of Heinz condensed soups. That's right, just a $1 bill and four Heinz soup labels. Think of it, 43 minutes of the world's great music. Highlights from eight RCA Victor albums, performed by famous orchestras directed by Morton Gould, Arthur Fiedler, Fritz Reiner, and others. Here's the only way you can get this wonderful 12-inch record. Send a $1 bill and four Heinz soup labels to Best of 57, Box 57, Rockaway, New Jersey. I repeat, Best of 57, Box 57, Rockaway, New Jersey. Send for yours right away. Supporting Mr. Price in The Pit and the Pendulum were Ellen Morgan, Jay Novello, Ben Wright, and John Hoyt. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape into the mind of a man who has been sentenced to die. 
A man who attempts to refuse the bitter fate society has imposed upon him. As James Poe tells it in his seething tale of violent death, Present Tense, starring Vincent Price. In pain, the cold, dark land wheels away, and the hills beyond below the stars are black and sharp. Dead hills, dark sky. Cold steel below my feet, cold as the face of the officer at my side, cold as the cuffs which link my arm to his, which join us on this journey to the prison where I die. Want a cigarette? No. Go on, take one. No, I, I don't use them. Oh. Has this happened to you before? What? Being handcuffed to a murderer. Has it happened to you before? Sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yeah, there's nothing special, brother. Lots of guys axe their wives, lots of them. I could have escaped after it happened, but I didn't, and now it's too late. Late. Late, ever too late. Never too late, too late, too late. Escape. Escape. If the train were to be wrecked... If the detective were to be killed. Late. Late. The sweet escape. The light escape. The crash escape. No! Oh, no, no, no. The darkness. Where am I? The cars must have gone down the gully. No lights and those people in pain. This thing fastened to my wrist went halfway through the glass of the door. Keep back, keep back from his blood. I, I, I don't seem to be hurt. No broken bones. Escape. Now the, the key in his pocket, his bloody pocket, and <laughs> the cuffs are off. His gun and, and the wallet. His face. His face is gone. His own mother wouldn't know him. I'm free. Fire! Fuel oil! I must get away. Here, my ring onto his finger. There, that completes it. Taxi, yes. Where to? Up Beverly Glen, above Sunset. I'll show you where. Gotcha. Read about the big train wreck? Yes. Understand almost a hundred were killed. Here you are. Keep the chain. Thanks. My home. It looks so small, so shabby. No one took care of it during the trial. No one cared. No one. No one cares now, but that's good. I like that. I'll be alone, and I won't let the neighbors see me, and I'll sleep and figure out where I'd go next. The light. Someone's yes, in I... there. <laughs> the whole thing went so slick. <laughs> ah, you'll always be the brains of those other things in there. Huh? Always. Uh, you bet I will, baby. You bet no. I will. No, it can't be. She's dead. I know she's dead. Want another bottle of beer, honey? Huh? Yeah, sure, it's cold. You bet it's cold. But, uh, I'm not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you said a mouthful there. Your husband of mine was never able to make me feel like this. Takes a man, baby. All he could do was sit around and write those poems all the time. We framed it so good that even he thought he killed you. <laughs> What was that? Mice. <laughs> oh, you're funny, you know that? You're real funny. Open the kitchen door so quietly. 
and walked softly here on the wall by the stove, the cleaver. Honest, I hear something. Are you nervous, baby? Yeah. Relax just a little bit. I see them now. It is she. How did they do it? How did they trick me into imagining the murder? I, I am innocent. Sweetmeats. That's what you are, sweetmeats. <laughs> Lover, man. The pig in his dirty undershirt. Soft, weak, white neck, fat on his arms. Pig! Grip the cleaver and walk like a feather. He shall be first. Soft, white neck. I... Honest, I hear something. What's the matter, sweet mates? What's the matter? <laughs> you killed him! Yes, and now you. I was innocent, and I thought myself guilty, and now I am truly guilty, and never in my life have I felt so innocent. Like a nightmare, the confession, the conviction, the sentence, and now, once more, dark night, cold steel, the sound of wheels, just as I lived it before. Why, even the cold face of the silent officer at my side, hard, cold face, so much like that other face. Want a cigarette? No. Go on, take one. No, I don't use them. Oh. Has this happened to you before? Uh, what? Being handcuffed to a murderer, has it happened to you before? Well, sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yeah, you're nothing special, brother. Lots of guys ax their wives, lots of them. But were you ever cuffed to an axe murderer who killed two people, two people at once? What are you talking about? My sin, my crime, what I did, I killed them both. Glam. I take it easy, brother. They only kill your wife. Just her, just one, that's all. It has been raining for some days now. And beyond the barred window, the leaden sky bleeds sorrow on the barren land. The lonely land, the land beyond the prison wall. The sky was blue when first I came here. Blue, so blue. And now it has become as the walls of my cell, of all our cells. Dark, cheerless cells, these lifeless cells, these cells of men who wait to die. That wet sky, gray sky, cheerless sky. But it is beautiful. I have 12 hours left of life, 12 hours left to live. Beautiful sky, beautiful, beautiful, wet and fresh and alive. Oh, rather would I spend eternity at a well's bottom with, with but one patch of that to gaze upon than leave this life, than leave this earth, than leave this sky. But leave it I must. The guard told me no man has ever escaped San Quentin's death row. Blocks and bars, guards and guns lie between me and the world beyond. No escape, not from here. But wouldn't it be nobler to gamble my life in bold attempt and lay it down in reckless resignation, eh? So, now to get out of this super-guarded area. Oh! Oh, God! God! Hey, oh. hey, fight down, fight down, cut it out. Well, what's wrong? What's the matter with you? Oh, my, my, my gut, here, it's killing me. Your oh. gut, huh? Well, I'll call a medic. Now, as I press you, tell me where it hurts. Everywhere in hell. Oh, all over down here. There! Oh, don't touch that place again. Call the ambulance. All right. This man's got appendicitis. Oh, do something. Well, what do I do? Why didn't they send somebody with you? The interns are all tied up. They're giving shots today. Well, he's acting kind of crazy. Let's get him over to the hospital block. In a hurry. I can't drive any faster. My windshield's steamed up. Oh, wipe it. You got a rag? Yeah, here. You could use my hack. Okay, pal. Give him the hack. Oh, my God. What the... Keep right on driving through the gate or the top of your head comes off. You won't get away with this. I will. I'm betting my life that I will. How far back is the prison? About 15 miles. The 
at least that. Okay, pull over. I'm taking her from here. And you too. I want your money, your clothes. And then you can walk back and explain about me. Explain about him? They won't find the ambulance for days. Not at the bottom of that canyon. Now I... I cross the border on foot. And into Mexico. You drink, senor. Oh, thank you. Uh, say, uh, when does the next bus leave for Mexico City? At 12 o'clock, senor. A little card bought in a back room with no questions asked. And I become a tourist. Four days growth of beard and I become poor. An empty suitcase with a butterfly net strapped to its outside and I become a source of amusement. A funny, dumb gringo. And who looks with suspicion on the funny, dumb gringo tourist who is poor? Mexico City is beautiful, but not when you are hungry. Not when you are an American who is hungry. Americans aren't supposed to be hungry. What can I do? All I know is writing, the writing of poetry. There, there is one place I might sell some poems. Pollen. His magazine prints some English stuff. Perhaps, well, why not? I have three pesos left. Buy some paper, a pencil, sit in the park, write, and storm the bastions. Das ist gut hier. Do you like them, Mr. Pollen? Well, I, I, well, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Lucida. See, Pollen? I have some poems here. Oh, let me see. The river doubled, dreaming droppled, faster passion of my soul. Ah. Muy bueno. Yeah, yeah, that is just what I thought. You are too kind. The poet should read his own work. <laughs> that, that drips, sweet droplets, passions, goblets, fates thy roll. Uh, yeah, Lucita likes your stuff. A rare woman. And, and I like what Lucita likes. Aha. Uh-huh. She says we do a book of your stuff. Oh? So here's an advantage. Too much. Take it. When the book. That it is. Right. Got the poem? I'll get them. Your name is... Smith. No good to doubt. So true. I'll make a new one. Please do. And so? Good day, and I'll be back. In 30 days. With the poem. America. Miles below. The bleak brown mountains. The desert yellow and red. My own, my native land. My advance money went for a new clothing and a round-trip plane ticket to Los Angeles and my new lease on life. In a small file under the eaves of the little house in Beverly Glen, there are poems, more than a thousand of them, poems which no one has ever seen, poems written in the evenings after work on Sundays. And now, with the beard and the hat and the glasses, no one will recognize me. A cane, I ought to carry a cane, too. Get the poems. Does someone live there in the house? Has someone bought it? <laughs> no matter. Get the poems and then get back to Mexico City. Hmm. hmm. Someone is living here. I wonder who. The hedge is trimmed. And my, my hammock. Someone's put on a new canvas cover. Baby, I'm shaving. Oh, all right. Yeah? Oh, no, 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 it can't be. Well, what do you want? Her face, it's Mary, but I thought I killed her. Who is it, baby? Well, what is it, mister? What do you want here? Are, are you the lady of the house? Ah, uh, who's out at the door? Some creep with a beard. Yeah, I'm the lady of the house, but I don't want to buy anything. Well, what is it, Santa Claus? What do you want? Are you the man of the house? Yeah, I'm the man of the house. That's sweet means. <laughs> I'll say. So what of it? I'm, uh, I'm making a survey. I'd like to ask a few questions. May I come in? Well, I don't know. Ah, oh, let him. What's the difference? Thank you. 
First, your name. Name? Yes, please. Fred Sneed. Hey, where's he going? Mister, what do you want in my kitchen? The cleaver, Mary. Don't you know me? Mary. Hey, who are you, mister? Look close, Mary. <gasps> the cleaver. Put it down. Know me? Know the man you tricked into San Quentin? Oh, no, don't. Put down that... Yes, Mary. Yes. No! Confession, conviction, sentence, transportation, and... Oh, again, again, the death cell as before. But when I came here, they promised I could keep the beard. They promised I could keep the beard. And it's gone. Gone. I can't remember when. What's that? Who's coming? Ready? Ready. It's time to go, my son. Time to go? You've refused my help up to now. But perhaps you'd like to walk with me. Rather beside you, Padre, than beside one of these mercenaries. My legs... The muscles quiver, not with fear, no, but with the desire to feel themselves moving, straining, acting, while yet there is time. I'm not afraid, but this body, I hate the thought of its being killed by these men, my beautiful body. Soon it will be dead, cold, rotting, dead. It will rot. No, they must not do this to me. You must be brave, my son. My body. Years I spent with the great corporeal master, the yogi, learning my bodily purpose, my bodily care, the use of willpower to control my body. The yogi, my teacher, yes, I shall use yoga, suspend my breathing and become invulnerable to their gas, suspend my body functions to the point of death and fool their doctor, of course. Oh yes, the greatest escape of them all, and this time I must succeed. All right, here we are. The room is so small. Somehow I had imagined it would be larger. And here is the chair. Yes, straps, hood. All right, now just sit down. And over there, the glass. Take it easy. Small pane with the dark faces seen dimly through. The witnesses. I lay your arms along these. The whole room is it's like it. some strange this this sort of time machine. Yeah. Machine for oh, launching yeah. a man into I another dimension. <laughs> so true. Yeah. I'd best yeah. begin to prepare myself. Relax. Relax. Must relax. It won't be easy. Have you any last words, my son? Yes, one request. Do not allow my poor body to be dissected or embalmed, but on the third day after my death, cremate it. That will be arranged as you desire. Thank you. God be with you, my son. Remember what Christ said to the two criminals. In this day shalt thou be with me in heaven. Now move your head forward a little. While I put the hood down. There. Ah. Now when you hear the pellets drop into the air, so don't try any tricks, just... Breathe deeply, see? Fumes don't hurt, see? You just cooperate with us. Make it easy on yourself, pal. You know what I mean? Dark here under the hood. Now, the last breath has the yogi taught me. And the lungs hold it. Body limp, all muscles, tendons, joints. Relax, all slow the bloodstream, lock the breath. Hold, hold. Slow, slow, hold. Suspend all bodily functions, hold. Fix the eye in, suspended animation. Gently fix the mind on time. Ease the beating of my heart. 
time as a picture on the screen of my mind. Slower. Slower. My perception is slower. The time seems to spin by now. Go slow, my heart. The ventilators go on, clearing the air of the poisonous fumes. Now the doctor will come with his stethoscope. I will my limbs to stiffness, my flesh to coldness. All right, it's clear, doctor. You can go on in. Well, let's see now. Respiration ceased. Heart stopped. <clears throat> by the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. I will myself to consciousness in six hours' time. Where am I? It's dark here and cold, so cold. I, I must get up and see. Oh, the prison morgue. It worked. But I'm... Cold, so cold. What's this on my toe? A tag. Too dark to read it, but I know what it says. It has my name, prison number, time of execution, yes. And now to look around. Because the next step must be played just right. And this should be it. A coffin crate ready for shipping. Some cadaver being returned to a sentimental family. Well, that ought to be just right. With him on my slab, my tag on his toe, and the most perfect escape of all time underway, here we go. I will my body to return from its state of suspended animation and to come immediately out of trance when next this coffin shall be opened. <laughs> bad heart. Let's see. No, it's going. Well, let's hope he's out for a while. This must be the workroom. Light hanging over the work table and there a locker. Ah, with a suit. Fine. And here in the, in the desk, might there not be some sort of... Uh, yes, here. A petty cash box. And it's quite full. And the old boy apparently doesn't believe in banks. <laughs> and now, and now that Lazarus has returned from the dead, this newspaper, Dateline, I was executed four days ago. Now I find myself resurrected in Indianapolis, Indiana. Los Angeles, California, this is Los Angeles. You can claim your baggage in the station or on the platform. <laughs> I return to my home. Beautiful time to return home. My old hammock is there and my flowers, my yard. Oh, the house is empty. The lawyer said he'd had it cleaned up. Oh, my books, my pictures. Here's my old pipe. I haven't smoked it in years. Mary didn't like it. But now she's gone. I don't hate her anymore. Tobacco's still fairly fresh. Fill the pipe. There's that detective story I never got to finish. Now I'll have time. Now I'll have lots of time. Time to smoke and read and write and rest. Oh, the sun's almost down. Twilight. Wonderful time to get outside. Cool, sweet air. Wonder what kind of birds those are. 
my hammer. Oh, oh, it's so nice. Light the pipe. And oh, relax. Wish I could remember what page I was on, but no matter. I can begin again. I've got all the time in the world. The rest of my life. <laughs> Birds. And the sun is slipping out of sight. Death of the sun. I read the sky. How soft those clouds. So lovely, so lovely. What's that? <laughs> birds playing in the fish pond. <laughs> Look at them. Happy birds. That hissing. The neighbor is turning on his lawn sprinkling system. <laughs> Lie here and smell the cool air. Evening coming on. Sky grows darker. Lie in the gathering twilight. Death of the day, birth of the night. Sweet softness of the summer night coming. Soon the stars. Oh, it's lovely, heavenly, just like heaven. Lie and swing. Rock and rock. To and fro. By the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Present Tense by James Poe, starring Vincent Price as Roger. Featured in the cast were Charles McGraw as Fred Sneed, Joan Banks as Mary, Harry Bartell as the Doctor, and Ben Wright as Pollen. Also heard were Tom Tully, William Lally, Jeff Corey, and Paul Fries. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are alone at the controls of an experimental rocket aircraft about to be hurled 40 miles out from the Earth's surface into the limitless boundaries of space, into a nothingness from which there may be no escape. Next week, we escape with Graham Doerr's imaginative and widely discussed story of a rocket pilot who receives the strangest and most terrible warning in the history of man, the outer limit. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. When Bob Hope visits Bing Crosby on Bing's CBS show tomorrow night, they'll be singing a duet called Have I Told You Lately. That's a good theme for Bing and Bob, for you know and I know that when the two lads get together, the gags about each other's shortcomings fly thick and fast. Tomorrow night, with National Sauerkraut Week as the springboard, Bing and Bob promise one of their most hilarious meetings. So don't miss the CBS Bing Crosby show, which is heard on most of these same stations. Now stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price in The Web. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Of all forms of entertainment designed to hold an audience in rapt attention, none has ever surpassed the murder mystery in excitement, drama, and suspense. And tonight, we bring you one of the more thrilling mysteries to reach the screen this season, Universal International's current hit, The Web, with three of its original fine stars, 
Ella Rains, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price. And with enchanting Ella Rains in the cast, you'll gather that tonight's play, in addition to its other spine-tingling ingredients, has more than a suspicion of romance. And speaking of romance, during the filming of The Web, Ella Rains herself became a bride and settled down to happy married life. Uh, uh, between pictures, that is. She assures me that when it comes to household management, a good supply of Lux Flakes is a wonderful help in washing fine fabrics and keeping tableware and silver sparkling clean. Well, I'm sure that many other young brides in our audience have discovered the same thing and thank their lucky stars for Lux Flakes on the pantry shelf. Here's Act One of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Andrew Colby. New York City. Two men, complete strangers to each other, are determined to see a certain Mr. Andrew Colby. One of them, elderly, haggard, has just stepped off a train in Grand Central Station. Father. Oh, Father. Are you, are you sure you're all right? I'm all right, Martha. You should have let me come up to meet you. To see me get out of prison? It's not a sight I'd want you to remember. You're free now, Father. That's all that matters. Where is Mr. Colby? He didn't come here. Did you expect him? Yes, yes, of course I did. Father, please, don't, don't upset yourself. Let's go home now. He should have been here. I must see him, Martha. I must see him. The other man, so intent on seeing Mr. Colby, is now in the offices of Colby Enterprises. Is there something I can do for you? Any number of things. But unfortunately, I'm here on business. I'd like to see Mr. Colby. What about? Well, he's been carrying on with my grandmother. I'd like to find out what his intentions are. I'm Mr. Colby's secretary. If you have any business with him, you have Don't to... bother. I can announce myself. Mr. Colby's busy. You can't go in there. Don't blame your secretary, Mr. Colby. She did her best. I trust this is something urgent. My name's Robert Regan. I'm an attorney representing Emilio Canepa. As a result of your negligent driving, his push cart and load of bananas were damaged to the extent of $68.72. Oh, yes, yes, I, I seem to recall You've ignored I... my letters, Mr. Colby, so try ignoring this. This piece of paper is a summons. Well, I assure you, Mr. Regan, it wasn't my intention to defraud your client. I turned your letters over to my attorneys, Porter and Griswold. Porter and Griswold? <laughs> they wouldn't take a bath unless it involved at least $100,000. I think you may have a point there. Anyway, I'll see that Mr. Kniepa gets a check. And a letter congratulating him on his choice of attorney. Ah, thank you. Do you always uh, tend to these matters personally, Mr. Regan? I thought my client was getting pushed around, Mr. Colby. I didn't like that. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Regan. Well, I guess you saw Mr. Colby all right. Sorry if I got you into a jam. Oh, anything for the cause of justice. My name's Regan. Robert Regan. I'll uh, try to remember. Oh, you will excuse me, won't you? Mr. Colby's buzzing. Well, I'm in the phone book in case your push card ever gets pushed. It very rarely does. Goodbye, Mr. Regan. I'm sorry about the interruption, Andrew. Regan? Oh, he was a welcome relief. <laughs> what an intense young man. <laughs> you seem in a very happy mood. Well, I ought to be. Noel Holcomb just phoned me. They've decided to back me 100%. Andrew, that's wonderful. You can wire our Paris office. We'll be ready to leave here in two weeks. May I come in? Oh, Charles, please do. We've been waiting for you. Croner was on the train, all right. His daughter met him. Croner. Hmm. How does he look, Charles? Yeah, about the same. Thinner, a little bitter. Five years. It doesn't seem possible, does it? Noel, that Regan fellow, what did you think of him? Oh, I don't know. Brash, hot-headed. Fairly bright, I imagine. Have him come to see me tonight. Come to see you? Yes, at home. Say nine o'clock. Oh, will you want me there? Naturally, no. Naturally. Come in, please, Mr. Regan. Quite a display of hardware on your front door. Do you always... Good evening. Well, 
Hello? Ah. You know, when I'm worth $40 million, I'm going to have a secretary who looks exactly like you. Oh, my tastes are fairly simple. $20 million would be quite enough. How's Emilio Canepa? Expecting a check. Uh, what's the idea of this interview? Ask Mr. Colby. Oh, I thought you were his personal secretary. He keeps a few secrets from me. I couldn't. Say, uh, what kind of a guy is he, anyway? Handsome, generous, warm-hearted, brilliant. Come in, Mr. Regan. Ah, it's a very attractive secretary you have there, Mr. Colby. Yes, I'm still young enough to notice that myself. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're wondering why I wanted to see you? Yes, yes, I am. Well, I was very much impressed with you this morning, Mr. Regan. I liked your loyalty to your client. Loyalty is a very rare quality to find these days. Well, you can buy it at any dog store in town. Unfortunately, that's about the only place. How would you like to work for me? Ooh, sounds fine. At considerably more money than I believe you're earning now. Sounds even better. What have I got to do that Porter and Griswold can't do? Well, briefly, it's this. Up until five years ago, I had a business associate, a man named Leopold Kroner. He became financially entangled and stole nearly a million dollars worth of bonds belonging to our firm. He had counterfeit duplicates made of them, and then, using his position as an executive of the firm... He sold those counterfeit bonds. Clever boy. Not so clever. He was sent to prison for five years. He's just been released. But I'm afraid the long confinement, well, it seems to have unbalanced him seriously. How do you mean? He seems to hold me responsible. He phoned me today, and he threatened my life. (laughs) You better call the cops. If necessary, I will. But I'm negotiating rather a large loan, and if certain prospective backers were to hear that my life had been threatened... Uh-huh, well, I see. On the other hand, if I were to engage a bright young man to be constantly at my side... Nobody would think a thing about it. Exactly. That is, ex- nobody except me, and I'd think about it a lot, and I wouldn't like it. Why not? Because I'm a lawyer, not a bodyguard. It wouldn't be for long, Mr. Regan. I'll be leaving for Europe in two weeks. In two weeks, you'll make $5,000. I've heard of that kind of money. But then what do you say? If you think I'm going to turn it down, you're crazy. But then you act a little crazy anyway. Uh, uh, I'd feel better if you took this. Be careful, it's loaded. Well, it's as serious as all that. Yes, I'm afraid it is. Can you get a permit to carry a gun? Oh, I can try. I have a friend in the police department, Lieutenant D'Amico, homicide. Huh. Well, when do I start? After you've seen your friend. I could see him tomorrow. What about tomorrow night? Very well, tomorrow night. You'll come directly here and Charles will have a room ready for you. Charles? Charles Murdoch, the gentleman who met you at the door. Oh, oh, sure. Tomorrow night, then, Mr. Colby, you've you've got yourself a bodyguard at five thousand per body. What's bothering you tonight, Mr. Regan? Besides you, well, nothing really. I'd like to see the boss, though. I'm afraid he's still upstairs in his study. You keep. Long hours for a secretary. I'm, uh, well paid. Oh. Where have you been? Oh, just looking the place over and getting the pants scared off me. That guy Murdoch. <laughs> Does he always walk around in the dark? Oh, Charles. He was probably just checking up on you. You better tell him I've got a permit now for that gun. He ought to wear a taillight. What does he do apart from turning up unexpectedly? Oh, lots of things. He's been with Mr. Colby for years. Mm, nice, compact little group. Murdoch, you, and Colby... There are a lot of double meanings in that remark. Oh, no, no. I just like to keep things straight. Who belongs to who? Why should you care? Well, we're we're all hired help together now. Maybe I have visions of asking you for a date sometime. With uh, what in mind? Mm, Dancing. Drink or two. Catch as catch can. (laughs) Thanks for warning me. I'll bring along my police whistle. Oh, that won't be necessary. My early years in reform school left a lasting impression. Problem, child? Average. I'd set fire to my kid brother once in a while, but (laughs) who doesn't? Well, that's very encouraging. Ask me nicely for a date sometime. Regan! Regan, help! Regan! Colby! Cronor! No, don't be a fool! Regan! Look out, Regan. He's got a gun. (sighs) You better take his gun, Mr. Gold. Yes. Get a doctor, will you? No. No, wait. I didn't know my aim was so good. But he he may just be pretending. I'd better... No. He's dead, Mr. Colby. I I killed him. Who is he? Leopold Kroner. How did he get in here? I don't know. I'll call the police. Dr. 
Sorry I'm late, Tomiko. I've been in with the district attorney. Yeah, I know. So he turns you both loose, huh? You and Colby. Why, does that surprise you? Oh, no, no, no. You killed a man in self-defense. Hey, did he give you your back, back your gun? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yes. Ah. I fixed it for you yesterday to get a permit for that gun, didn't I? I want to have my head examined. Well, that would look great in there without a permit. I don't like what happened last night. Well, neither do I. Colby's in his study on the second floor of his house. He's going over some business papers. He looks up and sees Leopold Kroner. How did Kroner get in there? I don't know. I told you that. So did Colby. Kroner has a gun in his hand. He says he's going to kill Colby and then kill himself. He says Colby has ruined his life. Well? Nothing. I just like to hear myself talk. Colby throws the papers in Kroner's face and makes a grab for the gun. Kroner fires one shot that goes into the floor. Colby starts yelling for you. He's still struggling with Kroner when you walk in. Yes, I signed a statement to that effect, didn't I? Sure, sure you did. You said Kroner turned on you with a gun, but he was off balance, you guessed. And you were able to shoot first. Any news yet from Kroner's daughter? Well, you'd know that before I would. Maybe. Maybe I would. Colby said he wants to make some sort of provision for him. What's bothering you, D'Amico? You are. A guy takes a shot at your boss while you're downstairs romancing a dame. You're a great bodyguard, you are. Why didn't he come to us if he'd been threatened? He didn't want the publicity, huh? All right, Regan. What was the payoff? Look. Look, are you going to hold me? No. But I've been looking over the chrono record for five, five years ago. Guy counterfeits some barn, sells him for a million dollars, and then pleads guilty. But nobody ever finds the million dollars. He stashed it away someplace. Great, then what's he so sore about? A man with a million dollars isn't sore at anybody. What's that got to do with me? Everything's got to do with you. You killed him. In self-defense, he had a gun in his hand. He'd already fired once. Anybody can shove a gun into a dead man's hand. Kroner's fingerprints weren't the only ones on that gun. Colby picked it up after Kroner was dead. We told you that. Kroner gets out of prison one day and gets bumped off the next. And all the time, there's a million dollars in cash lying around loose someplace. It couldn't be that you got a line on that money, could it? Now, lay off, Tomiko. You know me better than that. I only know one thing. This case is a long ways from settled as far as I'm concerned. Remember that, Regan. Tomiko, you really think there's something phony? You heard me. I've made out the check for Regan, Andrew, here. Oh, thank you. No, well, I'm terribly sorry you had to be mixed up in all this. Maybe you'd like to go on to Paris ahead of me. No, I'll, I'll wait. But I hope it'll be soon. I'm beginning to... We're in here, Mr. Regan. Oh, come in, Bob. I haven't had a, much of a chance to really thank you for last night. Oh, forget it. I'd like to show my appreciation. Well, would a check for 20 million be asking too much? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but here's the amount we agreed upon. Well, another day, another $5,000. I'd take it if I were you. I intend to. Thanks. Bob, if you'd like to stay on with me, no, I... No, I'm afraid I just couldn't stand the strain. I can't get used to the idea of killing people. What's the matter, Bob? Did that police lieutenant say something? Nothing important. What's the matter with her? There's nothing the matter with me. Oh, I think Noel's a little depressed. That Kroner didn't get me first? Is that nice? You know, you and I were talking about a date. Let's make it for dinner tonight, huh? No, thanks. Oh, come on. We're both in the dumps. We really shouldn't inflict our company on anyone but each other. Why don't you, know? Call me later on. I'll let you know then. Okay, I will. Oh, uh, Mr. Colby, here. My gun. I'm checking it in, Coach. It was a great fight, and I'm glad I won. Bob, I... I Meanwhile, you still owe my client Emilio Canipa $68.72. Noel, I'm... uh... I'm glad he suggested dinner tonight. Are you? Why? I just think you might enjoy it. Maybe I will, if I go. Well, you could cheer him up. Seriously, Noel, he denies it, of course, but that lieutenant must have said something to disturb him so deeply. And uh, you'd like to know what it was? I didn't say that. A few minutes ago, you were sorry because I was mixed up in all this. Noel, what's come over you? It isn't like you to suggest that I go out with someone else. Regan has done us a great service. It seems to me the least we could do for him. Of course. I'll dig up some light, bright table talk of my most alluring dress. Anything else? No. Nothing else, no. More coffee, no? Would you rather dance? <laughs> 
Not much of a choice. Coughing. Well, I couldn't have been more surprised when Kobe let you out tonight. What do you mean by that? I mean, if I were in charge of you, I'd be a little more careful about how I passed you around. If there's uh, any passing around to be done, I, I do it myself. I saw the look you threw him this morning before he gave you the nod. I merely wanted to know if he had anything for me to do tonight. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. You see, I don't kid myself that the president of Colby Enterprises isn't a little competition. This is America. You, too, can be competition. How do you stand with Colby? Why? What does that matter? Well, maybe I've already made a few plans. <laughs> well, if you have, they certainly don't include him. So why worry? Mm, I'm just naturally a worrier. How long have you worked for him? A little over six years. You must know him pretty well. I recognize him when I see him. Well, no more questions? Uh, What's the use? Tonight I sit making awkward passes at a beautiful girl. Last night I killed a man. Tomorrow I... You're not to blame for what happened. I'm to blame for getting in a spot like that. Who am I to be carrying a gun, playing around with people's lives? There was nothing else you could have done. Oh, I could have shot Croner in the shoulder, couldn't I, or in the leg. I could have kept my head and not have killed him. Is that what Lieutenant D'Amico said? Huh? What does that mean? Nothing. Only you seem so disturbed when you got back to the house. And after I tell you what D'Amico said, do you have to leave right away or can you stick around a while and report to Mr. Colby later? Let's go home. Quit kidding. Colby asked you to find out what happened down there. Did he? Well, as a matter of fact, I intend stopping by his house. Your friends, Porter and Griswold, are there. I may be typing all sorts of reports till morning. It's happened before. Go on. Look, I went out with you tonight because I wanted to. You're rude, but you're upset, so I'll forgive that. But if you want us really to know each other, why don't you stop acting like a schoolboy asking grown-up questions? I'm sorry. So am I. Now take me home. I'd ask you to come in, Bob, but Mr. Colby's probably still busy with the lawyers. Good night. Oh, wait a minute, Noah. I don't like to leave things like this. About tonight, I'm a warm-hearted, impulsive boy. Sometimes I say things I don't mean. You're forgiven. I, I'm not only warm-hearted, I'm, I'm shy. I need a lot of encouragement. To do what? Can I demonstrate? Kiss him good night, Noel, or I'll have him here for breakfast. You must wear rubber soles, Mr. Colby. The Porter and Griswold left a half hour ago. It was such a nice night, I decided to take a walk. Did you tiptoe the whole way? Is there anything you want me for, Mr. Colby? No, no. Run on home if you'd like. But why don't you both come in for a while? It's still early. I'd be glad to. Well, what did you do tonight? Oh, not much. We sat around, threw a few rocks at each other. Well, aren't you coming in, Noel? <laughs> it suddenly dawns on me that my dangerous beauty depends upon eight hours of sleep. My car's right here. Good night. Good night, night no. no. You have a drink, Bob? Hmm? Uh, no. Well, would you care to play some billiards? No, I don't think my aim's so good tonight. Well, how about a few hands of poker, then, at uh, showdown at a dollar a hand? <laughs> you must be interested in my $5,000. I'm interested in everybody's $5,000. <laughs> Sit down, I'll get the car. Lieutenant D'Amico doesn't settle so cheaply. He's interested in a million dollars. Oh? Kroner's million. He thinks I know where it's buried. Do you? Until last night, I had to save up to weigh myself. What else does... Well, what else does the lieutenant think? I don't know. I can guess. <laughs> he thinks a wealthy industrialist has somebody he's anxious to get rid of. He hires a not-too-bright, eager young man as a bodyguard. And he frames a situation where the bodyguard has to kill the guy in self-defense. And then? The industrialist is rid of the guy, he's in the clear, and the not-too-bright young man never tumbles. It's an interesting point, because even if our dumb boy should tumble, there's nothing in the world he can do about it. Why should he want to? Why shouldn't he? Well, the man is already dead. There isn't anything your young friend can do about that. The district attorney has exonerated him, so there's no danger there. But on the other hand, he may have made himself a powerful friend. But you forget, he's not very bright. He may feel some twinges of conscience. Why? There was no intent of murder on his part. Morally, he's as pure as the driven snow. That's true enough. Then deal the cards, Bob. Sure. Well, it's Lieutenant D'Amico's plot. Let him worry about it. Regan, I wish you'd change your mind and come to Paris with me. You'd like it. Maybe I would. Maybe I'd end up with as much dough as you have, huh? 
Hey, how good's a pair of kings? No good at all. I seem to have eights over fives. There must be some way of beating you. There are lots of ways, Regan. But not while I'm holding all the cards. In just a moment, our stars return in Act Two of The Web. Libby, what are you grinning about? (laughs) Remembering one of the funniest pictures I've seen recently. And what is that? Universal International's forthcoming Western. I was fortunate enough to be on the set when they were filming it. A Western that's funny? (laughs) Oh, that's something new, isn't it, Libby? Yes, definitely new and hilarious. It's called... The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap. <laughs> and in it, Abbott and Costello do a comedy version of the old six-shooter western. Marjorie Maine is the Wistful Widow, with uh, seven children. <laughs> and she makes a strong play for Costello. But uh, she has a beautiful daughter, played by Audrey Young, who foils all her attempts at romance. Didn't Audrey Young start her career as a Broadway dancer? Mm-hmm. But she also shows a definite gift for comedy in The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap. She dropped in on the set while I was watching Marjorie Maine do a very muddy barnyard scene. And then, well, Audrey proved that she's a mighty smart girl. I can believe that. Especially when I tell you she's a luck girl from way back. You see, we were both walking through the barnyard to chat with Marjorie Maine between takes when our nylons got spattered all over with muddy water. Oh. Oh, they looked terrible. But Audrey said, oh, goodness, Libby, I don't mind that. A dip in locks will fix them in no time. Well, of course, I cheered those sentiments. And she told me how she used to save her dancing stockings with Lux. She really raved, John, about the way Lux cut down the runs even in strenuous dancing routines. And she's so right, as you know, Libby. Our famous strain tests showed that stockings washed with Lux flakes last twice as long. Not only nylons, but every type of stockings. Silk, rayon, cotton. Yes. I wonder why any girl would risk strong soap or rub her stockings with a cake of soap. Oh, uh, there's another thing about Lux Flakes, too. Oh, I've forgotten something, Libby. Well, it's especially important these days. It's the way Lux saves the color of your stockings. And now, with the exciting new deep tones that you see in the stores, that's vital. Thanks, Libby. So, to keep stockings lovely, to make them last longer, it's smart to Lux them after each wearing. Here's William Keeley at the microphone. Act Two of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Andrew Colby. It's 20 minutes later. Deeply engrossed in the events of the past two days, Regan has gone home to his apartment. He's just opened the door when someone steps up behind him. Shut the door, Mr. Regan. You're Krona's daughter. Yes. And I have a gun in my hand. How much hate does it take to kill a man, Mr. Regan? I I didn't hate your father. I I didn't even know him. And yet you murdered him. I had to shoot. You've got to believe that. Why? Why should I believe a hired gunman? You murdered my father because you were paid to do it. To you, he was just, just a new car you could buy when he stopped breathing. Your father wasn't himself. He, he tried to kill Colby. I never dreamed I could hate enough to want to kill. But I've reason enough to kill you now ten times, and I'll do it. Oh. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt you, Miss Crona, but I, I had to get that gun from you. All right. You got it. Why don't you kill me, too? You've got to listen to me. I, I, I was hired to protect Mr. Colby. Protect him from what? My father wouldn't have hurt anyone. Miss Crona, when a man is out of his mind... He wasn't out of his mind. And he didn't threaten Colby. And he never owned a gun. How do you know? I knew my father. He was... the kindest man who ever lived. But he did break into Colby's house. He didn't break in. He was invited. Huh? Invited? He was asked to be there at ten o'clock. I was there when he phoned. As if you didn't know. You're sure of this? Do you have any proof? (laughs) If I had any proof, do you think I'd be here now? Or that you would? No, Mr. Regan. If I could prove what I know, you and Colby would be where you belong. In prison. Am 
mind if I sit down, D'Amico? Or do you want to eat alone? Well, what do you want, Regan? I just called police headquarters. They said I'd probably find you here. You know, you were absolutely right about people carrying guns. Here. Where'd you get this one? From a girl named Crona. When last seen, she was in my apartment trying to kill me. You asking for protection? Uh-uh. I'm asking for information. Amico, how near are you to pinning Crona's death on me? I'll let you know when the time arrives. Suppose I told you that I agree with you, that I think it was murder. I've got a pen if you want to sign a confession. Not, D'Amico, look. Everything I told you was the truth. Then what are you worried about? Well, it's finally occurred to me that I, I might have been a patsy in all this, framed. What's got you so scared? Does Crona Dame know something? I just want to work with you on this case. I, I'm on the inside and I might be able to dig something up. Sure, and cover it right up again. You seem to forget you're the one I'm after. You killed Cronin. If it's murder, you did it. What was my motive? That $5,000 you deposited in the bank today. In other words, I better get out of town. You wouldn't get three feet out of town. If I were you, I'd go to church every day and pray that a certain dumb cop named D'Amico was running himself right up a blind alley. Well, that's great, except I like to sleep at night. And I just talked to the daughter of the man I killed. Oh, you're in a tough spot. D'Amico, isn't there some way we can get together on this? Certainly. You confess and I'll arrest you. Okay, D'Amico. Regan, for a lawyer, you're not very smart. If you can prove that it's murder, you prove that you're a murderer. If it's a frame, there's only one guy can clear you. Colby. And I don't think he'd be too anxious to run to the rescue, deal. Thanks for nothing, D'Amico. Anytime, Regan. Anytime at all. Hello. Oh, good morning, Bob. I don't know how I could. I'll be busy all day. You what? Oh, uh-huh. Well, this afternoon, then? Three o'clock. No, you better not. I'll, um, meet you downstairs in front of the building. I'll be there at three o'clock. Now, isn't this better than working? A happy little drive through Central Park. You said it was important. When I feel like seeing you, it's very important. Why are you, uh, stopping here? Oh, this is the best little parking spot in town. I used to operate from here all the time when I was in high school, except I'd hit it a lot later in the evening. Uh-huh. That must have been a progressive school you went to. Oh, it was. What do you want to see me about? Well, made up my mind about a lot of things last night, Noel. For one thing, I'm not going to Paris with Colby. And I don't want you to go either. Really? What do you want me to do? See America first. You might get to meet someone you'd like. I might. But, Colby, what have you got? Money, influence, travel, yachts? Why don't you let me take you out of all that? That's an offer if I've ever heard one. No. I'm really very serious. I know you are. Bob, what's the matter? I spent the whole morning in a newspaper office going over the accounts of the Krona trial five years ago. Why? You just naturally get curious about someone you've killed. Anyway, I ran across the name of Victor Bruno. Who was Bruno? Didn't you find out? Well, I went to see a friend of mine, court clerk. Cost me a bottle of scotch, but I found out something. Now I'm very curious. He didn't remember much about Bruno, only that the cops figured him for the engraving job on those counterfeit bonds. But Bruno never testified at Croner's trial. No, no, I know. They never found him. But, Noah, what do you know about him? No more than you do. <laughs> Funny. Croner didn't look like the type to get away with a million dollars. Neither did Bruno. Oh, you've seen him? Yeah, once. Before he disappeared. Croner was out on bail at the time, and Andrew was doing everything he could to help him. He spoke to Bruno, hoping to clear Croner. What did this Bruno look like? Oh, I don't know. Strange little man, always trying to hide. He looked like a, oh, $20 a week bookkeeper. Glasses two inches thick and not a hair in his head. Is he a foreigner? Well, he spoke with an accent. Um, is, is Colby going to be home tonight? As far as I know, why? Oh, maybe I could get him to throw some legal business my way. <laughs> I'll keep him at home for you. Now you better take me back to the office. Well, well, little did I think when I first met Emilio Canepa that you'd be the mother of my children. Why? Is there some connection between the two? No Emilio, no summons. No summons, no children. 
We'll name our first one Emilio, uh, then. Uh, over my beautiful, muscular, dead body. Oh, well, back to your office. Hello, Murdoch. Good evening, Mr. Regan. Much killing going on around the place tonight? Mr. Colby is expecting you in the library. Ask a dull question, you get a dull answer. Oh, hello, Bob. Don't be so glad to see me until you find out what I want. I've already told him, Bob. Well, I'm sorry you won't come to Paris. Didn't you tell Mr. Colby about the services our new firm is prepared to offer? I thought I'd better say that for you. Well, we're offering everything in the legal line. Ambulance chasing and grave subpoenas. It sounds like an up-and-coming outfit. We'll sympathize with our clients' troubles and charge only $500 a day for the sympathy. Well, that's cheaper than the sympathy I'm getting from Porter and Griswold. <laughs> Your proposition sounds very attractive. Oh, uh, say, I almost forgot. You know, I think your house is being watched. Watched? Yeah, some little bald-headed guy, not a hair on his head. He, he just stopped me in front of the lamppost. I don't understand. He spoke with an accent, kept blinking at me through glasses two inches thick. Seemed like he was a $20 a week bookkeeper trying to act important. No, no. Perhaps, Charles. Perhaps. Why did he stop you? Well, he asked me for a light, wanted to know if I was coming in here. Look out the window, Charles. He said something about being a friend of Croner's and that you'd hear from him. He must have gone. There. There's no one out there now. There isn't any danger, is there? Oh, I don't think so, Well, Bob. if you'd like me to talk to if him... If we want Bruno, we can always reach Mr. him. Mr. Colby, if there's any threat, I could no, see him thanks. tonight. Maybe we'll call on you later. I'm much obliged for the information. All right. But uh, seriously, though, about my legal services... I'm sure there will be something for you, Bob. I'll have Porter and Griswold contact you. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Colby. Good night. Good night, Noel. Good night. Bruno. I wonder what's brought him back. Croner's death, of course, was in all the newspapers. Bruno never impressed me as being the sort of fellow who'd make threats. He was such a meek little man. Did you ever meet him, Noel? Probably. Oh, yes, of course you did. Sometimes I forget how long you've been with me, Noel, how long we've been together. Andrew, if you don't What mind, was it I... you once said about Bruno? That he reminded you of a $20 a week bookkeeper, wasn't it? Do... Do you have anything else for me to do this evening? I don't think so. Well, then, then I'll say good night. Good night, Noel. Well, hello. Hey, this could give me a pretty bad name with my landlady. But come in, come on. I'd like to know what you meant by that little performance tonight. Was I convincing? You're not a very nice person, are you? Your high school parking spot came through beautifully. Now, now, wait a minute, Noel. No, you wait. Just what are you up to? What's your guess? Blackmail. <laughs> That's a nice business, too, if you have the right connections. I think I deserve a better answer than that. Sure you do. Noel, there are several people in this town who believe that Croner was deliberately murdered. That's ridiculous. Is it? It would have been comparatively easy for Colby to frame... He invites Croner to the house. In the middle of the conversation, Colby pulls out a gun. He fires one shot into the floor, shoves the gun into Croner's hands, starts wrestling with him and yelling for help. I rush in, Croner turns startled, bang, bang, and it's all over. You must be out of your mind. Why should Andrew want to kill Croner? Suppose, suppose he dreamed up this whole counterfeit deal himself. Now, he promises Croner a share of the profits if he takes the rap, while Colby takes the million and builds up the business. Croner gets out expecting a share of the gravy instead... The lights go out. If I use that kind of reasoning, I could think of at least 50 motives why you killed Cronin. The police have a hundred. Just what were you trying to do tonight? I want to see Bruno. I dreamed up that little man by the street lamp, hoping I could startle Colby into giving me Bruno's address, but fortunately he doesn't startle so easily. How can you be stupid enough to believe all this? Andrew's one of the finest men I've ever known. He's certainly been decent enough to you. Uh, he may have carried his friendship a little too far for my own good. So... You take out the little corn-fed secretary, prime her up with some fake sincerity, and she spills over with everything you want to know. Oh, I know it's not going to be easy to convince you that the things I said today were sincere. It's just about the most hopeless proposition you ever faced. No, look, I'm going to have to make another try for Bruno's address tomorrow. If you give me away, I'll be sunk. In more ways than one. Do what you want. Just don't ask me for any promises. Good night. Well, Charles, 
Where did she go? Straight to Regan's apartment. Yes, I was afraid she had. Why don't you forget about the girl and start thinking about Bruno? She's not easy to forget, Charles. I think a great deal of Noel. It isn't like her to do anything behind my back. Well, what are you going to do about Bruno? Nothing now. I rather suspect he'll telephone us tomorrow. That'll be plenty of time to decide, Charles. Plenty of time. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll return to Act Three of the Web in just a moment. One of Paramount's loveliest finds of the year is charming, red-haired Lynette Parks, who came from St. Paul to Hollywood by way of the Pasadena Playhouse. Do you find your new life exciting, Lynette? Oh, tremendously, Mr. Keeley. You know, my very first visit to a set was during the filming of Cecil B. DeMille's new picture, Unconquered. An exciting spectacle, indeed. The siege of Fort Pitt by the Indians with flaming arrows and authentic fireballs is really sensational. Modern Pittsburgh, on the site of old Fort Pitt will have a chance to relive its history when the picture has its world premiere there October 3rd. I learned so much from watching the actors, too. No doubt, with Gary Cooper and Paulette Goddard heading such a fine cast of more than 5,000 players. I was especially thrilled when Paulette invited me to her dressing room one day while she was having a costume fitted. And you know the costumes for Unconquered were absolutely authentic for the period. Well, what thrilled me most was the gorgeous negligee Paulette wore between fittings. You know, I used to be afraid washing would fade such pretty things. Before I learned from the studio wardrobe people that Lux Care keeps lingerie lovely so much longer. But John Kennedy knows that. The studios see the practical results of Lux Care in the net. I've seen scientific proof. In actual washing tests, slips and nighties washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. Those washed the wrong way soon looked faded and drab. That means girls who give their underthings Lux Care can have three times as many. Without spending any more. How do you figure that, Mr. Kennedy? Well, instead of constantly replacing faded drab under things, you can buy pretty new ones. Because those you luck stay lovely three times as long. So, without spending any more than you would for replacements, you have three times as many pretty things. Thank you for coming tonight, Nanette Parks. We return you to William Keeley. Act Three of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Colby. It's been several days since Robert Regan has seen Emilio Canipa, he of the demolished pushcart, but now, shortly after breakfast, the much-involved young lawyer has good reason to call on his client. There's nothing to it, Kanipa. Just phone Colby and tell him exactly what I've told you to say. But you, you sure this ain't illegal? Look, now look, haven't I always been your friend? Sure. Emilio, didn't I graduate from law school? Yeah, sure. Didn't I get you $68.72 for your push card? Not yet. Well, don't be so greedy. If it hadn't been for your push card, we wouldn't be doing this in the first place. Well, okay, I call up. Atta boy, that's better. Yes, this is Mr. Colby. This is Victor Bruno, Colby. Oh, yes, Bruno. I heard you were in town. I want you to police to hear I'm in town. All right, Bruno. How much this time? For $10,000, the police don't find out. $10,000? That's a lot of money. I got a lot I could say. Stop by my home tonight. No, no, no. no. I don't make the same mistake Crono made. You send the money to me. Where? You know the place. You uh, remember the address? Yes. You sure you remember? Yes, of course. Now listen, Bruno, I'll give you the money on one condition. Get out of the country, you and your wife. With the money, there'll be two tickets to Mexico City. See that you use them. Just be sure to have the cash there tonight. Nine o'clock. This is the last time, Bruno. Remember that. Well, Charles, what's the matter? You look worried. Uh, If we're going to start paying Bruno, he'll never let us stop. Don't be absurd, Charles. That wasn't Bruno on the phone. Well, then who was it? 
Not Regan? No, not Regan. Probably a friend of his. How do you know? Instinct, Charles. That's what makes me such an enormous success. But if Bruno was here last Victor night... Victor Bruno has been dead for five years. Dead? Then how did Regan know what he looked like? No. She's the only one who could have given him that description. You never told me Bruno was dead. How did he die? Protesting his innocence. Well, what was Regan after just now? Bruno's whereabouts. Andrew, did you have Bruno killed? <laughs> don't be so inquisitive, Charles. I just don't want you to get the idea that what happened to Bruno could happen to me. I'm no coroner and I'm no Bruno. I hope we'll have you here for some time, Charles. Uh, what about Regan? Go to the bank and get $10,000. And then? And then we'll have to do something I'm not going to like doing at all. What about the girl? She's involved in this as much as Regan? Yes, it looks that way. You don't like the idea of getting rid of her, do you? I don't like it at all. But if I have to, I'll do it. I'll arrange for Noel to be here at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Andrew, I had dinner downtown. I found your message when I got home. No, there's something I wish you'd do for me this evening. In the safe there is a large manila envelope with $10,000. Will you get it for me, please? Of course. And then I'd like you to go to the Pennsylvania station and get two tickets for Mexico City. When you've bought the tickets, phone me. I'll tell you then where to deliver the money. Oh, never mind. You can leave the safe open, though. Is this the envelope? Yes. It's for Victor Bruno. You know, it's strange, Noel. Right now, I'm on the verge of getting everything I ever wanted to have. And yet I find there's only one person I can really trust. Andrew, please. I wonder if you know how much I appreciate it. Andrew, that that telephone call from Bruno... It... What about it, Noel? Oh, nothing. It's not important. I'll see you later. What did he want, Noel? He's paying Bruno off. $10,000 and two tickets to Mexico. Well, you were right, weren't you? Well, I'll know for sure after I've seen Bruno. You'll see him. Right after I bought the tickets. Come on. Well, she's on her way, Charles. She's probably met Regan by now. Why do you suppose she did it, Charles? Did she fall in love with what him? What difference does it make? For a moment, I thought she was going to tell me. If she had, I would have forgiven her. Well, I, I'd better call the police. Andrew, wait. I'm not so sure this is such a good idea. But why? Well, granted, we can have them picked up for stealing the $10,000 that they find her fingerprints on the safe. That doesn't really get them out of the way. But then, what if they're arrested not merely for theft? What if they're arrested for murder? What? What are you talking about? Whose murder? Your murder, Charles. Hello? Yes, this is Lieutenant D'Amico. Mr. Colby. What's that? Where? You sure? Penn Station, huh? Okay, just sit tight, Mr. Colby. Captain the Manhattan Limited, leaving on track eight for Philadelphia, Harrisburg. I'd like to make connections for Mexico City, too, please. Leaving tonight, if possible. Mexico City? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, just a moment, please. Excuse me, miss. You know Faraday? Why, yes, but... Come with me, please. You're under arrest. Arrest? And don't worry about your boyfriend. He's right where you left him. Except there's a cop hanging on a weak arm. Where are you taking me? To Lieutenant D'Amico, miss. He's waiting for us at Mr. Colby's house. Uh We got him all right, Lieutenant. Regan and the girl. Keep him in the hall. Okay, Doc. Take the body in the library. On the stretcher. Murdoch. Just stay put, Regan. But, but what happened? Why are they holding us? Mm, because I'm the biggest lunkhead of the year. It never occurred to me Colby would take it out on you. Andrew? 
Murdoch's dead. He's gotten rid of the last guy that knew anything about the phony bond deal, and he stuck us with a rap. But he couldn't possibly hope to get away with this. Why would we want to kill Charles? Don't worry. With Colby tailoring the evidence, it'll fit like a bathing suit. Well, a lot of good it does to say it, but I'm sorry, Noel. Bring him in, Johnson. Let's go. Well, laughing boy. I thought I told you not to leave town. Give out, D'Amico. What are the details? Murder and grand theft, and you haven't got a prayer. How does she figure in it? Oh, come on now, Regan. You got the money, Johnson? Here. Yeah. And she was buying two tickets to Mexico City. Okay. Do you mind stepping in here, Mr. Colby? I hope you'll get this over with as quickly as possible. Andrew. Uh, you don't have to talk to her, Mr. Colby. Just identify this envelope. Yes, that's it. I assume the $10,000 is the same. Lieutenant, you understand this is very difficult for me. Miss Faraday has been my confidential secretary for years. Uh, just tell me what happened. Well, I was up in my study doing some work. I heard a shot. I came downstairs and I found Charles dead on the floor with Regan's gun beside him and the safe was open. My gun? That was his gun. I gave it back to him after... You did? Him. Funny it should have only your fingerprints on it. All right, all right. Maybe mine are on it. When I gave it back to him, I set it on the table. Now, if he had this in mind, he wouldn't have touched it. Not without a glove. Regan, if you were me, would you believe that? If you knew Colby, you would. Who saw you give him back his gun? Miss Faraday, she... Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Colby. Well, I realized Miss Faraday was the only person besides Charles and myself who knew the combination to the safe. Andrew, you had me open the safe yourself. A couple of nights ago, I happened to overhear a conversation between Mr. Regan and Miss Faraday in which Mexico City was mentioned. And she was buying two tickets to Mexico City when we grabbed her. You already told me that. What are you looking for, a promotion? Lieutenant, he knows why I had the money and he sent me for the ticket. Uh, you'll get your chance to talk, miss. This is very awkward for me to Well, we're almost finished, Mr. Colby. Why do you believe him, D'Amico? Only yes. That was yesterday. I'm not interested in the Krona case anymore. I got one right here that suits me fine. But this is a frame. You get framed more than any guy I ever met. You're supposed to be a lawyer. Look at the evidence. Lieutenant. Uh, yeah, yeah, Doc. He's still alive. Murdoch's still alive. Charles. Stay right where you are, Mr. Colby. What are you talking about, Doc? That injection of adrenaline. We won't have him forever, but he may last through the night. Any chance of him coming too? Could be. Let me know the minute he does. Is it all right if we leave him in there, Mr. Colby? Uh, uh, couldn't we move him upstairs? No, no, don't, don't let him near Murdoch. Are He'll... you still running this case? I'm telling you, don't let Colby near Murdoch. You're under arrest, Regan. Now, will you stop telling me my business? Lieutenant Charles has been my closest friend for years. Naturally, I want to go to him. Well, later on, maybe. Right now, I'm waiting here in case he can talk. Maybe we all better wait here. Uh, Mr. Colby, uh, suppose you wait upstairs. Huh? Uh, Gus? Yeah, Lieutenant? Uh, pull up a chair in front of that room where Murdoch is. No visitors. Uh, Johnson, you wait in the front room. And, uh, you, Regan, you and her can have this nice big library all to yourselves. And you better start reading up on alibi. Bob, why don't we tell him about Bruno? Mm, how do you think that would sound from the witness stand? I was trying to find a man named Victor Bruno because I was convinced that the other killing I'd done was murder. No... <laughs> Colby figured on that one. If only somebody could find Bruno. Bruno's probably dead, too. Otherwise, how could Colby have been so sure it wasn't Bruno on the phone? <laughs> I suppose so. <sighs> how could I have been such a dope? You? I've been second-guessing the whole way. You couldn't have put your life in worse hands. Listen. Huh? Andrew. His study's just above us. He's worried. He's walking back and forth. He's worried. Charles, Lieutenant. Well, he's still alive. Still alive. He's still alive. I thought I... You left the cot in front of the door. Where'd he go? That doc needs some more adrenaline. He sent Johnson to the drugstore. Oh. Murdoch's not alone in there. The doctor's with him, isn't he? First you shoot him, and then you worry about his health. The doctor's in the kitchen boiling up a hypodermic. Come on, Regan. That's where we're going. You stay where you are, miss. He's alone. Charles is down there alone. Alone. Uh, they'll never.
never know now, Charles, will they? They'll never yeah, know that... bother killing them again, Colby. D'Amico! Murdoch's been dead for two hours, ever since you shot him. Now, how... Watch it, Regan! Turn on the light, Counselor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, don't just stand there. You knock Colby down, I'll pick him up. Get him out in the hall. Uh, you can come out, Miss Faraday. This you'll want to hear. Bob, what happened? I'm not so sure I know myself. Well, Mr. Colby, tough break, huh? I really solved this one from left field. I've had Regan tail for the last two days. I knew he wasn't here tonight. It's quite a comfort to us taxpayers to find our police department in such competent hands. Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, uh, just to keep the record straight, whatever happened to Kroner's million dollars? That's strange. That's what Kroner wanted to know. Yeah, very funny. Come on, Johnson. We're taking Colby downtown. Oh, that D'Amico. He's really the answer to a maiden's prayer. Yeah, he's a smart cookie, but he doesn't catch everything. What's that? Something D'Amico forgot to take. Two tickets to Mexico City. Think we can use them? Hmm? <laughs> I've, um, always wanted to try out my Spanish. Hey, don't forget you two. You'll have to check with my department if you're figuring on living the country. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, D'Amico. That Colby still owes my client $68.72. Well, you're a lawyer. Sue him. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Libby, do you realize what a big job American housewives do just getting together meals for their families? That's true, Mr. Kennedy. The average housewife plans, buys, carries home, cooks and serves well over 1,000 meals a year. And in most cases, she washes the dishes for all those meals, too. An average of six tons a year. And yet her husband and children expect her to keep her hands lovely. Well, smart housewives have found out how to do that, in spite of dishwashing, Libby. Of course, with Lux Flakes. For dishes, for any soap and water job around the house. Right. That's why a Lux lady doesn't have red, rough dishpan hands. Well, naturally. Some women try other types of soaps at one time or another, but they soon get wise. What strong suds can do to hands is a caution. And red, rough hands are no prize at a bridge game. Discouraging to friend husband, too. So, John, it's no wonder thousands of housewives stick to Lux for dishes. They're so right, because hundreds of scientific tests have actually proved how much kinder Lux is to hands. When strong soaps made women's hands rough and red, changing to Lux improved them in two to seven days. Soon the skin was just as soft and smooth as ever. And Lux is so thrifty, too. Lux flakes make such rich suds, they actually go further, much further. They don't die away like some suds. So, ladies, why not try Lux for your dishes? Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. For an exciting performance of a thrilling drama, our thanks to Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price, who take the spotlight for a curtain call. Ella, now that you and Edmund have solved the mystery of the moment, I wonder if, uh, in an altogether different vein, you'd help our audience solve the burning question of the season. I'll do my best. What is it, Bill? As one of Hollywood's most photographed and best-dressed stars, where do you stand in the current fashion battle between long and short skirts? Well, I, I see that Ella takes a stand in short skirts for tonight's appearance. Well, that's because I happen to be wearing a suit. Now, does that follow? Look at my suit. <laughs> Still just below the ankle. <laughs> but for women's suits, I feel the shorter length is smarter. For dresses, I prefer the current longer length. How do you feel about the question, Ed? Oh, I feel that women shouldn't be a slave to fashion, but ought to follow what looks attractive. You agree, Vince? Sure, I follow anything that looks attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, when it comes to shorter skirts, I believe the eyes have it. <laughs> you mean the masculine eyes, of course. <laughs> How about you, Vince? Are you a member of that um, 
little below the knee club? Well, it depends how little is below the knee. Uh-huh. <laughs> De gustibus non disputandum. Did I say something I shouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> no, Vince. Ella means there's no disputing taste. But there's no question of divided taste in what we're offering on this stage next Monday night. I understand it's something very special, Bill. Yes, one of the screen's most brilliant feminine stars, whose rare appearances in radio are always an event. Plus, one of Hollywood's outstanding male stars in his first screen role since he left the Navy Air Corps. Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. I guess you need say no more, Bill. <laughs> no, indeed. Catherine and Bob appear in Metro Golden Mayor's thrilling drama, Undercurrent, repeating their original screen roles of a man and woman whose love is overshadowed by a haunting figure from the past. Well, it ought to be standing room only Monday night. Congratulations and good night. Good, good night. night to all of you and thanks. <laughs> Viva Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes. Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor in Undercurrent. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Again, a word of appreciation to the Housewives of America for the swell job you're doing, saving and turning in used fats and oils. The world shortage of fats is still very much with us, and industry needs every drop of used fat just as much as ever. So now that the weather is cooler and you're doing more cooking, keep a tin handy for used fat. Remember, your dealer will pay you well for every pound you turn in. Ella Raines will next be seen in Nunnally Johnson's The Senator Was Indiscreet. Edmund O'Brien will soon be seen in the Canaan production... A Double Life. Vincent Price's next Universal International picture will be Up in Central Park. Heard in our cast tonight were Maria Palmer as Martha, Bill Johnstone as D'Amico, Robert Griffin as Murdoch, and Norman Field, Jay Novello, Edwin Cooper, Cliff Clark, and Eddie Marr. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Undercurrent with Katherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. It's spry for pastry so tender, flaky, nut sweet, any pie filling tastes more delicious. You'll say pastry is extra delicate, better tasting with spry. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Undercurrent with Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, Autolite presents Suspense with Claude Rains and Vincent Price. More coffee, Arno? Oh, I believe not, Hap. And I want to thank you and Mary for a marvelous meal. A delightful, delicious, delovely dinner. <laughs> You're more than welcome, Arno. I... Uh-oh, here comes Mary with that who's going to wash the dishes look in her eye. <laughs> hey, you better start talking about Autolite resistor spark plugs and fans. Ah, yes, of course, Hap. Autolite resistor spark plugs. Uh, as I was saying... Right now, by Cornelius, is the time when all good men who know good things will come to the aid of their cars with a set of brand new wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs. Why, with their wide spark gap, those auto light resistor spark plugs do things for a car your old narrow gap spark plugs just can't match. Why, they're marvelous. They're magnificent. By Cornelius, they're matchless. You're sparking, Harlow. But uh, let's switch to suspense.
Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Claude Rains and Mr. Vincent Price in Anton Leder's production of The Hands of Mr. Ottermore. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tell me, Sergeant. Yes? Uh, why do you think the Strangler killed the five times he did? Six times, Mr. Newspaper Man. Six? Yes. <laughs> well, I suppose you do know as much about the Strangler as I do. Uh, how long have you been on the police force, Sergeant? This is my 15th year as a member of His Majesty's Metropolitan Police, Mr. Newspaper Man. Uh. For ten years, I walked the beats of the Casper Street Station, and for the past five years, I've been a sergeant at that station. In 15 years, you learn a lot about many things, including murder. Oh, yes, murder. It's a word and a deed which has fascinated more people than you and I could count. <laughs> By all means, Sergeant, let's talk about murder. You'd think there'd be a little murder in such a district, wouldn't you, Mr. Newspaper Man? Murder for a bit of Henning, a cup of tea... There'd be nothing there to take except lives. And it was there that the Strangler came to practice his grim trade. Already it struck twice. Once on Lagos Street, once on Breen Street. His strong, white hands reaching for an unexpecting throat. Then he'd vanished into the darkness, leaving behind something that once had been a living, breathing human. What was his gain? Perhaps no more than the satisfaction of a job well done. Perhaps he felt he'd done some poor devil a favor. That a sympathetic force led him to his victims the same as a cyclone picks one corner and misses another. I was thinking about that the night I first met you, Mr. Newspaper Man. I was walking down Mallon End when I saw you, standing in the shadows. Oh, good evening, officer. Uh, stand where you are. Who are you? Oh, from the Daily Herald, officer. Oh, newspaper man, eh? Yes. What are you doing here? Oh, looking for a story. Are you expecting to catch the Strangler, officer? What would you know about the Strangler, Mr. Newspaper Man? <laughs> Only that he likes your district and that you have no idea who he is. That's right. He could be anybody who's about in this district at night. Perhaps even a newspaper man. Oh, you suspect that I might be making my news before I write? <laughs> and I shall keep that in mind for dull days. Good night, sir. All right. I watched you, Mr. Newspaper Man, as you walked away. Watched and thought of the force that moved the Strangler. About the same time, that force, whatever it was, brought the Strangler to Mr. Wybrow, an honest worker whom I've seen so many times, I can tell you nearly exactly how he spent his last few minutes on Earth. I know the very sound of his footsteps, almost his every thought. And I can hear the footsteps of the man who followed him. It was six o'clock of an evening and Mr. Wybrow was going home from work. He stepped off the tram at High Street and Mallon End and walked slowly, wondering if his missus would have herring or haddock for his tea. It was a wretched night and he could taste the fog in his throat, feel the dampness through the soles of his shoes. He turned down Lagos Street and the footsteps behind turned with him. And so, one behind the other, the two men walked through Lagos and turned into Loyal Lane. Any man other than Mr. Wybrow might have heard some warning in the footsteps that followed him, something that said, Beware. 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 No. The foot of a killer falls just as quietly as the foot of any other worker. But those footfalls were bearing a pair of hands to Mr. Wybrow. And there is something in hands. Behind him, even then, those hands were flexing themselves, feeling the strength run down through the strong fingers. Mr. Wybrow was almost home. He turned down Casper Street, plodding along through the dim light. Small dog barked at the figures. 
voices drifted out from the shabby houses, but Mr. Wybrow paid no attention to them or to the steps which followed him. Ahead of Mr. Wybrow was his own house, and he walked a little faster. Maybe it looked like he was going to get away, but the man behind only smiled and followed at the same pace. Mr. Wybrow turned in at his own gate and opened the door. He stepped inside. Is that you, Eric? Yes. What's for tea, Flossie? Eric, you're lucky to be getting back. Who's that? How do I know before I've opened the door? If it's a collector, he can just nip off. Well, what... And that is how Mr. and Mrs. Wybrow became the third and fourth, but not the last, victims of the strangling horror. Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Claude Rains and Mr. Vincent Price in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Hap, let me tell you about a foolish fellow who got the outside of his car all dolled up with doodads, trinkets, foxtails, and whatnots. All right. And then, by Cornelius, he comes chug-a-lugging up the avenue with misfiring spark plugs and his engine sounding like a stut-stut-stuttering teapot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, friend, I yelled at him, why don't you switch to a set of those smooth-firing Autolite resistor spark plugs and make that bus of yours sound as fancy as it looks. And what did he answer? This guy said to me, plugs is plugs. Well, auto light resistor spark plugs, I corrected him, are different. They've got a 10,000 ohm resistor, ignition engineered right into the spark plug that permits the auto light resistor spark plug to maintain a much wider spark gap setting. This extra wide gap, friend, lets your car idle smoother, gives you better luck with lean gas mixtures, actually saves gas. What's more, auto light resistor spark plugs cut down spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Pipe that. Badge, telling him. Wow, he says. Can you back up all that sales talk? Ah, listen, pal, I told him. These are just a few fine and fancy facts. And what's more, those wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs are one of over 400 automotive, aviation, and marine products world famous for their auto light engineered dependability. Then what, Harlow? I'll tell you the rest after suspense, half. Huh? And now, auto light brings back to a Hollywood soundstage. Mr. Claude Rains and Mr. Vincent Price in The Hands of Mr. Ottermore. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Sergeant, did you ever stop to wonder at the pranks of fate? Mr. Wybrow died at the one moment when there was no one around to witness his death. That's true. A few minutes earlier, perhaps a few minutes later, there were people on the street. Think how different it might have been if, uh, if you had arrived there earlier than you did. Perhaps, Mr. Newspaper Man, but I'd finished my evening tea and was walking through Casper Street to the station. Mr. Wybrow was still lying on the door of his house, his wife on the floor a little beyond him. Both were dead. I blew my whistle, and the constable came on the run. We searched the house, then talked to the neighbors on either side. Nobody had heard anything except Mrs. Wybrow's scream, and they thought that just a family fight. There's no sign of anything but brutal murder. While we waited for the ambulance, I suddenly remembered something. Smithers? Yes, sir? Just before I found them, I saw you standing at the end of the lane. What were you up to there? I thought I saw a suspicious character mucking about there, sir, and I was keeping an eye on him. Suspicious character, but blasted. You don't want to look for suspicious characters. You want to look for murderers. Yes, sir. Think we'll get him, sir? Well, just between you and me, Smithers, I have my doubts. With a man who kills to get a few bob, you know he's going to keep on because as soon as he's broke, he'll slosh another one. But a man like this, you don't know when he'll strike again. Or if he'll strike again. Back at the station, the newspaper men were waiting for the story, having scented it the way dogs will smell out the fresh track of a fox. 
There was one newspaper man, a tall, with shoulders and arms that looked more like a coal heaver than a journalist, who kept asking about clues as though he wanted to solve the case himself. That was you, Mr. Newspaper Man. Or maybe you just wanted to find out how much we knew. After the newspaper men left, I was in my office, uh, finishing up my report, when there was a knock on the door. Who's there? Oh, do you mind if I come in, Sergeant? Oh, it's you. Yes, I, I thought of a few more questions I'd like to ask you. Oh, it seems to me you are around all the time. So? Yes. And now you want to ask more questions. I'm afraid we can't give out any more information than you already have. Yeah, half a minute, Sergeant. All the papers are going to do a regular story on the strangling monster. I thought I'd like to do something different, uh, more of a mood piece. Now, you look like an intelligent man, Sergeant. Well, I, I thought you might help. Well, maybe I can, maybe I can't. What do you want to know? What sort of a man do you think the killer is? You really think he's a monster who can slip through the night without being seen? No, no, I think he's probably a very ordinary man. Everyone, even our own constables, is looking for the monster instead of the man standing next to them. No, this man can move about and no one sees him because he's an ordinary man and it's ordinary for him to be around. He, he might be a boot black, the man who makes deliveries, or even a policeman. <laughs> or a journalist. Why do you say that? I don't think I meant anything personal, Mr. Newspaper Man. I meant that he is merely someone you look at and... Never think that maybe he might strangle someone. Your theory is very interesting, Sergeant. And do you also think that you'll uh, catch him? Well, if he's caught, short of actually catching him in the act, it'll be because of only one thing. Oh, and that is? Curiosity. Curiosity? Yes. He'll be nabbed if his curiosity is too great. If he wonders how near others are to him. If he has to ask questions. And then returns to ask still more questions. Later that evening, I went out into the district, visiting beat after beat. The presence of the killer, the stranding horror, was in the air. The entire district was given over not to panic, for London never yields to that, but to fear of the unknown. And while the community still gasped over the deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Wybrow, while fear was moving into every tenement, the killer made his next move. Conscious of the horror caused by his hands and as hungry for more as any giddy girl at her first performance in the music hall, his hands reached out again. Well, I was cutting through Clemming Street when I saw you again, Mr. Newspaper Man. You slipped along the street, peering into alleys. Even then I had a hunch to stop you, and I felt I had no real reason to suspect you, so... I walked on. Peterson and Joyner were patrolling Joynigan Road. It was just uh, 9.32 when I met Joyner near the middle of the street. I spoke to him and went on. At 9.33, I met Peterson coming back from the other end of the street. I answered his greeting and passed, intending to go to the end of the beat and cut over to Logan Passage. Then, during the few seconds that everyone's back was turned towards the spot where he stood, the killer struck again. <coughs> Joiner, here. What the... Oh, heavens. It's Peterson. Yeah, it's Peterson. Dead like the rest of them. Strangled right under our noses. Where were you, Joiner? I just reached the end of my beat, Sergeant. Was already turning when I heard your whistle. And I just passed him on my way to Logan. Then we were covering both ends of the street. He must have come from Minnow Street or Clemming Street and gone back the same way before we could see him. It is dimly lit around here, sir. Yeah, say, what's up, Constable? I heard... Sam, where you are? Oh. It's you, Mr... Newspaper man? Yes. So he struck again. What happened, Sergeant? I've been checking the beats. Huh. I came up here, passing Joyner and then Peterson here. I was at this end of the street, Joyner with that, with Peterson in between us going towards Joyner. He cried out once, and then was like this. We saw no one. 
Where were you when you heard my whistle? On Clemming Street, uh, perhaps half a square down, and no one passed that way. That means that he must have come from Minnow. Shall I ring in, sir? Yeah, go ahead, Joiner. Half a square down Clemming Street, were you? That's right. That's where you were more than five minutes ago when I passed and you were coming this way. Well, I, I thought I saw something in one of the alleys and stopped to look closer. <laughs> Oh, now, come, Sergeant, let's not start suspecting each other. The mutual suspicion of this district is catching. Yeah, I suppose it is. Yes, of course. Still, there's a murderer who must be caught, Mr. Newspaper Man. The following day, I was back on duty early. You know, the sight of a uniformed sergeant somehow gave the people a bit more confidence than that of the constables. You know, Bobby are well, Bobbies are well enough in their way, but, you know, your average Londoner likes to see more important officials around when things are a bit rough. The talk in the pubs and on the streets was all cut from the same cloth. And the pattern was fear. I say the strangler's some posh who's off his beam. Thinks as though he ain't squeezed dry enough. So he nips over, squeezes a little more, and pops back to the West End. Oh, you're balmy. Eat a leg. Didn't he get a peeler last night, and don't that prove it? He's a bleeding Jack the Ripper. That's what he is. And he'll bloody well kill a lot of us without a single bloody flick to stop him. He got a bobby, didn't he? And with bobbies crawling all over the place, and that one to lay a hand on him. And who's to stop him? That's what I want to know. I walk the streets, dropping a bit of cheer. Here and there, four or five times, I saw you again, Mr. Newspaper Man. Your dark face twisted with emotion as you listened to the talk. This, too, was queer, for you were the only newspaper man I saw in the whole district. By nine o'clock, I was in Richards Lane, a narrow street, partly a stall market and partly cheap homes. On one side was the shattered wall of the railway yard. The wall of the railway yard put a shadow over the street so that even a garbage can looked like a man crouching. Farther down the street, the outline of the empty market stalls looked like a bunch of ghosts waiting for the man who would send them more ghosts. There was no one on the street, no one to witness that which was about to be. Then, suddenly, in the time between one footfall and another, the wall of silence was broken. Help! He's here! And then the lane came to life. It seemed like they were all released by that scream. All along the street, doors opened and people poured into the street, muttering as the stored-up anger began to overcome their fear. They milled around, uncertain which way to turn. Then, then the whistle pointed the direction to them. Gathering like dark clouds, they moved down on the cottage where I stood with the constables. The sight of so many of us made them feel that he would now be caught. And that anger came up in answer to it. Well, go in and get him. What you waiting for? He's through killing now. Go on and get him, you bloody feelers. He ought to be strung up. That's what I... Break I'm... it up. Break it up. Move back, all of you. Join her. Get around to the back and meet the constables there. Martin, Addison, take the house on the left. Jones, Edmonds, take the house on the right. Betts, you come with me. Save a piece of it for me, Sergeant. Inside the cottage, a whole family lay dead, fallen around the supper table. One look at their necks showed us the strangler's trademark again, but there was nothing in that cottage except death. One by one, the constables came back to report. Nothing. Once more, he had killed and slipped away again. I looked out at the crowd, now beginning to move back as they realized we were empty-handed. Suddenly I saw in the front ranks your face again, the newspaper man who seemed to be everywhere I turned. There was a light in your face, a light that was almost happiness. And looking at you in that brief second, 
I was aware that there were two of us who now knew the identity of the murderer. But the crowd shifted back, began to lose themselves in the shadows, and you were gone before I could move. The strangler had struck again and again. We were empty-handed as we waited for the ambulance. You may have been empty-handed, Sergeant, but I'm sure there were enough thoughts in your head to make up for the lack of something to put your hands on. Dark thoughts, perhaps. Yes, I did think, Mr. Newspaper Man. I tried to imagine what you were doing during the next hour. I thought, perhaps, that you went to the nearest pub and sat alone at the bar, attended by a frightened barmaid. I think you dismissed the strangling horror from your mind and thought only of the glass of stout and the sandwich, for even such men as you must rebuild their strength. I think you looked at the sandwich, noticing that it was skimpy as bar sandwiches usually are. And you may have thought idly of the inventor of the sandwich, the Earl of Sandwich, then of George the Fourth, then of all the Georges, as any good Englishman might, and so to that George who wondered how the apple got into the apple dumpling. It was while thinking of that and how the ham got into the ham sandwich that your mind came back to the people who had been murdered. Maybe it was then that you thought of the simplest fact of all that the murderer could escape by either running away or by standing still. It was then, I think, that you got up from the bar without finishing your sandwich. It was perhaps 20 minutes later that you walked down the street and met the man you were looking for. Well, seen anything of the murderer, Sergeant? Oh, it's you again. Yes. No, nor is anybody else. And I doubt if they ever will. Oh, I don't know. He's already struck five times. I've been thinking about it, and I've got an idea. So? Yes, yes. Came to me all of a sudden. And I felt that we'd all been blind. It's been staring us in the face. Oh? Has it now? Huh. Well, if you're so sure, why not give us the benefit of it? I'm going to. Yes, yes, it seems quite simple now. But there's still one more point I don't quite understand. I mean the motive. Now, as man to man, tell me, Sergeant Otto Mole, just why did you kill those inoffensive people? Well, to tell the truth, Mr. Newspaper Man, I don't know. But I've got an idea, just like you. Everybody knows we can't control the workings of our mind. Ideas come into our heads without being asked. But everybody's supposed to be able to control his body. Why? We get our minds from heaven knows where, from people who were dead years before we were born, some say. Maybe we get our bodies the same way. Our faces, our legs, our hands. They aren't completely ours. And couldn't ideas come into our bodies like ideas come into our minds? Couldn't ideas live in muscles as well as in a brain? Couldn't it be that parts of our bodies aren't really us? And couldn't ideas come into them all of a sudden like ideas come into my hand? <laughs> you see, Mr. Newspaper Man? It was six. One other thing the newspaper man did while he was in that pub... He'd called his newspaper and told them his idea and said he was coming to meet me. And so, they're hanging me, killing me for something which my hands did. I had nothing to do with it. You can see that. But what hurts me the most is what the judge said when he sentenced me. 
It's not true. It's not true, I tell you. That if I lived, someday these hands, my hands, they say, might reach out for you. <laughs> Thank you, Claude Rains and Vincent Price, for a splendid performance. Mr. Rains and Mr. Price will return in just a moment. Uh, Haro, uh, you were telling me... Oh, uh... yes, yes. Well, Hap, the next time I saw this fancy fellow, his gadget-laden car was humming and purring up the street as smooth as the slippery glide of a slide trombone. <laughs> I got my auto light resistor spark plugs, he yelled to me as he whirled by, and they're terrific. Well, by Cornelius, this fellow had the right dope. Because, friends, when you replace your old narrow-gap spark plugs with the wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can really tell the difference in your car. So if you don't already have a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs, drive down tomorrow to your nearest Autolite dealer and treat your car right. Switch to Autolite. And, friends, remember to... Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition-engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Mr. Claude Rains. The hands of Mr. Ottomole has always been one of my favorite mystery stories, and so it was a great pleasure to be able to play it on suspense, one of my favorite radio programs. What about you, Vincent? Well, I agree with you on both counts, Claude. And in addition, I found it refreshing to uh, play the murder victim for a change instead of the murderer. <laughs> uh, by the way, Claude, what will we be hearing on suspense next week? A treat you won't want to miss. One of Hollywood's most glamorous stars, Miss Rosalind Russell, in a top story, The Sisters. Another gripping study in... Suspense. Claude Rains will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, The Sin of Abby Hunt. Vincent Price can currently be seen with Lana Turner, Gene Kelly, and June Allison in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Technicolor production, The Three Musketeers. Tonight's suspense play was the famous story by Thomas Burke, adapted for radio by Ken Crossan, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as James Cagney, Ronald Coleman, William Bendix, and others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Rosalind Russell in The Sisters. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Turn in your scrap steel to your local scrap dealer. The more scrap the more steel. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines presents... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Vincent Price and Mr. Lloyd Nolan as stars of Hunting Trip. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Lloyd Noland and Vincent Price in a remarkable tale of... Suspense. 
It began with just a little hunting trip for the two of us, Eric and me. I hadn't seen Eric for several months, not be- since before Karen died, in fact. When I bumped into him at the club, he suggested that we run up to his cabin in the mountains for a few days. Grab a bit of fresh air and relaxation, see if we couldn't bag ourselves a moose or a deer. And yet, almost at the outset, I had an uncanny feeling about that trip. I suppose actually it was the night and the setting. It was the blackest night I'd ever seen. We'd left all humankind behind us. There was no moon. There was only blackness, the kind that seemed to be all enveloping, as though there was nothing outside our car but blackness. No road, no forest, no mountains. Well, I'd admit I was nervous. I was boring my feet into the floorboard of the car as though somehow that would help. (laughs) What are you laughing at? You, Stan. You don't look as though you're having a very good time. Well, I'm not. I, frankly... Shouldn't you be driving a little bit slower? Why? Why? Good heavens, Eric, if you make just one little slip at the wheel, we're, we're done for, that's all. I doubt if they'd ever even find us down in those canyons. <laughs> Nonsense. I know every crook and turn in this road. Oh, yeah? I don't think you're much of an outdoors man. Well, Stan. maybe not. I love this kind of country in the daytime, but I'll confess I'm not so keen on it at night. I don't like what I can't see. <laughs> Funny, I'm just the opposite. There's, well, there's a challenge in the darkness that stimulates my senses. Mm-hmm. It's exhilarating. It stirs my imagination. Well, sure, I suppose it would. But I'm not equipped to grapple with the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> Stan, you're much too modest. You always were. You've gotten out of life pretty much what you wanted, haven't you? Well, yes, I suppose so. Now, then don't always be belittling yourself. It's an effective technique, Stan, but I'm on to you. You're as clever as the next fellow, in your own way. <laughs> and tried to relax. Things weren't quite as Eric had pictured them. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, as they say. Eric had come up the hard way. I was average and soft. He was brilliant and hard. We'd known each other a long time, going to school together, being in love with the same girl, Karen. When I married her, he was my best man, and yet I didn't pretend to understand him. He was still pretty much of a stranger to me. I glanced over his way. He actually seemed to be enjoying himself. It crossed my mind that he was rather enjoying seeing me in a bit of a lather, too. Well, it's not far now, just around the next bend. Well, thank the Lord. (laughs) Well, am I amusing you again? (laughs) No. I was just thinking what a perfect spot this would be for a murder. A murder? Honestly, Eric, I believe that's all you think about. It is, almost. When I buy a newspaper, I read about murder the way you study the stock quotations. Murder is fascinating to me. I spend most of my time figuring out ways and means to commit murder. Now you're trying to sound like a mental case. Who knows? Perhaps I am. I have a mind. Well, here we are, old man. You see, I've delivered you safe and sound, all in one piece. Eric's cabin was perched high on a rocky crag jutting out from the side of a mountain with one wall flush against a sheer drop. In front, there was a steep path leading down to a lake. I could hear the lapping of the waves. Eric fixed us something to eat, then went outside. And pretty soon, he came back in. Arm full of logs. His face was red and healthy. I don't think you like my place, Stan. Huh? Oh, yes, I do, honestly. I'm just tired, I guess. Well, we'll turn in directly. Oh, thanks. Cigarette? Yes, thanks. I believe I will. I like it here. All the privacy in the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Say, Eric. Yes? Why do you read about murder? Why do you read about stocks and bonds? Well, because they interest me. It's my business. My business doesn't interest me. I read about murder because I'm interested in people. Murder is emotional. And when people are being emotional, you get to see more of them. Why are you so interested in people? Oh, I think I'm more curious than interested. Well, all right. Why so curious? Well, it amuses me. I find out about people. I write down what I find out, and I write my impressions of how those people will react to a series of circumstances. It's a good way to get rid of one's inhibitions. 
sort of a frightening hobby. I think uh, stamp collecting is frightening. <laughs> You're too darn clever, Eric. Why too clever? Well, I mean you see through people. Well, what's wrong with that? Unless, of course, they uh, have something they want to hide. Oh, I suppose it's all right, if your friends don't mind. Do you? Mine? No, heavens no. Why should I? That's right. Why should you? Well, how about hitting the hay? We have to be up early. We'll only get a few hours sleep as it is. Well, suits me. You sleep in my study, Stan. Uh, the bed's in there is a bit more comfortable. I'll bunk out here on the couch. I had undressed and gotten into bed and was reaching over to put out the light on Eric's desk when my eyes fell on a stack of typewritten sheets. I wondered if they were the notes Eric had been speaking about. The strange mumbo-jumbo he'd written there, phrases he liked, single sentences describing people he'd met. There were a few clippings pasted on sheets of white paper, clippings describing murders, by strangulation, by pistol, by drowning, by poison. A full sheet was devoted to Karen. I hadn't realized how much he'd cared for. His analysis was very kind, almost maudlin. He spoke of his shock at hearing of a suicide. He tried to reason it, to find causes. A small memo pad caught my eye, however. And on the last page, I saw my name carefully printed. I read it eagerly. I read Eric's arguments for not hating me because I had married Karen. I read Eric's cold analysis of my character. <laughs> not exactly flattering, but it was pretty accurate. And at the bottom of the page, newly written by the looks of it, and in Eric's own careful hand, I read four ways to commit murder. By strangulation, by pistol bullet, by drowning, by poison. <laughs> For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Vincent Price and Lloyd Nolan in Hunting Trip by Paul Bernard and Lee Horton. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Ken Niles for Grand Estate Wines. Last night, a friend who entertains frequently told me how much he likes Grand Estate wines. Those wines of outstanding excellence presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner. Here's what he said. Recently, Ken, I served Grand Estate wine to some very particular guests, people who really know wine. Their sincere praise for that wonderful fragrance and taste was certainly flattering to me as a host. Grand Estate wines are outstanding. Yes, to bring you this limited bottling of Grand Estate wines, Roma selected only the choicest juice-laden grapes from California's finest vineyards. Then at Roma's famed wineries, unmatched in winemaking resources, Grand Estate wines are patiently, skillfully guided to perfection. Necessary time and the age-old skill of Roma master vintners endow each Grand Estate wine with brilliant clarity full fragrance, and mellow taste. So, whatever the occasion, you're sure to please all tastes with Grand Estate California wines. Medium sherry, ruby port, and golden muscatel for delightful entertaining. Grand Estate burgundy and sauterne for gracious dining. Remember the name. Grand Estate wines by Roma, the crowning achievement of vintner skill. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Lloyd Nolan as Stan and Vincent Price as Eric in Hunting Trip, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I suppose I slept that night, but it seemed as though I had only just dozed off when I heard the door open quietly. I opened one eye cautiously. It was still gray in the room, so I know I hadn't slept long. I was about to bo open both eyes to save Eric the trouble of waking me when I thought... He hasn't come to wake me. My mind threw two words at me. By strangulation. If 
before I had the chance to move, I felt his hands carefully on my throat. <laughs> Don't! Why, why, Stan, what's the matter? I thought for a minute that... Yes? You, I guess I must have been dreaming. Nightmare. <laughs> you grabbed hold of my hands like you thought I was going to strangle you. Oh, did I? <laughs> what's the matter? Have you got a guilty conscience? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have. I... What did you want, Eric? Time to get up. Oh, already? Yeah, that's right. I've got good news, too. I just spotted a likely-looking buck right across the lake when I went down for water. Oh, good, good. Well, I'll get breakfast going as soon as you're ready. Yeah, I'll be right with you. Now, there's no rush. Take your time. Nice to have you here. Well, maybe it was the way that he'd said that as though he'd really meant it. For a minute, I was convinced that I'd let my imagination run away with me. And as for putting his hand on my throat, that was an accident. He'd been groping for my shoulder. And then the next minute, I was asking myself, was it an accident, though? Suppose I'd really been asleep. Suppose I hadn't grabbed his hands. I still didn't know what to think. Well, I dressed, and we sat down to breakfast. Oh, pass me your cup, will you, Stan? I'll, I'll give you some coffee. There you are. Thanks. Sugar coming up. No, no sugar for me, thanks. Well, Stan, when are you going to confess? What do you mean, confess? Or shall I drag it out of you? What are you driving at? Oh, come now. You're not going to play the adolescent schoolboy with me. I swear, I, I I'm don't... I'm referring to the lovely young woman you've been seen dining with and taking to the theater. Oh, oh, oh you mean Marcia. Is that her name? Yes, yes. Well, go on. Where did you meet her? How? When? Is she wealthy? Is she as beautiful as they say she is? Come on. Let's have the sort of details. No, Eric, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. Am I? Oh, I'll admit I've taken her out occasionally, but it's nothing like that. Marcia, do I know her? No, I don't believe you do. Isn't her last name Jenkins? Yes. Oh, of course I know her. That is, I met her. Well, don't you remember? You introduced me to her yourself. Oh, oh did I? Yes, don't you remember? I ran into you at Silver's. You were buying perfume, and, and she was helping you select it for Karen. Remember? Oh, oh yes, yes. Now that you recall it, More I... coffee? Uh, yeah, no sugar. Well, when we got to the lake, we bailed out the boat, loaded it, and pushed it out into the fog. It was still half light when we reached the other side, so we sat in the boat and lighted cigarettes waited for the sun to come up. We'd been sitting there, just smoking, not saying anything, when he suddenly turned to me and said, You say that she'd been ill? Uh, oh, Karen. Yes. Yes, she'd been ill for some time, Eric. So she killed herself? Yes. There was an inquest, of course. Well, yes, of course. Why do you ask? Look at that sun. Did you ever see such color? Four ways to commit murder. I'd almost forgotten about Eric's hands on my throat. Now the incident jumped vividly back to my mind because now I knew that Eric had a reason. He looked away after he asked me about the inquest. He didn't answer me when I asked him why he wanted to know. Somewhere in that strange, dark corner of his mind, he was still obsessed by love for Karen, even though she was dead and gone. He thought that she'd still be alive and happy she hadn't married me. My legs were weak when he motioned me out of the boat. A deer blew somewhere near us. We stopped. Hey, did you hear that? Yeah. Listen. It's moving west. Yeah. Stan, you work west. Just about half a mile or so ahead of us, you'll come to a clearing. Mm -hmm. Take your stand there. Right. I'll strike north and west and then work toward the clearing. Good hunting. This is it, then, I thought. He'll hide somewhere along the way to the clearing and shoot me in the back. Now that I knew what to expect, I felt somewhat relieved. At least I'd be ready for him. Nothing happened until I'd nearly reached the clearing. And then I got the feeling that someone was walking with me, timing his steps with mine. I stopped listened. I don't know how long I stood there. 
my rifle gripped in my hands. But suddenly, instinctively, I wheeled around. A shot whistled over my head. Then I saw a buck running across the clearing. He'd shot at me and missed. Well, two can play at that game, I thought. The next shot would be mine. I wouldn't miss. I dropped on my knees watching the brush for him. Then all of a sudden, I saw him running toward me, right out in the open. I started to raise my rifle, but I couldn't. I couldn't kill a man that way in cold blood. Dan, Dan, did I hit you? The Count found you. Now, I... hold on a minute, old son. Let's not well... lose our head time. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, of course, but I had no idea you were to take stand in the clearing, so I naturally assumed you were there. I, I don't know what I can say. Well, it, maybe it was my fault. I don't know. Anyway, let's forget it. But I... I, 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 I said let's skip it. Stuck close to Eric after that, I gave no more opportunity for a shooting accident. It was dusk when we hunted, headed back toward the cabin. We didn't get our buck, not that I cared, and I'm sure Eric didn't. He was after different game. Then I saw a boat on the beach. By drowning. Here we were alone. I couldn't refuse to get in the boat with him. There was no other way of getting back to the cabin. I could feel the perspiration trickling down my ribs. I stumbled in the underbrush. Easy, easy now. Hey, it's too bad we didn't bag that fella. Uh, what? That buck. Better luck tomorrow, maybe. Yeah, better luck tomorrow. You seem preoccupied, Stan. Do I? Yes, I have the ghastly feeling that I'm failing you as a host. I don't think you're having a very good time. I, I think this is a marvelous country, Eric. <laughs> You've exercised phenomenal restraint, old son. What do you mean? About expressing your admiration for it. I'd never have suspected that you liked it so much. That remark called for some sort of an answer, but I wasn't equal to it. Fortunately, I was spared the necessity... We reached the lake and the boat then. We tossed our guns into us. Eric started to push out to the shore. Hop in, Stan. Easy does it now. Hang on to the oars, will you, while I climb in? Uh -oh. All set? All set. Splendid. Here, now, you better let me row. I know this lake. There's some treacherous spots in it. What do you mean? Oh, some nasty boulders sticking up. Some of them that aren't easy to spot. Come too close to the surface for comfort. I see. If we were to hit one of them, we'd turn over in a hurry. You don't swim, do you, Stan? You know darn well I don't. Oh, that's a shame. It's a mistake not to learn to swim. Don't you think? What happened after that was a nightmare. He rode. I sat there, paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. I knew, I knew I should do something, but what? I stared at the water till I was blind, looking for rocks. Eric's face was a blur. He just smiled, rode, rode and talked. His voice sounded hollow and unreal. You're shaking, Stan. Is something wrong? This lake's plenty deep. Lots of fish in it, too. Maybe we can do a little fishing. He stopped suddenly. He'd seen something in the water. He turned around, pulled hard on the oars. We'd reach the spot he knew it. And then... No! No, Eric! Eric, we go! When I came up, Eric was there in the water near me. He didn't speak. He just grinned. And then I saw his face above mine, grinning. I saw him raise his face to strike me, and that's the last I remember. <laughs> Came to, I, 
was lying on the beach, and Eric was standing over me, smiling. Well, hello. How are you feeling? I... Okay, I guess. Say, you're a tough customer to rescue, old son. You put up quite a fight. I'm... I'm sorry. I thought no, that maybe... don't try to talk now. You've had a pretty bad time. Take it easy. Well, it was all clear to me then. Eric had saved my life. It had been accidental. The shot, the boat turning over. He didn't want to kill me. A man doesn't save you from drowning when he wants you dead. But it had all been my imagination, a nightmare. Oh, the relief that flowed through my body was almost too much for me. It would... Well, there aren't words to express how I felt. A little later, Eric helped me up to my cabin and I stretched out on the couch. Eric went to the kitchen to fix hot coffee and soup. He brought the coffee in first, pulled up the coffee table close to me and poured us each out a cupful. Ah, uh, there you are. Get some of that into you and you'll feel different. Oh, thanks. I'll be back in a second. Soup's coming right up. Hey, uh, Stan. Do you like to cook? Huh? I said, do you like to cook? You know, I do. I, I, well, I like to try different concoctions. Oh, not me. I'd starve to death if I had to cook for myself. Oh, man. This coffee hits the spot. Ah. I can use a little of that, too. It sure does warm the innards, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. I got a little chilled. Nothing like a cup of coffee, I always say. (laughs) That's what I always say, too, Stan. Uh, Why didn't I say say something funny? Am I amusing you again? (laughs) Immensely. In fact, Stan, I think that's probably the funniest thing you ever said. Mm. How did you like it, Stan? Four ways to commit murder. You read it, of course. Why, well, yes, I, I, I couldn't could tell you had, just as I intended you to. Were you frightened all day today? I don't understand. I... You didn't know, did you, that I came to your engagement party to ask Karen to be my wife. I wasn't aware that you were throwing a party or that she had accepted you. Oh, good Lord, Perhaps you don't remember what I told you that night. You thought I was joking, but I meant every word I said. That I'd make you pay if you failed, Karen, if you made her unhappy. But then all these years you would... Then you did bring me up here to... Murder you? You're so right, Stan. But you pulled me out of the lake. You saved my life. You are a dull-witted clown, aren't you, Stan? Don't you know me better than that? Did you think I'd kill you in, in the manner of a homicidal moron? Oh, no, Stan. But you... Did take a shot at me. Oh, yes. That was the second way. The first way was by waking you up by the throat this morning. The boat tipping over was the third way. And now I suppose we've reached the fourth way. Your brilliance positively staggers me. You can't get away with it, Eric. Oh, yes, I can. I have. You see how intently I'm watching you. I'm waiting to see you fall. You're going to die, Stan. Just as Karen died. What do you mean? In the coffee stand. That's right. Your coffee's poisoned, just as you poisoned her coffee. Only yours is a slow poison. <laughs> Poetic justice, don't you think? You you poisoned my coffee? Yes, I, I wore down your guard. I, I planned it so that by now you would trust me. You would <laughs> have faith in me. You, you poisoned <laughs> my coffee? <laughs> what if... What if you... <laughs> I didn't drink my coffee, oh, Eric. Oh. I changed cups with you. There was sugar in my cup, Eric. (laughs) I I don't take sugar in my coffee, Eric. So I changed cups with you. I I didn't mean to do it, Eric, but... (laughs) I don't like sugar in my coffee. (laughs) So you see, I, I didn't kill Eric, really. <laughs> he killed himself accidentally. But, but I wish he had killed me. He had a good reason to. Because somehow he knew about Karen. About how I killed Karen. 
by putting poison in her coffee that morning. And I watched her die. The same way that I watched Eric die. I'm tired now. I don't want to talk anymore. You do whatever you want with me. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now, our two distinguished stars, Lloyd Nolan and Vincent Price, are returning for a curtain call with William Spear, our producer-director of Suspense. Mr. Spear is carrying two large gift baskets of Grand Estate California wines. Lloyd and Vincent, and Vincent and Lloyd, (laughs) just to keep the billing straight... Uh, we want you each to have a basket of these Grand Estate wines with our compliments for a thrilling performance. Oh, hey, thank you, Bill. Hey, this is quite a selection. It certainly is. My thanks, too, Bill. Well, there, there must be a Grand Estate wine for every occasion here. I guess there is, isn't there, Ken? Well, there is indeed, Bill. Even my favorite, Grand Estate Medium Sherry. A truly versatile wine, Grand Estate Medium Sherry is delicious as an aperitif before dinner. Delightful for afternoon or evening parties, too. And, of course, like all Grand Estate wines by Roma, medium sherry possesses the brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste that distinguish truly great wines. That sounds wonderful. Well, yes, Mr. Nolan, and you can be sure that any Grand Estate wine you serve represents the ultimate in wine goodness, the crowning achievement of vintner skill. That's why Grand Estate wines presented by Roma... The greatest name in wine are the choice of discriminating wine users everywhere. Well put, Ken. Uh, Vincent, what's new and startling over on the 20th Century Fox lot? Well, they're pretty excited about Daryl Zanuck's film version of Mom's The Razor's Edge, Uh which has just finished up shooting. And I guess the picture that they like best among the current releases is Claudia and David. Uh You're on loan out just now, away from the home lot, aren't you, Vincent? That's right, Bill. And Lloyd is, too. Oh. Yes, yes, sir. I will be in a couple of weeks. Right now, I'm just loafing, grabbed a little fishing, took a hunting trip up north. Uh, you wouldn't want to go on a hunting trip with me, <laughs> would you, Lloyd? No, thanks. I had plenty of that tonight on suspense. Uh, oh, Bill, who's on the show next Thursday? It's uh, Dane Clark in a suspense play about a gunsel, a professional murderer who doesn't know he has any emotions until he finds himself falling in love with the wife of a man he's killed. Sounds wonderful. Hey, we'll be listening, eh, Lloyd? Oh, yes, sure thing. Well, well then, if you two will relieve me of these baskets of Grand Estate wines before my arms give way and there's a loud crash. <laughs> Thanks again, Bill. <laughs> well, good night. Good night. Next Thursday, same time, listen to Dane Clark on Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, welcomes you again to this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars Miss Ida Lupino, currently being seen in Warner Brothers' In Our Time, and Mr. Vincent Price of 20th Century Fox, soon to be seen in the Daryl F. Zanuck production, Wilson. 
Of the appearance of these two distinguished screen personalities, Lucille Fletcher has written a suspense play that deals with brooding anxiety and sharpening suspicion played against the severe and forbidding background of the late Victorian era. And so with Fugue in C minor and with the performances of Ida Lupino and Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in suspense. April 1st, 1900. Dear Bessie, this is just to let you know that I arrived in Pilotsville. Lizzie met me at the station. She's heartbroken about Papa's bankruptcy and for some reason feels that it's up to me to remedy the family situation. I told her I'd been offered a job, but she swept away that idea in horror. A girl with your looks, Amanda Peabody, doesn't have to get a job. There are too many rich husbands floating around for that. Furthermore, she says she has a rich husband already picked out for me right here in Pilotsville. Don't you remember? I told you about him at Christmas time. He's a Mr. Evans, rich as Croesus, charming, cultured, a lonely widower with two dear little children. And besides that, he's just your type, a real intellectual. You should hear him play the pipe organ. And you know, Bessie, I've met so few interesting men lately. And all you'd have to do is lift your little finger. Mr. Evans. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Chumley. How delightful to see you here. I'd like you to meet my sister. Mr. Evans, my sister, Amanda Peabody. Delighted, I'm sure. It's a lovely party, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Miss Peabody. Have you just come to Pilotsville? Yes. She's down from New York visiting me after the whirl of the hectic social season. Oh, indeed. <laughs> well, I'm afraid our Pilotsville society must seem a bit dull to you, Miss Peabody. Oh, no, not at all. It's charming. I've enjoyed everything so much tonight. Your beautiful house, the music... I hear you're going to play for us, Mr. Evans. Oh, a bit. Do you care for organ music, Miss Peabody? Very much. I never miss a church recital. But what a luxury it must be to have your own pipe organ right here in the house. I'm afraid I couldn't do without it. It's my hobby, you know. Bach, Buxtehude, César Franck. Don't you adore their work? Oh, Amanda's very musical. You should hear her render the burning of Rome. (laughs) Yes. And the delightful thing, of course, about having a pipe organ in the house is that it's everywhere to sit at a keyboard and hear the walls, the ceilings, the floors vibrate. You see, Miss Peabody, I've had the pipes installed all over the house. Under this floor, for example, are all the choir stops. Up in the bedroom walls are the stops for the swell manual. In the great uh, 32-foot pedal stops, the giant diapasons are underneath the staircase. My children sleep next door to the echo chamber. (laughs) So, you see, we live like angels here in a paradise of music. How thrilling. Ladies, come upstairs to the second floor landing, won't you? And I'll show you the console. It was made for me in Vienna. And Bessie, dear, to tell you the truth, I really find him fascinating. I wish you could hear him play. It sweeps you off your feet. There is such wildness to it, and at the same time, such dignity. And to hear the sound all through that marvelous house, rolling through those gorgeous rooms with their beautiful tapestries and potted palms. I could sit and listen to him all night. You have the most amazing eyes, Miss Peabody. What are you thinking about? The music. Oh, please don't stop. It's so beautiful. Well, you seem to be as mad about music as I am. Your sister says you play too. (laughs) Oh, no, only a little. My appreciation of it is all inside, I'm afraid. That's plenty. If one can't play, it's better just to enjoy the music of others. I can't bear this sentimental drumming, can you? I shouldn't think you would enjoy it. The idiotic tunes people play nowadays. Give me the old stern classics. They have strength and power. Give me something with life to it. Something that will flood the whole house with sound. Oh, 
that's marvelous. Uh, you're a very unusual girl, Miss Peabody. Quite unlike the run of girls here and down here at Pilotsville. Yes, in what way? Oh, it's rather hard to explain. Uh, some more tea, Amanda. No, thank you. A muffin? No, thank you. You have an excellent cook, Mr. Evans. Please, please call me Theodore. You know you promised. Theodore? Amanda. And your house is beautifully run, too. You must have an excellent housekeeper. Everything always looks so charming and quiet. I haven't even heard a peep out of your children. My children? Oh, yes, the children have been away at school. You have two, haven't you? Yes, Daphne and David. What sweet names. Ordinarily, I don't approve of schools for young children, but you see, they were rather overwrought. After Mrs. Evans passed on... Oh, I can well understand. They were almost morbidly devoted to their mother, and then, of course, the unfortunate circumstances of her death, but I suppose your sister, Mrs. Chumley, has told you all about that. No, not very much, except your wife was killed in a street accident, wasn't she? Yes, in Philadelphia, a brewery wagon and four horses ran her down. Oh, how terrible. It's something I don't like to think about very often. Poor, beautiful Margaret... Well, it's like a nightmare, Amanda, and I still can't feel reconciled, but... Well, what I was driving at was the children. They were in school when she died, and by some malicious stroke of fate, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever raging up there. The authorities wouldn't lift the quarantine and let them out for her funeral. Oh, poor little things. Yes, it upset them dreadfully. In fact, I sometimes fear it's left a mark on them which may endure all their lives. Why, what do you mean? They suffer from delusions. Delusions about her... They think that in some way she is linked... Her soul is imprisoned in the organ pipes. How horrible. I wish I could do something about it. It's a frightful notion, but they won't... They don't let me play when they're at home. That echo chamber in particular next door to their bedroom. Yes? You know, it's nothing but an empty sealed room with a few wires. Of course, it's all because they never saw her dead. But they have a notion that she's... Well, somehow hidden there. How ghastly... They really think that, do they? Children can think up such very strange things in their little minds. Can't they? Tonight for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, whom you've heard in the prologue to Fugue in C Minor. Tonight's tale of suspense. Let us look in on another scene for a moment. A smart dinner party at the internationally famous Hotel de Nacional de Cuba in Havana. One of the guests, a world-traveled American, sets down his wine glass and remarks that a truly fine wine always carries the unmistakable flavor of the particular vineyards from which it comes. Well, then laughs his Cuban host, you must be homesick for California right now. For the wine you are enjoying so much is from America, from California. It is Roma wine. Yes, it's true. Our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma wines that discriminating people in other lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. You pay none of the expensive overseas shipping charges and duties. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself with the wonderful flavor that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern quality controls and tests. Yes, only pennies a glass full for a treat you are certain to enjoy. For remember, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Roma. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Ida Lupino as Amanda Peabody and Vincent Price as Theodore Evans in Fugue in C Minor. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! I met the children today, Bessie, for the first time. It was a shock. They're strange little creatures, utterly unlike their father. The girl is about 11 and the boy 8. They were both dressed in deep mourning. Their large grey eyes seemed strained with terror. 
They listened and trembled at every sound. This is Miss Peabody, children. She's a very good friend of mine. Now, I want you both to shake hands with her. Oh, come now, Daphne. You can at least tell Miss Peabody how old you are. Oh, no. Please don't press her. I know when I was a little girl, I hated people to talk about my age. I'd much rather hear about, well, about school. We're not going back there. No matter what anybody says. David. That's all right. Then you didn't like school. No. And Mommy didn't like it either. She cried when we went away. Oh. But your mama wanted you to be educated, didn't she? She wanted you to grow up and be intelligent people, didn't she? Well, didn't she, Daphne? Who are you? You may call me Aunt Amanda. I'm a friend of your papa's. Do you know where my mama is? Your mama? Well, your mama's in heaven, dear. No, she's not. Then where is she, dear? Please, please don't start them off, Amanda. It's too upsetting. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music, like old times. You remember when your mother was alive? We all used to play together. David, you with your cornet and Daphne at the violin and Mama at the piano. Well, Miss Peabody plays the piano, too. And she's promised to play Narcissus, Mama's favorite piece. Well? Well, perhaps some other time, Theodore, when they don't feel so strange. I tell you, I've humored them to death. Now, come, David. There's your cornet on the mantelpiece. And Daphne? No. I insist. Look, now, I'll start the melody on the organ. David, you come in with your cornet obligato in the third measure. Daphne, you can follow me. That funny noise. What note? Oh, oh, you mean that? Oh, that's just a cipher. A wire must have stuck somewhere. One of the pipe valves. It's Mama. That's where Mama is. She's calling for us. Oh, don't be silly. I'll just hit the key a few times and it'll stop. You've heard these ciphers before, haven't you, Miss Peabody? Well, I don't know much about pipe organs. It's a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What is she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's in the pipe and she can't get out. Daphne, stop that nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. She won't let him because he killed her. Daphne. Daphne, what did you say? Well, she didn't mean it, I'm sure. The poor little thing's hysterical. We should never have tried to persuade them. Oh, man. Just because they never looked upon her face, because they never saw her lying there in the coffin. Hush, hush. My own children believe that I am a murderer. Theodore, you're making them both sick. So I, I who loved their mother so much, who was so devoted for 12 years, do I look like a murderer, Amanda? Do I? No. There it is again. It's Mama. It's Mama. Shh, dear. I'll take them upstairs for you, Theodore, while you try and fix it. April 24th. Oh, Bessie. Those poor little children. We took them out to the cemetery today to show them her grave. A marble angel guarded it. It was planted with pure white tulips. How final it was and peaceful. And yet they began to tremble again the moment we set foot inside the house. Poor Theodore. The man is nearly out of his mind. What can he do? I keep asking myself that question. She died in Philadelphia, you say? Yes, on May 15th, just a little less than a year ago. You weren't with her? No, she went there to take a piano lesson. There was a new teacher she'd heard about. She was always so self-conscious about her technique. But she never reached his studio. They notified me at midnight from the city morgue. And no one in Philadelphia saw her? No one except the attendants at the morgue, of course, and the people who picked her up after the collision. It was such a brutal accident there been no one from among them who could speak to the children, explain to them? Oh, no. Oh, it's so horrible, so sordid. Oh, I know, my dear. I hate to make you suffer. But if we could find some way, if they could just believe. When you brought her back here to Pilotsville, there was a funeral. Yes. And was there anybody then who saw her? Oh, no, I couldn't bear it, Amanda. I, I didn't think at the time she'd been so beautiful. Her lovely, sweet, gentle face and her eyes... The horses had completely trembled. Oh. Even if the children had been able to come home, I wouldn't have let them look. The coffin was sealed when I left Philadelphia. I didn't want to see her again myself. 
There was a funeral. People came. There were flowers, an undertaker. Yes. Well, if they could believe that, if there was one witness, perhaps my own sister Lizzie. Amanda? Of course there was a funeral. The finest funeral in town. A snow-white hearse and 25 coaches. Everybody sent flowers. The casket wasn't open, but I've been to lots of funerals where they don't open the casket. And from what I understand, she was pretty badly mangled. But it was a beautiful funeral. Mr. Evans played the organ himself. The finest selections. All the sweet old pieces his wife liked. There was Narcissus and Mighty Life Rose and Goodbye Forever. It was. So you see, David, my sister, Mrs. Chomley, was there. Yes, but how did she know it was Mama? Oh, David. Uh, she didn't see Mama, did she? Well, nobody saw your poor Mama, dear. She wouldn't have wanted anyone to see her. Mama wasn't there. She talks to us every night. She tells us to look for her. Where, dear? In the pipes. But, David, your Mama's dead. She's been dead for nearly a year. Now, you she... saw her grave out in the cemetery... She's happy and at rest. Why doesn't Papa give us a key? If he'd only let us have it, we could look for her. What key, dear? The keys to the pipes. There's a little door just underneath the stairs. That's where they that's where the big pipes are. And inside it's all dark. But where are the but there are there are the tunnels. There's a little room. A little on, room. Dear. That's yes. where she's hiding. That's where Mommy is. Oh. That's where Mommy is. Oh, David, darling, now look, come here. No, I hate you. But why do you hate me? Why don't you let me help you? Because... Because what? Because you... you like him. Him? Papa, you're going to marry him, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, you are. The Venus says you are. You're going to marry him. Then he'll send us back to school. There'll be no one left to help Mama. Poor Mama will never be left out. Oh, I hate you, I hate you. David, what are you doing here? David, did you strike Miss Peabody? He's sick, Theodore. I'm sure he's very sick. Now go to your room at once. Oh, those dreadful children. I tell you, Amanda, they'll ruin whatever happiness we might have. Theodore, I love you very much. But I couldn't marry you. Not with that child's cry ringing in my head. We've got to help them. Give them that key. Let them go and look in the room where the pipes are. Then they'll see for themselves that there's no ghost. Key? Who told you about a key to that room? The children. The children? Amanda, I'm going to tell you something. Something I've tempered, never told to a living soul. It, it may frighten you. Yes. Margaret was going mad when she died. Oh. No one knew it but me. It ran in her family. I discovered it long after we were married, after the children were born. Otherwise, I'd never have... And now you think the children? I'm afraid so. It was peopling of sound she had, just like them. A fear of the dead's returning. She used to play... What's that? It sounds like the organ. But the motor isn't on. The console was locked when I left. Someone's trying to play. No one but me can touch that instrument. It's forbidden in this house and the servants are out. Unless those children... Come upstairs, Amanda. Theodore. Why, there's no one here. No one at the keyboard. The organ's playing itself. That's impossible. The motor's not going. The motor? Yes, it sets the bellows going. There's no air in the pipes unless it's on. No air to make the pipes speak. It's impossible, I tell you. Perhaps children found the key and got in. The key? No, no, no. The key's here in my pocket. There's no other way. No. Theodore, open that door. Go in there and see what's happening, please. No. Theodore. I won't give in. I, I won't be a prey to it. Do you hear? I, I won't. I, I won't. I won't. Here. Yeah. It stopped now. Yes. It was probably really nothing but the wind. Theodore, give me the key. I'm not afraid. Are you saying that I am? I don't know. But I'll be fair with you, Theodore. I couldn't marry you and live here with that any more than your children can. What do you mean? Rip out those pipes. Rip out the whole pipe organ. Give it to a church, but don't keep it here. Get rid of it's the not pipe worth organ? It. Yes. But I couldn't. The whole house was built around it. It's been the very soul and spirit of this home. It's been the curse, you mean. 
Theodore, I know I'd go mad too if I had to listen to it night and day. It's so hollow. Think of those pipes so huge down there in the darkness. I'd begin to hear things too. Oh, Theodore! Be quiet. Be quiet. Come outside. We'll take a walk. No. No, give me the key. Give me the key. You're hysterical, Amanda. I'm sorry I've overburdened you. Why don't you want to go in there? Is it because you know something? You did something. What do you mean? Did you kill her? Amanda. <laughs> Very well, Amanda. Here's the key. If that's the way you trust me, we'll go down and look around together. Come now, Amanda. I'm sorry, Theodore. It slipped out. It was a dreadful thing to say. It's all right, I understand. Yet it hurts a little. I've trusted you so completely, Amanda. Theodore. Yes, Amanda. Let's not go in there. I do trust you, darling. I, I believe everything you've told me. No. This little key. To think it should mean so much. Oh. Oh, black it is. Yes, pitch black. And cold. Where are the pipes? I can't see them. Come in further, Amanda. You'll see them as soon as your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. The biggest pipes pack this well under the great staircase like giants. Oh, yes, I, I'm beginning to see them now. Shouldn't we go and get a candle? Oh, no, no, go in a little further. Be careful, the floor is a maze of wires. Now stand there for a second. Theodore, don't leave me. I won't be long. I thought you said you weren't afraid. No, I'm not only... Where are you going? Just upstairs to play for you. Theodore! I'd like you to hear how the music sounds in the darkness. It's quite an experience being so close to the pipes... You know, narrow, suffocating, especially when I pay the great Passacaglia and Fugue of Bach. Oh, Theodore, please. I don't want to stay Perhaps here. Perhaps one of the Rheinberger symphonies or the great chorales of Cesar Frank. <laughs> Margaret, of course, preferred Narcissus. Margaret? Now, you're very gullible, Amanda. And you did kill her. You killed her in this room. And you're going to kill me. Yes, yeah, simple, isn't it? But why? I don't why? know. One gets tired every now and then of mere music... Sometimes the classics demand competition. A scream, for example. There's something so exciting about pulling out all the stops and drowning out all human sound. Have you ever tried to match your voice, Miss Peabody, against the thunderous voice of Bach? It's most effective. And then when the struggle gets weaker, when the air is almost gone and you choke and gasp for breath to bring the music down, softer, softer. Theodore, you're mad, you're mad. Come, Amanda, would you deny me that pleasure? No, I Help. promise you the concert Help. will be too long. It takes about eight hours before the air gives out, but you know I could play for days. And don't worry about the children. I think you've convinced them about the ghost. What's that? Theodore! Someone shut the door. It's locked and the key's outside. Who's there? Let me out! Let me out! Theodore. Get away from me. Let me out, do you hear? Let me out, let me out. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. It's so dark, I can't breathe. Let me out, please, please. I can't breathe. I can't... No, no, no. I can't, I can't let... Let me out, I can't breathe. <laughs> I shall be coming home in a few days, Bessie. I still can't sleep at night. I still hear that laughter. Still hear that cornet playing its unearthly music. And Theodore Evans once more lies dead at my feet. It was his heart, Bessie. He died of fright. In those few moments, he anticipated the hideous fate he had meted out to so many. And I might have died there if he had not gone so quickly. But the children hated me. They wanted to kill us both. Those terrible, pathetic children. What horrors they must have sensed in that charnel house. 
there were other women beside his wife. The police found them all buried and stuffed away into unused parts of the pipe organ. Bessie, I was in that pipe room alone with him for four hours before that door creaked open. There they stood, and I shall never forget their faces or the things they said. All right, Miss Peabody. You can come out now if you're really sorry. I'm sorry. Are you sure he's quite dead? Yes, he's dead. We were right all the time, weren't we, Miss Peabody? Yes, you were right. No. Will you come and help us find Mama? And so closes Fugue in C Minor, starring Miss Ida Lupino and Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Of all the rich treasures man gets from the earth and Mother Nature, none has been more highly esteemed than wine. Good, delicious wine. And if you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines add to your meals... Well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer or ruby red Roma Burgundy or the deliciously delicate flavored Roma Sauterne. These superb wines cost you only pennies a glassful. Yet, they make even the simplest meal taste like a million dollars. Get some today. And if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. You owe it to yourself to have and regularly enjoy R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ida Lupino. Mr. Spear has just been telling me a little about next week's suspense show. The star will be Thomas Mitchell in a story about a man who had headaches, tried everything to cure them, finally went to a psychiatrist and found out that he was a murderer. Now, that certainly sounds like a broadcast we listeners won't want to miss. One more word. Don't forget to buy that war bond this week. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Vincent Price as star of The Name of the Beast, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Vincent Price in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! News and views in the world of art. Yesterday at the Deauville Galleries, a record-breaking crowd attended one of the most sensational exhibitions of recent years. 
Masterpiece of the show is a portrait by James Dorrance titled The Name of the Beast. It's a savagely candid work, a face from which violence has shattered the last vestige of humanity. The tragic circumstances of the artist's death are too well known to review here. But at the same time, one cannot help speculating upon the essential mystery surrounding this remarkable canvas. What is the name of the beast? The name of the beast was Krebs, Elmer Krebs. I found him in an evil waterfront dive, took him to my studio and made the first sketch for the portrait that night. I gave him money and he promised to return the next day. When he didn't show up, I went in search of him. He wasn't hard to trace. My search came to an end in a squalid room of a waterfront hotel. Come in. He didn't look up when I entered the room, but continued to sit there on the sagging, dingy bedstead, holding his head in his hands and gently moaning. I crossed the room and raised the blind to let in the daylight. Then I saw it. Blood on his hands, on his shirt front, in his hair and beard. A horrible, sticky mass of blood. You didn't show up for our appointment today. I'm the painter you met last night, remember? You were going to sit for a portrait. What do you want? You want your money back? Certainly not. I want to finish my painting. I want you to come back to the studio. You must be crazy. Look here, it's very important for me to finish that painting. I'll make it worth your while. Money? I don't need money. <laughs> Not anymore. Well, maybe I can help you in some other way. You're in some kind of trouble, that's obvious. What business is that of yours? You'd better wake up and pull yourself together. We'll have to get rid of those clothes some way or other. And well, I'll think of some way. What happened? I told you it's none of your business. Why don't you leave me alone? I'm sick. All that blood. The first thing we must do is clean up this mess here. Now get those clothes off. And the shoes, too. I'll make a parcel out of them and dump them in the river after dark. You'd better shave off that beard, too. They'll be looking for a man with a beard, you know. Who will? By the police, of course. What makes you so sure of that? I know more about you than you think I do. You're bluffing. Maybe, maybe not. But you're in no position to take chances. For all you know, I might be a witness. I might have seen you kill... Shut up! Temper, temper. I told you I'm sick. I'm liable to do anything. It wouldn't be smart for you to do anything to me, Elmer. I'm your only hope. You know that, don't you? You lost your head. You were clumsy. To get away with murder, you need a clear head. Look at the mistakes you've made already. Blood all over you. As good as a rope around your neck. Where did you hide the loot? Well, that's what you're after. Then it was robbery. Somewhere close by, too. Couldn't have gone far with all that blood on you without attracting attention. Well? It was in a shop, I imagine. That means they probably won't find the body till Monday What's morning. What's all this third degree? You with the police? On the contrary, Elmer. I'm going to save you from the police. Huh? I told you. I want to finish painting that portrait of you. It don't make sense. All this just to paint some crazy picture. Ah, but what a picture, Elmer. I've waited 20 years to paint this picture. Everything I've ever painted has been merely the preparation for this. I've worked alone, never exhibited a single canvas... Do you know what it is to work alone? Yeah, I know. Nobody knows your name, but one day, quite suddenly, a masterpiece explodes in the face of a jaded world. Like your murder, Elmer. After a life of petty crime, at last an act of yours really means something. Newspapers will headline it. The whole world will be clamoring to know your name. Exciting, isn't it? Exciting? Well, that's the way I feel about this portrait. I how must I... finish the job just how as you I know finish... you won't take those clothes to the cops instead of dumping them? I'm taking a terrible chance walking out of here with a bundle of blood-stained clothes, as it is. They'd fit me about as well as they fit you. Okay, that's fair enough. By the way, where... where did it happen? A hawk shop. Number 23, next to the alley. Was it necessary The old to... man came in and started firing a revolver right off. I don't pack no rod. There's nothing else to do. I grabbed the fire axe off the wall. Oh, my... And I suppose the police have your fingerprints on file? Yeah, I've done time once. What did you do with the axe? Just dropped it there. I was sick, all that blood. I suppose you left nice red fingerprints all over the place. I didn't touch nothing. Maybe the window's still going out. Oh, that's the first place they'll look. 
And you're obviously in no condition to go back what there now. What are you now. trying to do? Buy yourself a nice murder rap? My dear fellow, any intelligent man can get away with murder if he keeps his wits about him. You ought to be very grateful to me, Elmer. I'm going to take your clumsy crime and make it into a work of art. <laughs> For Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Vincent Price in The Name of the Beast by Robert Tallman. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Yesterday, a happily married friend told me one of his favorite formulas for enjoying life. He said he never eats dinner while still burdened with the pressures of a busy day. Instead, he sits down for a few minutes, takes it easy, chats with his wife, and enjoys with her a glass or two of Roma California Sherry, the perfect first call to dinner. Yes, Roma Sherry before dinner is a pleasant custom millions now share with family and friends. For Roma Sherry is a glorious golden amber wine. Soft and mellow on the tongue, so inviting with its pleasing nut-like taste. Roma Sherry makes mealtime more welcome, helps you anticipate the good food to come. And when friends drop in, there's no more gracious greeting than a glass of Roma Sherry. Tomorrow night, before dinner, share Roma Sherry with your family. It costs no more to serve Roma, America's favorite wine. So insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Vincent Price as James Dolance with Elliot Lewis as Krebs in The Name of the Beast, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> The shoes of the beast were just my size. I wore them when I went on my errand that night. It was fortunate I did. Getting into the place was simple. It was an old-fashioned lock, and the skeleton key to my studio fitted it perfectly. The shop bell jangled when I opened the door. I made my way quickly along the dark rows of counters to the rear of the shop. A pair of dusty portiers provided it from the back room. I pulled them, too, behind me and snapped on my flashlight. <laughs> The body, or what was left of it, lay in a heap in the center of the room. The floor, well, it was lucky I hadn't worn my own shoes. There would be tracks out of that place, red tracks. The axe lay near the old man's head. I picked up the axe and carried it over to the sink. I washed off what I could and smeared out the prints with the cotton gloves on my hands. Then I made a quick circuit of the room, taking in every surface. With the wet gloves, I smeared the prints on the safe handle, the windowsill, and the jimmy the murderer had so stupidly left behind him. Then I dropped the cotton gloves on the floor and left them there. No way to trace a pair of cheap cotton gloves. Now there was only one last thing to do. Walk around the block to dry the soles of those shoes and burn them in the stove when I got back to my studio. The handiwork of the beast would remain but the name of the beast had been expunged. But I didn't burn the shoes, nor did I throw that bundle of clothing into the river as I had first planned to do that night. No, no. This would be an authentic portrait of a murderer in the very blood-stained garments of his crime. <laughs> That will be all for today, Elmer. How much longer does this go on? Until the painting is finished. You can't set a time limit on the completion of a masterpiece, you know. Uh, 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 don't look much like me. You've forgotten. I made the first sketch before you shaved off your beard. I don't like this picture. Did you have to paint in all that blood? My dear fellow, no one in the world would ever recognize you as the man with the beard in this painting. I don't painting. like this picture. 
I don't like staying here. Look, what about that stuff? When can I start cashing in on it? I should have thought I was paying you enough to live on. Suppose I want to get married. Well, that... What? Oh, good Lord, man. You mustn't even consider it. In the first place, I can't afford to support another person. Who's asking you to support anybody? I got that stuff, haven't I? Well, I'm going to cash it in, that's all. Listen to me, Elmer. If you try to unload as much as one piece of that loot, the police will be on your tail so fast... Oh, no, my friend. That stuff has got to stay where it is for some time to come. You just say that so I'll have to depend on you. So you can paint that lousy picture. Maybe. Oh, by the way, Elmer... I've never said anything about it before, but you never told me exactly what you did do with the loot. The suitcase, I told you. Yes, I know, in a locker at Grand Central, but where's the ticket? <laughs> That's one secret I'm keeping. Well, all right. But you will promise me not to unload those jewels. Not for a while She keeps yet. asking me, when are we going to get married? What am I going to tell her? Oh, by the way, who is the lucky lady? Jeannie. Her name's Jeannie Baker. Hey... Wait a minute, though. She don't know anything about me. Not anything. If I ever catch you talking to her. So help me, I'll kill you. You say you're a friend of Elmer's? Well, not a friend exactly. I'm afraid this will be rather a shock to you. You're very close to Mr. Krebs. Well, we're engaged to be married. What is it? Is he in some kind of trouble? Are you a detective? Well, not exactly. You see, I represent the insurance company. What insurance State company? State indemnity. Our policyholder doesn't want to prosecute, but at the same prosecute? time... Prosecute? Well, after all, the jewels were of considerable value. What jewels? Why, the jewels in the suitcase, in the locker at Grand Central. He did leave the ticket with you, didn't he? Oh, well, yes, but, but I mean, he didn't tell me... that. Well, he did say it was valuable and he didn't want to risk losing the ticket, but... I... How did you know about it? My dear Miss Baker, we insurance investigators have ways of finding out these things. Now then, if you're a sensible young woman... And I can see that you're not only a sensible young woman, but a very beautiful one as well. Mr. Dorrance, what has he done? Well, I don't think he regarded it as a theft exactly. More of a loan in all probability. After all, his aunt was a very old lady and... You mean he... St- Stole this jewelry from his aunt? Well, I wanted to spare you those exact words if I could. Actually, the lady would prefer not to prosecute. But, of course, if we can secure the return of the property in no other way... I suppose I'd be arrested, too, as, as an accessory or something. I must say it was rather thoughtless of him to have involved you in this manner. How do I know you're what you say you are? I have credentials, of course. But I would rather take care of this unofficially... Especially since this little talk with you. You're much too fine a person to be involved in a sordid affair like this. I don't even know that suitcase has any jewels in it. Then supposing we go there together and get it, Jeannie? Well, now... Now, let's have a look. How, how are we going to... Well, I, I think I have a key here that'll open it. There. <gasps> what? Those must be worth a fortune. Yes, they are, Miss Baker. You understand our concern? Yes. Close it up. I, I don't want to look at it anymore. I'd like to have spared you this. You understand, of course, that I wouldn't dream of prosecuting... Not now that I've met you. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Dorrance. This... This is such a shock to me. How could he? How could he? There, there. You're not the first innocent girl to be deceived by an unscrupulous fellow like that. How did you happen to become involved with him in the first place? Oh, I I was lonely. I I have no friends here, and he came into the cafe where I wait tables. Oh, there, there now. You won't let anything happen to me. I promise you, I'll do anything to keep you from knowing another moment's unhappiness. That night I worked feverishly, like a man possessed. But as I worked, an uncanny change came over the man in the portrait. There was something about it, something that terrified and at the same time fascinated me. Yet the more I tried to make it come right, the less it really looked like Krebs. I began to regret I had had him shave his beard, in spite of the risk involved. 
Being clean-shaven altered a man's appearance more than I thought. But that wasn't the real difficulty. The real trouble was Jeannie Baker. How could she ever have loved a beast like Krebs? A girl so gentle, so lovely. I tried not to think of her. But the image of Jeannie stood between me and the canvas. And the painting just would not come right. And this Krebs sat there suddenly posing for me. His eyes began to grow more and more cunning and suspicious. As though he could actually read my thoughts. He would jump up every time I laid down my brush and circle the portrait like an infuriated animal. Until finally... Around four in the morning, he dropped off to snoring. I let him stay there. In the dawn light, I looked at the picture for the last time and draped the easel to shut it out of my sight. My masterpiece, for which I had become accessory after the fact of one murder and, and sowed the seeds of a second, was, I knew it now deep in my heart, a failure. I was obsessed now with only one resolve, to prevent the second murder, which by some instinct I knew was in Krebs' mind. At whatever cost to myself, no harm must come to Jeannie. Mr. Dorrance, I've been told that artists are full of romantic notions, and the Bureau has dealt with a number of them in this neighborhood, as you can well imagine. But... I must say that of all the pipe dreams that have been brought to me, yours is the most fantastic. Oh, but listen, Inspector, you've got to believe me. That girl's life is in danger. Yeah, we're checking on that. Now, let's check on a few other things, Mr. Dorrance. You say that on the night of the 12th, you met this man Krebs at a place called Louis. Yes, sir. And afterwards, you went with him to your studio and made a sketch of him for a portrait. All right, so far, so good. He promised to return the following day and sit again for the painting. But he failed to show up, so you sought him out at his hotel. Now the story really becomes incredible. He tells you he's committed a ghastly murder. He's covered in blood. You offer to help him get away with the murder in order to finish the portrait. Oh, now really, Mr. Dorrance. You painters need publicity as bad as all that. But, Inspector, I tell you, I have all the evidence. Where? At my studio. Where's this man Krebs? Except for the portrait you say you painted of him, I can't find a shred of evidence that he exists. Now, oh, just a minute. Yes, Sergeant? They've picked up the girl. Good. Send her in. Oh, she'll tell you. She'll tell you who Krebs is. Oh, come in, Miss Baker. We won't detain you long. Miss Baker, do you know this man? I say, do you know this man? It's all right, my dear. Speak up. Yes. His name is Elmer Krebs. A few minutes later, they let me go, dismissing me as a harmless crackpot. Jeannie walked out of the station with me, clinging to my arm with solicitude, as one might act towards a beloved and mentally ill relative. Why did you do it? Elmer came to my apartment last night. He told me the whole story. But then why... He was boasting, boasting about how he's pinned the crime on you. Don't you see? Everything you've done to save him has incriminated you, the bloodstained clothes, even the, the loot. Oh, I'm tired. I don't know. Don't listen to me. He'll always be a threat to us, to our happiness. He's safe. The police don't even know he exists. They don't even know what he looks like. There's still the portrait. It's not a masterpiece, but they can identify him from it. I see. <laughs> Darling, you, you didn't mind my rechristening you? You once loved a man named Krebs. And I still love a man named Krebs. And it's all right. For that, I'd do anything. Put this in your overcoat pocket. It'll keep you safe, darling. What? Oh, no, no, I... It'll keep you safe, darling. He was there in my studio when I got in that evening, waiting for me. I had more or less expected it. I hadn't expected to find him in such a cheerful frame of mind... He had pulled the drape off of the painting and was walking round it, viewing it from every angle. Hi, Dorrance. How did you get in here? Through the door. No more window jobs for me, Dorrance. Yeah, the picture. How about that? Got a new model, huh? What? The picture? Oh, it's no good. By the way, it's finished now. You won't need to come here anymore. You don't say. I'll get you the suitcase. I suppose it'll be safe for you to cash that stuff. I already in by this found time. the suitcase, Dorrance. Oh, well. Take it along with you, then. It's over there on the table. I opened it up. Well, 
Did you think I'd take it without checking on the contents? What are you talking What'd about? What'd you do with the rocks, Dorrance? Rocks? You took the rocks, the jewelry. There's nothing left there but the settings, a pile of junk. Listen, Krebs, I swear I never opened that suitcase but once, just after we took it out of the we... locker. She's in it with you. Listen, Krebs, you can think whatever you want to about me, but keep Jeannie out of it. I keep Jeannie out of it? That's a laugh. I mean what I say. Krebs, where are you going? Oh, our place. If she has those rocks, I'm going to Krebs, get come back here. I have a job to do. Krebs, if you go out of that door, I warn you. All right. I dragged his body inside the door and left it there. Then I dropped the revolver Jeannie had given me back in my overcoat pocket and left my studio. For the last time, as I closed the door on the room, it seemed that the face in the portrait was grinning at me in hideous mockery. I had meant to go straight to the police and give myself up, but I must have known in my heart that I wouldn't. Instead, I walked, and my feet took me almost against my will to the house on Grove Street, the house where Jeannie lived. I had roused her from sleep, and she seemed rather cross. What's the big idea, barging in here this time of night? I had to see you, Jeannie. Well? That was an unlucky name you gave me, Jeannie. What's happened? I shot him. You gave me a murderer's name, and now I am a murderer. So you really did it. I wondered if you'd have the guts. Jeannie! Oh, Jeannie. What do you want me to do, put on black and cry myself to death? You loved him once. Who said so? You were going to marry him. Maybe. I thought he was smart once. I said I'd marry him if he pulled a really big job. I might have kept my word, but he bungled it. What's worse, he involved me. When I found out, he'd planted that stuff on me. You knew. You knew all the time. Oh, so what? So what? You'll get your cut. Oh, Krebs was right. You did take those stones, and I killed a man for you to save you. What did you do with the gun? It's in my overcoat pocket. I was going to the police. Oh, you sap. Why didn't you leave the gun there? Make it look like suicide. It was, in a way, wasn't it, Jeannie? I'm Krebs now. Dorrance is dead. You planned it very nicely. Oh, stop. Stop trying to be deep. Doesn't matter what your name is. Either way, you've messed it up. Anybody have a key to your place? No. And we still have time. Time for what? The body! Any intelligent person can get away with murder if he keeps his wits about him. You told Elmer that. Yes, I told Elmer that. You're scared to go back there, aren't you? Do you want me to do it for you? No. No, I'll do it. I must do it. Here. Mustn't forget your overcoat. No. No, I mustn't forget my overcoat. It'll keep me... It'll keep me safe. Goodbye, Jeannie. Two stiffs. Hmm. What a shambles. Looks as if he shot this guy and then bumped himself off. Who are they? I don't know the other one. This is a guy that came into headquarters Saturday. You know, the artist. Huh? Well, there must have been something to his story after all. Uh, here's a note he left. You see... Dear Inspector, the portrait I told you about is standing on the easel facing the window so you can see it in the light. James Dorrance. Uh, I guess this must be it here. He said it identified the murderer. Is it a good likeness? Gee, I don't know. You look at it. Ah. Why, it's, it's a woman. Yeah, it's a dame we picked up. The little waitress. Hey, but look, it's it's got men's clothes on. Bloody. And the way he's made the face all twisted and ugly... She was a good-looking kid. Yeah, she was. He must have been cracked. I guess he must have been. A thing like that makes you wonder, don't it? Yeah, a thing like that makes you wonder. The discerning art lover will recognize Doran's painting as more than a mere portrait. It's the human soul stripped naked and its dark and secret, deep and secret places shown in all their morbid, brooding fascination. But still one cannot help wondering, what is the name of the beast? Did the woman in the portrait exist, or was she only the creature of the artist's fevered imagination? Our only clue is in a quotation which the artist caused to be printed in the exhibition catalog. 
And he causeth all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Before we hear again from Vincent Price, the star of The Name of the Beast, tonight's suspense play, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a tip for you men. Every wife loves surprises. Little unexpected deeds that reflect thoughtfulness. So, tomorrow night, boost your stock with her. Solve her problem of how to brighten weekend dining. Add to your own mealtime pleasure, too. Take home a bottle of delicious Roma California Burgundy. One sip will convince you both that red, robust Roma Burgundy is the perfect table mate for stews, spaghetti, or baked beans. For Roma Burgundy brings out hidden flavors, adds rare goodness to every morsel. Yes, gentlemen, Roma Burgundy can make a hero of you on two counts, for being thoughtful and for solving a mealtime problem. And Roma Wine, America's first choice, costs no more than ordinary wines. Remember, for greater dining pleasure tomorrow, take home Roma Burgundy. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Vincent Price. Next Thursday, our friend Keenan Wynn will be your star on Suspense in what sounds like a very exciting play which all takes place on a bus. A bus making a return trip from the state insane asylum. I know you won't want to miss it next Thursday. And now, let me add my voice on behalf of a very great and wonderful cause. The pennies, the dimes, and the dollars that you give when you buy Easter seals... Give crippled children their chance for happy living. Help a crippled child to walk again. Buy your share of Easter seals tomorrow. Thank you. Vincent Price appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox and will soon be seen in their production, Dragonwick. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Keenan Wynn as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. There's a lot of truth in the old saw about the loss of a horseshoe nail resulting in the loss of a kingdom. The tiniest detail can often lead to quite extraordinary results, particularly if the detail is observed by a clever con man with sufficient larceny in his soul. A man like the amazing Dr. Alcazar, who parlayed a piece of string into a small fortune. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. Vincent Price stars in The Green and Gold String, which begins exactly one minute from now. Smoke, Kent. Smoke, Kent. 
Vincent Price in The Green and Gold Spring, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Hey, yeah, uh, hey, uh, step this way, ladies and gentlemen. Learn what the future holds for you. As Dr. Alcazar, her boy and That dulcet voice belongs to Abby, my good and devoted assistant who stands outside my studio here in Coney Island and drums up business. Of course, I wrote his spiel. And did it pay off one evening last fall? Oh, uh, thank you kindly. Good evening, sir. Uh, are you Dr. Alcazar? Alcazar, indeed I am, madam, at your service. Uh, I'd like a reading, if you don't mind. Hmm. Age 35 to 40, cheap purse, expensive suit, suit too tight and too short, not hers, a hand-me-down accent, British cockney, nervous, mm, something on her mind, possibly a housekeeper or a lady's maid. I showed it to the chair reserved for customers. It's under a mirror. Ah, they're handy mirrors. Spooky in here, ain't it, with all these black curtains? Black velvet, madam, to minimize all distractions. Is that your crystal ball? Yes, madam, the mysterious orb in which I see revealed the future as well as the past. But in your case, I think it won't be needed. Your psychic projection is extremely strong. Even now, I can clearly sense that... That what? That you're deeply troubled. Well... In a way, I, I am all upset, like. But, uh, you see, sir, it's a private matter, and... Uh, of course, of course. Uh, may I suggest that you relax as much as possible? Any undue tension disturbs and obfuscates your aura. And in order to obtain closer contact with your psyche, I'd like to hold some personal possession. Oh, no, 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 not your brooch. No personal jewelry. Its intrinsically counteractive density tends to abdumbrate the necessary metaphysic radiation. It does? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, perhaps something in your purse, hmm? I see. That's another gambit in the little game I play. By leaning back and half-closing my eyes, I can watch the mirror and see the contents of an open purse. In hers, I saw a roll of stamps, a shabby wallet, a half-eaten candy bar... A postmarked envelope addressed to Miss Lily, Lily something or other. A folded, neatly folded sheet of tissue paper, violet colored, wrapped around a length of gift wrapping cord, interwoven strands of green and gold, hairpin, a compact. Will this do? Uh, your compact. Excellent, excellent. Now, to sense the vibrations. Your name. Your name... You are named for a flower. Yes, a lily. Oh, well, I never... You have a fondness for candy, a sweet tooth. Oh, I know. I did awful. Your present life is bound up with a person of great wealth. I think a woman. <gasps> it's the truth, everywhere. You have a highly sensitive anima and are therefore a most sympathetic subject. You are an excellent seamstress and... Uh, and that, madam, concludes the general reading. Oh, is that all? Well, I could go deeper, much deeper, with a special delineation for an additional 50 cents. Uh, shall I continue? All right. Uh, I, uh, I guess you might as well. Excellent, excellent. Now, if you'll state your problem briefly. Oh, do I have to? I should think you'd already know. I see Madam finds it necessary to test me further. Very well. Well, now, I seem to see paper, tissue paper. What a strange color. Almost orchid. Orchid-colored paper and something else. Two colors interwoven, green and gold. Green and gold. Ooh. Have I mentioned something which frightens you? 
Oh, well, now you should have sufficient proof of my powers. And since my time is limited, I suggest you tell me the rest of the details. Hmm? Well, it's about my miss... My sister. My sister and her husband. You see, sir, I, I've just found out that he's deceiving her like, and I'm the only one that knows. Uh, the eternal triangle. Oh, no, it's nothing like that. Oh? That's why I, I don't rightly know what to do. The funny thing is that what he's doing to deceive her is making her happy. Now, my problem is, should I tell my sister or should I let well enough alone? I see, I see, I see. You are entangled, madam, in a most unusual psychic web. Now, uh, one moment, one moment. There are widely differentiated karmas here. Two paths lie before you. I see you taking one and then the other, but it makes no difference which you follow. For whatever you do, the result will be the same. And there now, I, I trust your mind has been set at rest, huh? You mean that's all, sir? Apparently all that fate intends you to know, at least for the present. Well, if you say so. That will be one dollar and a half. Oh. I'd forgotten all about the mousy little woman until three days later. Abby and I were having breakfast in the diner near the subway station. I was scanning the morning paper while I half listened to Abby's cheerful and rather uh, witless you know, this time chatter. Last year we was already in Miami Beach. Remember, boys? Mm. We traveled in style, but mm. man, yet. Yeah, this year looks like we won't even scrape up enough scratch for a bus fare. Sure be a laugh if we were stuck here all winter. Oh, Lily Morton. <laughs> I thought her last name began with an M. Poor wench that same night. What you talking about? And the old friend, despair not. We may winter in the sun after all. How come? Look at this picture. Recall that face? Huh? No, why? Three nights ago on Friday, you ushered her into the studio. Oh, one of the suckers, huh? So what's she done to get in the paper? She got herself murdered, poor soul, that same night. Yeah? It seems she worked as a maid up in Rockland County. She took a late bus back there from New York, and walking from the bus to the house where she worked, well, she encountered someone who strangled her. Oh, it's tough. But how does that make us any dog? Listen to this. Gloria Druce, former luminary of the New York stage, now Mrs. Clinton de Vries, today expressed great sorrow over the brutal murder of her personal maid, Lily Morton. Declaring that she wanted to do everything possible to help bring the murderer to justice, Miss Truth said she was posting a reward of $5,000. Five grand? And you know who done it? No, no, but I have a hunch. And I have an idea how, uh... uh let me see now. I need proper clothes, cutaways, striped trousers. For you, a uh, chauffeur's cap should suffice. And we need a car, a limousine. A which? Abby, how much money do you have? For what? Working capital. To make money, you have to spend money. I've got about 28 bucks and some chicken feed. And I have less than five. I have it. My two $50 gold pieces. With them, we'll have a total You of... ain't gonna spend them. You always said they was for good luck. Uh, so I did, Abby. And here is the good luck I've been waiting for. That afternoon, we arranged to rent a limousine, a 1938 Rolls, which I felt exactly suited my persona. We also rented the necessary clothes, and the next day we set out to visit Mrs. Clinton de Vries, named Gloria Drew. Uh, what's the name of the place? Leonard's Cove. You'll see the sign. Oh, gotcha. You know, I never even heard of this name, Gloria Drew. Never heard of her, the greatest Juliet of our century, the theater's fairest ornament for more than a generation. I noticed you had a look around. Merely to refresh my recollection. After all, she's been in retirement for more than ten years. Oh, then she couldn't be any spring chicken. A woman like Gloria Druce is ageless. But it's my guess she's on the dark side of 50. Now, look, Abby, while I'm talking to her, I wish you'd somehow manage to get inside the house. Get acquainted with the servant. Well, huh? Sure, it'll be a cinch. Uh, what should I find out? Anything and everything, but your main assignment is... Mr. Clinton de Vries. Dr. Alcazar, is Mrs. de Vries expecting you? No, unfortunately, I was... Who is it, Edward? A Dr. Alcazar, madam. Alcazar? I don't believe I knew... Madam, forgive me for taking this liberty, but... He says it's about Miss Lily. Lily? Oh, come into the library, doctor. Uh, Thank you, thank you. Ay, what a charming room. A perfect setting for you, Miss Truth. I beg your pardon, uh, Mrs. DeVries. Oh, don't apologize. I like it when people remember. Oh, 
Now, what is this about Lily? If you have any information, shouldn't you have gone to the police? Oh, but I've come here seeking information from you. Uh, perhaps you'll let me explain. Oh, please do. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. Now then, you see, Mrs. De Vries, I'm a metaphysician, a sort of professor of the occult. Oh. But understand, madam, I have never used my powers or knowledge for personal financial gain, only in the interests of science. What has all this to do with Lily? Well, recently, about ten days ago, I was engaged in a simple experiment with my crystal ball, in the course of which I encountered a very unusual interruption of the comic stream. A total picture of a woman in distress, a woman in dire danger, seeking help. At the time, I made a full notation of the occurrence and then put the matter from my mind until yesterday. Yes? At the home of friends in Baltimore, I chanced to look at a New York newspaper. Lily Morton's photograph caught my eye. And you think it was Lily you saw in the crystal? That is the question, Miss Truce, which has brought me all these miles to see you. Why, this is fascinating. Please, if you will permit me, I'd like to describe the face I saw. Yes, please go ahead. I saw a woman, part of her form, but dimly. But I saw her features very clearly. A rather plain, almost homely face. Welch, perhaps English. Colorless hair, plainly dressed. Close-set gray eyes, no makeup. A mole here near the right ear. One gold cap tooth. Upper left incisor. Yes. Yes, it is Lily. You're quite sure? Oh, yes. There can't be any doubt. <sighs> well, Miss Deuce, you have set my mind at rest. I, I can't thank you. And I... Oh, you're not leaving. I mean, aren't you going to try to find out more? I uh, don't think I understand. Well, the Doctor, in these few minutes, you have convinced me completely. I'm greatly honored. And I was thinking... Suppose you try to get in touch with Lily, wherever she is, or, or isn't that possible? Well, of course, I have often received messages from the beyond, but... Then, but... then you could find out who killed her. Oh, but, madam, don't you think the police... The police, they haven't found a single clue. Oh, won't you please try? Well, it's a challenge. Though I must warn you, it's not likely to succeed. Nothing. The crystal is entirely blank. I'm wasting your time, dear lady. Oh, please. Don't give up yet. Well, as you wish. Ah, here is something. It, it's clouding. Now the mists are clearing. A woman's figure? No. No, it's gone. All I see is a serpent. No. No, apparently it's a rope, but oddly colored, interwoven strands of green and gold. The colors of the rope are, are vivid against a background of violet. It's a peculiar shade of violet. Oh. It looks... Oh, but the light's fading. The mists are closing in. Oh, sorry. The image is gone. I'm truly sorry. I think we're being misled. You mean because what you saw hadn't anything to do with Lily? Exactly. No, it wasn't about Lily. It was about me. You? Yes. Just a minute. Doctor, is this the same shade of violet? Yes. Yes, this is what I saw. The same violet tissue paper and this interwoven green and gold string. But why? It was such a powerful image. Has this any emotional meaning, Mr. Debris? Well, yes, it has. It has to do with George. So that's your husband's name? Oh, no, no. George is an old admirer of mine. Of Gloria Drews. Not Gloria De Vries. I've never seen him. I don't know his real name. We just call him George. And this paper and string is what he always wraps his presents in. An old admirer who sends you presents. It's most romantic. Isn't it? There's no note with his gift. No, no address, nothing. Except in the very first one. That was nearly two years ago. He enclosed an old theater program from The Green and the Gold. Ah, The Green and the Gold. Oh, remember. <laughs> oh, yes, I saw you in that. I'll never forget it. Well, that's how I know he's an admirer. You don't know what it means to an old actress, Doctor. To be remembered. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, what sort of gifts does he send? Oh, books. 
Perfume, odd little knickknacks. No candy? Oh, yes. Every third or fourth package, heavenly liqueur chocolate. Ah, yes, I'm sure they're delicious. But all this is keeping us from poor Lily. Won't you try again? No, not just now. I'm afraid it would be useless now, Mrs. DeVries. But if you like, I'll resume my efforts tonight. Alone. moment, we continue with Suspense. Do you like surprises? Do you like fun? And do you like to meet famous personalities? Then you're sure to like the Amos and Andy Music Hall. The Amos and Andy Music Hall, located in the grand ballroom of the Lodge of the Mystic Knights of the Sea, is presided over by three of your favorites, the Kingfish, Amos, and Andy. Every weekday evening, Monday through Friday, over most of these same CBS radio stations, They play host to you and to one or more of the top stars in show business, who's a featured surprise guest. People like Jack Benny, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Frank Sinatra, Doris Day, Judy Garland, Tony Martin, and lots of other exciting big-name stars drop in to join the fun, the variety, and the music at the Amos and Andy Music Hall. Why don't you drop in, too? Remember, the Amos and Andy Music Hall comes to you every weekday evening, Monday through Friday, over most of these same CBS radio stations. It's a treat for all the family. And now we continue with The Green and Gold String, starring Mr. Vincent Price. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was nearly six when Abby and I left the DeVries house and headed for a little restaurant in Nyack where the Shadro used to be excellent. <laughs> it still is. Well, now that you've satisfied the inner man, Abby, could I have a report? Well, I found out a lot about this DeVries guy from the servants, but I don't know if it helps. He's, he's around 40 to 45. Uh, considerably younger than his wife. Yeah, he's been married to her about five years. Uh, they rub along okay, but no hard throbs, at least not with him. Uh. But he likes polo ponies and sailboats, and she's got the dough. Ah, very good, Abby. Now, one or two questions. Hold it, I ain't finished. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Now, as to Sir Clinton's recent whereabouts, he's got his boat moored somewhere out on Long Island Sound. You see, she's got a beach house out there, and that's where he went morning of the day this lily was killed. And he's still there? Yeah, but he's due home tomorrow. It's time for dinner. Now, make with your questions. Abby, I haven't a one. You've really covered the ground. I'm proud of you. Well, then it's your time, brother. Seeing as we've spent nearly our last dime hoping to horn in on that five grand reward, I think you ought to fill me in. With pleasure, Abby. First, I know who killed Lily. Then let's spill it to the cops and collect. Not so fast. I found out something else. The same killers planning to kill again. I think soon. Lily was murdered only because of something she found out. Yeah? What? This man, this killer, has been sending presents to Mrs. DeVries. Book perfume, candy. Well, it's my guess that someday soon, the candy will be the death of her. And Lily Watts has found out who he is. Indubitably. And since the dame you're talking about is the DeVries dame, then I suppose you right. think... Right. The guy is the DeVries guy. Oh, well, Doc, it couldn't be. He was out on Long Island. Well, no, Abby, he was hiding, waiting for Lily Morton. Look, it was easy. He started out in the morning ostensibly for Long Island, but instead he hid his car and lay low. The whole day, he knew the shortcut Lily always took from the bus stop through the back of the estate. And that's where he killed her. Then he drove off to the beach house, where he was supposed to have been all day. And I suppose you got all that from your crystal ball. No, no, from Lily Morton a few hours before she was killed. No way, you're reaching, Doc. I told you I knew one thing the police don't know. Yeah, if it was this Clint, you said yourself you got no proof, and Lily ain't doing no talking now. Curse, Abby, to the point. You're getting better and better. So what do we do? Pick us a park bench, sit around getting corns, waiting for Mr. Clint George to send his frau a popsicle full of strychnine. <laughs> I don't think we'd have very long to wait. I think he's about ready to strike. But since our funds will only see us through another day at the most... You said a mouthful It's word. up to us to smoke him out. And I have an idea just how to do it. <laughs> Oh, good afternoon, Dr. Alcazar. 
Forgive me for bothering you at this time, dear lady, just when your husband's returned. Why, that's right. He has. But how did you know? Well, I have, shall we say, certain sources of information. You found out something? Yes, something startling, almost unbelievable. But I, I must check it further before... I... Oh, but I have to know. Can't you tell me? I, I'd rather not. Not on the telephone. Oh, then you come to dinner, please. Oh, no, no, no. That would be imposing. Nonsense. I've told Finnan all about you. Indeed? I warn you, he's a terrible skeptic. But you can convince him. I know you can. Sure, for a cognac, doctor? Well, yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. DeVries. Oh, now, Doctor, do tell me what's happened. I told Clinton about your seeing Lily and the crystal, and about the paper and string. Ah, that string, that green and gold string. Curious, you must admit, Mr. Debris. <clears throat> Very curious. Indeed, yes. And if I sounded excited when I phoned, I was. You see, Mr. S <laughs> Mrs. Debris, I, I've been at work on our problem, and suddenly I saw, or rather I sensed, that the tissue paper and the green and gold string were not part of your psychic stream. Whose, then? Lily Morton's. Lily's? But why? What could George mean to Lily? I believe he killed her. George? Why, that is the most preposterous idea. Uh, are you sure? And to be frank, no. But I'm convinced that one more evocation of the psychmantic waves will bring confirmation... Or the reverse. Oh, Doctor, then couldn't you do it here, tonight? Well, I could try, unless Mr. De Vries objects. No, go ahead. Matter of fact, I'd like to sit in. Excellent. I was hoping you would. Is the room dark enough? Quite, thank you. Oh, what nonsense. Clinton, don't fidget. Ah, uh, I hear is something. It's clouding. Yes. I can see the green and gold serpent on the violet background. And now I see a man. Is it George? I don't know. I can only see his back. His shoulders shake. And he is laughing an evil, malevolent laugh. George has done nothing evil. He's only... The picture is changing. Now I see this room. It is morning and there is a package on the desk. Wrapped in violet paper, a woman enters. It's you, Gloria. You see the package and you're delighted. Be careful, Gloria. You think this is a gift sent with love. But it is sent only to lull you into a false sense of security. Why? Why? Because one day, someday, a package will come that will spell your death. <coughs> Clinton. The image is changing. It's another room now and Lily Morton is there. She is staring in amazement at something she has found. A ball of green and gold string and a roll of violet tissue paper. And finding them has shown her the identity of George. She knew and never told me. Lily is troubled by her knowledge. She doesn't know what to do. She takes a sheet of the paper, a little coil of the string, and she is gone. And now the image of George again... Still, I, I cannot see his face, but he is staring after Lily. He knows she has discovered him. And he knows she might tell. Perhaps. But now we are in a place of shadows. George is lurking there, waiting. He hears Lily's footsteps. He tenses. He leaps at her and seizes her by the throat. Oh. Now she is motionless, lifeless. He bends down and finds her breath. Takes something from it with his gloved hand. The paper and the string. He's Stealing away. If only, only I could see his face. Try. You must try. Wait. At last. At last he is turning. We are going to see his face. He... That's enough. Stay where you are, both of you. Don't move. Clinton. You killed Lily. And you too, if you're not quiet. Your plan with the candy might have worked, Mr. DeVries. But with a gun, you don't have a chance. Shut up. Gloria, open the safe and take out the money you put there this morning. Come on, move. Oh, all right. Okay, DeVries, that'll do. Drop the gun. Hey, what? You... Oh! 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 I, uh, I'm sorry, lady, but it was him or me. Oh. Him or all of us. That was very terse, Abby. Completely to the point. 
you've really got a grasp for this kind of work. Emmy! Annie! Yeah, boss? Look what just arrived in the mail. Oh, oh. oh the dame, Gloria Drews. Has she sent us the five Gs? Take a look. Ten. Ten Gs. Doc, what are we going to do? Well, what do you suggest? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, we could split it and quit. Each of us do what we want. Have you? would let money break up our winning combination. But not me, Doc. Good. Then let's use our hard-gotten gains to set you and me up in business. Business? What kind of business? Alcazar Associates, private investigators. With you doing the legwork and me reading the crystal ball, we're a cinch to make a million. in The Green and Gold String, adapted by Sylvia Richards from a story by Philip MacDonald and produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Miss Nancy Kelly in Trial by Jury, another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Supporting Mr. Price in the green and gold string were Jeanette Nolan, Irene Tedrow, Lou Krugman, Byron Kane, and Ben Wright. Ever hear of the Vandals, that group of savages who bucketed around over most of Europe, destroying everything that was beautiful? According to history, they lived and did their damage over 1,400 years ago. But sometimes one wonders if the Vandals really died out. Certainly there's a group roaming America, especially during the outdoor months, that acts like the Vandals of old. You've seen their work. They're the ones who make sure our picnic spots and roadsides are littered with sandwich wrappings, pop bottles, and beer cans. It's carelessness, not viciousness, that prompts their destructive behavior. Could be that you yourself have been careless in that fashion once or twice. Now, make a vow against it. Do your part to help keep America beautiful. Hear America's favorite shows on the CBS Radio Network. of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. It is a principle of law that a man cannot be charged, convicted, and sentenced twice for the same crime. But there is no law in the books that says a man cannot murder his wife over and over again in his fantasy. For a man of sufficient imagination, repetitive oxoricide can indeed become a pleasant way of bringing time to a stop as Vincent Price accomplishes it in present tense, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. wheels away, and the hills beyond below the stars are black and sharp, dead hills, dark sky, cold steel below my feet, cold as the face of the officer at my side, cold as the cuffs which link my arm to his, which join us on this journey to the prison where I die. Want a cigarette? No. 
Go on, take one. No, I don't smoke cigarettes. Okay. Has this happened to you before? What? Being handcuffed to a murderer. Has it happened to you before? Sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yep. You're not the special, brother. Lots of guys axe their wives. Lots of them. I could have escaped after I killed her, but I... I didn't. Now it's too late. 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 Never too late. Never too late. Too late. Too late. Escape. Escape. If the train were to be wrecked, if the detective were to be killed, late. Late. The sweet escape. The light escape. The crash escape. No. Oh, no. Oh, oh, the darkness. Where am I? The, the cars must have gone down the gully. No light. And those people in pain. And this thing fastened to my wrist. Oh, we must have gone halfway through the glass door. Keep back. Keep back from his blood. Uh, I, I, I don't seem to be hurt. No broken bones. Escape. Now the key in his pocket in his bloody pocket and the cuffs are off his gun and the wallet his face his face is gone his own mother would know him I'm free fire fuel oil I must get away here now my ring onto his finger and that completes it <laughs> Bus number 63 from Bakersfield now arriving. Please claim your luggage at the curb. Bus number 14. Taxi, from San Mr. Diego now yes, arriving. yes. Please claim your luggage. Where to? Up Beverly Glen above Sunset. I'll, I'll show you where. Gotcha. Hey, you read about a big train wreck? Yes. Understand almost a hundred were killed. home. It looks so small, so shabby. No one took care of it during the trial. No one cared. No one. No one cares now. But that's good. I like that. I'll be alone and I won't let the neighbors see me and I'll sleep and figure out where I go next. The lights are on. Someone is there. Hey, this lake, huh? <laughs> The whole thing was so slick. <laughs> You'll always be the brains for both of us, won't you, honey, huh? Always. No, no, it can't be. She's dead. I know she's dead. I killed her. Want another bottle of beer, honey, huh? Yeah, sure. Is it cold? You bet it's cold, honey. <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> you said a mouthful there. Mm, that husband of mine was never able like this. Well, it takes a man, baby. All he would do was sit around and write those poems all the time. We framed it so good that he even thought he killed you. Hmm. What was that? I, I heard a noise. <laughs> Mice. <laughs> You're funny. You know that? Real funny. Open the kitchen door so quietly and walk softly. Here on the wall by the stove... The cleaver. Honest, I hear something. Uh, you're nervous. Yeah. Relax just a little bit more. I see them now. It is she. How did they do it? How did they trick me into imagining the murder? I, I am innocent. Sweet meats. That's what you are. Sweet meats. Mm, lover man. The pig in his dirty undershirt. Soft, weak, white neck. Fat on his arms. Pig. Grip the cleaver and walk like a feather. He shall be the first. Soft, white neck. I... Honestly, I hear some... What's the matter, sweet meats? What's it? <coughs> you killed him! Yes. And now you... No! I was innocent. And I thought myself guilty. And now I am truly guilty. And never in my life have I felt so innocent. When I 
like a dream, like a nightmare, the confession, the conviction, the sentence. And now once more, dark night, cold steel, the sound of wheels, just as I lived it before. Why, even the cold face of the silent officer at my side, hard, cold face, so much like that other face. Want a cigarette? No. Go on, take one. No, I don't use them. Okay. Has this happened to you before? What? Being handcuffed to a murderer? Has it happened to you before? Oh, sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yep. You're nothing special, brother. Lots of guys axe their wives. Lots of them. But were you ever cuffed to an axe murderer who killed two people, two people at once? What are you talking about? My sin, my crime, what I did, I, I killed them both. Them? Oh, take it easy, brother. You only killed your wife. Just her, just one, that's all. <laughs> In a moment, we continue with William N. Robeson's production of Suspense. Looking for a new lease on life? Never mind the legal language, just tune in on the happy things that happen six times a week on the Amos and Andy Music Hall. New and old song favorites say cheerful things with music. Remember, the fun is on the house every Monday through Friday evening and each Saturday in the daytime. When the Amos and Andy Music Hall comes your way. We continue with Present Tense, starring Mr. Vincent Price. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. It had been raining for some days now. And beyond the barred window, the leaden sky bleeds sorrow on the barren land. The lonely land. The land beyond the prison wall. The sky was blue when first I came here. Blue. So blue. And now it has become as the walls of my cell, of all our cells. Dark, cheerless cells. These lifeless cells. These cells of men who wait to die. That wet sky, gray sky, cheerless Sky. Ah, but it is beautiful. I have 12 hours left of life. 12 hours left to live. Beautiful sky, beautiful, beautiful. Wet and fresh and alive. Oh, rather would I spend eternity at the bottom of a well with but one patch of that to gaze upon than leave this life, than leave this earth, than leave this sky. Leave it, I must. The guard told me no man has ever escaped San Quentin's death row. Blocks and bars, guards and guns lie between me and the world beyond. No escape, not from here. But wouldn't it be nobler to gamble my life in bold attempt than lay it down in reckless resignation, eh? So, now to get out of this super-guarded area... Oh, 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 guard, guard, oh. Hey, guard, hey, pipe buddy. down, what's guard. wrong? Hey, what's the matter with you? Guard, my gut, my gut, here, here, it's killing me. I'll call a medic. <laughs> now, uh, as I press, you tell me where it hurts. <coughs> Everywhere, Doc, it, oh, all over down here, the air. Oh, oh, don't touch that place again, no. Call the ambulance. <laughs> This man's got appendicitis. Oh, do something, please. Hey, do hey, something. what do I do? Why didn't they send somebody with you? Well, the interns are all tied up. Shots today. Oh, look, he's oh. acting kind of crazy. Let's get him over to the hospital in a hurry. I can't drive any faster than my windshield steam. So wipe it. You got a rag? Uh, look, here. You can use my handkerchief. <coughs> hey, what's going on back there? Your pal's out cold. And I've got his gun now. So keep right on driving or the top of your head comes off. You won't get away with this. I will. I'm betting my life that I will. How far back is the prison? Oh, about, oh, 15 miles, at least that. Okay, pull over. Okay. I'm taking her from here. And you, I want your money and your clothes. 
And then you can take your pal back and explain about me. They won't find that ambulance for days, not at the bottom of that canyon. And now, I cross the border on foot and into Mexico. A little card bought in a back room with no questions asked, and I became a tourist. Four days' growth of beard, and I became poor. An empty suitcase with a butterfly net strapped to its outside, and I became a source of merriment, a, a funny, dumb gringo. And who looks with suspicion on the funny, dumb gringo tourist who is poor? Mexico City is beautiful, but not when you're hungry. Not when you are an American who is hungry. Americans aren't supposed to be hungry, but what can I do? All I know is writing, the writing of poetry. There, there is one place I might sell some poems. Harlan, his magazine, prints some English stuff. Perhaps, well, well, why not? I have three pesos left. Buy some paper or pencil, sit in the park, write, and storm the bastions. <laughs> Yeah, good, sehr good. Do you, do you like them, Mr. Pollen? Well, excuse me, Lucita. Si, sí, Pollen. I have some poems here. Let me see. The river dappled, dreaming droppled, fester passion of my soul. Mm, muy bonito, muy bonito. Yeah, yeah. Just what I thought. Oh, you are too kind. The poet should read his own word. Oh, <laughs> well, that drips, sweet droplets, passions, goblets, fates thy own. Lucita likes your stuff. A rare woman. And I like what Lucita likes. Aha. She says we do a book of your stuff. Oh? So here's... An advance. Too much. Take it. When the book. Thirty days. Right. Got the poems? I'll get them. Your name is... Smith. No good. Two doubts. So true. I'll make a new one. Please do. And so... Good day, and I'll be back... In thirty days. With the poems. America. Miles below. The bleak brown mountains. The desert yellow and red. My own mystic land. My advance money went for new clothing and a round-trip plane ticket to Los Angeles and my new lease on life. In a small file under the eaves of the little house in Beverly Glen, there are poems. More than a thousand of them. Poems which no one has ever seen. Poems written in the evenings after work on Sundays. And now, with the beard and the hat and the glasses, no one will recognize me. <laughs> a cane. Yes, I ought to carry a cane, too. Get the poems. Does someone live there in the house? Has someone bought it? No matter. Get the poems and then get back to Mexico City. Hmm. Someone is living here. I wonder who? The hedge is trimmed and my hammock. Somebody's put a new canvas cover on it. Get it yourself, baby. I'm shaving. Oh, all right. Yes? Oh, no. No, it can't be. Well, what do you want? It's Mary, but I... I... I thought I... I, I killed her. Who is it, baby? What is it, mister? What do you want here? I... Are you the lady of the house? Huh? Who's that at the door? Some creep with a beard. Yes, I'm the lady of the house, but I don't want to buy nothing. Huh. Well, what is it, Santa? What do you want? Are you the man of the house? Yeah, I'm the man of the house. That's sweet, Miss. I'll say. So, what of it? Well, I'm making a survey. I'd like to ask a few questions. May I come in? I don't know. I'll let him. What's the difference? Thank you. Mm. Well, first, your name. My name? Yes, please. Uh, Fred Sneed. Where's he going? Mister, what do you want in my kitchen? The cleaver, Mary. Don't you know me? Mary? Hey, who are you, mister? Look close, Mary. Oh! The cleaver. Put it down. You know me? No. Know the man you tricked into uh, San Quentin? No, don't. Put down it. 
You killed him. Yes. And now you... No! Confession, conviction, sentence, transportation, and again, again the death house, as before. But when I came here, they promised I could keep the beard. They promised I could keep the beard. And it's gone. Gone. I, I can't remember when. What's that? Who's coming? Ready? Ready. It's time to go, my son. Time to go? You've refused my help up to now. But perhaps you'd like to walk with me. Rather beside you, Padre, than beside one of these mercenaries. My... my legs. The muscles quiver. Not with fear, no. But with the desire to feel themselves moving, straining, acting, while yet there is time... I am not afraid, but this body, I hate the thought of its being killed by these men. My beautiful body, soon it will be dead, cold, rotting, dead. It will rot. No. No, they must not do this to me. You must be brave, my son. My body? Years I spent with the great corporeal master, the yogi. Learning my bodily purpose, my bodily care, the use of willpower to control my body. The yogi, my teacher. Yes, yes, I shall use yoga. Suspend my breathing and become invulnerable to their gas. Suspend my body functions to the point of death and fool their doctor. Of course, oh yes, the greatest escape of them all. And this time I must succeed. All right, here we are. The room is so small. Somehow I had imagined it would be larger. And here is the chair. All right, now yes, just sit down. straps, hood, and over now, there, your arms along the these. glass. Small pane with the dark faces seen dimly yeah, through. The witnesses. There. The whole room is like some strange yeah, sort of time machine. Yeah, like that. Machine for oh, launching really? a man into another dimension. Yeah. <laughs> and so true. I'd best begin to prepare myself. There we are. Relax. Must relax. It won't be easy. Have you any last words, my son? Yes. Yes, one request. Do not allow my beautiful body to be dissected or embalmed. But on the third day after my death, cremate it. That will be arranged as you desire. Thank you. And God be with you, my son. Remember what Jesus Christ said to the two criminals. In this day shalt thou be with me. Oh, move in your head heaven. forward a little while I pull the hood down. There. Now, uh, when you hear the pellets drop into the acid, don't try any tricks. Just breathe deeply, see? The fumes don't hurt, you see? Uh, cooperate with us. Make it easy on yourself, kid. Know what I mean? So dark here under the hood. Now, the last breath. As the yogi taught me. <sighs> and the lungs hold it. Body limp, all muscles, tendons, joints. Relax all, slow the bloodstream, lock the breath. Hold, hold. Slow, slow, hold. Suspend all bodily functions, hold. Fix the eye in, suspended animation gently. Fix the mind on time. Ease the beating of my heart. Time is a picture on the screen of my mind. Slower, slower. My perception is slower. The time seems to spin by now. Go slow, my heart. The ventilators go on, clearing the air of the poisonous fumes. Now the doctor will come with his stethoscope. I will my limbs to stiffness, my flesh to coldness. It's clear, doctor. You can go in now. Well, let's see now. Respiration has ceased. Heart has stopped. <clears throat> by the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. 
I will myself to consciousness in six hours' time. Uh, where am I? It's dark here and cold. So cold. Uh, I must get up and see. Oh, the prison morgue. It worked. But I'm, I'm cold. I'm so cold. What's this on my toe? Tag? It's too dark to read it, but I know what it says. It has my name, prison number, time of execution. Yes. And now, to look around. Because the next step must be played just right. This should be it. A coffin crate ready for shipping. Some cadaver being returned to a sentimental family. Well... That ought to be just right. <laughs> and with him on my slab, my tag on his toe, and the most perfect escape of all time underway, here we go. I will my body to return from its state of suspended animation and to come immediately out of trance when next this coffin shall be opened. <laughs> funeral parlor. <laughs> Poor fellow. <laughs> Must have a bad heart. <clears throat> Let's see. No, it's going. Well, let's hope he's out for a while. This must be the workroom. Light hanging over the work table and there a... a locker. Ah, with a suit. Fine. And here in the desk might there not be some sort of... Yes, here. A petty cash box. And it's quite full the old boy apparently doesn't believe in banks. <laughs> and now, now that Lazarus has returned from the dead, this newspaper dateline, I was executed four days ago, and now I find myself resurrected in Indianapolis, Indiana. Los Angeles, California. This is Los Angeles. You can claim your baggage in the station or on the platform. I've returned to my home. A beautiful time to return home. My old hammock is there. My flowers, my yard. <laughs> the house is empty. The lawyer said he'd had it cleaned up. My books, my pictures. Here... <laughs> My old pipe, I, I haven't smoked it in years. Mary didn't like it. But now she's gone. I don't hate her anymore. Tobacco's still fairly fresh. Fill the pipe. <laughs> There's that detective story I never got to finish. Now I'll have time. Now I'll have lots of time. Time to smoke and read and write and rest. Sun's almost down. Twilight. Wonderful time to get outside. Cool, sweet air. Wonder what kind of birds those are. My hammock. Oh, so nice. <laughs> Light the pipe. Oh, and relax. Wish I could remember what page I was on. <laughs> but no matter. I can begin again. I've got all the time in the world the rest of my life. The birds, the sun is slipping out of sight, death of the sun. How red the sky, how soft those clouds, so lovely, so lovely. What's that? Oh, birds playing in the fish pond, look at them, happy birds. That hissing. Oh, the man next door is turning on his lawn sprinkling system. Lie here and smell the cool air. Evening coming on, the sky grows darker. Lie in the gathering twilight. Death of the day, birth of the night. Sweet softness of the summer night coming. Soon the stars. Oh, it's lovely. Heavenly. <laughs> 
just like heaven. Lie and swing to and fro, to and fro. Heavenly, heavenly. By the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. Suspense. In which Mr. Vincent Price starred in William N. Robeson's production of Present Tense by James Poe. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Raymond Burr in the Peralta map. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Supporting Mr. Price in present tense were Ellen Morgan, Peg LaCentra, Jack Crucian, Dawes Butler, Joe DeSantis, Charles Rodelak, and Sam Pierce. Original score composed and conducted by Amerigo Marino. CBS Radio is sure you'll agree it's as important for a young man to find the right niche in his military career as it is for him to choose the right college or trade school course. To make it easier for any young man to decide which choice will fit in best with his abilities and goals, a free booklet has been prepared. It's obtainable on request. The title of the booklet is It's Your Choice. All you need to do to obtain your copy is write to It's Your Choice, Washington 25, D.C. Why not send for your copy today? Theater brings you Gene Tierney and Vincent Price in Dragon Wick. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If I should offer any one of you a kingdom, I'm sure you'd accept it. And that's how a certain section of our country was settled. Under Dutch rule in the 1600s, wealthy Hollanders were offered vast estates along the Hudson River as an inducement to come to America. Over these land grants, or patroon ships, as they were called, the patroons had absolute authority, and many of them ruled until the middle of the 19th century, a unique phase of Americana that forms the background of tonight's play. 20th century's Fox screen hit, Dragonwick. We are happy to have the fine stars of the picture, Jean Tierney in one of her greatest dramatic roles, and Vincent Price in the part that raised him to well-deserved stardom. On to our play, Act One of Dragonwick, starring Jean Tierney as Miranda and Vincent Price as Nicholas Van Ryan, with Gail Gordon as Dr. Jeff Turner. <laughs> New York City, 1844. In a suite at the ultra-fashionable Astor House, Elfram Wells and his daughter await the arrival of a man they've never met. Oh, I never had such a dinner in my life, Pa. Imagine Mr. Van Ryan ordering all that food just for us. Wasteful extravagance is what it is. And how did he know what I wanted to eat? But there was everything you could possibly want. Everything is what no man should ever want, Miranda. Yes, Pa. We'll drink our coffee later. 
And renting these rooms for us. I just don't understand such a man as Nicholas Van Ryn. But what is there to understand? He wrote to us inviting me to live with his family at Dragonwick. After all, we are related. So distantly as to matter not at all. We've never even met him. Then why do you feel so suspicious, Pa? Because the wealthy affect an elegance that is against the word of God. Because he is a patroon. I'm a Yankee farmer, and we're as good and maybe better than any Dutchman on the Hudson River. Oh, of course, Pa. But there's no harm in my being a companion to his little daughter if he and his wife so wish it. I gave you my consent, however foolishly. And you're going to Dragonwick. I want you to read with me, Miranda. Hand me my Bible. Yes, Pa. I will sing with mercy and, and judgment, judgment unto, unto thee. thee o oh Lord, Lord, will I sing. I will walk, walk with... with I will, I will walk, walk within, within my house, house with, with a perfect, perfect heart. heart. I will set no, no wicked, wicked things before my eyes. eyes. I, I will, will not know a wicked person. I, uh, I had no wish to interrupt. I am Nicholas Van Ryn. Please continue. Him that hath a proud look will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall, shall be upon the faithful, faithful of the land. land. But, but he that worketh deceit shall not tarry in my heart. Cousin Miranda, more coffee? No, thank you. You, sir? No, thanks. Mr. Van Ryn? Sir? I don't know what made me think you'd be a much older man. Does that affect your confidence in me, sir? Alexander the Great, when he was younger than I, had conquered most of the world. Maybe if he'd been a little older, he'd have conquered all of it. What are your politics? For Van Buren, I suppose. Van Buren is an old friend of mine. Naturally, if he's nominated, my farmers will vote for him. Your farmers? Yes, the tenant farmers on my land. Tenant farmers? You mean they don't own their own land? The land has belonged to the Van Rynes since 1630. I permit the farmers to work it. In return, they pay me tribute and a share of their produce. But they can buy the land if they want it. No, they cannot. Why? Because it belongs to me. I'd rather own one half acre of barren rock than work the richest land in the world for someone else. I dare say we don't understand each other's viewpoint. I dare say. Cousin Nicholas, that music, is that what they call the waltz? It sounds very much like one. Do you dance the waltz? Yes, Cousin Miranda, uh, but never in public places. Oh. It's time for bed, Miranda. Don't forget your prayers. I won't, Pa. Good night. Good night, Cousin Nixon. I'll be here in the morning at 8 o'clock. The steamboat sails at 9. At this time tomorrow, you'll be in Dragonwick. Yes, Mr. Van Ryan. Oh, uh... Yes? <laughs> Cousin Miranda, on occasion we dance the waltz at Dragonwick. Good night. Mm -hmm. Dragonwick. Oh, golly. It's like a great castle. All alone on a mountain. Oh, how can you sit there so quietly? But why not? I should think that seeing Dragonwick would be more thrilling to you than to anyone. Nothing could be thrilling that is shared with so many other people. Oh, tell me about Dragonwick. How many rooms are there? I've never counted them. And lots of servants. <laughs> I've never counted them either. Oh, your bonnet. Do you mind if I keep it off just a moment? The breeze feels so wonderful against my face. The breeze must feel very wonderful indeed with a face as beautiful as yours against it. Uh, come, Cousin Miranda, I'd better see about your luggage. And this, Johanna, this is Cousin Miranda. Cousin Miranda, my wife. Oh, welcome to Dragonwick, child. It, it's most kind of you to let me come, Cousin Johanna. Katrine is in bed? Yes, Nicholas. She's asleep. Then your meeting with my daughter will have to wait until the morning. Shall, shall I retire now? Not unless you wish to. Oh, I don't wish to. I mean, well, I'd love so to see all of Dragonwick. I'm afraid, dear, that would take more than one evening. And more than that, too. Still, there's no reason why Cousin Miranda should not make a start. No, Nicholas, no. I only Now, this that... room over here, for example. Do you like it? Oh. How beautiful. And a harpsichord. And that portrait on the wall. Who... Who is she? She was my great-grandmother, Azild. Azild? What a strange name. I don't know why we keep her hanging there. And that ugly old harpsichord. The servants have to be driven to dust it. 
You think it was going to bite them? Azild was from New Orleans. She and my great-grandfather were married there in 1743. This harpsichord was hers. If you'd listen to the servants, they'd have you believe she still plays it. Fortunately, we don't listen to the servants. Oh, no, of course not. I... I... Isn't it rather late, Nicholas? If you wish to retire, my dear. Yes, I think I, I will. Well, good night, then. Good night, Johanna. Good night, cousin dear. Cousin Miranda, do you think you will be happy here? Oh, what a question to ask. You won't be homesick? A little, I'm sure. But that doesn't... And there is no one else at home? A, a young man, perhaps? No, cousin Nicholas. No young man. I'm... Well, it is getting late, and you've had an exhausting day. I'll have the housekeeper show you to your room. Her name is Magda. Good night, Miranda. Good night, cousin Nicholas. You're ready, Miss Wales? I'll show you upstairs. You're Magda? Yes, miss. This room, it's lovely, isn't it? It's called the Red Room. Was she very young, Magda? Who, miss? The lady in the portrait. About your age. Mistress of Dragonwick. How proud she must have been. He never loved her. He only wanted their son. He broke her heart and drove her to... What were you going to say? Only what's been told for all these years. That she prayed for disaster to come to the Van Rines and swore that when it came, she'd always be here to sing and play. She killed herself in this room, miss. Oh, that's just kitchen gossip. I'm sure it is. Oh, you mustn't take me seriously. No one ever does. Shall we go up now? Thank you. Of course. I've never heard a zeal play. You won't hear her either. Because you have no Van Ryn blood. But he'll hear her, the master. And so will the child, Katrine. This is your room, miss. I've lit candles. Thank you. Miss Wells, why have you come to Dragonwick? Do you think Katrine is in need of a companion? Why, I... Uh... That would be for her mother and father to decide. Don't you think Katrina's in need of a mother and father? That was a silly question, wasn't it? Do you like it here? Of course I do. Of course you do. But one day you'll wish with all your heart and soul that you never came to Dragonwick. Good night, Miss Wells. Well, Kathleen, that's enough studying for today. Just think, it's three whole weeks I've been here. I'm glad you're my teacher. I'm glad too, dear. Papa's kind of like a teacher to you, isn't he? He's been very kind and helpful, yes. What's he like? Your father? Does he like me? Katrine, your father and mother both love you very much. I don't love them, I only... Look, a carriage... That must be the de Grignier's. And the Count's such a funny-looking little man. A Count? Coming here? Oh, yes. By tomorrow, the house will be packed with people. Papa always has a Fourth of July ball for the river families after the farmers have their comets. A ball? Everyone will want to dance with you, Miranda. Oh, golly, I hope so, Catherine. But what did you say the farmers did? Kermes? What's that? It's like a carnival. And then in the afternoon... Pa sits in a chair under a tree, and the farmers bring him their tribute. I... I see. Miranda, we could go to the Kemet if we hide. But why must we hide? Papa doesn't want me to be seen with those people. Then we'll not go, of course. Oh, but it's so much fun, even just watching. They dance, they have games. We'll they... see, Catherine. Maybe if we just watch, well... Every year, Miranda, sometimes after Papa leaves, I stand in the carousel. We shouldn't have come. It's wrong to disobey. Hello, Katrine. Hello, Dr. Turner. Oh, I, I didn't know you were with someone. This is Miranda Wells. How do you do, Miss Wells? How do you do? Pa sent for her all the way to Connecticut to be my companion. Oh, whereabouts in Connecticut? Near Greenwich. But that's all farm country. Haven't you ever met anyone off a farm, Doctor? Not at Dragonwick, no. Well, this seems an odd sort of place to watch the commiss. We're not supposed to be here. We're hiding from Papa. Oh, I see. But don't worry, I'll keep your secret. Oh, uh, may I have the honor again, Miss Wells? Why, yes, if you like. You're sure it won't be too unpleasant? That's a very strange thing to say. I'm afraid it isn't. The patroon and I don't get along very well. In fact, the first thing I've ever known us to agree on is bringing you here. I think that was a fine idea. Oh, 
Why doesn't he like your father, Catherine? Because Papa doesn't like him either. Why not? Papa never says why not. But I think it's the... Oh, hide, Miranda, hide, they're coming. Who's coming? Papa, Papa and the Count de Grenier. They won't see it. I think we could even get closer, Catherine. But why? All the fun's going to stop now. When Papa comes, that's when they pay him the money. I, I still think that I'd like to see it. Well, all right then. Come this way, Miranda. I hope you won't find this too boring, the Grenier. <laughs> uh, shall I sit here next to you? Please do. Uh, that is a strange sort of chair you have, Nicholas. This chair came from Holland with the first patroon. It has stood in this one spot for over 200 years. All right, Dirk, I'm ready. Yes, my dear. The first man will come forward bringing rent and tribute. Klaus Plika, rent, winter wheat, and... You brought nothing with you? Nothing. Perhaps your crops were poor. My crops were good. Take your hat off when you speak to the patroon. I take my hat off to no man. What you do with your hat is your own concern. Are you ready to pay your rent? No. Now, will you ever again get so much as a grain of wheat from me? <laughs> now what, Nicholas? You seem very calm. Why shouldn't I be? It is your purpose, then, to farm my lands without making any returns? Your lands? Do you hear that? His lands! We've paid the worth of it many times over, and you know it. Well, here's the finish! In that case, I order you to leave my land by tomorrow noon. Have the next man step forward. Otto Gephardt! Mr. Van Ryan. Well, what brings you here, Dr. Turner? I'm here to ask you to reconsider your decision. Klaus Bleeker and his wife and children have no other home than the hill farm. Where will he take them? That, I would say, is Klaus Bleeker's concern. Gebhardt? Yes, man here. Empty-handed, too. Have you a reason? You know the reason. It's his birthright as a free citizen. These men are not alone. The anti-rent movement has swept the whole of New York State. Take your head out of the sand, Van Ryan, and help solve this problem peacefully. Because it's got to be solved peacefully or not. Well, speak up, Otto. I, I'll bring the rent and tribute tomorrow if... If that will suit. Tomorrow, then. Will the rest of you men step forward, please? I have something to say. No, man, no! I'm tired of listening and talking. I say an end to this here and now! Drop that knife, Bleeker! I'll kill him! I'll kill him! Bleeker, look kill. out! Who will Bleeker, you? Well, Dr. Turner, I... I suppose I must regard what you just did as an effort to save my life. Klaus lost his head. None of us means violence. Dirk, you will have Klaus Bleeker placed under arrest. As for you, doctor, I... I suppose I must thank you. If Klaus had killed you, it would have done these men infinitely more harm than you can ever do alive. Don't thank me. As you wish it. I shall say a few words about what has just happened, and they will be my last. Dr. Turner's efforts to incite anti-rent rebellion have been well known to me for many months now. Believe me, gentlemen, my welfare does not depend upon you. Rather, you depend upon it. But my rents and tributes and my responsibilities are hereditary the symbols of a way of life to which I have been born and in which I shall continue to live, I shall never relinquish my position. I will be here tomorrow, and so will you, with rent and tribute. Good day. All alone, Miranda? Yes, Nicholas. Are you enjoying the ball? I suppose everyone has commented on your gown and how beautiful you look. Not everyone. Do you like it, Nicholas? Very much. Do you think I'm beautiful? Yes, I do. Thank you. I'm very grateful. You haven't answered my question. Are you enjoying yourself? It's very interesting to watch. That's no answer. Well, then, no. Why not? You know that answer as well as I. Because I'm off a farm and because I don't speak French and because I don't belong here. That's nonsense. I'm as good as any of them. Better than most. But it's the wrong river. I'm not from the top of the Hudson, Nicholas. I'm from the Connecticut River bottom. They let me know that, those fine ladies I've tried to speak with. Oh, I've made such a fool of myself. Dance with me, Miranda. I can't go back in. They know what I am. By now everyone knows and they'll laugh at me. I doubt that very much. But you don't know what... I know that you'll be with me and that if anyone laughs, we'll laugh. Dance with me. Yes, Nicholas. They're looking at us, Miranda. They're watching us dance. And they're not laughing, are they? No, they're not laughing. Then I shall. Suddenly I feel like laughing. <laughs> this house could stand a little laughter. And a moment ago, I... I was afraid to dance with you. Afraid? Yes. You must never be afraid of anything with me, Miranda. I never will be, Nicholas. 
Never. Our stars, Gene Tierney and Vincent Price, will return in Act Two of Dragon Wick in just a moment. Here's your producer, William Keeley. Act Two of Dragon Wick, starring Gene Tierney as Miranda and Vincent Price as Nicholas Van Ryan. In the weeks that have passed, the wealth and abundance of Dragon Wick had been to Miranda Wells like a beautiful dream. But now a pall has fallen over Dragon Wick, for Nicholas's wife, Johanna, is ill. There's no thunder in the world, Johanna, like the thunder of the Catskills. The lightning seems to set the mountains on fire, and they roar back. That's all very romantic, I'm sure, but it doesn't help my cold. If I must stay in bed, why can't I have Dr. Hamilton to look after me? Why, you may, of course, as soon as the storm lets up and the roads are passable. Where's Miranda? She's with Katrine, reading to her. Come in. Uh, what is it, Magda? Excuse me, madame. Mein Herr van Rijn asked that this be brought to you, this plant. Why, Nicholas. Yes, Joanna. But your favorite plant, your Grinalda. Why should it brighten my hothouse if it could brighten your room, my dear? Nicholas. Oh, thank you, Nicholas. I, I can't remember when anything has pleased me more. And that will be all, Magda. Thank you. Yes, my dear. I know how you treasure it, Nicholas. And you, you sent it to me. Why, Joanna, you're smiling. How good to see you feeling better. Now I'm sure you'll want to rest. Nicholas, you're going to your tower room again? Yes, Why? The servants think it's strange that you spend so much time in... in a tower room. And I find it strange that you should bother about what servants think. But what could you possibly do up there? It might be anything, Joanna, from pinning butterflies to hiding an insane twin brother. Actually, I read. I hope that satisfies you. I'm sick. And you haven't even let Dr. Hamilton know. Well, your happiness over the Grinalda plant seems to have faded most rapidly. But you can't imagine what it's like to be sick in this miserable, drab house. I cannot imagine that Dragonwick could be miserable or drab except to those who reflect misery and drabness from within themselves. I will stop in and see you later, Johanna. Mein Herr. Yes? Dr. Turner has called. No one sent for a doctor. He says it's most urgent. My regrets to Dr. Turner. I cannot be disturbed. Yes, mein Herr. No. Magda, wait. I'll be glad to talk to Dr. I wouldn't have intruded, Mr. Van Ryn, were it not so important. Klaus Bleeker has been arrested for murder. Well, it's a pity you weren't there to stop him a second time, Dr. Turner. But I was there. He didn't kill anyone. There's been an anti-rent riot near Smoky Hollow. Oh, another rebellion, I see. Klaus wasn't anywhere near the man who was killed, but they blamed it on him. The farmers aren't going to stand for this. They've threatened to storm the jail. And just what do you want me to do? Help my enemy to defeat me? I want only your assurance that Bleeker will get a fair trial. Dr. Turner, whether Bleeker lives or dies is of no more concern to me than my life was to him or you. Good evening. Oh, Miranda. Come in, my dear. You see, in spite of the storm, we have a visitor. Dr. Turner. Good evening. Won't you stay for dinner, doctor? Miranda, have Tompkins set another plate. Uh, please, I'd rather not. Perhaps I've been a little hasty, doctor. I may be able to help you after all. You've changed your mind? Is John Van Buren to prosecute? Yes. We're close friends. I assure you that Klaus Blicker will have every consideration. Now you might do something for me. Well, if it's after all within reason... I don't I... think you'll find me extravagant. My wife is ill. A severe cold. Will you help her if you can? Forgive me. Of course I will. And you will stay for dinner? Thank you, Miss Wells. I... I'll be very happy to. And a lighter diet might help, Mrs. Van Ryn. Soup, boiled eggs, less pastry and sweets. That's nonsense. Dr. Hamilton always told me to stop a cold. I'll eat all I please. You'd get well faster without it, but you'll get well anyway. Oh, what a beautiful plant. Yes, it's a Grinalda, Doctor. Quite rare in this country. You, you're sure my wife will be all right? Just a head cold. Oh, you don't know how relieved I am. 
Now, if you and Miranda will wait dinner for me, I'll visit a little longer with Mrs. Van Ryan. Yes, yes, of course. Good night, Mrs. Van Ryan. You told him you wanted to visit with me. Of course I do, my dear. Oh, Nicholas, you confuse me so. Sometimes when you bring me flowers and smile at me, I think... What? That you like me, and, and sometimes... Yes? I feel that you hate me and would like me to die. Nicholas, Nicholas, could we go away together when I'm well again? Certainly, Joanna, as soon as you're well again. Oh, I feel well enough already. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm sure Dr. Turner would approve of your finishing your dinner. Shall I bring your cake? <laughs> Looks very tempting, a rum cake. Oh, yes, please. Here, my dear, enjoy it. being very silent, Dr. Turner. I was just thinking. You know, it's funny. The day we first met, I thought we'd have very much in common. But the way it's worked out, frankly, right now, I don't think you have the slightest idea what to talk to me about. Would you care for some sherry wine, Doctor? No. No, thank you. I believe I'll... Oh, forgive it. me for taking so long. We fell to reminiscing, Joanna and I. We should dine at once. This way, Doctor. The storm is still raging. Don't think of going back to the village, Doctor. You'll stay overnight. Oh, no, really, consider I have Consider all objections overruled. Of course you'll stay. She woke up in terrible pain. Oh, she's in such agony. Magda, what's the matter? It's Mrs. Van Ryan, miss. Oh, she was moaning so. Did she take any medicine but what I gave her? No, sir. You'd better send for Mr. Van Ryan. I already have. Here, here's her room, doctor. My poor mistress. My poor mistress. Mrs. Van Ryan. Mrs. Van Ryan. What is it? What's happened? Joanna. Mr. Van Ryan, I, I... Your wife is dead. Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner, what could have... I, I can't understand it. Are you sure she took nothing but those drops I left? Not while I was with her, sir. And except for Magda, no one was with her but myself. I, I gave her some cake. Acute gastritis. It's possible, but Is I... Is it I... also possible that she may have been more ill than you imagined? I'm afraid that's always a possibility. See that the pastor is notified at once. Yes, mine health. I'm sure he didn't mean that you were to blame. Whether he meant it or not, Miranda, I don't know why she died. And that's shameful. You... You'd better get some sleep. I thought I... Yes, Doctor. <laughs> Please, you must get some rest. Do you hear that bell, Miranda? I remember how it rang when Joanna and I were married. 
She said it was a heavenly bell that would ring for us until death. But we were never happy, Miranda. Never. Nicholas, you must... Oh, our life together was tolerable enough until Katrine was born. And then we knew that Joanna could have no more children. That there would be no more Van Rynes after me. That I would be the last. I wish I knew something that I could say that would help you. I want to so much. Nicholas, you must have faith. Yes, yes, I intend to. I, I must not feel that my life is finished, and I won't. As long as you are with me. The bell has stopped now. It must be nearly dawn. Miranda, you have known as well as I that we were inevitable. Out of all this world, why should you have come to me and no one else? You knew it the instant our eyes first met. And you know it now. You have no right to say that. To talk like this, please. Then tell me that I'm wrong. And forgive me if you can. No, I had no right to speak as I did. And you have every reason to be angry. But I had to say it. There was no way for me not to. And no one but you to hear it. Good night, Miranda. Good night, Nick. There. Whoa. Why are you stopping, driver? There's someone down the road, miss. Looks like Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner? Miranda, I, I just heard you're going away. Yes, Jeff. I'm going home to Greenwich. I, I think it's fine that you're going back to your folks. Well, what I meant is that well, Greenwich isn't so very far away, is it? Maybe I can come there and visit in, in a month or so? Of course. Whenever you're passing through, Jeff. Would next week? No, I, I guess that would be too soon. Well, I hadn't... Oh, uh... I, I know there's so much you don't know about me, Miranda, but I've always hoped that in time I could show you how I really felt, and maybe... Miranda, you... You know what I'm trying to say, don't you? Yes, Jeff, I think I do. I'd like to think that... That in time, I... I... Jeff! Is it that hopeless? I'm sorry. Have a good trip. Thank you. Bye, Miranda. Goodbye, Jeff. Miranda? Yes, Pa? How long is it since you came back home from Dragonwick? I don't know, Pa. Months. Yes, months. And something's been wrong with you ever since. Nothing's wrong. I promised your mother to get to the bottom of this, and I'm going to. I haven't seen you smile since the day you drove in here in that fancy carriage. You've been no more one of us than if you never came home at all. I'm sorry, Pa, if I've upset everyone. It's because your home's not fine enough now, because we're not fine enough. That's not true. It has nothing to do with that. Ephraim! We're in here, Ma. Oh, Ephraim, a message. It just came from the village. Who's it from? Well, I don't know. I didn't open it. See if you can talk some sense into her, Ma. I just can't. Oh, Miranda, dear, it's just that Pa loves you. We all love you, and it hurts us so to see you. I'll be you. concerned if this don't beat all. Well, what is it? Nicholas Van Ryan is in Greenwich. He's coming here this afternoon. Nicholas. He's here. On a matter of the greatest importance, he says. Oh, at last. At last. Eh? What in Tunket could he want? I don't know, Pa. I'm only hoping. Hoping. Bring you Act Three of Dragon Wick, starring Gene Tierney and Vincent Price in a moment. Back now to Mr. William Keeley. Act Three of Dragon Wick, starring Gene Tierney as Miranda and Vincent Price as Nicholas. They return to Dragon Wick a few weeks later. Nicholas Van Ryn and the gay and beautiful Miranda Wells, this time as man and wife. A month later, Nicholas went away on a business trip, but now he's back in the arms of his young and beautiful bride. 
Oh, Nicholas, you're home at last. Miranda, Miranda, I'd almost forgotten how lovely you were. I'm not when you're not with me. I'm not anything. You have missed me? Oh, terribly. Katrine, too. She's still in Boston, of course, with her aunt. She seems wonderfully happy from her letters. She wants to stay, go to school there with her cousin. An excellent decision. But, Nicholas... I'm very selfish, my darling. I want only you at Dragonwick. Only you. Oh, I... I beg your pardon. I, I didn't know... Oh, Peggy, this is Mr. Van Ryn. Was it anything important? Well, it was just to remind you they ate none of your breakfast this morning. Please, let's not talk of food. Well, you'll eat everybody your lunch, or there'll be quite a bit of talk. Tell me, Peggy, why do I ever put up with you? I don't know, ma'am, but you'll eat your lunch just the same. And who is that? <laughs> her name is Peggy O'Malley, Nicholas. I've, I've engaged her as my personal maid. Your maid? That untidy little creature? She's not untidy, Nicholas. And her lame leg's no fault of hers. She's had a miserable life. Well, that's the strangest recommendation I've ever heard. She's bright and willing and good to me. And, Nicholas, I I want her as my maid. I shall have Tompkins give her some extra money and a good character. It's so little to ask. Please, Nicholas. Deformed bodies depress me, Miranda. How dare you say that? How dare I? You speak as if her crippled leg were a weakness on her part rather than God's will. We'll agree, then, it is God's will. Now tell me the plans for the Kermes ball. Oh, I saw Madame Duclos in New York. She'll have your gown ready in plenty of time. I shan't need a new gown, Nicholas. Why not? Because we can't have a ball without people. Everyone is declining our invitation. It's because of me, Nicholas. Because you married me. Miranda, you are Mrs. Nicholas Van Ryn. You will be with me wherever I am, always. Yes, Tompkins? Luncheon is ready on the veranda, sir. Thank you. Nicholas. Yes? Sometimes, sometimes I think that your friends, that, that we... That we what? I think about the night, the night Joanna died. It was so soon after. Perhaps we should have waited to decide. In the hope that our gossip-mongering neighbors would be more approving? I don't care what they think, Nicholas. It's just that we know, and, and so does God. Miranda, I've never heard you speak so childishly before. Do you believe there's a God snooping on human behavior, punishing all violations of the pastor's latest sermon? I believe that God has put a sense of right and wrong within all of us, Nicholas. And that when we do wrong, no matter if no one else knows, we do. Yes, my dear. Now sit down. Luncheon looks delicious. Nicholas, you do believe in God. I believe in myself and I am answerable to myself. I will not live according to printed mottos like the directions on a medicine bottle. Would you like me to say grace? That won't be necessary. Then I shall mix the salad dressing. I... I can't stay here. I can't... Miranda! <laughs> Miranda! What possible excuse can you have for humiliating me before the servants? What is the matter with you? I believe in God. Which is your privilege? I have no intention of... And frankly. so will my child believe in him. Miranda... And I will pray to God to make him healthy and strong and happy. Oh, my darling, my darling. Have I done something to please you at last? May I kiss you, Miranda? Please, may I kiss you? I was sorry to interrupt your meeting with the farmers, Dr. Turner, but... Well, we hardly expected you, Mr. Van Ryan. As you gathered, we were celebrating the new state constitution. The farmers may now buy the lands they've been working. I came on a still more important mission. You have not seen Mrs. Van Ryan of late, have you? No, I have not seen Mrs. Van Ryan for months. She is about to have a child. I need your help. Dr. Williams is there, Williams but I... is a fine He's doctor. He's a fool. I beg of you to help her. She's in danger? I don't know that she... Doctor... Nothing must happen to my son. I'll do what I can. Thank heaven you've come, Doctor. I think Van Ryan would kill me if anything went wrong. But that's nonsense, Dr. Williams. Is it? When I tried to resign from the case last week, he had me locked in my room and watching me all the time through those icy eyes of his. Uh, about Mrs. Van Ryan. Uh, she'll have her child before evening. Everything's quite normal. Then why did he send for me? The child. There's an irregularity in the heartbeat. I see. Why don't you get some rest, Doctor? You'll call me? My room is just down the hall. Don't worry. I'll call you. Jeff? Jeff, is that you? 
Yes, Miranda. I don't know whether to believe this or not. You'll take care of me now. Yes, Miranda. I, I'll be all right then. I'm not afraid anymore. You'll help me. I'll help you. I'll always help you, Miranda. It's all right, Miranda. Everything will be all right. Why do you look so sober, Dr. Turner? This is a day of joy. My son has been born. There's something you must know, Mr. Van Ryan. Your son is not well. I can't tell you how sorry I am. But your wife is fine, and in time, there's no reason why she can't have other children. My son is entirely well, Dr. Turner. His heart is malformed. It's nobody's fault. Nothing could have prevented it. It's just a tragic accident that he won't live. There's a carriage waiting to take you to the village. You'll never believe anything you don't want to, will you? And there'll be no need for you to see Mrs. Van Ryan again. If you'll excuse me, Doctor, the pastor is waiting. My son will be baptized tomorrow. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, I do baptize thee, Adrian Peter Van Ryan. Mein Herr Van Ryan, please accept my most sincere congratulations. Thank you, Domine. And you, dear lady. Thank you. You understand, of course, that this house ceremony was only at the insistence of Mrs. Van Ryan. In a month or two, my son will be properly baptized in the Dragonwick Church. Yes, of course. No, Nicholas. We can thank God that he was baptized in time. In time? The child I hold in my arms. My son. My son is dead. Is that you, Peggy? Yes, Mum. Should I light some candles? No, I like the dark. Oh, you'll ruin your eyes. How long has he been up there this time? In the tower room? A week, maybe more. Oh, ever since the baby. I'm sure it isn't very pleasant for him, Peggy. Oh, and what is it for you? Shut up there for days on end without a word or a sound. Peggy. <sighs> yes, ma'am. I'm going up to him. Oh, no, not alone. Don't be silly. Oh, I'll not let you go up there alone. No, don't, please. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Well, Miranda, now that you've come up here, don't be frightened. I'm not frightened, Nicholas. Yes, you do have courage. It must have taken a great deal to make a pilgrimage to the mysterious tower room. I assume your twisted little servant is offering up suitable prayers for your safe return? I see no reason why they should be necessary. Why? Because of what you see? Just a room, no velvet drapes? Nicholas, what do you do in this room? What do I do? I live. But how could you understand? Oh, don't be offended. By ordinary standards, you're quite intelligent. But I will not live by ordinary standards. I will not look to the ground and move on the ground with the pack. Not so long as there are those mountain tops out there and clouds and limitless space. You still don't understand, do you? I want to try if you'll help me. Then steal yourself. Prepare to have your God-fearing, farm-bred, prayer fat and morality shaken to its core. You see, I have become what is vulgarly known as a drug addict. Why? What? No tearful reproaches. No attempts to regenerate me. Why do you find it necessary? Because I have set free something within me. Something that ever since I can remember has been like a rock in my heart, in my brain. Pushing at me. Choking me. I know you better than you think. And you're just running away. <laughs> Is it as simple as all that? Yes, Nicholas. As simple as that. When you've come up against something unpleasant that you couldn't change, like the rent law. Or the death of my son. Oh, son. Get out of here. I want to help I you. I don't need to be helped. Help me, then. Please don't shut me out like this. Let me be unhappy with you and happy again. Let me be part of you. Let me love you and love me, too. That's how she would talk. Joanna. And Joanna is dead. <laughs> Turner, she 
went up to the tower room to see him, but it did no good, no good at all. That's quite a story, Peggy, but I'm afraid you'll have to tell Mrs. Van Ryan there isn't much I can do for her husband. Tell her? Well, she doesn't know I've come to see you. It isn't him I'm worried about. It's her. I'm afraid for her. Afraid of what? Well, I... I can't say right out, sir, but... Oh, there's a blackness in that house and in him. Oh, you've got to take her away. What makes you think she wants to go? Whether she wants to or not. You can't leave her there to be hurt and hurt again, not knowing what she's done wrong or, or how to do right. Happy as a child because he so much as sends a plant to her room and... A plant? What sort of a plant? Well, something that grows in the hothouse, sir. Grinald, I think she said... Come on, Peggy. I'm going to Dragonwick now. Why have you come to my room, Nicholas? What do you want? Inasmuch as this is my house, must I explain my presence in it? Of course not. Forgive me, I'm, I'm just so tired. Yet I cannot remember you more beautiful than you are now. Your strength, your grace, your unexpected look of quality. It would be a pity if you were not to have another child. That's a matter of the Lord's will. Oh, yes, the Lord. The Lord who giveth life and also takes it away. Why did he take away my son's life? I have no way of knowing that, Nick. Why do you suppose you are here, Miranda? By the Lord's will or by mine? What you are is the reflection of what I wanted you to be. Now, you do look frightened. What are you thinking? I'm thinking of Johanna. Why? I don't know. Nicholas, what is it? Do you hear something? What? Nothing, nothing. It's nothing. It's just the wind through the trees. There is no wind there tonight. There is a creaking board somewhere. It's not important. It's, it's stopped now. But I didn't hear anything. Neither did I. But you did, and you still do. It's from the red room. The harpsichord. Azeel. Stop it, Miranda. Stop and that it. That dream did hear her that night when Johanna died. And you, you must have heard it too. And you must have been listening the night our little son. I never believed it, really, but, but now I do. I... Nicholas, where are you going? Nicholas! Red room, Doctor. Staring at that picture on the wall. Just standing there, staring at that picture. Wait here, Peggy. Good evening, Mr. Van Ryan. What? Oh, Dr. Turner. <laughs> Summoned in the best heroic tradition by the faithful little cripple. <laughs> and have you an army of farmers armed with pitchforks lurking in the garden? No, that fight's long over and you lost it. But Peggy seemed worried about you. Do I look as if I needed medical aid? I can't diagnose from appearance alone. You've become more careful, Dr. Turner. I can recall when your diagnoses were less thorough. I've learned a lot since then. For one thing, I've made a careful study of plant life. I would think human life more important. Jeff, what, what are you doing here? About to discuss plant life with your husband. I assume you've thanked him prettily for the lovely plant in your room? I don't understand. He understands. Your late wife's bedroom, Mr. Van Ryn, the night she died. I was never able to forget that plant. At first, I thought only that it was very beautiful. I've learned since it was also very deadly. Nicholas, what does he mean? The plant contains a glucoside, similar in action to digitalis, but much more toxic. How shrewd to have a doctor on hand that night you asked me to dinner. And weren't you lucky, Mr. Van Ryn? that I wasn't a better doctor. It was all so simple. Your wife with the bad cold. She couldn't possibly have tasted anything in the cake. It was soaked with rum anyway. I don't believe it. I... Stop it, stop. Pick up his pistol, Miranda. I... I suggest that you stay here, Mr. Van Ryan. Don't try to leave Dragonwick. If you do, even your friend the prosecutor will be quite helpless to aid you. Nicholas. Let me alone and get out. All of you, get out. Nicholas. There he is, sitting in the patroon's chair, just like he did as a kermesse. Hold up your lanterns there. Mr. Van Ryan. Mr. Van Ryan. Mayor Curtis, isn't it? If you don't mind, Mr. Van Ryan, I'll have to ask you to come along with us. But I do mind. I have no intention of going anywhere with anyone. This is not a request, Van Ryan. You're under arrest. Back so soon, Dr. Turner. 
Nicholas, oh, please. Oh, my wife. Go with him. It's your only chance. My only chance. How little you know me, Miranda. Even Joanna would never have said that. Dr. Turner, you might use your influence to benefit these men for once and tell them to get out of here. How little you know me, Mr. Van Ryan, or them. I am well armed, Dr. Turner. You don't believe I'd shoot again? Yes, I believe you. Drop your pistol, Van Ryan. All right, men, take the prisoner. Have it your own way, then. Look at you. All of you. Taking off your hats. That's... That's right. Take off your hats in the presence of the patrol. And now you're going home, Miranda. Leaving Dragonwick. You could ride to the boat landing with me, Jeff. I'd like nothing better. Except that I'd have to ride back here alone. Is, is that all you're taking with you? It's all I brought with me from home, except a black dress. The way you just said home, as if you never had any other. Have I? Ever? You know, Ma once said she never should have let me come to Dragonwick, that she was afraid. You couldn't marry a dream, she said. Do you dream, Jeff? Sometimes I dream. Some dreams are very real so real that they get confused with reality and then when you wake up and look around you find yourself saying what am I doing here what is this to do with what I want and I guess you make up your mind you've had a nightmare and you go crawling to your mom and pa so it's back to Greenwich now Miranda with never another thought of anything here Greenwich isn't so far away Jeff perhaps sometime You'll be passing through. Here's Mr. Keeley with tonight's stars. As every producer knows, truly fine actors in a truly great play are surefire box office. And that's what we enjoyed tonight, with all our thanks to Gene Tierney and Vincent Price. Thank you, Bill. It was a real thrill doing Dragonwick again with Vince. Although I must say, he makes a somewhat awesome patroon. You know, Gene, that title has always bothered me. I keep mixing it up with platoons, paltroons, doubloons, pontoons. And looney tunes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of patroons, I wonder how many of our audience know that Vincent Price is one of Hollywood's most loyal patrons of the arts. Well, Bill, I've always been interested in painting and encouraging young painters. And you're a very talented painter yourself, then. Mostly out of curiosity. Mm, how do you mean, curiosity? Well, when I start a painting, I never know quite what it's going to be. And when I'm finished, I always wonder what it is. <laughs> <laughs> do you go in for painting, Jean? All I know is the primary colors. Stop and go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say Jean's part is motion pictures. Good night. Good, Good night. night and come back again soon. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines with xylene, rich lube, all-weather motor oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to the jungles of South America and a seething tale of terror and violence as told by James Poe in Bloodbath. Starring Mr. Vincent Price.
By portaging the rapids and walking the mules in the shallower stretches, we'd managed to get our supplies and equipment more than 1,700 miles up the river. After this, further navigable passage being impossible, we'd traveled by foot, hacking our way through the thick, steaming jungle, coaxing and goading the heavily laden beasts. We'd left the jungle and begun the climb. Eleven days later, high in the Andes, we found our objective, and we set to work, hard work. And then, on a hazy afternoon in late May, we found it. I shall never forget the scene. Below us, the mountains swung down to the jungle which stretched eastward, far as the eye could see. The peaks above us had cut off the setting sun and the light had a curious violet quality. The dank, chill wind whispering and gusting set the sparse timber scrubs to trembling and shuddering and the mules, disdainful of their five strange masters, foraged the cacti and dwarf pine. The instruments were set up and the specimens were at hand and now, crouched and tense, we leaned forward. How about it, Hess? Wait. The tube's got to warm up. Come on, come on. Wait, will you? I've waited five years for this moment. Five? Five hundred, you mean? Five million? Come on, Hessie. How about it, Hess? Mm-hmm. Okay. Give him the sample, O'Brien. Yeah, here. Come on, baby. Shut up, will you? Shh. Here goes. Switch on. Holy cow. Good. Good. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Hesse. What's the word? Yeah, Hesse. Give him. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Unless this machine is busted, unless this Geiger counter has forgotten its multiplication table, we have discovered the richest load of uranium ore known to man. Yeah! <laughs> I won't go into the details of how we'd come to locate the ore because that's a story in itself. Suffice it to say that late in the afternoon of that hazy May day, the five of us, gamblers all, came to the end of our rainbow, found our pot of gold. The vein runs all the way up the side of the mountain. Must be worth a million bucks. A million, a billion. A trillion bucks. <laughs> Do you boys realize what we've got here? Sure we do. We've got the world at our feet. Why, the man who gets the strike registered in his name can be a king. Every country in the world is going to come running up to him with trunks full of money and power. Ah, <laughs> you tell him, Hesse. Power? Yeah, we'll make the United States the most powerful nation on earth. Why the United States? Oh, you wouldn't sell to anybody else, would you? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Harris. You're a fool. No, no. I'm a businessman. A trillion bucks. <laughs> oh, gents, we've got the world at our feet. Split five ways. <laughs> That night, as I lay huddled under my thin blanket, I wondered what it would be like being a wealthy man. Wondered if it were really true. Wondered how it would affect the others, how it would affect me. In the morning, we were to set off on the long return journey down to the jungle and through the jungle to the launch and down the river to civilization. There, we'd register our claim, purchase, if need be, the land, lease it perhaps from the government. Hmm. Oh, millionaires, world at our feet. Uranium, enough to blow up the whole universe. Power. Harris, wake up. Uh, oh, what's the, what's wake the up, time? Harris, wake up. Oh, good morning, millionaire. Weems, wake up. Huh? The sun's coming up. Hey, huh? hey, where are the others? They're gone. Huh? Gone? Yes, Dumont and O'Brien. They took the mules and most of the food and cut out. When? How do I know when? Sometime during the night. But why? Why? A trillion bucks, that's why. Oh, no, no, no. Once they get down to the jungle, they'll have to travel on foot. There's ten days' march to the river. If they beat us to the boat, we're stuck with 1,500 miles of jungle between us and safety. Fifty? Impossible. 
We'd never make a hundred. That's right. We've got to catch them or we're dead. We traveled as lightly as possible. It was a risky business, doubly so because O'Brien and Dumont had taken our guns with them. The only weapons we had between us were one long machete and two pocket knives. These would be of little protection against jaguars, bushmasters, tapirs, bow constrictors, and the rest of it. Fortunately, they'd left our number one necessity to survival. They'd forgotten to take our quinine. This and our food was all we carried. The long descent to the jungle was slow going on foot. It was here that we nearly gave up hope. We moved as fast as we could, but we were no match for men who were riding. But we reached the jungle. Then things took a better turn. Here the thick vines and heavy undergrowth was, we knew, almost an impossible hazard for a riding man. And we could see their boot prints mingled with those of the mules. We knew that they were having trouble, too. The animals were afraid of many things in the jungle. Would balk suddenly require careful handling? We pushed ahead as rapidly as possible, battling mosquitoes, pume flies, matukas, and the blood-sucking carpato ticks, and, of course, the jungle itself with its never-ending barrage of razor grasses, needle vines, swamps, bog traps, and so forth. It was hot, stinking hot, and the going was hard, but we had to make it. couldn't travel at night. We'd taken our flashlights. We'd bundle up as best we could, protecting ourselves, not from the cold, it was hot and muggy even at dawn, but from the mosquitoes. And as we progressed towards the river area, from the bats, vampire bats. <laughs> Ever seen them? <laughs> They're small, rather fragile-looking little things. By day, they hang heads down from the trees, wings folded like like clusters of rotten fruit. By night, they hunt. They have razor-sharp teeth, bite like the finest steel scalpels. Their object is to break the skin very delicately, start the blood to coming, and then they simply hang on and sip. Without mosquito netting, we had a rough time of it, a sleepless time. But we managed to keep on going. And on the third day... Uh, it's not yours, fellas. We can't make it to the river before them. We've got to, Weezy. We've got to make it. right, Weezy. And even if we do catch up, they got the guns. Shh, shh. Huh? What are you stopping? Oh, quiet, quiet. I heard something. What did you hear? Shh. Gunfire. Yeah. Come on. They can't be more than a mile or two ahead. Come on. We ran through the jungle, following the fresh marks of the animals uh. and the two men. And a half an hour or so later, we broke into a little clearing, and there was Dumont. Dumont. He's dead. Shot in the back. <laughs> Good old Obi. Sweet guy, that Obi. Here, come on. Let's turn him over. <clears throat> He's really been sweating, huh? Uh, yeah. It's malaria. You see his face? Good old Obi. And Dumont came down with malaria, probably started to slow him down. Sweet guy, that Obi. Come on. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Hey, they should have remembered the quinine. I got no sympathy for Dumont. <laughs> you know, you know what would be nice? What? If that, if that Obi should get malaria now. Yeah. He'd be helpless. <laughs> He'd ask me for quinine. And I'd throw him a stone. On we went. Now there were no boot marks with the mule tracks. Apparently O'Brien was riding one of the animals. From time to time we'd see a flurry of tracks churned up as though he had had to dismount to tug one of the beasts back onto the trail. We followed the tracks for another two days and then on the sixth day... We found one of the mules. How you feeling, boy? Huh? 
Where's your saddle? He really looks beat. Look at those marks on his flanks. Vampire bats. Yeah. That leaves O'Brien on foot. Yeah. Hey, hey you hear that? Hey, it's the launch. Where did the river? He's starting the motor. Come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't very far, just a few hundred yards. And the path was strewn with O'Brien's discarded supplies. Quite suddenly, we came out of the jungle and onto a narrow white sandbar. The river. And there, not 30 feet away from us, just drifting off into the deep, dark, fast-moving waters, was O'Brien in the launch. O'Brien! I beat you up! Look at him. He's like a skeleton. Obi! Wait for us, Obi! The launch lurched dizzily as it floated downstream. O'Brien was feeble, sweating, possessed. He had the fever, had it bad. Come on, let's go after him. You can't, this is piranha water. Cannibal fish, they'll eat you. Yeah. Hey, Obi! Hey, you know me, Obi! Your old pal, Hesby! Hey, what do you say, Obi, huh? Huh? He staggered dizzily about the cockpit, trying to start the engine. He was laughing, and he was so weak that he could barely spin the flywheel to the kicker. Obi! He slipped! Good Lord, he's in the water! The fish, the piranhas! They got him, they got him! I ain't gonna look at this! One moment we saw him swimming weakly, his large, fever-ridden eyes turned imploringly toward us, and the next moment he was gone, leaving only a large red churning patch on the water. The piranhas are small, rarely more than 12 or 14 inches long, small fish with large, powerful jaws, teeth like broken glass, and an insatiable, maniacal appetite for flesh. The launch, caught by the deep, fast-moving waters, rocked softly this way and that, and moved on downstream, away, away around a bend and out of sight. The march of science over the years has produced better than ever gasoline for your car. But now science adds one of the greatest gasoline components of all. It's called xylene. Xylene, a super gasoline component, adds two great qualities to gasoline. Xylene gives higher than ever Antinoc performance. Xylene means power. Today, every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains xylene. If you want a motor that runs quiet as a whisper, if you want pickup and power to spare, try Richfield gasoline with xylene. Your Richfield dealer offers a choice of two great Richfield gasolines with xylene. Richfield high octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield ethyl. Ethyl at its best for tip-top results in the highest compression motors. Drive in where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Get Richfield gasoline with xylene. Xylene, one of the highest Antinoc components in gasoline history. And now we return you to Escape, starring Vincent Price. We picked over the supplies O'Brien had left on the shore. There wasn't much we wanted. A gun without ammunition, a few tins of food, a tent and some bedding, cooking equipment, a coil of rope. We loaded these things onto the mule and set off through the jungle, downstream along the river's course, 1,500 miles to civilization. had it tough. The jungle was thick along the river's bank, and we made little progress. Not more than five miles that day, but the next day, we rounded a bend, keeping close to the shore, and there, about a quarter mile below us, and nuzzling the opposite shore, grounded on the sand, lay the launch. Looks shallow enough here. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, but what about the fish? How deep does it look to you, Harris, at the deepest spot, I mean? Oh, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet, maybe three. Uh... Most of it's less than that. I got an idea. Shoot. We got to get across the launch, see? Yeah. So here's what we do. We throw away everything. There'll be food and water in the launch, see? Yeah. Now, you see that little patch of sand in the middle of the river where the bar shows? Yeah. We go that way. That's bound to be the shallowest way, see? How do we go? On the mule, the three of us. Ah, you're nuts. 
cats. This mule ain't in such bad condition it can't get the three of us across 70 feet of shallow water. What do you say, Harris? Why not? All right, I'll get aboard first. Come on. Get farther up, Wimsy. You're the lightest. Yeah. Harris, you get on next. Mm -hmm. Hang on to Wimsy. Yeah. Here, here. Carry this coil of rope around your neck. We okay. may need it. I've got the machete strapped to my back. Hey, you set, Weems? Yeah. <clears throat> now hold tight to me, Hess. Don't worry. If I go, you go too. Yeah. And if he goes, I go. <laughs> so let's hang on, gents. Yeah. Let's really hang on. As long as he's moving fast, he can't get at his legs. Ain't that right? He's not showing anything to him but hoofs and hair. Hold his head up, Weems. Don't let him look down. Uh, now, you all set? Yeah, all set. All right, here we go. All right, get off. Come on, come on. Come on, baby. I felt the mule uh, lurch when he baby. stepped into the water. The sand was on, softer here than on the shore. Sand, huh? Ahead, come not on, 40 feet away, lay the come little on. spit of land. The mule refused to come run, on. couldn't run, and before he'd taken 10 steps, I knew he was too weak to support the three of us. From every direction in the swirling water about us came small, shadowy, dark shapes. Come on. The piranhas. Don't stop! Come on, baby. Come on. Keep moving, baby. Come uh, on. Move along, baby. He can't do it. You gotta do it, baby. Come on, Sweet come on. mother... What are those? The piranhas were churning the water about us, and coming in from beyond them were four or five long, dark shapes, six and seven feet long, thick and wriggling. Eels, electric eels. Uh, they'll sting them. Get along to the back. Get him to the sandbar. Faster, faster. Come on. <laughs> Made it. It's true about electric eels. <sighs> They can throw a jolt that'll kill a jaguar. They got jaws like a vice. So, here we are, gentlemen, stuck. Just 30 feet of water between us and the shore. Get across it, and we can get to the launch and the civilization and all the rest. Oh, the three of us are too much for that mule. Uh, only 30 feet. Why, you could run it in seconds. You see those little shadows around us in the water? I see those little shadows around us. You don't have to draw pictures. Hey, uh... Oh, here's another bright idea coming up. As a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, hold on to your hat, Harris. We got that curl of rope. Yes. The mule could carry one of us. That mule's not in such bad shape, you know. Yes. Tie the rope over his bridle. Then one of us pulls him over with him fast, you see. One rides, and then the other two pull him back. Yeah. And yeah. the next one gets on. Yeah. What do you say? Oh, he can't stay here. It's a natural. Who uh, goes first? Me, on account I'm the lightest. I won't tire him so much. How about it, Harris? All right. Well, get going then. Okay. Tie that rope to his bride. I'm doing it. All right, give me the machete. What do you want the machete for? I want it, that's all. Give me. No. Okay. All right, Here. now you two get at the end of the spit. So as when you pay out the line, you don't get it caught in his legs. Well, you think of everything. That's right, I'm a smart boy. You're ready with the line. You sure it's tied fast to the bridle? Yeah, I'm sure. No funny business, Weems. All we gotta do is jerk this rope once while you're over that water and you're done for. You're a sharp article. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But not sharp enough! Hey! Weems, you cut the rope! So long, suckers! The rope. Our only salvation was cut. And now Weems, grinning and riding, was out into the stream, heading for the shore and safe. Get up. He went not 15 feet when one of the long, dark, wriggling shapes made for the mule and got his leg. The mule reared up on his hind legs, the eel clinging to his foot, pumping paralyzing shocks into him. Weems clutched his neck with one hand and slapped him on the flank with the flat of the machete with the other. The mule came down and more eels went for his legs. He began to lurch sideways. Weems swung the long steel blade in an arc, barely missing the mule's leg and connected with one of the eels. His hair seemed to stand on end. His other arm released the mule's neck. The arm holding the blade was extended stiffly, still caught in the thick, muscular back of the electric eel. And then the mule reared again, and Weems fell back into the water. The mule, freed of Weems, made the shore and vanished into the jungle. We turned away. No man could watch what was happening to Weems and retain his sanity. And so, there we were. Hess and I on that sand spit which the river was slowly washing away. Night coming, vampire bats coming, and all about us, the electric eels and the little cannibal fish waiting.
There was no moon. There were evil stars, red and yellow. There was a black sky and against it blacker shapes, the vampire bats. We waved our arms and kept them off, but again and again during that long and terrible night, they brushed against us, squealing and squeaking, trying to get us. Dark, evil, thirsting bats. A thousand years later came the dawn. That water's taken a lot of sand away. This thing isn't much bigger than a card table. Mm. Look at them. Look at those fish. You think they had enough to eat yesterday? Mm. Mm. Listen, Harris. No matter what happens now, at least you and I have played it square, right? Yeah, that's right, Harris. Shake my hand, Harris. All right. Because I think I got an idea on how we can get out of here. What? Yeah. Look up there. Yeah. See see that vine hanging down from the big tree? It's over the water and it must be 15 feet up. Yeah, yeah, but if you were on it, you could do a Tarzan to the shore. The rope? Oh, that's right. Now, if we can just lasso the end of that and pull tight, we'll have enough swing to make it across. Swing like a pendulum, if you follow me. One guy gets on the other's shoulders to swing over to get the start, see? Then when he gets to shore, he fastens a rock and swings the rope back to the other. Oh, that vine will hold. It'll work. <laughs> It took us two hours before we managed to lasso the end of that vine. And then we tested it again and again until we were positive it would hold a man's weight. And then we were ready. Ah, you stand good and steady now, pal. I'm going to go easy on you, but don't shake. Because if you spill me in that water, I'm a gone guy. I'm ready. <clears throat> I'm ready. Good luck. Uh, here. No! I felt his feet leave my shoulders, and then he was off, skimming the water with his feet drawn up, and then, miraculously, he was on the shore. Good boy! Good boy! <laughs> yeah! Like a breeze, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like a breeze. Hey, uh, any rocks around there? Sorry. He smiled at me and shrugged and then looked down the stream at the launch. I knew that smile, that trillion dollar smile. It said, so long, sucker. <laughs> Don't do it, Hess. Send me the rope. <laughs> You're too nice a guy, Harris. You and I would never get along. You, you can have it all, Hess. Every scrap of it. Only for the love of mercy, send me the rope. No, no, you'd want some. You wouldn't approve of what I mean to do with it. Hess! <laughs> He's stood there laughing at me and shaking his head slowly. But a, above him, just over his head, was another vine, thick and mottled, and it was moving. Look out, Hess! Hess! <laughs> he didn't understand or didn't hear me. Just stood there smiling and shaking his head. The boa constrictor dropped heavily and accurately a thrashing tangle of scaly muscles. <laughs> The sun was hot, blistering hot. I was alone, all alone, except for the ever-waiting piranhas. Hess's body was hidden by the low, scrubby vines and palmettos. Several hours later, I saw the boa, now gorged, slither lumpily away. I waited, and I waited. From time to time, I thought of stepping out into the stream. It would be over very quickly, I told myself, very quickly. But I, I couldn't. And then I noticed an odd thing. The current which had been sweeping the sand away had shifted slightly. A whim, a miracle. And now new sand from some sunken bar was beginning to pile up between me and the shore, grain by grain, rib by rib. I watched this. And I watched. And I watched. And at five o'clock that afternoon, I walked ashore to the launch. And didn't even get my feet wet. It 
It's nice where I live. Quiet little streets, nice people, nice kids, nice country, peaceful, nice peace. I know where there's enough uranium to blow it all to hell. Want it? Just go up the river. Up the river, it's, uh, it's for the taking. Ask Dumont and Obi and Weems and Hess. A trillion bucks worth. Enough to give the whole world a bloodbath. Yourself included. Warm summer weather makes you think of baseball games, picnics, and holiday driving. But be sure your car's ready when you are. Get Richfield All Point Safety Service. The service that puts your car in top shape for warm weather driving. With Richfield All Point Safety Service, you get a careful All Point lubrication job that protects the chassis, transmission, and differential. You get lubricants that stick to your car's ribs no matter what the temperature. You get the protection of Rich Lube All Weather Motor Oil, the Pennsylvania premium grade oil that cleans as it lubricates. You also get a safety check of batteries, spark plugs, tires, and radiator. And expert service if your car has automatic transmission. The Richfield gasoline dealer is specially trained to protect your car against wear and breakdown. So get Richfield All Point Safety Service tomorrow. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight starred Mr. Vincent Price. Bloodbath was written by James Poe. Others in the cast were Wally Mayer, Ted DeCorsia, Paul Fries, and Tony Barrett. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea. Moving carefully, step by step, dreading to find what you know is there. Death in the form of a deadly Bushmaster from which there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape to the Caribbean and a grim voyage of impending death as Martin Storm tells it in his exciting tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. Goodbye then until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lorene Tuttle and I have been having a little argument as to the relative merits of... Having a little discussion regarding two different schools of literary thought. I've been maintaining to Mr. Price... You may call me Vincent. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Vincent. I've been maintaining that our whole lives are enriched by the warmth and beauty of romanticism. Romanticism, my dear Lorene, is for those weak, lily-livered individuals who haven't the courage to face the realities of life. Realism is life. Now, I'll take Eugene O'Neill any day in preference to Winnie the Pooh. And I'll take Cinderella any day rather than Hedda Gabler. Cinderella. Now, she's exactly what I mean. A smudge-faced juvenile delinquent, if you ask me. It's only one of the most beautiful fairy tales ever told. I defy any realist to tell such a moving story. Oh, you would, eh? Well, very well. To prove my point, I'll tell the real story of Cinderella. Very well. But ladies first. Please. To prove my point, I'll tell the romantic story of Cinderella. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Ed Verdier and Don Clark's dramatic excursion into the realm of realism versus romance, as the workshop presents 
Speaking of Cinderella, or If the Shoe Fits, starring Vincent Price and Loreen Tuttle. Special music composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. Upon a time in a faraway country, there lived a lovely young girl named Cinderella. Unfortunately, she had a cruel stepmother and two stepsisters who were hard-hearted and ill-tempered. Poor Cinderella worked like a slave during the day, and in the evening she would sit alone in the chimney corner among the ashes. Now it happened that the king of the land was giving a ball, and all the people of rank and fashion were invited. Among these were Cinderella's two stepsisters. I'm really very well pleased that my two daughters have been invited to attend the king's ball. Oh, oh so, so are we, we Mama. Mama. It has been rumored that the king's eldest son, the prince, is to choose his bride from among the young ladies who will be present. Oh, the prince is so tall and handsome. So gallant and rich. And don't forget, one day his bride will become queen of the kingdom and will rule over all the subjects in the domain. Dear stepmother. What? Oh, it's you, Cinderella. What do you want? Dear stepmother, could I, too, go to the ball? What? You? Have you taken leave of your senses, girl? You have no clothes, only those tattered old rags you're wearing. There are ashes in your hair. Your shoes are broken and scuffed. With very little trouble, I believe I could make myself quite presentable. You were scullery maid. Presentable. Well, I've never heard of such conceit. I beg of you, stepmother. A simple little dress. I could wear a flower in my hair. That will be all from you, you impertinent ragamuffin. Back to the kitchen. Do you hear me? Back to the kitchen this instant. <laughs> and so poor Cinderella went back to her chimney corner and wept bitter tears. She knew that. Wait she... a minute. Wait a minute. Now, there's as fine an example of flapdoodle as I've been exposed to in my whole life. What do you mean, flapdoodle? This Cinderella character. Why, the way you romanticists picture her, the poor girl needs an analyst. Oh. What on earth is she doing groveling around in the fireplace getting ashes in her hair? Nobody could ever be like that. Now, do you want to know what really happened? Well, I don't think so. It would do you good, Loreen. Facing reality, you understand. Well, this gal, Cindy, wasn't getting much of a break, but she didn't take it sitting down. She knew she had to play it smart. So when a rich man in town sent out bids for a big wingding he was throwing, Cindy was all ears. I'm certainly glad you girls have been invited to Mr. King's party. It should be real nervous. Yeah, when he throws one, it's really a rocket. And you can say that again. The last one we went to, I was hung over for three days. I read in somebody's column, Winchell's, I think, that the old man has given his son the word to get married and settle down. Get the possibilities? I understand the guy's quite a wolf. So what? And don't forget that someday he'll be a vice president of King Betancourt Bagby and wins one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. Well, no wonder they call him the prince. So, if one of you girls latch on to him, you'll have it made, but good. Hey, how about me crashing this bra? You, Cinderella? You must be blowing your stack. <laughs> now I've heard everything. <laughs> Ah, go up on the roof and feed your pigeons. Knock it off, you two, or I'll belt your one in the teeth. Don't pull any of your lady wrestler stuff on my gals. I would have been a champ by this time if you hadn't made me throw those last two matches. I had gorgeous Gloria's shoulders pinned to the canvas when you... What are you beefing about? You got your cut? Yeah, then you took me for the whole bundle shooting craps. Look, do I make this party or don't I? You don't. Besides, you haven't got a thing to wear. You're loaded. You might part with a little grab. I can pick up a nifty little number at Orbox for a few bucks. That's enough out of you, Cinderella. Get back to the kitchen and wash the dishes. And get the dried egg yolk off the plates for a change. Uh, don't give me that lift, that load, tote, that bail routine. I got other plans. Cinderella, where are you going? Down to Dirty Joe's Bar and Grill, that's where. That horrible, smelly dive down on the waterfront? I've smelled worse. But the dock workers are having label trouble down there. You're... Don't worry your empty head about me, Steffi. I can take care of myself. 
be seeing you. Oh! I have never, never in all my life heard anything so outrageous. <laughs> Vincent, you, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. Distorting that lovely story and making Cinderella such a horrible character. Well, at least she has spirit. She isn't the namby-pamby little goop you'd want the public to accept. My Cinderella is a charming child, unspoiled, sweet, and naive. Oh, she's naive, all right. She's so naive, she's simple in the head. She ought to be in an institution. That isn't true. She has all the personality of an oyster. Why doesn't she stand up for her rights? Because she's a dear, obedient child. Well, a good psychiatrist might help her, but I doubt it. Your Cinderella was trying to escape reality by indulging in daydreams about a fairy godmother. Fairy godmother. <laughs> it wasn't that way at all. You see, there really was a fairy godmother. You don't say. Yes. So, when her two stepsisters had left for the ball, dressed in their beautiful gowns, Cinderella went sorrowfully to the kitchen sat down in the chimney corner and broke into sobs of unhappiness. At this moment, a beautiful fairy appeared. <laughs> no, no, stop your crying, my child. I am your fairy godmother, Cinderella. If you wish to go to the king's ball, you shall. But you must do everything I say. Yes. Oh, yes, of course. First, bring that pumpkin out into the garden. Where shall I put it? Oh, right there. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'll touch it with my magic wand like this. And... There. Oh, my. A splendid coat, all gold and silver. Oh. Now, bring me those six mice in yonder trap. Yes. All right. But... Shall I do with them? You put them there, in front of the carriage. Yeah, that's it. So, a touch of my wand and... <laughs> Six white horses with golden harness and red and blue ribbons in their manes. Oh, fairy godmother, it's wonderful. Oh, well, my dear, is this not a fit equipage to take you to the king's ball? Indeed. Indeed it is, but... But... I have no suitable gown. All I have are these tattered rags. Oh, yes. We'll soon take care of that. Oh, how lovely. A white satin gown. Covered with pearls and diamonds. And tiny slippers of glass. Spun as fine as gossamer. How can I ever thank you, dear... Dear fairy godmother. By being happy. But hear me, there is one condition. You must not remain at the ball after the clock strikes twelve. If you do, your coach and horses will all return to their natural forms, and your fine gown will again turn to rags. Oh, I promise I'll leave the ball at the very first stroke of twelve. <laughs> then off with you, my darling, and have a merry time. You've been so good to me. So very, very good. And so, in all her finery, Cinderella started off for the king's ball, looking more like a princess than anyone would be there. Cinderella was very happy. Oh, what stuff and nonsense. Really, in all my born days, it I have never... It wasn't that enchanting, my dear. Enchanting? It was appalling. Appalling? Moreover, it doesn't make any sense. Cinderella's stepmother obviously has money. She thinks nothing of getting Dior and Adrian gowns for her daughters. But still, her place is overrun with mice and rats. Why, if the Board of Health You ever... are getting more odious by the minute. Odious, schmodious. Let's get back to reality. And the way the story really happened. Now, this Cinderella kid wants to go to the ball, all right. But instead of falling back on her schizophrenic escape pattern, why doesn't she do something constructive? Now, actually, she does. Such as what? Such as this. When Cinderella left her mother's house, she was pretty steamed up about the treatment she'd got. So, as she said, she went to Dirty Joe's down on the waterfront. 
where she could get a short beer and think things out. Hi, Daddy Joe. Hiya, Cindy. How are your pigeons? Joe, you know Crummy. Crummy? Yeah. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Crummy who? You know, Crummy McRotter. Oh, him. He comes in here all the time, doesn't he? Yep. You see him tonight? Yep. You mean he's been in? Sure. When did he come in? About an hour ago. Did he say where he was going when he left? Nope. How long ago did he leave? He didn't. Huh? You mean he's still here? Yeah, over there, in the last booth. Oh, thanks. I mean, thanks. Hi, Crummy. Hi, Bright Goyle. How's the pigeons? Mind if I sit down? What's to stop you? That sawed-off shotgun. Oh. I'm moving over here. Why the artillery? Things are tough on the water for right now, Bright Goyle. The boss wants us band boys to play soft, sad music as a warning to the dock wallopers who ain't kicking in. Yeah. Who's the target for tonight? Guy by the name of Gus Guggelheimer plays a glockenspiel. You run out on us. And what's on your mind, bright girl? Look, Crummy, I- I'm going to put it right on the line with you. I need some dough. Oh, sure. Who don't? I need a slick drape and I'm a... sorry, bright girl. You can't put the bite on me for nothing like that. I don't need much, Crummy. Just a couple of C notes. Hey, what do you think I am? Your fairy godmother or something? If you need some scratch, get it from your old lady. Uh, she wouldn't give me a dime. That's too bad. Now, uh, the way I hear it, she keeps plenty of ice around the place. And... Hey, the wall safe. Come on, you got something there. You know how to crack a safe. You ain't just beating your gums, baby. I got ten years in Alcatraz to prove it. All right, then. Now, here's what we'll do. Listen. <laughs> You getting it, Crummy? Will you shut up and leave me listen? One thing I've got to remember. Yeah, what's that? Except for the bracelet I'm going to give you for this caper. I've got to put back all the rest of the jewels before midnight. There's a time lock on this safe, and it's set for 12 o'clock. I got it open. (laughs) Hey, there's plenty of loot in here. Wait a minute. Get your cotton-picking hands off that stuff. Oh. Oh, no. Here's a bracelet. Must be worth a grand, at least. Uh, give me two C-notes, and it's yours. Then you better add an extra sawbuck for cab fare. Well, here's a 200, but not another cent. I made a sucker deal, if you ask me. All right, all right. Don't give me the extra 10. I'll just have to heist a car to get to the party. That's all. Code 3, 768-4379, HF22. Be on the lookout for a pumpkin yellow Cadillac convertible just stolen from the corner of 4th and Spruce Streets. Repeating, code 3, 768-4379, HF22. You see what I mean? My Cinderella is a realist. She has spirit. Oh, really, Vincent? You know this whole thing is impossible. I don't quite agree with you. Your version of the Cinderella story is impossible. Mine is possible. But uh, continue, my dear. Well, I'm not sure that I want to, but I suppose I must if any semblance of dignity and decorum is to remain in this lovely story. <laughs> well, when Cinderella arrived at the king's palace, she was surrounded by courtiers who led her into the ballroom. All eyes were directed toward her, for everyone was struck by her grace and beauty. No one knew who she was. Even her cruel stepsisters did not recognize her. So rich and splendid was her dress. All the king's courtiers, one after another, asked Cinderella to dance, and they were all highly pleased with her grace and elegance, as well as enchanted by the wit and brilliance of her conversation. The prince himself arrived quite late. Seeing Cinderella, he so admired her appearance and manners, he immediately offered her his hand to the dance. What a charming creature you are. Tell me your name, I pray. That I cannot do, sir. And please do not press me to tell it. I am sure you must be a princess from a distant kingdom. Really? What makes you say such a thing as that? No one but a princess could wear as magnificent a gown as yours, encrusted with precious gems and jewels. And no one but a princess could be so beautiful and so beguiling. You will turn my head with the sweetness of your words, my prince. And indeed, what 
is that? It is the tolling of the curfew bell. What o'clock is it? Tell me quickly. It is midnight. I must go. I must leave at once. I beg you to stay yet a while, for you dance with the likeness of a butterfly on the soft summer breeze. I cannot stay. I cannot. My heart prompts me to tell you that I love you, for I have never seen a maid so fair. No. No, please let me go. Good night, my prince. My prince charming. Good night. In her haste to leave, my beautiful princess has left her slipper behind. A slipper of glass spun as fine as gossamer. I vow I shall find my lovely princess if I must search all the kingdoms of the world, for I would make her my wife. Now, there's a real basis for a successful marriage. (laughs) The prince has one dance with Cinderella. One dance, mind you, and he wants to marry her. Why not? I wonder what a marriage counselor would say about that. Must you be so literal? And she is such a bird brain, she runs off leaving one of her shoes behind. It was a slipper of glass, spun as fine as gossip. And those two stepsisters of Cinderella's, they can't be very bright. They're right there at the ball, and they don't recognize her just because she's wearing a new dress. Now, I ask you, what sort of an IQ would those two have? Now, you take my Cinderella. You take her, and you can have her. My Cinderella has moxie. She goes after what she wants. No fairy godmother nonsense about her. When she arrived at Mr. King's party, the place was really jumping. The minute she wiggle-walked into the joint, all the cats began to yowl. Get a load of a babe. Wow. Hey, it's a doll. A real living, breathing doll. Hey, looky, looky. Hiya, cookie. Ah, get away from me, short, fat, and repulsive. Come on, sweet mama. How about pinning on a jig? Let's live it up for real. Stop dead, cornball. What's with you, beautiful? You mad in this madman world? Mister, I'm just not playing the field, that's all. What I'm looking for is the favorite. Where's the prince? In the rumpus room, lapping up some corn squeezes, I suppose. Thanks, chum. See you around the bowling alley sometime. Man, dig that crazy, crazy walk. Real cool, man. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Hiya, babe. You the character they call the prince? That's right. My old man is J. Walter King, a king, Betancourt, Bagby, and Wentz. Sure, I know. You're in the advertising racket. Big deal. Hmm. You know something? You're okay. Sounds as if this advertising dodge pays off in blue chips. You mind if I park the bustle? My dogs are killing me. Yeah, sit right here next to me, doll. That's it. Would you like a slug gun? Yeah, I don't mind if I do. Uh, double bourbon on the rocks with a twist of lemon peel. There you are. I like you, sweetie. You're a real dish of stuff. Oh, it's the spot. Fill her up again, Buster. Mm-hmm. You and your old men are throwing quite a bash tonight. Uh, entertaining the sponsors is what they call an occupational headache. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. Met a couple of the jokers when I came in. Well... Here's mud in your eye, Prince. Cheers. That's a real sharp bunch of threads you're filling. Yeah, it's just a little something I picked up. And diamonds and pearls. Yeah, I picked them up, too. So you're the original man in the gray flannel suit, huh, kiddo? Ah, oh, I suppose one of these days I'll make vice president. How come you haven't pressured your old man before this? He's just made me an account executive for Bimbo's No Bunion Shoes, but I think he's thrown me a curve. The radio and TV ratings are doing a nosedive. What you need is a gimmick, Princey. Ah, you can say that again. Come on, they're playing a rock and roll, and that's for me, sugar. Okay, honey. A gimmick, I think. No giveaway, no panels. These kind of notes really send me. A gimmick that... Oh, doggone it. What's the matter, baby? I'm losing my slipper. Wait a minute, Princey. Wait a minute. I think I got your gimmick. What's with you? You're flipping your lid or something? Now, listen. I leave my slipper behind when I leave here tonight. Nobody knows who I am, so you put big ads in the newspapers and buy spots on radio and television. A coast-to-coast campaign, a big build-up in Ballyhoo to find the bimbo no bunion shoe girl. You got it, Princey? Hey, I really think you got something there. 
jumping catfish. Is that 12 o'clock? It sure is. The time lock on the wall safe. The stuff's got to be back there before midnight. I got to scram out of here. What are you yakking about? If I don't get going right now, I'm a dead pigeon. Uh, here's my slipper. You take it from there. So long, Princey. <laughs> You see how competent and constructive my realistic Cinderella has turned out to be? She's scheming and conniving and actually dishonest. She stole her stepmother's jewelry. Oh, nonsense. She only borrowed it for a little while. She's hurrying home right now to put it back in the wall safe. How about the bracelet she gave to Cummy? Don't you worry about my girl. She's ingenious. She'll find some way of getting around that. She's an uncouth, unprincipled creature. Well, at least she isn't inane and innocuous like your girl. But please, go on with your story. Thank you. The prince searched everywhere for Cinderella. But alas, he could not find her. And when his search had quite failed, he grew ill with disappointment and vexation. Then the king, who dearly loved his son, called a privy council and asked his ministers what was to be done. They decided to send out heralds throughout the kingdom, proclaiming that the prince would marry the lady who could wear the tiny slippers spun of glass as fine as gossamer. Ah, the slipper does not fit you, my lady. Dear, I'm so disappointed, Prince. Let me try, sister. (laughs) I'm sorry. It does not fit you either. I felt so certain it would. Let the modest little girl who is standing back there come forward. Why, Why, it is you, my princess. Despite your modest garments, you cannot conceal your identity from me, for I see you through the eyes of love. Now, we'll try on the slipper. Yes, my prince. It fits. The slipper fits. Come to my arms, my darling, my own true princess. My prince. My prince charming. And so they were married and lived happily ever afterwards. Now, wasn't that a sweet and lovely story? To be perfectly frank with you, Lorena, I found it rather dull and pedestrian. Oh, Vincent. Well, in my version, there is action and excitement. My Cinderella is real and colorful. And I suppose your story has a sordid ending like so many realistic stories. She probably went to the penitentiary and the advertising man was sent to the Chicago office. No, Lorena, not at all, not at all. Listen. This is your newscaster, Thomas Lowell. The search for the bimbo no bunion shoe girl continues. She has been reported seen in St. Louis, Altoona, and Tibet. Cinderella, turn off that radio. There are rumors that... I'm sick to death of hearing about that bimbo no bunion shoe girl. That's all you read about in the newspapers, all you hear on the radio, all you see on the television. And that singing commercial... Where is the bimbo girl and who is she with a no bunion shoe? Bunion shoe. Driving me nuts. Ah, Keep your hair on, kids. It'll be all over tomorrow. It's been the greatest search since Bridie Murphy. And, Dad, the ratings are neat, 43. The bimbo shoe sales are up 72.9. A terrific campaign. This makes you a vice president, my boy. I owe it all to you, Cinderella. Ah, oh, it's okay, Princey. But when do we get hitched? Whenever you say, baby. You better see how soon we can line up the network so we can get full coverage. We want this wedding to be a real doozy. Bimbo's no bunion shoes will sponsor the whole works. I better let the press and photographers in. They're getting impatient. You're smooth, Cinderella. Real frantic smooth. Oh, and Princey, you're the most. Well, Vincent, at least you had a happy ending. Of course. You see, Lorene, there are all sorts of Cinderella stories. They happen every day, but they all end in exactly the same way. Even today, the beautiful girl 
can marry the handsome prince, and of course, they'll live happily ever after. <laughs> Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Speaking of Cinderella, starring Vincent Price and Lorene Tuttle and directed by Don Clark. Original script by Ed Verdier and Don Clark. The cast included Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Louise Arthur, Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedrow, Harry Bartell, Sam Edwards, Peter Leeds, Jack Crucian, and Byron Kane. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frug. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when we present Jacob's Hands, an original news story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. And we are proud to welcome as our narrator the distinguished author, Mr. Isherwood, presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. Sunday, over most of these same stations, the New York Philharmonic Symphony will be heard playing the Brahms Piano Concerto No. 1 in D minor, with Guido Cantelli conducting and Rudolf Fiercuzny as soloist. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Laura, starring Dana Andrews, Gene Tierney, Vincent Price, and Otto Kruger. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if there is one form of entertainment we Americans are singularly partial to, it's the mystery or detective story, popularly known as the whodunit. One out of every four new works of fiction published in this country is a mystery or detective story. Some 300 new books of this sort appear each year. Needless to say, you couldn't read all of them if you tried But tonight, we're bringing you one of the most intriguing mysteries of recent years. The current 20th century Fox hit, Laura. Our stars are Gene Tierney, who is just completing a bell for Adano at 20th century Fox, Dana Andrews, and Vincent Price. All three in their original screen roles. Also, the ever-versatile Otto Cooper. Now, I think one of the reasons mystery stories are so popular, especially in troubled times like these, is that they satisfy our sense of order. They take a troublesome and seemingly hopeless situation, and they put everything to rights, simply by the use of human intelligence and sensible methods. Of course, you could say the same about lots of things. Lux flakes, for instance. They take those troublesome problems of how to wash fine fabric safely so they'll wear longer and look better, and they give a quick and very satisfactory solution, especially in these difficult times when it's important to take care of what we have, 
It's little wonder Lux Flakes are so popular. Well, now it's curtain time. And here's act one of Laura, starring Dana Andrews as Mark McPherson, Gene Tierney as Laura, Vincent Price as Shelby Carpenter, and Otto Kruger as Paul Leidecker. Now, most people who read a newspaper or listen to the radio know the name Paul Leidecker. Mr. Leidecker is a legendary oracle of barbed wire and forget-me-not, whose enchanted pen and acid tongue have brought fame to hundreds and oblivion to just as many. His New York apartment is a combination art gallery and Roman bath. And now, immersed in one of his marble pools, Mr. Leidecker has a visitor. Detective Lieutenant Mark McPherson of the Homicide Bureau. Be careful, will you? That stuff is priceless. Oh. Mr. Leidecker? Quite an art collection in there. Those pieces you are pawing over are irreplaceable. Nice little place you have. It's lavish. I call it home. You'll hear about the murder of Laura Hunt. I made my statement yesterday to Sergeant Detective Crane. I know. Told him what I know. Now, suppose you tell me what you know. (laughs) Why not? Uh, Hand me that washcloth, Mr. Uh, Uh, McPherson. How good a detective are you? I've picked up a few facts. Laura Hunt was killed the night before last. A bell rang. She opened the door and someone pulled the trigger of a shotgun. It wasn't nice. The range was close. Have you found the shotgun? No. What else? The thought comes to me, Mr. Leidegger, who's questioning who? Uh, may I remind you that you're a guest in my home? <laughs> yeah, that's mm. right. What else, huh? Well, Miss Hunt was a very good-looking girl, probably. About 25, lived in a swell apartment, had a maid named Bessie. And where did she get the wherewithal to support such a menage? Bullet company, advertising agency. She had a good job, art director or something. Uh, not or something. She has a lady cousin in town and a couple of boyfriends. One named Shelby Carpenter and the other is... Paul Lidecker. Hmm. Today is Sunday. Why haven't you tried to see me? Because it's a peculiar case and I wanted to think. Hmm. If you'll wait, I'll go with you when you leave. Why? Murder's my favorite crime. My radio audience loves it. I know you'll visit all your suspects and I'd like to study their reactions. You're on the list yourself, you know. <laughs> Be insulted if I weren't. Were you in love with Laura Hunt, Mr. Lidecker? Was she in love with you? Laura considered me the wisest, the wittiest, the most interesting man she'd ever met. I was in complete accord with her on that point. Hmm. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll get dressed. Oh, uh, uh, where shall we be stopping first, Lieutenant? I'd like to see Laura Hunt's cousin. Uh, Mrs. Ann Treadwell, yes, yes, of course. So I'd like to ask a few questions, Mrs. Treadwell. I'll do anything I can to help. Oh, good morning, Paul. Good morning, huh? You were fond of your cousin, Mrs. Treadwell? I adored Laura. Paul can tell you. I can tell you considerable. Did you approve of Miss Hunt's coming marriage to Mr. Carpenter? Why shouldn't I approve? I don't know. Uh, Just what does Shelby Carpenter mean to you, Mrs. Treadwell? To me? Well, he comes here regularly. Is he a friend, acquaintance? Or are you in love with him? Well, this is beginning to assume fabulous aspects. What are you driving at? The truth. Are you in love with him? Why, no. Uh, I'm very fond of Shelby, of course. Everybody is. I despise him. You've been withdrawing a lot of cash from your bank, Mrs. Federal. Fifteen hundred at a clip. Seventeen hundred. I a... needed that money. Mm-hmm. The day you took out fifteen hundred, Carpenter deposited thirteen hundred fifty. When you withdrew seventeen, he deposited fifteen. You shooting crap, Sam? Oh, must I be insulted like this? Shelby needed some money. I lent it to him. I supposed I could do with it as I pleased. Sure, sure. Now, on Friday night, you were home alone. Why didn't you go to the concert with Mr. Carpenter? Concert? Why, I didn't go because he didn't ask me. Well, hello. Oh, just talking about you, Carpenter. What a coincidence to find you here. This is Lieutenant McPherson. Yes, we've met. I didn't know you were here, Mr. Carpenter. I've been lying down. My hotel room is so hot, and then all the reporters and the telephone. You know how it is, Lieutenant. I've... I've hardly slept a wink since it happened. Is that a sign of guilt or innocence, McPherson? I'm as eager to find the murderer as you are, Lieutenant. Laura and I were going to be married this week, you know. No, he doesn't know, and neither do I, nor you, nor anyone else. Oh? No, Laura had not definitely made up her mind to marry him. She told me so herself. She was going to the country to think it over. Laura was extremely kind, but she'd never have thrown her life away on a male beauty in distress. 
I suppose you've heard losers whine before, eh, Lieutenant? Yesterday you said you went to that concert Friday night. Mr. Carpenter? What did they play? Oh, some Brahms and Beethoven's Night. Mm-hmm. Well, this place Miss Hunt had in the country. Have you got a key to it? No, but I think there's one in her apartment. Well, I'll have a look. And perhaps I could help you? Okay, come along. Goodbye, Mrs. Bedlow. <laughs> You can start looking for that key now, Mr. Carpenter. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I'll try the den. Excuse me. That's the dame's portrait on the wall, isn't it? Will you stop calling Laura a dame? Look at the furnishings. Would you call this the home of a dame? Look at her portrait. I am. Not bad. It was painted by Joseph Carter. He was in love with her then. Have you ever been in love, McPherson? A doll in Washington Heights once got a fox fur out of me. Have you ever known a woman who wasn't a doll or a dame? Yeah, one, but she kept walking me past furniture stores. Uh, where are you going? Phonograph, there's a record on here. Selection from Bitter Sweet. One of Laura's favorites. Not exactly classical, but very nice. You know a lot about music? I don't know a lot about anything, but I know a little about practically everything. Then why did you say they played Brahms and Beethoven at that concert? They played nothing but Sibelius. Did they? Well... To be perfectly honest, I fell asleep and I didn't hear a note. Oh, I know it sounds phony, but I'm just a natural-born suspect. You see, I'm not the conventional type. Don't worry, I fall asleep at concerts myself. Find that key? No, maybe it's in here, at her desk. Uh, yes, yes it is. I, I knew there must be one around somewhere. Oh, it's funny, the police looked in that desk drawer yesterday and the drawer was empty. You had the key right along, didn't you, Carpenter? Yes. I didn't want to give it to you while Lidecker was present. I have private reasons that don't concern him. You have private reasons, no doubt, to lie about that key. Paul, I'm warning you to stop implying I had anything to do with Laura's death. Very well, I'll stop implying. I'll make a direct statement. You asked for this, Paul. Get it out, the two of you. Okay, we came here to find the key, and I've got the key. Now, let's get out. There's nothing more you want from me? No, not now. <laughs> I'll, I'll run along, then. You, uh, having lunch, Lieutenant? I guess so. There's uh, rather a superior restaurant nearby. Okay, let's go. Nice, quiet little place, Mr. Lidecker. Yeah. What's the matter? You uh, wouldn't call me a sentimental person, would you, Lieutenant? Well, I... Dozens of times we sat here at this very table, Lord and I. How long did you know her? Nearly five years. I was just thinking, we're here, we're eating lunch, and it was at lunch that I first met Laura. El Gonquin Hotel. I was alone. I looked up and I found her standing in front of me. She had a layout in her hand. Sample and question. Lidecker, how do you do? I'm Laura Hunt. Well? I'd like to talk something over with you, if I may. I am eating my lunch. Yes, but it's practically impossible to get to see you and I... Either thought... you're from some incredibly remote community where good manners are unknown, or you suffer from a common delusion that being a female exempts you from all the rules of civilized conduct. Possibly. But I wanted to show this to you. It's an ad for the Wallace Flow Wright pen. You're such a famous writer and commentator. It would be tremendously helpful if you'd endorse what we say about the Flow Wright pen. I don't use a pen. I write with a goose quill dipped in poison. And you may tell your employers that... Oh, I'm they don't know person. anything about this. It was all my idea. They'd give anything to get your endorsement. And if I were the person getting it, why... You disregard completely something far more important to me than your career. Oh? My food. You mean that, don't you? Well, of course I mean. I never heard of anything so selfish. In my case, self-absorption is completely justified. I have never discovered any subject quite so worthy of my attention. But in your column, on the radio, the things you say, they're filled with such understanding... Such sentiment. Miss Hunt, you are beginning to bore me. You're a poor man, Mr. Lidecker. I feel very sorry for you. Goodbye. Meeting with Laura Hunt occurred about two hours later. She kept after you, did she? No, I went to her because I couldn't stop thinking about her. I was more than slightly annoyed, but she had something, that girl. Something far deeper than good looks. I went to Bulletin Company proceeded to do something I have carefully avoided since the age of two. I apologize. Laura looked at me and she smiled. Your apology is accepted, Mr. Lidecker. It was very nice of you to go to all this trouble. Goodbye. Uh, in a moment, uh, Miss Hunt. Uh, for reasons which are too embarrassing to mention, 
I'd like to endorse the Wallace fluoride pen. Have you, Nat? You're a very strange man. Now I'm sure you're sorry for the way you acted. Let's not get psychiatric. But in a word, yes. And you are a very kind person. No, I'm vicious. The real secret of all my charm. But uh, if you think me kind, I'll call for you here at six. What? We'll have dinner together. I can't make it any later. Will you be ready? Why, why yes, I'll be ready. Coffee, Mr. Lidegger? Thanks. I started then to help Laura. I did everything in the world for her. I am a man reputedly of overwhelming ego, but this I admit without reserve. It was Laura's own talent, her own incredible charm that enabled her to rise to the top of her profession. Through me, Laura met everyone, famous and the infamous. And deferring always to my taste and judgment, she captivated them all. She became as well known as my walking stick in White Carnation. And like them, she was always with me. When does Carpenter enter the picture? Well, men couldn't keep away from Laura, but she never regarded them seriously but me. Her own discrimination ruled them out, and I never had to intercede. She met uh, Carpenter one night at a party at Aunt Treadwell's. She became attracted to him instantly. I was shocked. As a fellow completely without talent, with as much depth of character as a saucer of stale gin. Shortly before I took Laura home, I overheard her talking with Carpenter on the terrace. And so I spend my time doing what I've always done, nothing. <laughs> then tell me, what does it feel like living on the income from an estate? Oh, I once knew what it felt like, but the sheriff interfered with that over ten years ago. Then why don't you work for a living? Oh, I did ask a friend for a job once. All he did was laugh. He thought I was joking. Weren't you? No. When he saw I was sincere, he just got embarrassed. He said he'd phoned me. That was months ago. Do you really want a job? Yes, I do. Then you've got one. What? Now you think I'm joking. Well, I'm not. You just be at Bulletin Company tomorrow morning. You're going to work, Mr. Carpenter. And so in time, they got engaged, huh? They became attached to each other very quickly. I concealed my annoyance with masterly self-control, but here was a situation, however ridiculous, that required my attention. As you will see, it was for Laura's own good. Well, I followed them one night to this very restaurant. They had been working late on some advertising campaign. Tell me the truth, Laura. Will it really make people brush their teeth more often? <laughs> the idea is wonderful, Shelby. And so are the layouts. By the way, who's the model you use? You don't remember? Well, you hired her yourself, Diana Redford. Oh, of course. Laura, you look wonderful. Well, that's a quick switch of subject. Oh, I like this one much better than toothpaste. Good. Could you have dinner with me tomorrow night just like this? Maybe. And what about the night after that? But Shelby, I can't just... What about three weeks from tonight and all the nights in between? Don't you think I have any other engagements? What about two months from now and the month after that? And what about next year? Then it's all settled. What about breakfast? What about lunch? Beautiful lunches, day after day And what after... about beautiful work? Day after day... Why, Miss Hunt, the way you talk, you'd think I was in love with you. <laughs> Sparkling bit of dialogue, wasn't it, Lieutenant McPherson? If they'd known you were listening, they might have snapped it up a bit. Laura knew that I had overheard them because I told her so the following evening. By then, I had some other information to tell her also. I don't care what you found out about Shelby. It's the snooping about, Paul. It's degrading. Of course, but I thought you'd want to know. That sterling character almost went to jail last year for passing rubber checks. And after that, in Virginia, he was suspected of stealing his hostess's jewelry. Those are only insinuations. I know his fault, but a man can change, can't he? Oh, Laura, for heaven's sake, open your eyes. So Carpenter has changed. Yes, he's changed from you to do Diana Redfern. Running around with her now. A model from your own office. Paul, how can you be so despicable? You know what you mean to me. How can you try so deliberately to hurt me? Hurt you? Paul, Shelby and I are going to be married next week. Ah. Oh. You gave him a cigarette case on his birthday, didn't you? A valuable case. Where did you get it? From the pawn shop where Diana Redfern took it after he gave it to her. I don't believe it. He probably needed money and was too proud to borrow. Perhaps that's why this pawn ticket is in her name. I won't let this go any further. I'm going to telephone him. You won't find him at his hotel. Tonight, Carpenter's deserted both you and Miss Redfern. He's dining with a young and wealthy widow. Someone you know. Your cousin. He's been treating her rather badly these days. I'll phone Anne at once. Really, my dear, you don't think that Anne would give give him away, do you? Oh, it's nasty, I know it, but I must make you realize. Now, suppose we visit. 
Cousin Anne, hmm? He won't be there. I know he won't. Oh, good evening, Miss Laura. Good evening, Mr. Lidecker. Hello, Margaret. Oh, I- I'm terribly sorry, but Mrs. Treadwell isn't at home. Satisfied, Paul? Well, suppose we just wait for her. Huh? Oh, please, Mr. Lidecker. Uh, come in, Laura. I... Why, Laura, dear. And Paul. We were just having dinner. Yes, I know. Laura, I, I didn't expect to see you tonight. There you are, Laura, in a moment of supreme disaster. He's trite. I was just telling Anne about our getting married. Well, sit down, you two. Oh, no. No, thanks. I just stopped by to give you this. The cigarette case. You must have misplaced it somewhere. Laura. Laura, wait a minute. I... Good night, Anne. Good night, Shelby. this episode of the cigarette case, Mr. Leidecker? Last Wednesday night? On Friday, Laura had lunch with a Redfern girl. I wish I'd been there. And as I said in my statement, Laura and I were to have had dinner that night. At seven o'clock, my phone rang. I had a sudden sensation of depression, a foreboding of disaster. Hello? Paul, I'm frightfully sorry, but... I just can't meet you. Well, there's nothing wrong, Laura. I mean, you're not ill. Oh, no, no. I've just decided to go to the country for a few days. What, in this storm? Why, well, it's pouring. It won't last, Paul. It will do me a lot of good to be alone. Oh, you're thinking about Carpenter, hmm? Of course. Hmm. Please, I simply must have time to think this out for myself. Uh, when will you be back, dear? I don't know. I'll call before I leave. Maybe you could meet me. Well, of course I will. Thank you, Paul. Goodbye. Goodbye, my dear. That was the last time I ever heard her voice. This, this red fun girl, where does she live? In Newark. She's in the phone book. I will never forgive myself for allowing Laura to become involved with Carpenter. That was my fault. I should have stopped it long ago, somehow. And she's dead now. It's too late even to think about it. Well, so long. Yeah, too late even to think about it. Uh, oh, uh, uh, goodbye, Lieutenant. Our stars will return with Act Two of Laura in a moment. Now, here's what a young girl said to me the other day. Mr. Kennedy, why do you always talk as if only housewives wash dishes? Now, I work in an office from 9 to 5.30, but I'm the KP at home. Wash dishes every night for five of us. Oh, Mother cooks the dinner, but... I clean up afterwards so she has a chance to talk with Dad and catch up on mending for the kids. And I know a lot of other business girls who do dishes, too. So I asked her if she knew what dishpan hands were. (laughs) You bet I do. For a while, Mother brought home any old kind of soap. Strong chips, granules, bars. Well, sometimes my hands were so red I wanted to wear mitts when I took dictation. So that's why the dishpan test you talk about interested me. Now, you say changing to Lux takes dishpan hands away, and you're right. One day, Mother brought some Lux Flakes home, and in just a few days, my hands looked nicer. Soon, they were soft and smooth as you please. Then I said, maybe you're too young to worry about being thrifty, but that's another advantage with Lux. It goes a long way. Ounce per ounce does up to twice as many dishes, we've found, as other leading soaps tested. Then she said... Well, I can believe that, too. Some of the soaps I used to use didn't dissolve completely and made little gooey lumps in the dishpan. But with Lux, I get such quick and abundant suds. It dissolves so quickly. So I've told Mother to keep on getting Lux if she wants me to keep on washing dishes. And now, Mr. Barrymore returns to the microphone. Act two of Laura, starring Jean Tierney as Laura, Dana Andrews as Mark McPherson, Vincent Price as Shelby Carpenter, and Otto Kruger as Leidegger. <laughs> It's an hour later. In front of Laura Hunt's apartment, Lieutenant Detective Mark McPherson picks up Sergeant Crane. Together they make another thorough search of the girl's rules. Two things interest McPherson. A pile of Laura's letters and a bottle of Scotch whiskey. If you're thirsty, Lieutenant, I think you can do better than that there. I'm not thirsty. When did you say that maid was due here? Any minute now. Say, where's McCavity? In the basement. I've had the telephone tapped. He's sitting on it. But who's going to use the phone besides us? Nobody I know of. Still a good idea. 
I'm making a call now myself. Go down in the basement and relieve Mac. I'll wait here for the maid. Carpenter's coming, too. Okay. Hello. Moscones? This is Lieutenant McPherson, Homicide Bureau. Flora Hunt's been buying liquor from you, hasn't she? Yeah. Did she ever buy a brand of scotch called Black Pony? You sure of that? Okay. Thanks. Oh, come on in, Miss Clary. Never mind that Miss Clary stuff. My name's Bessie. Have a chair. It seems to me you... Those letters. Those letters belong to her. Yeah. You've been reading her private letters. I said sit down. Cops. I was brought up to spit whenever I saw one. <laughs> okay, go ahead and spit if that'll make you feel any better. What do you want to find out? Who killed Laura Hunt? How would I know? You think I'd done it? Ask anyone. Anyone who ever came here. Why, I'd have worked for or scrubbed for or done anything she would have wanted of me. Pay or no pay. You're loyal, Bessie. It wasn't only on account of the wonderful things she'd done for me. It was because she was so wonderful herself. Miss Hunt was a real lady. Something cops wouldn't know about. How'd this bottle get into her cabinet? I put it there. It's cheap scotch, Bessie. Laura Hunt wouldn't buy cheap scotch. I found it on a kitchen shelf Saturday morning. You know what that means? It means that somebody brought it here Friday night. And that somebody was here with her Friday night. Now, who was it? I don't know. But I didn't want anybody to get any wrong idea about her. God rest her soul. Why, I put the bottle in the liquor cabinet. I done more than that. There were two glasses. I washed them out and cleaned off the bottle, too. Destroying evidence, Bessie. I don't care. I'll do anything to keep her name from being dragged through the mud. Relax. Bessie, I'd like some ice in this setup. You mind? I'll get it. A couple of highball glasses. I'm expecting somebody. More cops? No, Shelby Carpenter. Let him in and then get the glasses. The door's open, Lieutenant. Oh, come in. I didn't expect you, Mrs. Treadwell. Oh, are you either, Mr. Lydecker? Shelby's dropping you at the hairdresser later. I only sent for you, Carpenter. I know. So I thought I might as well come along. Yes, my excuse is equally feeble. I just dropped in to inquire as to the state of your health, Lieutenant. Insipid, I trust? It's about to have a drink. Oh, Bessie, two more glasses. Yes, sir. Hello, Bessie. What are you doing here? I'm paid up for the week and I'm working regardless. Scott Slidecker? Excellent. Will this do? It's Black Pony. I'm a guest here. It'll have to do. Here's the ice and the glasses. <laughs> you can skip mine, Lieutenant. I'm not much of a daytime drinker. Oh? Well, that'll be all, Bessie. You can go home now. But I... Yes, sir. I'll go. Thank you. I remember when Laura bought these glasses. She loved them. She loved all her things, so. What are you going to do, sell them? I suppose so, if I'm appointed administrator. I'll probably call in Corey. Corey, the art dealer? Yes, he can dispose of everything. It'll be less, less gruesome that way. Uh, not quite everything, Anne. There are two or three things that belong to me. That vase, for instance, the antique fire screen, and, of course, the clock. That's quite a hunk of clock. You've got one just like it, haven't you? I noticed it in your apartment. They were made 200 years ago by Corbet Feast. Two clocks exactly the same... Created at the order of the Prince of Wales. I lent one to Laura. Oh, really, Paul? Yes, really. But the vase is the gem of my collection, and I intend to have it back. I can take it with me now. Nothing's leaving here, Lidecker. Only you. Oh, is that your quaint way of indicating dismissal? Well, we're all leaving. I've got to get back to headquarters. But I don't understand, Lieutenant. I, I thought you sent for me. I did. Well, don't you want to ask me any questions? Nothing pressing. Oh, I see. Well, I bid you goodbye. The vase, Mr. Lidecker. Put it down. The va- oh, oh, go, of course. Just a slight touch of kleptomania. Crane? Yeah? McPherson, I'm back. Upstairs in her apartment. How you doing in the basement? Any calls come in this afternoon? Not a thing. I've just been looking the place over. I've only done it 40 times. Anything interesting? Everything's interesting. Especially that portrait. A really beautiful doll, Lieutenant. Yeah. I've read her letters, smelled the perfume, drank a scotch, gone through her wardrobe. Wait a minute. Yeah? Someone in the hall. Look, at 7 o'clock, Alford will be along to relieve you. Make sure Alford keeps his ear on that phone. Right. Well, who is it? Yes. Coming, Lidecker. You just happen to be passing by. And I noticed the lights on. Uh, by the way, have you sublet this apartment, McPherson? You're here often enough to pay rent. Any objection? Yes. Especially to your prying into Laura's letters. That bundle in your pocket, for instance. No, these. They're yours. The best of the bunch. That's the trouble with getting murdered, Lidecker. It ruins your privacy. And have detectives who buy portraits of murdered victims a claim to privacy? 
Lancaster Corey tells me you already put in a bid for Laura's portrait. That's none of your business. McPherson, did it ever strike you that you're acting very strangely? It's a wonder that you don't come here with roses and a box of drugstore candy. Have you been dreaming of Laura as your wife? By your side at the policeman's ball or in the bleachers? Or listening to the heroic saga of how you acquired a silver shin bone in a gun battle with a gangster? Yeah, I see you have. Why don't you go home? I'm busy. Well, perhaps we can come to terms now, huh? You want a portrait? Perfectly understandable. I want my possessions, my vase, my clock, my fire screen. Now, if you... Get going. Come, you better watch out, Lieutenant. You'll end up in the psychiatric ward. I don't think they've ever had a patient who fell in love with a beautiful girl who died before he met her. Or did you meet her? Well, good night, McPherson. of drugstore candy. Have you been dreaming of Laura as your wife? Yes, I can see you have. You better watch out, Lieutenant. You'll wind up in the psychiatric ward. I don't think that the devil... What's the matter with me? Maybe you can tell me. You, the girl in that portrait there. You're beautiful. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Somebody killed you. Why? Why? I could sit here and look at you all night. All night long, I could sit and... Who is it? Who's in there? You. You. What are you doing there? You're alive. If you don't get out once, I'll call the police. You're Laura Holmes, aren't you? Aren't you? I'm going to call the police. But I am the police, you see. My badge, credentials, Mark McPherson. What's all this about? You don't know? Don't you know what's happened? No. Haven't you seen a paper? Where have you been? In the country. I... I don't get a newspaper. Haven't you got a radio? It was broken. What? Here. Look at these headlines. And sit down, Miss Hunt. I'm very glad to see you. On Friday night, somebody was murdered in this room. What? What did you say? Until you opened that door just now, we thought it was you. Now, do you have any idea who it could have been? You don't know. A girl died from shotgun wounds, close range. No, apparently we don't know. Who had a key to this apartment? Nobody except my maid. When did you say it happened? Friday night. You better take off that coat. It's dripping wet. When did it start raining? Just a few minutes ago. It's teeny outside. It was raining Friday night, too, when that girl... Wait a minute. Raining. Now, come with me, Miss Hunt. Here, into your room. I want you to please look in your closet. I simply don't understand. The closet, Miss Hunt. Here, open it up. Do all these dresses belong to you? Certainly they belong to me. All of them? Every one? Are you out of your mind? Of course they... What's this one? I don't know. You tell me. Why, this dress isn't mine. It's hers. Diana Redfern's. She had it on when she came for lunch on Friday. Well... But this dress wasn't in here when I left. It wasn't. This Redfern girl. Is she a girl about your size? Yes, she's a model. She works for us. Yes, and she lives in Newark, but she hasn't been home. Her landlady said she'd gone to Philadelphia. That's right. We have a branch office in Philadelphia. She had an assignment there, but she didn't go. It was postponed. She got relatives in the city? An aunt and uncle. The same name. They live in the village. Thanks. Where are you going? Just to the telephone, Miss Hunt. I think Miss Redfern's aunt and uncle had better go to the morgue right away to make an identification. Identif... Oh... <laughs> Right. So long, Inspector. Well, that's that, Miss Hunt. They've located the red thing. Yes, we ought to know soon. Now, Miss Hunt, when you went to the country Friday, did you see anyone you knew on the train? No. Then what? I got off at Norwalk. I keep a car in a private garage near the station. I drove to my house. It's about 18 miles. What did you do in the country? Worked in my garden. Didn't leave your place in all that time? I keep everything I need in the house. I went there expressly to be alone. Mm Mm-hmm. You were going to marry Shelby Carpenter this week? Yes. But you went away for a long weekend to be alone. You know Shelby Carpenter has a key to this apartment. Why didn't you tell me? Because I know nothing of the sort. He hasn't. How else did the Redfern girl get into the apartment? You knew she was in love with Carpenter. I knew she was in love with him. She told me so herself. But I also know that she meant nothing to Shelby. I understand him better than you do. She was found, and I'm convinced now it was Miss Redfern, 
She was found in your dressing gown. What of it? You yourself told me it was raining Friday night. You yourself just saw her dress. It's full of wrinkles and rain spots. Well, how did she get in here? Why? Who brought her here? I haven't the slightest idea. Now look, Miss Hunt, do you love this carpenter fellow so much you'd risk your own safety to protect him? He must have brought her here. You suspect me. You think I killed somebody in jealousy. I'm trying to get at the truth. I'm sorry. Strictly routine. Well, I'll uh, see you in the morning, Miss Hunt. Meanwhile, don't leave this apartment and don't use the telephone. But I've got to use it. I've got to let my friends know I'm alive. I'm sorry, but I must insist. If anything should happen to you now, I I wouldn't like it. All right, I promise. There's one more thing. I know that you went away to make up your mind whether you'd marry Shelby Carpenter or or not. What did you decide? I decided not to marry him. Well, uh, I'll be seeing you in the morning, Miss Hunt. Good night. Good night. Alford? Is that you, Mark? Yeah. Watch your step. It's pretty dark down here. Anything come through those earphones? Yeah. The mall just called. Is the Redfern girl all right? Well, it kind of balls things up, doesn't it? Yeah. Say, you seem pretty... Hey, wait a minute. She's dialing the number up there. Give me those earphones. Here. Hello? Shelby, this is Laura. I just... Laura? I can't tell you... Don't say anything on the telephone. Meet me right away in front of the office. Can you leave? Right away. Was that... Yeah. The dames are always pulling a switch on you. You stay here, Alford. McCavity out front? Yeah. Get headquarters. Tell them to send another man down here right away. McCavity's going to tail the girl. What about you? I think I'll stick by Mr. Carpenter. I'll see you. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, our stars will be back with Act Three of Laura. Now... Here's our Libby with her head in a turban, looking like a fortune teller. I see the future of your stockings. Well, here's a lady who would like to know how long her stockings will last. Suppose you tell her. How long have you had them now? Uh, They're new. I've worn them twice. You will wear these stockings for three weeks more, until Monday, February 26th. Why, how wonderful. How can you tell? (laughs) It's simple. According to a washing expert... 23 days is the average wearing cycle of rayon stockings. So, if you've worn these two days already, you've still got 21 days or three weeks to go. But my stockings never last that long. I must be way under average. Oh, that's too bad. Perhaps I can help you. I see you in the evening washing stockings. I see cake soap and rubbing. That's right. In this weather, stockings get all splattered up the back, and I have to rub to get the spots out. Well, I think that's your trouble, then. You see, stockings are delicate. They just can't take harsh treatment like that. They need gentle care, lukewarm water and gentle luck, and no rubbing. If they are spotted, just take a few luck flakes in your moistened fingers and work them in gently. Then squeeze the suds through the stocking, rinse well, and dry rayons for at least 24 hours. With proper care, I'm sure your new stockings will last much longer. Yes, strain tests show that Lux stockings do last longer, actually twice as long as those washed with strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. Twice the wear from every pair with Lux care. That's worthwhile, isn't it? So stick to Lux for stockings. Now, Mr. Barrymore returns to the microphone. Now, after the play, you're invited to join us for a brief chat with our stars. Now, here's Act Three of Laura, starring Dana Andrews as Mark, Gene Tierney as Laura, Vincent Price as Shelby Carpenter, and Otto Kruger as Lydica. For three hours, Detective Lieutenant McPherson has been following Shelby Carpenter. Now in the black hours of night, he stops his car near a lonely house 18 miles from Norwalk and makes his way carefully toward the front door. It's not quite shut. He peers through the crack for a moment and then walks in. What? What are you doing with that shotgun, Carpenter? Well, I must admit this is somewhat embarrassing, Lieutenant. Let me see that gun. 
been fired recently. Yes, I killed some rabbits with it. When? Oh, a while back. I don't know exactly. I gave the gun to Laura for protection. You haven't borrowed it lately. You didn't just bring it back. Well, you ought to know. You've been following me. You realize the spot you're in? You brought Diana Redfern to Laura's apartment. You knew all along it was she who was murdered. Didn't you know Laura would come back any day and spill the whole thing? Or did you plan to kill her, too? Oh, you're being fantastic, McPherson. You took a bottle of Black Pony to her house Friday night. I took it there over a week ago. Bessie says Friday night. I can't help what Bessie says. Where's the key to Laura's apartment? I haven't got one. I never had one. Okay, you didn't bring the Scots there Friday night and you never had a key. How did you get in? Well, I... Come on, talk. Talk? Well, all right. You see, Laura kept an extra key in her office. I'd asked Diana to meet me in a restaurant. I, I wanted to have it out with her once and for all. You know, she thought... Well, she thought she was in love with me. She started to get hysterical. We had to leave. Well, I couldn't very well take her to her room in Newark, could I? Or to my hotel room. So we started to walk. It began to rain suddenly and we got drenched. I thought of the key and I stopped by the office to get it. We couldn't find a taxi and so we walked back to Laura's apartment. Yeah. Diana went to Laura's bedroom. When she came out, she had on a dressing gown. Well, we talked, argued maybe, for a couple of hours and... And then the doorbell rang. Why didn't you go to the door? I suppose one of Laura's friends had found me there. What would they think of finding Diana there? I told her to say that Laura had lent her the apartment. Anybody who knew Laura would have believed that. Don't stop. Well, I heard Diana open the door, and then there was an awful explosion. By the time I reached her, the door was shut again. Diana just lay there on the floor. Didn't you go out to see who did it? I was too confused, too horrified to do anything. The hallway was dark. I, I don't remember what I did. I knew I had to keep out of it and keep Laura out of it, too. The only thing on my mind was the safety of a person whose life was dearer to me than my own. Don't you understand that? Did you think Laura had killed her? Did you? I don't remember what I thought. Do you think so now? No. On Saturday, when Detective Crane went to see you, you seemed sincerely shocked. I was. I hadn't expected the police to mistake Diana's body for Laura's. But your alibi was already the concert. You knew the minute Laura got back to town, it wouldn't stick. I couldn't think that far ahead. I was groping for some way to keep Laura's name out of it. I was heartbroken about Diana and panic-stricken about Laura. Okay. And tonight you met Laura in front of her office. What did you talk about? About what I've just told you. Well, what are you turning on the radio for? To see if it works. Why don't you tell the truth? She says you're here to get rid of that gun. She doesn't even know I came here. It was my own idea. The radio works fine, doesn't it? Well, why wouldn't it? I hoped it wouldn't. All right, we're driving back to New York. Well, am I under arrest? I don't know. Just don't leave town. It would be a very foolish thing to do. Oh, good morning, Lieutenant. Good morning. You know, I have a terrific yen to call you Laura. Why don't you forget that Lieutenant business and just call me Mark? Because Especially I... since I brought you all these groceries. Breakfast. You didn't buy any food when you went out last night. So you know. Yeah. I can fix bacon and eggs. Can you make coffee? Oh, I uh, spoke to Bessie. She'll be a little late. When I told her you were alive, she'd down there passed out. Yes, yeah, she phoned. You might have been a little more delicate about it. Suppose you set the table, but we'll have to wait a little while for the coffee. I've asked Paul Lidegger to stop by. Did you tell him about me that I'm alive? No. Why not? It's brutal. I'm not doing it for laughs. Why did you break your promise last night? Not to go out? Because I'll never be bound to do anything unless it's of my own free will. The Redfern girl was in love with Carpenter. You admitted that. I also told you he wasn't in love with her. Paul? I don't know. Just sit still in here. Hello, Lieutenant. Laura? Oh, good morning, darling. Hello, dear. Well, excuse me, Lieutenant. I'd like to kiss my fiancé good morning. Oh, so it's on again. So do I have to get a police permit? So now who? Come in, Lidecker. The door's unlatched. Lidecker, huh? Right on my heels. Well, me person, have you thought over the deal I suggested? What about the portrait and the... Why? Why? Paul! Laura. I'll be all right in a moment. Laura, what? Not now, dear. Don't try to talk now. Come on, I'll take him into the bedroom. Just be quiet, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. How is he? He'll be all right. 
He's lying down. This is going just a little too far, McPherson. Your methods are vicious. Must have been a terrible shock to him seeing me. Poor darling. Don't tell me you're in love with Lydecker, too. Stop talking that way to Miss Hunt. Laura, why do you cover up for a guy like Carpenter? What story did he tell you when you met him last night? Don't answer him, darling. Shut up. I've got enough on you, Carpenter, to arrest you right now. Frick McPherson, the handcuffs. Trundle him off to the Hooskow. Oh. I hope you'll forget my weak touch of angina, my dear. It's an old family custom. Uh, did I interrupt a pinch, McPherson? I've changed my mind for the moment. Well, in that case, better order some food and liquor, Laura. People are coming to celebrate your return this afternoon. A cocktail party. Who asked them? I did. In the quiet of your boudoir just now. I called my man, and he's calling all our dear friends. Why did you do that? Well, perhaps our friends can weave all the loose ends into a noose. Eh, McPherson? You shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mr. Lidecker. I'd already called them. Well, I'll run along now, Laura. Sorry about the breakfast. Some other time, maybe. Shelby, Shelby, come here. What's the matter, darling? Your party's a huge success. Shelby, tell me. I must know. Why did you go to the country last night? Laura. Well? You don't know? I was afraid you wouldn't think of hiding that shotgun. What shotgun? The one I gave you. Oh, darling, you don't have to lie to me. Well, what's going on here? Oh, nothing at all, Ann. In case you don't know it, that McPherson man hasn't taken his eyes off you. I know. Maybe it would be better if I, well, mingled with our guests. Laura, McPherson suspects him. Shelby. He suspects me, too. Oh, don't be absurd. You could never have done a thing like that. Darling. Yes. Are you as interested in Lieutenant McPherson as he is in you? Anne, I only met him last night. Sometimes that's more than long enough. Anyway, he's better for you than Shelby. Anybody is. Shelby's better for me. Why? Because I can afford him. He's no good, but he's what I... Wait a minute. He's coming. Mark. Oh, Mark, is it? I'm sorry to break up your party, Laura. But you haven't. You've been a model guest so far. I'm not joking. Get on your things. I'm taking you to headquarters. I was going to get a cell and a denim dress. Is this your office? Before they trot out that denim dress, I want to know what you why you've been holding out on me. Have I been? You told me the radio at your country place was broken. It was. Not last night. I stopped in the village on my way back. I asked the local handyman to fix it. And how did he get in? With a key. The key I always leave under the flower pot on the porch. All right, I'll accept that. Why? Because you're too intelligent to make up a story I could check so easily. The main thing I want to know is why you pulled that switch about Shelby Carpenter. You told me last night you decided not to marry him. But today it was on again. Why? I changed my mind. What went on between you and Carpenter when you met him last night? Or should I guess? He convinced you that if you broke your engagement now, people would think you believed that he killed Diana Redford. Yes. But now I know the real reason why he wanted to stay engaged. He thinks I did it. So do you. Are you in love with him? No, I don't know how I ever could have been. Come on, Laura. You're going home. But I thought I was... That's under... what I wanted you to think. You and a few other people. I didn't even book you. And all this was just some sort of a game. I was 99% certain about you, but I just had to make sure of that 1% doubt. Wasn't there an easier way to make sure? You're, you're smiling. You're not sore? No, Mark. I'm not sore. Go back to your party, if there's anything left of it. And you? I'm going to Lydecker's apartment. I'll drop by later on. I'm glad they've all gone, Laura. It's been a long time since we've been together. Well, darling, what's the matter? Nothing, Paul. You're worried. Yes, McPherson. He's using you for something. I don't think so. I don't deny he's infatuated with you in some warped fashion, but he's incapable of any normal human relationship. He's been dealing too long with criminals. When you were attainable, unattainable, and he thought you were dead, that's when he wanted you most. Fell in love with your portrait. He was glad when I came back, as if he were waiting for me. You know what he calls women? Dames. A dame in Washington Heights once got a frock's fur coat out of him. That's his very word. That doesn't mean anything, Paul. He isn't like that. Laura, my dear, you have one glaring weakness. With you, a lean, strong body is always the measure of a man. And you always get hurt. No man is ever going to hurt me again. No, not even you. I? Hurt you? 
Laura, look at me. You were a long time finding out about Shelby. But that's all over now. We'll be together again. Wait, the door just opened. Don't get up. It's only me. Oh, haven't you heard of science's latest triumph, the doorbell? I'm glad you're here, Lidecker. I've just been to your apartment. Uh, do you mind if I should search your pockets? I found a shotgun. Oh. But I wasted my time. It wasn't the gun that killed Diana Redfern. First he tells you he thinks you're innocent, and then he proceeds to check up on you. I never said you're innocent. Me? I'm talking about Laura. My dear, this entire maneuver could be a trick to throw you off guard. It could be. But it isn't. I know. I believe you, Mark. See, I'm beginning to get annoyed. Laura, it's the same obvious pattern. If McPherson weren't full of muscles and good looks, uh, in a cheap sort of way, you'd see through him in a second. Paul, I mean to be as kind about this as I know how. But you're the one following the same obvious pattern. First with that painter you thought was in love with me, then with Shelby, and now I suppose... Laura, what are you saying? That I don't think we should see each other again. But, darling, you're not yourself. Yes, I am. For the first time in ages, I know what I'm doing. Very well. I hope you'll... Never regret what promises to be a disgustingly earthy relationship. Oh, uh, listen to my broadcast in ten minutes. I'm discussing the other great loves of history. That was the most difficult thing I've had to do in my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, but I still haven't found it. I haven't found it. What? The gun that killed Diana Redfern. What are you doing? Taking a look at your clock. He's got one just like it, hasn't he? Yes, but... I wasn't alone just now in Lydecker's apartment. A guy named Sergeant Crane came with me. Crane's old man is a clockmaker. And while I wore myself out looking for a shotgun, all the sergeant did was drool about Lydecker's clock. He said probably there's not another one like it in the world. Obviously he was wrong. Yeah, and he showed me something about that clock. A little feature with all clocks made by Corbe Feast. Underneath, here, near the floor, is a little spring. You push the spring and the whole bottom compartment opens up. See? Like this. But I never knew. In the old days, I guess people used the compartment for a kind of safe. Today, they use it for hiding other things. Shotguns, for instance. Well, this is it, Laura. I'm sure of it. And it was put here by the only man who knew about this clock, Paul Lidecker. Oh, no. Yeah. When the red friend girl opened the door, this hallway was dark. Lidecker saw a girl, assumed it was you, and he fired. He figured if he couldn't have you for himself, he was going to make sure no one else did. He heard Carpenter, so he hid behind the stairway outside in the corridor. Carpenter was scared to death. He got out as fast as he could. Then Lydecker slipped back in and tucked the gun away in the grandfather clock. Oh, I felt it ever since I came back. I'm the one to blame. Not for anything I did, but for what I didn't do. I should have stopped seeing Paul long ago. But I couldn't. I owed too much to him. I can understand all that. But I can't understand why you tried so hard to protect Carpenter. I was frantic you'd arrest him. I knew he wasn't guilty. But I knew Paul would do everything he could to incriminate him. It was his way of getting rid of Shelby, just as he got rid of every other man who might have meant something to me. For a charming, intelligent girl, you've certainly surrounded yourself with a remarkable collection of dopes. Now, look, don't touch anything. I'm leaving the gun and the clock. I'll have it picked up in the morning. You're going? Yeah, I'm picking up Lidecker. Mom. I've got to. You know that. Try and get some sleep, will you? Sleep? Well, maybe I can. I'll read a book. Listen to the radio. Will you call me later? Sure. Try and forget all this. It's just a bad dream. Good night, Laura. Good night, Mark. Good night. And be careful, please. Final word for this evening, Mr. Paul Lidecker. As history has proved, love is eternal. The strongest motivation for man's actions throughout centuries. Love is stronger than life. It reaches beyond the dark shadows of death. May I remind you of some favorite lines of mine from Dowson's poem? They are not long, the weeping and the laughter and love and desire and hate. I think they have no portion in us. After we pass the gate. They are not long. Days of wine and roses. Out of a misty dream. Our path emerges for a while. Then closes within a dream. <gasps> That's the way it You've is, You've heard the voice of Paul Lidecker by electrical transcription. This is the... 
There is the final irony to all of this, Laura. You know how I despise melodrama, and yet here I am, a gun in my hand, about to kill you. Oh, you've taken one life, isn't that enough? The best part of myself, that's what you are, Laura. Do you think I'm going to leave you to the vulgar poings of a second-rate policeman who thinks you're a dame? You'll find you, Paul, you know you will. leave. Don't you overestimate the man who thought I left a few moments ago. And all I did was wait in the hall, Laura. And then I let myself in again with the key I've always had. Laura. I'm not going to Laura. lose you, Laura. Open the door. Don't move, Laura. He didn't leave. He's somewhere in this building. Laura, are you all right? He'll find us together, darling. As always we should have been. As always we will be. No, no, no. Turn your face, darling. Please, turn your face. I can't. Sorry, Miss Hunter, I had to do it. I better let the boss in before he busts down your door. Laura, Laura. It's, it's all right, Mark. Got him through the window, Lieutenant, from the fire escape. I'll call headquarters. Fine detective. A fine detective I am. Laura. Goodbye. Goodbye, my love. Oh, my. It's all right, darling. It's all right. The bad dream is over. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price in The Letter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some stars are born to fame. Others have fame thrust upon them. Then there's a third kind, like Betty Davis. All the honors in Hollywood have come to her at one time or another. Those who judge stars by box office value place her among the leaders. Those who judge by purely artistic standards accord her the same position. She's won the Academy Award twice, and yet I doubt whether Betty has has ever been completely satisfied with one of her performances. Like most great artists, she always found some detail that, uh, that might be improved, but neither the box office nor the critic judge as harshly as her own instinct. Tonight, we present Betty Davis in the letter by Somerset Maugham. She gave one of her finest performances in the Warner Brothers picture, and that was only fitting, because it was in another Maugham story called Of Human Bondage, that Betty really came of age as an actress. The letter packs the drama of a lifetime into a few weeks of love and violence and death. It's a great play for a great actress. But you'll hear more than one star performance because Herbert Marshall will play opposite Betty in the same part he had in the picture. And our third star is Vincent Price, who makes his first appearance here tonight. When I was first connected with the theater, the audience which enjoyed a production like this was limited to the few hundred people who could crowd into a Broadway playhouse. You can picture the riot that'd be if tonight's stars were appearing on Broadway for one night only. But today, Lux Flakes has made it possible for 30 or 35 million people to hear the play at the same time, and every one of you has the best seat in the house. The soldier in New Guinea... It's in the third row center, right beside the banker who is listening from his Park Avenue apartment. And Lux Flakes is at work in both places, in millions of American homes and abroad where a steel helmet may do double duty as a wash tub. Here's the curtain now for the first act of the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and Vincent Price as Howard Joyce. this happened a few years ago on the Malay Peninsula in the days before the war. Just north of Singapore lay the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce built by natives and white men. On this particular night in the main bungalow of one of these plantations, a light burns dimly through a shaded window. 
The night is hot and humid. The soft breeze heavy with the scent of flowers. A clouded moon hangs low in the sky, filtering slowly through the trees, making patterns of shimmering silver on the ground. There is deep silence. Suddenly, the door of the bungalow is flung open. Missy, I hear a gunfire. Missy Crosby, I hear. That man, that is Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? I, I think him dead. You see him, Missy Crosby? Do you know where the new district officer lives? Yes, Missy. Send someone for him at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. And get word to my husband. He's out somewhere on the number four plantation. Yes, Missy, I try. Leslie! Leslie, where are you, Leslie? I'm here. Mr. Crosby? Yeah? I'm John Withers, the new district officer. Where's Mrs. Crosby? She locked herself in her room. She wouldn't see me until you came. Huh? Excuse me. Leslie, let me in. Leslie, darling, it's Robert. Leslie, what happened? Didn't they tell you? They said Hammond was killed. Is he... Is he still out there? I had your head boy remove the body to a shed. Leslie, what happened? Tell me. He tried to... To make love to me, and I shot him. Leslie... Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you There, darling, there. Hold me tight. I'm so frightened. There's nothing, nothing to be frightened about. It'll be all right. <gasps> oh, there, now, 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 that's better. Uh, I'll try not to do that again. Mr. Withers, I hope you'll understand. I didn't want to see anyone until my husband came. Yes, of course, I understand, Mrs. Crosby. Oh, Howard, uh, come in. I got your message in Singapore. Howard, how nice of you to come. Well, naturally, I want to be here if I can help. Oh, you will help me. Us. In every way I can, as your lawyer and your friend. You're a dear. Mr. Withers, this is Mr. Howard Joyce, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? How's Dorothy Howard? Oh, she's very well and anxious to see you. Has her sister arrived from England? Adele? Oh, yes. She came last week. Oh. Oh, here now. Uh, here now. Leslie, you better be resting. Oh, I do feel dreadfully faint. Come and lie down, darling. I'll, uh, I'll get you a drink. I'm sorry to be so tired. Nonsense. You're being very brave. How long have you been here, Mr. Withers? About an hour. One of the Crosby houseboys came to fetch me. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes. He was just riddled with bullets. What? Well, here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Uh, here, you two. You better have a drink yourselves. Thanks, but I'm afraid I shouldn't. I'm on duty of a sort, you know. Well, I'll have one, Bob. You feeling any better, Leslie? Much better, thank you. Um, Mrs. Crosby, I'm afraid it's my duty to... Ask you some questions. Well, I think I can wait, Mr. Withers, until my wife... Oh, it's all right, Robert, really. I, I feel perfectly well now. Then suppose you tell us, Leslie, in your own words, exactly what happened. I'll try. And take your time, Mrs. Crosby. Remember, we're all friends here. You've been so patient. Well, well, as you know, Robert was spending the night at Number 4 Plantation. Oh, I never mind being alone. A planter's wife gets used to that. Oh, my I dear. had dinner rather late, and I, I started working on my lace. Oh, I don't know how long I'd been working, when suddenly I heard footsteps outside and someone came up on the veranda and said, Good evening, can I come in? I was startled because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Who is it, I asked. Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, I said, come in and have a drink. Were you surprised to see him? Well, I was, rather. He hadn't been in the house for ages, had he, Robert? Three months at least. I told him Robert was over at the number four plantation getting out a, a shipment or something. Wasn't that it, darling? What did he say to that? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come over and see how you were getting on. Well, I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another. He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it yesterday? Did you? Oh, yes, I believe you did. Well, we, we went on chatting until... Well... Well, suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating. He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said, Leslie. He said, you've got very pretty eyes. It's too bad to hide them under those ugly spectacles. Has he ever said anything of the sort to you before? Oh, no, never, and I thought it impertinent. I don't wonder. Did you answer him? I said I didn't care a row of beans what he thought about me. But he only laughed and said, I'm going to tell you all the same. 
I think you're the prettiest thing I've ever seen. No, sir. Let her finish, Bob. Well, in that case, I said I can only think you half-witted. He laughed again and moved his chair up closer. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't throw him out there and then. Well, I didn't want to make a fuss. I think a woman only makes a perfect fool of herself if, if she makes a scene every time a man pays her a compliment. When did you first suspect that Hammond was serious? The next thing he said. He looked at me straight in the face and he said, Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? Swine. Were you surprised? Of course I was surprised. Well, we've known him for seven years, Robert, and he's never paid me the smallest attention. I, I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. We haven't seen very much of him the last few years. Yes, yes. Go on, Leslie. Well, he helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking before. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. He emptied his glass and asked me in a funny, abrupt way, Do you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? I said, that's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Oh, it's awful having to tell you all this. I'm so ashamed. I wish there was some way we could spare you, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie, it's for your own good that we know the facts. All you can remember of them. Very well. I'll tell you the rest. I got up from my chair. I was standing in front of the table about, about here. He rose and stood in front of me. Good night, I said. But he just looked at me. And his eyes were all funny. I'm not going, he said. Well, then I began to lose my temper. You poor fool. Don't you know I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. He answered, Robert's away. Well, that was the last straw. Oh, I wasn't frightened, just angry. If you don't go away this minute, I told him, I'll call the boys and have you thrown out. I walked past him to call the boys, and he took hold of my arm and swung me back. Oh, I screamed as loud as I could. He flung his arms about me and began to kiss me. I struggled to tear myself away from him. Oh, he seemed like a madman. He kept talking and talking, saying he loved me. Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. I'm very sorry, Leslie, but we'll have to know the rest. Well, he lifted me in his arms. I, I struggled to get free, but he was too strong. He started to carry me, and, and then he stumbled on those steps, and I got away from him. Suddenly, I remembered Robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest. He got up, but I reached it before he caught me. Oh, it was all instinctive. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report and saw him lurch, lurch toward the door. I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch and fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more. Just the reports, one after another, until there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. And suddenly I looked down and saw him lying there, lying in the moonlight. It was... Only then that I knew what I'd done. My poor darling. Mrs. Crosby, may I say I think you've behaved magnificently? I'm terribly sorry we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. Well, you were all very kind. It's quite obvious the man only got what he deserved. Withers, if you'll come with me, I'd, I'd like to see the body for a minute. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll take you to the shed. We'll only be a few minutes. My poor child. Oh, Robert, what have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths of them wouldn't have had the courage. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. So horrible to think that I killed him. Leslie, why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. Darling, we have been happy, haven't we? You've been the best wife a man could have. I'm grateful for all the time we've been together. Oh, Robert, don't say it that way. It sounds so... so in the past. Oh, nonsense. We've got most of our lives ahead of us. Oh, if only there was something I could do to help you right now. You can love me. That's all I need. I've always loved you. Yes, but now. Leslie, darling, if I could love you anymore, I would now. Robert. You have to be very indulgent towards my cooking, gentlemen. I can't vouch for it. Well, I can and will. Funny. The head boy running off tonight. Yeah, it is odd. Well, he couldn't have done any better than this, my dear. It's delicious. It certainly is. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we should start for Singapore as soon as we're finished. Right away? It's still dark, Howard. It'll be eight o'clock by the time we get there. We'll ring the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. I think that's the first thing to do, don't you, Withers? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's the best thing to do. Would I have to be arrested? Well, you see, Mrs. Crosby, uh, as a matter of fact... I... I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Shall I be imprisoned? Well, that's up to the Attorney General. 
But it's quite possible he'll be able to accept bail. He's, he's a very good fellow, and I'm sure he'll do everything he can. How do you mean, be able to accept bail? Well, my dear, it, it depends on what the charge is. What do you mean by that? I think it's not unlikely that he'll say that only one charge is possible, and in that case, well, I'm afraid that an application for bail would be useless. What charge? Murder. <coughs> Leslie. Oh, I'm quite all right. More coffee, dear. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, if we're going to leave, I'd better put a few things together. I won't be long. Let me do it, Robert. No, no, no. Don't bother, dear. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it, Howard? Just before, when I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh, yes? It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. I'm afraid it sounds very cold-blooded. But I was so terrified I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was confused and blurred. Oh, well, there, Leslie, I, I shouldn't even have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. Come in. Well, Longchi? Mr. Crosby to see you, sir. Oh, ask him to come in. Mr. Crosby. Thanks. Hello, Bob. Uh, how, how is she? Have you seen her? If I can be of any assistance, sir, uh, I shall remain within call. Not at the moment, Ong, thanks. Ong has been a great help on the case. He finds out everything. He's the perfect confidential clerk. I tried to catch you at the house. I... Had to see you, Howard. You needn't hesitate about coming to the office, Bob. You know you're always welcome. How is everything? Everything's fine. In fact, Leslie's much better than you. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I don't mind confessing I'm all in. It's the first time we've been separated for more than a day since we were married. Oh, you mustn't let yourself go to pieces, old man. I've tried to work, but it's no good. The estate can go to blazes for all I care. I hate the house and every tree on the place. But then why not stay in town with us? Dorothy's for it, and so am I. Thanks, I think I will. I won't be so lonely. Oh, you'd better get some sleep before you see Leslie. You don't want her to have to cheer you up. She's a plucky woman. It's monstrous they should have to keep her in that filthy prison all this time. They have no choice. Anyway, it's only a week now before the trial. Well, the whole thing's a farce. Why subject her to the ordeal of a trial? Because she admitted killing a man. A trial is inevitable. She shot him as she, as she would have shot a mad dog. You don't have to convince me, Robert. You know, it, it's curious Hammond was able to keep his life so hidden. That gambling house he owned, and especially the Eurasian woman. Will she be one of the witnesses? And I shan't call her. I'll just produce evidence that Hammond was married to her. He managed to keep that manager's secret, too. Oh, I know you're busy, Howard. I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, nonsense. Now stop worrying. That's your lawyer's job. All right, thanks, old man. I'll, I'll see you up at the house. Yes? Mr. Joyce. Well, Long? If you are not too busy, sir, may I trouble you for a few words in private conversation? No trouble at all. It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes? A friend has brought me information, sir, that there is a letter from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. Well, that's not surprising. In the course of seven years, I have no doubt that Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. But the letter, sir, was written on the day of his death. Well? You will recall that Mrs. Crosby had stated that until the fatal night, she had had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. This letter indicates that her statement is not in every respect, accurate. Have you seen the letter? I have with me a copy, sir. The original is in the possession of a woman who happens to be the widow of Mr. Hammond, deceased. May I read it? Oh, certainly, sir. Of course, as I said, this is but a copy. Can you understand it, sir? Perfectly. Ong, it's... It's inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. May I suggest, sir, that it would be well to make sure, since my friend is of the opinion that the letter would be of some interest to the prosecutor. I'm obliged to you, Ong. I'll give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to communicate that to my friend? It might be well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. It might be very well.
You may stay in the visiting room as long as you want, Mrs. Crosby. The warden's orders. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Howard, how good of you to come. I wasn't expecting you today. Good morning, Leslie. You're looking very well. Thank you, Howard. Well, the trial's only five days off now. I know. Each morning when I awake, I say to myself, one day less. Just like I used to at school with the holidays coming. Oh, Leslie. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, Howard. The time has really passed quite quickly. I've read a great deal and worked on my lace. But I will confess something to you, Howard. I'm not looking forward to testifying in court. Leslie, one of the things that it's impressed me is that each time you've told your story, you've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. And what does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory or... Or? Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. Leslie, I suppose I'm right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe. Oh, quite. I I'm positive of that. Let's see. Well, the last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFarren's. I don't think I said more than two words to him. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. At one time, you'd been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you stopped asking him to anything? Well, we hadn't anything much in common. He was very popular, you know, and well, there didn't seem to be any need to shower him with invitations. Are you quite certain that was all? Well, I may as well tell you, we heard about his, uh, his wife. And once, just by chance, I actually saw her. Oh, well, you never mentioned that. What was she like? Horrible. Covered with gold chains and bangles and bracelets. And a face like a mask. And it was after you knew about her that you stopped having anything to do with Hammond? Yes. Leslie, I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. Well, I've, I've often sent him little notes to ask him something or other. This letter asked him to come and see you because Robert was going to be away. Oh, but that's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. Here, you'd better read it for yourself. This is not my handwriting. I know that. It's said to be an exact copy of one written on the day of Hammond's death. Well, Leslie? What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write the it. The original is in your handwriting. It would be useless to deny it. But it could be a forgery. It would be difficult to prove that, Leslie. It would be very easy to prove that it was genuine. Uh, well, it, it's not dated. It might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll, if you'll just give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your houseboys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. I swear to you, I did not write this letter. Very well. And there's nothing further to talk about. I'll be going Howard! Howard, wait a minute. I... I did write it. But you see, I was afraid to mention it. I thought none of you'd believe my story if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. Go on. You see, I was preparing a surprise for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and... Oh, I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things. I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and get him to order it for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. Will you have another look at it? No, I don't want to. Then let me read it to you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I'm desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up to the door. Leslie, I'll have to talk to you very plainly. I told Robert today that I was certain of your acquittal. And I didn't say that just to cheer him up. I don't believe the jury would have retired at all. But this letter alters the case completely. I won't tell you what I... What I personally thought when I read the letter. The duty of counsel is to defend his client, not to convict her, even in his own mind. I don't want you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Oh. They can prove Hammond came to your house at your urgent invitation. I don't know what else they can prove, Leslie, but if the jury comes to the conclusion that you didn't kill Hammond in self-defense... I know. I know that... They're... Leslie! Matron! Matron, quickly! Yes, sir? Call the nurse. Mrs. Crosby is ill. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act 
two of the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and Vincent Price as Howard Joyce. In that split fraction of a moment, before her mind slipped into blackness, Leslie Crosby realized that the letter she had written to Jeff Hammond was damning evidence. Evidence enough to hang her. Now, a few minutes later, in the first aid room of the prison hospital, she leans wearily back in a chair, her eyes half closed. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert, not for me. You've distrusted me from the beginning, Howard. That's neither here nor there, Leslie. Who's got the letter now? The Eurasian woman who was Hammond's wife. Oh. Howard, are you going to let me be hanged? What do you mean by that, Leslie? You could get hold of the letter. Do you think it's so easy to do away with unwelcome evidence? But surely nothing would have been said to you if the, if the owner wasn't prepared to sell it. That's quite true. But I'm not prepared to buy it. Oh, but it wouldn't be your money. Robert has saved some. I wasn't thinking of the money. I don't know if you will understand this, Leslie, but I've always thought of myself as an honest man. You're asking me to do something which is no different from suborning a witness. Do you mean to say that you can save me and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I want to do my best for you, Leslie. But a lawyer has a duty to his profession and to himself. I can't do what you ask. Oh, poor Robert. He doesn't deserve it. He's never hurt anyone in his life. He's so kind and simple and good. And he trusts me so. I mean everything to him, everything in the world. And this will ruin his life. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You despise me. You think he's well rid of me if they do hang me. It isn't important what I feel about you. Do you understand? But I'm going to do what I can. Oh, Howard. Bob will want to know what the money's for. Will it be a very large sum? Well, I imagine this woman has a pretty shrewd idea of the letter's value. You won't have to show Robert the letter, will you? I'll do everything possible to prevent it. He'll be an important witness, and he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And after the trial? I'm going to try to save your life. Oh, if Robert loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. say your friend could be induced to part with the letter? I believe so, sir. But my friend has not got the letter, sir. The woman has it. She did not know the value of it till my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Only ten thousand? Well, why not fifty or a hundred? For the reason, sir, that Mr. Crosby has in the bank a savings account in the amount of only ten thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Ten thousand dollars is a good deal of money, Ong. Well, I'll speak to Mr. Crosby. Have the woman come to my office. I was about to mention, sir, she made two conditions. She insists that the money shall be brought to her. I can take you to the house whenever you are ready. What is the other condition? That Mrs. Crosby shall bring it to her personally. Why, you must be mad. Great heavens, man. Do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can just walk out of a prison cell whenever she feels like it? My friend thinks you could arrange to have her stay at your house until the trial. I believe the judge will permit it if you are responsible for her, sir. Very well. Ong, tell me something. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars, sir, and the satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. Well, sit down, Howard. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you. Oh, Thanks. Uh, you're looking more cheerful, Bob. I feel better since this morning. I guess you finally convinced me we have nothing to worry about. Well, as a matter of fact, Bob, something has come up. Oh, it's nothing very much, but I thought I'd better have a talk with you about it. Yes? Well, it, it seems Leslie wrote a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. Why, that's impossible. You heard her say she'd had no communication with him for weeks before it happened. Nevertheless, she did write the letter. She wanted his advice on something she was buying you for your birthday. Your birthday was about then, wasn't it? Yes, it was the end of April. In the excitement, she forgot the letter at the time and then later was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. But that's not like Leslie. She isn't afraid of anything. This was a pretty serious mistake. And she realized it. 
Who has the letter? Hammond's widow. She threatens to turn it over to the prosecution. Well, what if she does? Leslie can explain it in court just as she explained it to you. Yes, but don't you see, it might alter things a good deal in the minds of the jury if, if Hammond came to your home by invitation. Well, what's to be done about it? I think we must get hold of that letter. I want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. All right, buy the letter. I'll pay you back whatever it costs. Good. Now put the matter out of your mind. Oh, by the way, Leslie will be at the house tonight. I've arranged to have her released pending trial. Don't tell me that's the same lace I saw you working on at the McFerrins. How can you go so fast? Well, I hadn't anything much else to do this past month. What's it going to be? It's too fine for a tablecloth, surely. It's a coverlet for our bed. Oh, Dorothy, Leslie and I have some work to do this evening. Look here, Robert. Why don't you take the girls to a picture? Well, it won't take all evening, will it, huh? Well, there's a lot to go over. No use you three hanging around. You'd much better see a good film. Yes, go ahead, darling. It'll take your mind off tomorrow. I want you to. All right, then. I'll bring the car around. Oh, come on, Adele. I can see the legal mind is anxious to get rid of us. <laughs> Good night, Leslie. Good night. Where do we have to go? The Chinese Quarter. Some sort of shop, I believe. I've always wanted to see the Chinese Quarter. I hear it's a bit creepy. Of course, I'd have chosen other circumstances for a visit. Be flippant about your own crimes if you like, but don't be flippant about mine. Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. I didn't mean to be flippant. Really, I didn't. Oh, maybe it's my own sense of guilt... I have an unpleasant feeling that I'll have to pay the piper for what I'm doing tonight. I'm jeopardizing my whole career, and I have to rely on your discretion. Whatever else I am, I'm not ungrateful. Please forget what I said. Leslie, when did you first start doing that lace work? Oh, a few years ago. How did you happen to take it up? I wanted something to do, and it appealed to me. But it must take enormous concentration and patience. I find it soothing. You mean it uh, takes your mind off other things? Is that a legal question? You're not an ordinary client, Leslie. You've been watching me, Howard. I felt it all evening. Trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so... so evil. That's it, isn't it? Some time ago, I saw a volcano erupt. An island south of here, Guadi... It had been dormant for years. And then suddenly the crest blew off. It was terrifying and beautiful. Fire turned the sky and the sea crimson. And three villages melted into ashes. Well, it's time we were starting. Ong Chi will be waiting for us. Come in, please, come in. This is the shop of my friend. If you will wait here, I shall return in just a moment. And let's not be too long about it, Ong. I will speak to the lady at once, sir. Well, they seem to have a little of everything to sell here. Yes, most of these shops do. That looks like good jade. And this dagger. See the workmanship on the ivory handle? Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. Will you follow me, please? The lady will see you now. Now, where is she? You said she'd be here. She is coming, sir. Well, what is she standing there for? Ask her if she has the letter. Yes, sir. Nego Feng Su Hei Ma Feng Shun. Gil ge nu yen chui kui gamo. Um hao mung kui. Gil kui chui gamo. Mrs. Crosby, I regret, but the veil that you wear over your head, Mrs. Hammond requests that you remove it. Of course. Gil kui hang lai ni shi. Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Hammond has a further request. She wishes you to walk over to her. Now look here, tell her this is enough. Howard, Howard, it's all right. I don't mind. Ne sang oi fung sum. Ne nun gim hega. Heyunga deha. What does she say? Mrs. Hammer say 
You may have the letter if you will pick it up at half feet. Thank you. Gentlemen of the jury, uh, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The prisoner will please rise and look upon the jury. Do you find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. And from that day on, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another cocktail until Leslie was acquitted. So if these aren't up to my usual high standards, remember, I'm out of practice. Oh, Dorothy, darling, they're wonderful. N n never been better. Robert Crosby, right now you wouldn't know what you were drinking. I guess that's right. I, I can't taste or think or feel. All I can do is keep saying to myself over and over, Leslie's safe. Darling. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, anyone planning to bathe, shower or sponge before dinner should be getting at it. Well, a shower for me. Oh, I've laid out some things for you, Leslie. Thank you. Darling, I'm going to tidy myself up a bit. No, 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 don't go, Leslie. I shan't see a minute. Well, there's something I particularly want to talk to you about. And, Howard, I want to see you, too. I want your legal opinion. Oh, you do? Well, what's up? Well, I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. Well, I think a bit of a holiday would do you both good. No, no, I mean for good. But how could we? Well, you can't very well throw up your job. Well, I've got something in view that's much better. It's, it's in Sumatra. We'd be away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life. The only thing is that you'd be awfully lonely, darling, at the start. Oh, I wouldn't find that. I'd like to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? Oh, I hope it'll be better. At all events, I'll be working for myself and not for a company in London. What do you mean? Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? This plantation belongs to a Malacca Chinese planter who's in financial difficulties, and he's willing to let it go for $30,000 if he can get the money the day after tomorrow. Well, how on earth are you going to raise $30,000, Bob? Well, I've saved about ten, and the bank is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Robert, darling, I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account. I'll be perfectly all right here. Really, I shall. Nonsense, darling. You just said you wanted to go. But I'm not sure it wouldn't be a mistake to run away. Everyone's been so kind, and, and they'll all help to make it easy for us. I do think the thing to do is to stick it out here. Anyhow, Bob, it's not a thing you want to rush into. Let's wait and see. Why should I wait? It's a good thing, and I don't want to lose it. Look, I've got all the papers in my briefcase. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Please, Robert. Oh, now, come, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. But, Robert, Leslie, I... Leslie, darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I won't be a minute... Howard, what are you going to do? What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. I can't bear any more. You heard what he said, Leslie. He wants the money at once to buy the estate. He can't. He hasn't got it. Oh, give me a little time. I'll pay it back. Leslie, I can't afford to let you have a sum like that. I've mortgaged everything I own. I was glad to advance it, but I... Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, it will break his heart. What shall I do? I don't know, Leslie. If I tell him, he'll want to see the letter, of course. Here we are. Well, he's coming. It's up to you, Leslie. Oh, tell him. Tell him and have done with it. Mr. DeMille presents Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price in the final act of The Letter... In a moment. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll ask Betty Davis about a certain special hobby of hers. But now here's the curtain for the third act of The Letter, starring Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price. Robert Crosby has returned to the room his thoughts full of plans for the purchase of the new plantation. In silence, Leslie and Joyce watch Robert, who is brimming over with enthusiasm as he arranges the papers on his desk. 
This is really a handsome estate. We'll be stealing it for 30000 Bob, I don't like to throw cold water on your plans, but hasn't it struck you that the costs of, uh, well, of what we've been through will be pretty heavy? Costs? Oh, yes, the uh, legal expenses. Oh, no, I'm not going to charge you anything for my own services. But there are certain out-of-pocket expenses. Oh, that's awfully decent of you. I'm not sure I can accept that. But uh, what, are, what do these other expenses amount to? Well, the principal item is that, uh, that letter of Leslie's I mentioned to you. Oh, yes, yes, I'd almost forgotten. You were going to... I had to pay a great deal of money for it. Well, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars? Why, well, you must have been mad. You may be quite sure, Bob, I wouldn't have given that if I could have got it for less. But that, that's every cent I have in the world. Why didn't you let them bring the letter in and explain it to, to the jury? I didn't dare. Do you mean it was absolutely necessary to suppress it? If you wanted Leslie acquitted. But what, what was there in the letter? I told you at the time. It was very stupid of me, Robert. I, I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted to uh, get something for me, didn't you? Yes, I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and, and you know how ignorant I am. Buying that letter was a criminal offense, wasn't it? Well, it's not the sort of thing a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense. Yes, it was. I might be disbarred for it. Then why did you do it, you of all people? What were you trying to save me from? Leslie, you knew I was buying a gun from Cameron. Why did you want to make me a present of another? Well, how should I know you were going to buy a gun? Because I told you. Well, I'd forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking to me like this? Who has the letter now? I have. Where is it? Bob, it's not your letter or mine. I've got to pay $10,000 for that letter. I'm going to see it. Let him see it. Thank you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No, you couldn't. We'd been in love for years. It's not true. I used to meet him constantly, once or twice a week. Every time we met, I hated myself for it. It was horrible. I loathed myself. I was like a person who was ill. Then came a time about a year ago when he began to change toward me. Oh, I didn't know what was the matter. I was frantic. I made scenes. I threw myself at his feet. Leslie. Then I heard about that, about that native woman. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her walking in the village with those hideous spangles and that chalky face and her eyes like a cobra's eyes. I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. You've read the letter. Oh, we'd always been so careful about writing before, but this time I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. He came and I told him I knew about his marriage. Oh, at first he denied it. I was frantic. I don't know what I said to him. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I insulted him. I cursed him. At last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me. But it was true about the other woman, that she was the only one who really meant anything to him. He said he was glad I knew, because now I'd leave him alone. I knew that if he went out that door, I'd never see him again. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry, and I saw it hit him. I ran after him, and I fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. That's what happened. And I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. How could you do this? How could you? I'm sorry, I shouldn't let myself go. I, I've got to think. Leslie. Well? He's going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. And the fifth couple of the Prescotts. Oh, yes, Robert's told me about them. Oh, you'll adore them, Leslie. Well, now, both of you get a good sleep because it'll be a late party. Good night. Good night, Dorothy. Good night. It's lucky you brought your dinner coat, Robert. You hardly fit in one of Howard's. Now, let's see what else you'll need. Oh, well, how about your studs? They're, oh, they're probably still in the bureau at home. Home. Robert, it's no use, is it? We can't make it go, can we? I don't know. I'm not sure. Robert, you're so kind and so generous. You 
should have had the sort of wife you really deserve. Through no fault of yours, I've failed you, wrecked your life. I can't ask you to forgive me. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. But what about you? Can you go on? I'll try. I'll really try. That's not what I'm asking. I'll do everything to make you happy. Everything in my power. That isn't enough. Unless... Leslie, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. Kiss me, then. Kiss me as if... Rob. No. No, I can't. I can't. Leslie, I can't. tell me, Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. Leslie? Leslie, let me in. My dear, they're all waiting for you. This is your party, you know. I'm sorry, Dorothy. I took rather long to dress. Why, Leslie, isn't that your lace work? Yes. Were you working on it just now? A little. I'm anxious to finish it. Oh, Leslie, please come downstairs. Of course, dear. In a few minutes. Very well. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. At last he turned on me. He was sick and tired of me. She was the only one who meant anything to him. She was the only one. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. Fired and fired and fired until there were no more cuts. I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to... Who's out there? Who is it? You, I see you there. Mr. Crosby. Come here. What are you doing out there? I don't want to come. She make me come. She tell me I come here. She? Missy Hammond. She tell me I come here. Bring dagger. Leave it outside window. Of course. Mrs. Hammond. Dagger, Missy. She say bring dagger to you. She's here, then? Yes, Missy Hammond on path by gate. You no go in garden, Missy Crosby. She kill you. She with her. That is what dagger mean. She kill you, you go in garden. Missy, you no tell police I come? Missy, you no tell police I come? Dagger, see the workmanship on the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. Leslie. Leslie. Yes? Leslie, you've got to do something about Robert. He's acting very strangely. What is it? I don't know. At first I thought he was drunk, but it's worse than that. I'll be right down. But where will you ship from, Crosby? Oh, it's near a good harbor, only five, six miles away. And I can ship my rubber for less money, or to get ahead fast. In ten, fifteen years I can live in London, travel... Do anything I please. Robert, will you come with me, darling? Please. Not now, darling. Maybe later. I'm telling the boys about my new plantation. Sounds like quite a place. Of course, we'll miss Singapore. Our friends are here and we've had some mighty fine times. No English people in that part of Sumatra. Only Dutch and natives. Going to be a little lonely at first, maybe. But we'll get used to it. Robert. There'll just be the two of us. But my... My wife's a good sport. Always can count on her. She's not afraid of anything. And we'll have each other. That's the important stop thing. Stop it, stop, stop it. I can't stand anymore. I can't stand it. Give me a drink. I want a drink. I don't suppose the reason is that. I don't understand. Howard, where is Leslie? She ran out into the garden. The garden? Oh, I'll find her. No, let her alone. There's nothing you can do for her. Garden. She kill you. You go in garden, Missy. See the workmanship on the ivory handle. 
She kill you. I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I couldn't give him up. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. That's not true. It means I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No. We'd been in love for years. Been in love for years. We'd been in love for years. Mr. Crosby, go back. Go back. Oh! You killed her. You killed her. Kui Ying say. Who is that? Don't move. The police. The police. Don't move. I will shoot. What do you do here? I do nothing. I tell her no go into garden. I tell her. This woman, she, she is dead. Kui Ying go say. In order, say Kui. She, she, she kill her. It was right she die. Listen. Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. Meantime, we take you to a home, almost anywhere, and a mother who might be almost anyone. Mrs. Thompson is in her kitchen, and she's getting ready to do her dinner dishes. There. All scraped and rinsed. Now, why, that's funny. I know it was here when I did the luncheon dishes. Now, where did I put it? Not on the table. The closet. Hmm. I know I haven't used it all. A box lasts me practically a month. Well, I suppose I could use the laundry soap. But it takes forever to make suds. Besides, it's hard on my hands. Alice! Oh, Alice! Do you know what happened to the box of Lux Flakes I keep here on the drain board? Oh, well, you bring it right down this minute. I need it for the dishes. Well, do your sweater later, dear. I have to have it now. Guess I'll have to get a box for the bathroom when I go to the store tomorrow. The man said he expected more this week. I hate to be caught without Lux. I know what those strong soaps do to my hands. Women everywhere say that once you've used Lux for dishes, you'll never want to use a strong soap again. Lux leaves hands so soft and lovely. Even if they're red and rough from using harsh soaps, just changing to gentle Lux flakes will take away that dishpan look, make them smooth and attractive again. And Lux is thrifty. You can change dishpan hands to Lux hands for less than a penny a day. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. A curtain call is one of the oldest traditions in the theater. I don't believe it's, it's ever been better earned than tonight. And coming back to the footlights now are Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price. It's a pleasure to be back, Mr. DeMille. I'd like to thank all the people in the cast for their excellent work tonight. Uh, to most of us, Betty, your, your name stands for fine artistry in the theater. But I think that when this war is over, many, many thousands of soldiers will remember you for another reason. That being the Hollywood canteen which Betty started. I've seen the canteen in action, and it's a very fine thing to be remembered for. So that we can keep the record straight, let's give mm. credit to the right people. There were really more than 6,000 who worked together in a team to make the canteen possible. I still say you coached that team, Betty. How many boys have visited the canteen, Betty? Well, I believe about a million and a half, Vincent, many of whom greatly admired Bart Marshall's work as a bust boy. You know, I've, uh, I've often wondered what the fellows talk about when they wander over to the snack bar to see you or Irene Dunn or Eddie Lamar. Well, I remember one boy who paid me a very nice compliment. Hiya, Rosie, he said. <laughs> I can't stand you on the screen, but you're certainly sweetness and light around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's quite a tribute to your acting, Betty. <laughs> Have you picked a play for next week yet, Mr. DeMille? Yes. And it's a roaring drama of the West. Republic's current screen hit in old Oklahoma. And our stars will be Roy Rogers, Martha Scott, and Alba Decker. It's the story of a, of a girl and a cowboy who discover romance as well as oil in the rich land of Oklahoma. 
And besides the thrilling drama, we'll also have the songs of Hollywood's great cowboy star, Roy Rogers. A very exciting evening, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Any theater should be thankful for players like you three. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Martha Scott, Roy Rogers, and Albert Decker in in Old Oklahoma. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This week, all America salutes those women who are working in war-useful jobs. Women must get into the war with their hands as well as their hearts, until victory is finally won. Betty Davis has just finished the picture Mrs. Skeffington at Warner Brothers, and is currently seen in Old Acquaintance. Herbert Marshall appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Vincent Price is currently seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, The Song of Bernadette. The Warner Brothers screenplay of the letter was written by Howard Koch. Heard in tonight's play were Charlie Lung as Ong Chi, Dee Benaderet as Chinese woman, Richard Davis as Withers, and Frederick Warlock, Alex Havier, Regina Wallace, Paula Winslow, Joe Gilbert, Eric Snowden, and Charles Seal. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Martha Scott, Roy Rogers, and Albert Decker in the play In Old Oklahoma. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, the Lux Radio Theater proudly presents Vincent Price as Winston Smith in 1984. 1984. The world is one world, divided into three parts. East Asia, Eurasia, Oceania. Religion is abolished. God is rooted out. There is only Big Brother. Big Brother is the head of the party. Big Brother is one, indivisible, unassailable. Oceania is good because Big Brother is good. Oceania is one because Big Brother is one. Big Brother sees everything, knows everything. Everyone exists by the clemency of Big Brother. Big Brother. Big Brother. Big Brother. In Oceania, there are the proles. The proles, like the animals, are free. They have no telescreens in their houses. They have no numbers. They wear no uniform. The proles are the primitives, the early inferior people. Subdued by the party, subject to the party... They are the lost and the forgotten. Between the proles and the party, there is a great gulf fixed. A prole cannot join the party. No party member can retreat to the proles. The party is one, as Big Brother is one. Big Brother! Every member of the party wears a uniform, a suit of overalls. Every member of the party has a telescreen in his house. Every member of the party has a number. You there, stand up in front of the screen. What is your number? 6079. Your name? Winston Smith. Where do you live? Third floor, Victory Mansions. Employment in the party? Records Department, Ministry of Truth. Repeat the slogans of the party with fervor. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. How is Oceania governed? By Big Brother, through the Ministry of Truth, the Ministry of Peace, the Ministry of Plenty, the Ministry of Love. Describe their functions. 
the Ministry of Truth, News, Entertainment, Education, the Ministry of Peace, Conduct of War, the Ministry of Plenty, Economics. Well, go on. The Ministry of Love, what does that do? I don't know. I have never been there. Let us hope, for your sake, that you never do. The Ministry of Love is where people who do not love Big Brother are taught to love him. Do you love Big Brother, Winston Smith? I love Big Brother. Repeat it. I love Big Brother. I love Big Brother. Your tour of duty at the records office begins at 900 hours. Be there on time. 6079 Winston Smith. Dismissed. That was an unexpected call, wasn't it? Oh, they do it sometimes. Part of the quarterly brush-up discipline, you know. Perhaps. But that fellow on the screen was probably from the thought police. They can cut in on anybody's screen, you know. They do. How do you think so many comrades have been vaporized? Thought police, of course. And the home telly screen. They can see you and hear you all the time. But I've got nothing to worry about. I stick to the party rules. I do my job. But I... you don't think the way the party thinks, do you? More important, you don't want to think the way the party thinks, the way Big Brother wants you to think, do you? I just couldn't face the telescreen any longer. I had to get out and get away. You and I. You? Well, you. I'm you, Winston. I'm the other you who looks out of your eyes. Yes, yes, you twitch my lips and tingle in my fingertips at the most inconvenient times. But they know nothing about you. They control me like they control everybody else. Then why do you do the silly things you do? What silly things? That book you bought. But it's just an old book with blank pages. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Except they don't make books like that anymore. And if they ask you where you got it, you'd have to tell them at an antique shop in the Proley Quarter. But I just wanted to keep a diary. Nothing wrong in that, is there? No, except you'd find it hard to explain why you wanted to keep a diary. And remember... You're not supposed to go into the Proley Quarter anyway. I know, I know. The Proleys aren't members of the party. They're just slaves. But will you stop it? I've got enough to worry about as it is. Yes. It's the girl, isn't it? The girl in the fiction department. Yes. Yes, the way she looks at me. The way she stays near me. She's rather pretty. What if you like that sort of thing? A lot of good it is when she wears the red sash of the anti-sex league and could be a police spy into the bargain. You're rattled this morning. Mustn't get rattled, you know. It shows. That's the way they get onto you first. Pull yourself together. There's where you work. There's the Ministry of Truth straight ahead. Smile now, Winston. Smile! <laughs> Morning, Comrade Smith. What? Oh, oh, good morning, Comrade O'Brien. Not often we meet like this. No, no, Comrade. Of course, I've often wanted to. I... Wanted? What, Comrade? Well, I, I don't know. It's probably foolish. You are known as a great man in the party. I've admired you from a distance. I hear good reports of your work, Smith. Well, I've often hoped I, I might discuss it with you. A pity we have no time now. Never mind. We'll meet again one day. In the place where there is no darkness. In the place where there is no... I, I, I beg your pardon, comrade. Uh, good morning, comrade. Don't let me keep you from your work. The place where there is no darkness. He, he said... Never mind that now, you fool. Compose yourself. You're at work. Everybody watches. Everybody listens for Big Brother. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. But O'Brien understands. Yes. Yes, O'Brien understands. You know now that you're not alone. But smile, smile... There's that girl again. Don't let her see. Don't let her guess. Above all, not her. Six zero oh, seven nine, Comrade Smith. Present for duty. Repeat the slogan of the Ministry of Truth. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Does the past exist? Yes. Where? In records and in memories. Which is the more important? The records. Why? The records endure, but memories fade. So? Who controls the records controls the memory of the people. Are you impressed with the greatness of your task? I am. Then begin, Comrade Smith. This is urgent. 
Big Brother's Order of the Day, 17th of the 3rd, 84, contains references to unpersons. Rewrite completely. Unpersons. Oh, I have to be careful about this. Unpersons are always tricky. Even Big Brother can't refer to them. Unpersons don't exist. Oh, let's be frank. Unpersons are persons who have been liquidated, destroyed. Your job is to see that all record of them is destroyed as well. Are they mentioned in the press? Delete their names. Are they shown in photographs? Make a new photograph. Are their voices recorded? Destroy their records. And presto, they do not exist. They never existed. They have no place in memory or history. That could happen to you, too. All personnel will lay aside their work and face the telescreen for the one-minute hate. You're out of luck. The girl's sitting right next to you. Watch your step now. Make it a convincing hate. Thought police are very shrewd. You are here to hate. You are here to loathe, to despise, to detest with all your being. Whom do you hate? Goldstein. 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 Goldstein is what? Enemy of the people. Saboteur, traitor. Whom else do you hate? The Brotherhood. Goldstein and his Brotherhood. And the penalty for traitors like these? Death, 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 death. death, death, death. We hate traitors. We love Big Brother. We hate traitors. We love Big Brother. Speak to us, big brother. My comrades, my brothers, we live in times of great peril. We are exposed to the attacks of enemies without and traitors within. But have no fear. I am with you always. The one minute hate is concluded. All personnel will return to work. Are you eating with anyone, oh, Smith? Hello, sir. I'm well. No. I... Good. I'll join you. <laughs> I don't know what they put in this victory gin, but it always makes me do that. Yes, it is rather strong, isn't it? Excellent product, though. Excellent. You seem rather distracted, Smith. Something on your mind? What's that? Oh, oh no, nothing on my mind. I, I was just looking at that girl over there. Yes, she's been looking at you too. Do you know her? No. Wouldn't help you if you did, would it? She wears that red sash like a banner. It's an odd thing to say. Comes of working in the poetry department. We're editing Kipling now, you know. Quite a lot of banners in Kipling. I understand the Junior Anti-Sex League is one of the favoured institutions of the party. Oh, yes, yes, I believe so. Uh, you're married, aren't you? I was. Oh. Divorced? Separated. Oh. With the consent of the party. It was apparent we would have no children. The party takes a very wise view of these matters. Of all matters. As you say. Funny, that girl's still looking at you. But I can't help it if she has nothing better to do. Oh, here comes Parsons. Hmm. He lives near you, doesn't he? Yes, next floor down. He's got a wife and children. You'd better talk to him. I don't think I could. Oh, hello. Hello, comrades. Hello, hello comrade. Parsons. Oh, I've been chasing you, Smith. What? Yes, it's about that subscription you forgot to pay me. Oh, which one is that? Eight week. The house by house fund. We're going to decorate Victory Mansions. And two dollars, you promised me. Oh, well, here you are. Thanks. I say, did I tell you about what my little girl did last Saturday? Yeah, well, she was out with the junior spies troop near Birkenstead. They spent the whole of the afternoon following a strange man. They kept on his tail for two hours and then handed him over to the patrols. Clever, eh? <laughs> what was the man doing? Nothing. He says. 
But my little Millie was smart. She spotted him chipping pieces off the rocks with a hammer. Must have been a saboteur. Well, uh, what happened to the man? Well, I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know? Uh, that's very good. <laughs> of course, we can't afford to take chances. I mean, not with subversive agents everywhere. No, no, of course. Of course. Well, I've got a few more subscriptions to chase up. I'll um, see you later. Tell me, Smith, hmm? did you ever regret not having any children? And I can't say I've thought much about it. Why? I was just wondering. Parsons seems very happy with his little brood, doesn't he? You see what I mean about being careful? Watch that fellow, Syme. Oh, he's clever and he never says a word out of place, but he's marked. One day he just won't come to work, mark my words. Why should I worry about Syme? He can look after himself. I'm worried about me, about that that girl. Oh, working in the same building, people are bound to see each other frequently. But for some reason, she's interested in me. She keeps turning, and why, why? It can't be sex. She's a member of the Junior Anti-Sex League. I doubt if she's from the Thought Police. Except for that diary you keep, you haven't given too much away. Well, anyway, she's not important. The important thing is O'Brien. He spoke to me today. He understands. He knows. Knows you're guilty of thought crime, that you hate Big Brother, that you... All of that and more. Everything. Don't you see? If O'Brien knows, there is hope then. There oh. is hope. Oh, I'm sorry, I Comrade. Know. I wasn't I was looking, looking where I... I was. Wait a minute. You're the girl from the Ministry of Truth, aren't you? That's right. You've been watching me for days. Yes. But why? I'm a good party member. Why do you have to spy on me? I'm not spying on you. All I wanted to do was to tell you... I love you. You love me? Wait. Wait a moment. She... She loves me. She said she loves me. Good evening, Mr. Smith. Oh, hello, Millie Parsons. What are you doing out so late? Mr. Smith? Yes, Millie. You're a traitor. What? I've been watching you. You're a thought criminal. Millie. Millie, get out. Go home. I'll tell your father about this. Smith's a traitor. Smith's a spy. Catch him first and let him die. The year of Big Brother. The all-embracing night of Big Brother. If you belong to the party, you are free to attend a party rally, or a party discussion group, or rest briefly, or watch the party entertainers on the party telescreen. But if you are number 6079, Comrade Winston Smith, party member in revolt, loaded with the guilt of thought crime... You walk the city, the dark, narrow streets of the city, clinging desperately to those few cubic centimeters inside your skull case, which is all that is left to you of privacy, possession, and hope. The way she said love made it sound completely personal, private, indestructible. It isn't, you know. It can't be. Not now in the year of Big Brother. Love involves an alienation of something that belongs to Big Brother and to the party. Love is betrayal. Love is thought crime. It's hopeless. I refuse to believe that. It is not hopeless. There is a chance. There is O'Brien. He understands. He is in revolt, too. Yes, there is O'Brien. Hello, you've walked a long way. Remember that shop? Yes. That is where I bought the book for my diary. It's a junk shop. It's old and musty and full of useless things. But it proves something, don't you see? It proves that things were different once in spite of what the records say. And if they were different once, they could be different again. Go on. In you go. Good evening. Good evening. What can I... Why, of course... 
You're the gentleman that bought the ladies' keepsake album. Is there anything special I can do for you? I was passing. I just looked in. I, I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well. The shop's nearly empty. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand, no stock either. That's a pretty thing. What is that? that? No, it's a glass paperweight. Uh, what's that inside of it? Oh, that's coral. Coral? Hmm. Must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to melt the glass onto it. More than a hundred years old, that is. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yes, indeed it is. Now, there's another room upstairs you might care to take a look at. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> there's not much in it. Just a few pieces. Well, we could do with the light if we're going up. Yes, the room. We used to live here till my wife died. Now I'm selling the furniture off little by little. See, that's a beautiful mahogany bed. There's, there's no telescreen. Ah, oh, I never had one of those things. It was too expensive. I never really felt the need of it. You, you don't live here now? Oh, dear me, no. I live with my daughter. Oh. She's quite a nice apartment. In the worst of days. But... You know, I lock up at night and leave all my memories here. Well, now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, there's quite a nice one over here. And the frame's screwed to the wall, but, but I dare say I could fix it for you if you wanted it. I, I know that building. Hmm? It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street outside of the Palace of Justice. That's right. It's outside the law courts. It was bombed in um, oh, many years ago. It was a church at one time. A church? Oh, yes, yes. St. Clement Danes. <laughs> Oranges and lemons. Hey, the bells of St. Clement. <laughs> Silly of me. What's that? Oranges and lemons. That was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. Oh. How it goes on, I don't remember. But it ends up... Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. <laughs> it's a kind of dance and a game all in one. And all the names of the churches were in it. I've heard about churches, but I didn't realise I'd ever seen one. Oh, there's a lot of them left, really. But, of course, they've been put to other uses now. You, uh, you wouldn't like to buy the picture? No, no. No, no but look... I like this room. Hmm? I might, well, I, I might at some later date want to rent it from you for a while. I'd pay you quite well. Well, I, yes, I don't see why not. You, you'd look after all my old things. I know. I, I'll and, let you know later, then. You've been very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Pity you've got to go. I, I'm just on the verge of remembering the rest of the rhyme. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Lemons. Winston, huh? stop. Don't look round. Just light a cigarette. Oh, this is madness. Do you we... want us to meet? Yes, of course, but... Next Sunday, are you free? Yes. Then listen carefully. Now, you'll have to remember this. Go to Paddington Station. Take the train to Ilborne. Yes. Now, when you get there, turn left outside the station. Oh. Walk two kilometres till you come to a gate with the top rail missing. Now, follow the path and wait for me by the fallen tree. Have you got that? Yes, wait. I'll be there at 1,500 hours. I must go now. Now, don't follow me. Just finish your cigarette. But listen, you... I love you. I love you. bluebells in the country while you're waiting for a girl. You know you've taken the first step on a road that has only one end, death. And yet you're picking bluebells. I don't remember picking bluebells before. It's not in the party syllabus. Well, to hell with the party, to hell with... Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, do you always talk to yourself? Usually. It's safer. Uh-uh. It isn't really. It becomes a habit. The habit gives you away. Oh, I suppose it does. You can put your arms around me, you know. I don't bite. I, I don't even know your name. <laughs> Mine is Julia. Yours is... Winston Smith. I know. I found out. Now put your arms around me. Kiss me. Oh, Julia. Julia. Till this moment I didn't know what color your eyes were. I'd forgotten what a pair of lips tasted like. I'd forgotten. 
forgotten how it felt to hold a woman. It didn't take you long to remember. Look, before we go any further, I'm 39. I've got a wife I can't get rid of. I've got a varicose ulcer and five false teeth. And, and I couldn't care less. Julia, are we safe here? Safer than anywhere. Now relax. Uh. Hold me in your arms. Mm. Oh. Now just let's be ourselves. Tell me... What did you think the night I told you that I loved you? I hated the sight of you. You must know I thought you belonged to the Thought Police. <laughs> the Thought Police? Oh, not really. Well, it's not that. At least it's a good one. party member, pure in word and deed. Banners, processions, games, community hikes. <laughs> and you thought if I had half a chance, I'd denounce you to the police and get you killed oh, off? More or less, I... I... <laughs> it's this blasted sash that does it. The Junior Anti-Sex League. Let's get rid of it for the afternoon, huh? Junior, you're a perpetual surprise. <laughs> Not really. It's just that I've got the right appearance. I'm good at games. I was a troop leader in the Junior Spies. I do voluntary work three evenings a week for the Junior Anti-Sexers. I spend hours and hours placing their silly posters all over London. I always look cheerful and I always yell with the crowd. That is the only way to be safe. Why did you pick me? Something in your face. I knew you could be one of theirs, but I thought I'd take a chance. Julia, I've got a place, a room and furniture. We can be there whenever we like. Uh -uh. Whenever we can, darling. It's not quite the same thing. I still have to stick up posters and you still have to go to discussion groups. But there'll be times. Where is this place? In the old part of the city where the Proleys live. It's over an antique shop. Well, we have ourselves a love nest. Mm. Oh, but we'll have to be careful. Very careful not to give a sign. Not a flicker of recognition. We will be. Julia, have you ever done this before? Of course. Dozens of times. With dozens of men. Was it the same as with me? Not quite. You see, darling, I love you. But the others? Two reasons, darling. I like it. The party doesn't like it. You make it sound like a political act. That's why they'd arrest us if they ever found out. Love is a political act. Oh, Julia. Oh, yes, darling. Do you think it was ever like this for everybody? Like what? Being in your own room on a summer evening, talking about things you wanted to talk about. Not worrying about telescreens or thought police. Mm, I don't know. I know it's nice now. We've got another hour to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all. Oh. <laughs> Would you like me to make some tea? Yes, please. I like this room. I like... Oh! Get out, you filthy room! What was that? Oh, only a rat. A rat! Oh, he's a big, ugly fellow. I gave him a good fright, though. Oh. Darling. Oh. Darling, what's the matter? Of all the horrible things in the world, I... I hate rats most of all. But, darling, there's oh. no need to be upset. Oh. They're ugly things, unclean things, no, but that's no. all. No, no, they're more than that. They're much more than that. Julie. Now, darling, Julie, get not, rid of it, please. darling, just lie please. back. I'll make tea and then I'll oh, plug no, the hole. No, 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 plug up the hole first. Please, Julia, Julia. All right, darling, of course. Julia, when I, I was a child lying lonely and awake in the dark, they were voices gibbering in the darkness. Their feet sc scurried closer, closer, and then... Retreated only to come again. They touched my face. It was more horrible than the, than the touch of a dead hand. I've never got over that feeling. Ever since that night, I've laid awake and screamed soundlessly for hours. Whenever I heard the small, pattering feet of a rat. I'm all right now. Uh, darling. Yeah. Uh, darling, what's this picture? I've seen it somewhere before. Oh, it's... It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement Danes. Mr. Charrington taught me a, a rhyme about it. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin. Julia, you know it. Go on, please, go on. <laughs> when will you pay me, say the bells <laughs> of Old Bailey? Bailey. I'm da, da, dead. The da, next da, line, but then it says... Here, here comes, comes a candle, candle to light you, you to bed. bed. And, and here comes a chopper to chop off your head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Julia. Yes, darling. You know, I have the strangest feeling about that silly little rhyme. What sort of a feeling? As if everybody connected with it were someone who could make us happy. As if... As if I hoped the next person to recite it would be... O'Brien. O'Brien? Yes. I told you he spoke to me again in the lift yesterday. He wants us to go up to his flat. Oh, darling, must we really? But he's one of us. No. He may hate Big Brother and the party and all the rest. But, darling, that doesn't make him one of us. Oh, Winston, we're two people. We make love together and we talk together and we drink tea together. O'Brien has no part in that. But don't you see, as we are now, we are alone. If we join O'Brien and his brotherhood, we won't be alone. We'll still be arrested in the long run. But that's not the important thing. The important thing to me is this room and what we do here and how we live here and the joy we have. We don't need O'Brien to keep us alive. It's not being alive that counts. It's being human. And being human means you share your living and your hoping and your fearing with other people. The party is only too happy to have you share. But not the human things. Only the inhuman ones. I want to think there's a hope we could all be as human as we two are now. That's why I want to see O'Brien. I know your names, you know mine. I'm O'Brien. We may dispense with introductions. Pardon me while I switch off the telescreen. Can you really switch it off? Members of the inner party have that privilege. We... we are... are... we are... Alone? Yes, yes, we are quite alone. I... well, Julia and I believe that there is some kind of a secret organization working against the party. We believe that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. We are... Living together, we are thought criminals. I tell you this because it puts us at your mercy and you will know that we are telling the truth. If you wish, we will sign a statement. There is such an organization. Its leader is Emmanuel Goldstein, whom you know. Yes, but we thought we were afraid that Goldstein and the, and the conspiracy were invented by the thought police. No, they exist. But what are you both prepared to do to help the conspiracy? Anything we are capable of. You're prepared to give your lives? Yes. yes. To commit murder? Yes. yes. To betray your country? Yes. yes. To cheat, forge, blackmail, corrupt the minds of children? Yes. yes. You're prepared to commit suicide if ordered to do so? Yes. yes. You're prepared to separate and never see each other again? No! It's just as well to understand these things right at the beginning. You understand you'll be fighting in the dark. You'll receive orders and obey them without knowing why. Sooner or later, you will be caught and tortured and you will die. You will never know whether your work has served a single good purpose. We and you now are the dead. Our only true life is in the future. A thousand years away, perhaps. But if in that thousand years we extend the frontiers of sanity even a little, we shall have done well. Eh, uh, eh. Uh. You have a hiding place? Yes, in the old quarter, a room over an antique shop. The proprietor is called Charrington. That will do for the moment. Later, we shall make other arrangements, give you more definite instructions. Now it is time for you to leave. Then we are accepted? Yes, you are accepted. Have you any more questions? Only one. Do you know an old rhyme called The Bells of St. Clements? Yes, I think so. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clements. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin. <laughs> when will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey? When I grow rich, say the bells of Shardy. You know it, you know it, you know all of it. I told you he'd know it, Julia, didn't I? Oh, Julia. Oh, mm. my darling. It's nearly time to get up. Oh, I don't want to get up. Oh, neither do I. You know what I was remembering just then? Hmm? No. You remember that thrush that sang to us the first day in the wood? No, he wasn't singing for us, just for himself. <laughs> Not even that, he was just singing. That's what I mean. I wonder if we will ever see the day when we'll be just, just singing. No, oh, I doubt it. What did O'Brien say? We are the dead. We are the dead. You are the dead. It, what? it came from behind the picture. What? Behind the picture. Yes. <laughs> oh. Now you can be seen. You are the dead. The telescreen behind the picture. Julia! Stay where you are. What? Don't touch each other. 
Clasp your hands behind your heads. Now stand back to back. Oh, I suppose we may as well say goodbye. You may as well say goodbye. And while we're on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Mr. Charrington. No! Nineteen eighty-four, the year of the revolt of Winston Smith against Big Brother and the party of Big Brother. It had been a bloodless revolt, bloodless and small and secret in a mahogany bed in a fusty upstairs room. The issue had been decided before the thought was conceived or the act begun. But even now, Winston Smith had no certainty where he was. His world was a windowless room with walls of white porcelain flooded with light from hidden lamps, stark under the scrutiny of four telescreens from which every motion was visible. He was more lonely than he had ever been in his life. And yet, he was not alone. Can I talk? There are still the telescreens, Parsons. Oh, I don't mind those. I have, I have nothing to hide, nothing at all. And what are you in for? Thought crime. You wouldn't think it possible, would you? You don't think they'll shoot me, do you, old chap? I, I mean, they don't shoot you if you haven't actually done anything. I know they give you a fair hearing. They'll know my record, won't they? You know what kind of a chap I was. Not brainy, of course, but keen. I'll get off with five years, don't you think? Or ten? A chap like me could make himself pretty useful in a labour camp. Are you guilty? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I'm guilty... You don't think the party would arrest an innocent man, do you? Thought crime is a dreadful thing, old man. It's insidious. Do you know how it got hold of me? In my sleep. Yes, that's a fact. Never knew I had a bad streak in me, and yet there it was. How did you find out? I started talking in my sleep. Yes. They heard me shouting down with Big Brother. Who denounced you? Well, actually, it was my little daughter... She listened at the keyhole and heard it, nipped off and told the patrols next day. Pretty smart, eh? And she's only seven. But that's the sort of thing I mean. They'll understand that I trained my children properly. They'll take that into consideration, won't they? Parsons? Yes. Yes, just tell me what you want done. I'll cooperate. You won't have any trouble Room with me. Room 101. Oh. Yes. So, you're alone again. <laughs> Alone except for that whimpering thing in this gleaming, aseptic world of the Ministry of Love. It's not a new experience, this solitude. You're not too afraid, are you? Yes, I am afraid. I am afraid of this procession of frightened men with broken bodies and terrified eyes. I don't know whether that's part of the treatment, too. Yes, it's all part of the treatment. Keep reminding yourself of that. The lightest word, the least calculated gesture is all part of the treatment. There is no mercy, there is no kindness, there is no intermission of misery. It is all part of the treatment. Come on, you. We can't wait any longer. Me? No, not you, this. Come on, on your feet. Where are you taking me? Room 101. No, no! Don't do anything but that. You've been starving me for weeks. Finish it off and let me die. Shoot me, hang me. Take my family and cut their throats, but don't take me there! Oh, 101! No! No! Smith, take your hands away from your face. It's forbidden to cover your face in the cells. Take hold of yourself now. That's part of the treatment, too. Everything's part of the treatment. Mm. But so long as you still have those few cubic centimeters inside your skull, you're still a man. You're still stronger than they. Hello, Smith. O'Brien. Oh, That's right. So they got you too. Oh, they got me a long time ago. You mean you are one of them? Don't deceive yourself, Winston. You knew this a long time ago now, didn't you? You've always known it. I, I, I... I told you myself we should meet like this. In the place where there is no darkness. Now that we have met... We are going to make a new man of you, Winston. A new man. Take him! Ah! 
You see how it is, Winston. Pain itself and suffering is no longer a chance or accident. It is a calculated process of being measured and graduated and controlled. We are not medieval butchers probing for the nerve roots. We are masters of this most subtle of sciences. Look, there is a dial upon which your agony is measured. There is a lever by which I can increase or diminish it. But it is not I who inflict this pain on you, Winston. It is you yourself. You understand that, don't you? Winston, you are suffering the pain of birth, the rebirth of sanity. You must be born again. You know that, don't you? Look at my hand, Winston. How many fingers do you see? Two. And on this hand, two. put them together, two and two. What does that mean? Four. And if the party says two and two, make not four, but five. What then? There is still four. How many fingers, Winston? Four, four. What else can I say? Four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it, I'll tell you four. Four. How many fingers? Five, five, five. <laughs> Do you know where you are, Winston? I don't know. I can guess. In the Ministry of Love. Do you know how long you've been here? I don't know. Days, months, years. Why did we bring you here? To punish me, to make me confess. No, Winston, not that. Uh, not the small tasks of punishment and confession. Uh, what could you tell us that we don't, don't know already? Uh, what satisfaction do we draw from your stricken flesh? Uh, Shall I tell you why we brought you here? Uh, to cure you. Cure me of love for a woman. Love. Love is a word, an obsolete word. There is no love. Only a biological act. Cure me of what, then? Of false and foolish thinking. Uh, we don't want martyrs, Winston. We want disciples. Uh, willing disciples. Uh, and when we've made you a willing disciple, then we shall destroy you. Uh, and why do you go to, to the... Trouble to torture me. Because you are a flaw in a pattern, Winston. You are a stain that must be removed. But you've not told me why. Why? No, Winston. You uh, must tell me why. I know. The answer to that question is the measure of my whole success with uh, you. Uh, it may be the key to your release uh, from this small uh, prison of great agony. You tell me why, Winston. Why do we do all these things? You... You are ruling over us for our own good. You believe that human beings are not fit to... Ah! Ah! Stupid! Stupid! Stupid, Winston! You deserve an eternity of pain for a folly like that. Now I will tell you why. The party seeks power for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested only in power. Not wealth or luxury or long life. Only in power. Pure power. No one ever sees power with the intention of giving it up. Power is not a means. It is an end in itself. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. Each is an exercise of power. A pressing upon the nerve of agony until one after another all men are converted to our discipline. All men are submissive to a universal power. You'll never do it. You'll never do it. Never. Never. We did it to you, Winston. Shall I show you in a mirror? Just what we have done to you. <laughs> Shall I tell you that you're just a bag of bones? <laughs> that you've lost all semblance of a man? <laughs> that your hair and your teeth are falling out? <laughs> that you are an offense to sight and to smell? <laughs> we did that to you, Winston. <laughs> now, two and two may cry, but I'll never betray you. You failed there. You couldn't make me betray her. Couldn't you? You failed, O'Brien. You failed. You, 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 you failed. No, we never yes, failed. 
Never. We cannot afford to fail. Take him, Baboom 101! So this is the end of horror. This small room down in the bowels of the earth. I'm strapped to a chair. Tightly, so tightly that I cannot move. I cannot retreat inside my skull case. That does not belong to me anymore. It has been entered and possessed and garrisoned by O'Brien. There is no retreat left anymore. I am faced now with the ultimate agony. I am in room one, oh, one. You asked me once, Winston, what was in room 101. You knew the answer, though. You wouldn't admit it. No. Everybody knows it, really. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world, of course, varies from person to person. For some, it is burial alive. For some, it is death by fire. For some, it is quite a trivial thing. In your case, Winston, it is... Rats. Oh, oh no. Oh, 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 take them away. Keep them away from me. You, you can't do this to me. You can't do you this. You have not yet surrendered to me, Winston. How can I surrender if I don't know what you want? I've answered all the questions, haven't I? I I've learned all your lessons, haven't I? Take them away. Please, take them away. The rats are starved, Winston. They will eat a man alive. I, stand, I, I can I, I, use I, I them on you, to, or I can please. use them on Julia. You have your choice now. Which? Use them on Julia. I don't care. I don't care what you do. But don't let them near me. Don't. 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 Let Suffer now. Let her. Yeah, now, it's over now. There isn't any more. It's all over now. <laughs> is a calm, a great pervasive calm. You sit at your corner table in the cafe and fumble with the chessboard and sip your victory gin and scan the newspapers. You look out the window and watch the people go by. One day, Julia passed and something stirred in your mind for a moment and then died again. There are so many people, and this small corner which they keep for you is warm and comfortable. When you finish the newspaper, you watch the telly screen. Strange that, in a life without struggles, without any hint of climax, that is the moment that comes nearest to emotion. The face of Big Brother flashes on the screen. You hear his rich, Full voice. My comrades, my brothers, we live in times of great peril. But have no fear. I am with you always. My care and my love reach out to you, wherever you are. And we love you, big brother. We love you. We have erred. We have been punished. And you have taken us back. We love you, big brother. Love you. Love you. Love you.
Lux Radio Theatre is produced by Sterling McAvoy. 1984 was adapted from George Orwell's novel by Morris West. Tonight's play was directed by Paul Jackson. Heard in our cast were Lionel Stevens as O'Brien, Alexander Artsdale as Charrington, Guy Dolman as Parsons, and Dorothea Dunstan, Gordon Chater, Rupert Chance, Murray Powell, Leonard Bullen, and Alan Herbert. David Netheim was heard as the narrator. Margot Lee played the role of Julia, and as Winston Smith, you heard our distinguished Hollywood star, Vincent Price. (laughs) One week from tonight, Accent on Youth, starring Hollywood star Melvin Douglas in person. Until then, this is the Lux Radio Theatre signing off from 50 stations throughout the Commonwealth of Australia. That concludes this week's broadcast of Echoes of a Century. This program was an independent production by Doll Shoe Radio Creations, copyright 2005, produced in the studios of WLSU La Crosse, an affiliate of Wisconsin Public Radio on the La Crosse campus of the University of Wisconsin. I'm King David McKenzie. Thanks for listening. I hope that you'll join us again at the same time next week. Until then, remember, fear and God do not inhabit the same space. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime is now transcribed for radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. Anything wrong, Captain? Nothing serious, Mr. Templer. Just coming down here for a check. Go on just as soon as we can. Oh, and uh, where is here? Headstone, New Mexico. Used to be a big silver mining town, but now it's just another little town, I guess. Although I did notice there's a carnival playing over on the edge of this emergency landing strip. Well, how long are we to enjoy the hospitality of Headstone? Oh, two or three hours. Long enough to see the town, have dinner if you like. We're sorry to delay, sir. Oh, it's all right, Captain. I'm seldom bored in a strange town. Well, you better go back and fasten your seatbelt, Mr. Templer. We're coming down now. Right. I'll see you later. Well, good evening, Saint. You know me? Yet I don't seem to recall your face. Harry Kelly, and you don't recall my face because we've never met, but I've seen many pictures of you, and so I recognized your meeting. Well, that's very flattering. Tell me, Mr. Kelly, how can I get into town? You can find a cab on the other side of the carnival. Planning on staying long? Not at all. Should I? On the contrary, I was just going to suggest that I doubt if Headstone would welcome the presence of the saint. Just a friendly remark, you understand. Oh, naturally. <laughs> And if I may be permitted a friendly question, why are you telling me this? Just an interest in the continued health of my fellow human. If you have any trouble in town, look me up. Anyone can tell you where to find me. I look, I look, the big show is just about to start. See, little Fatima, the girl who shakes and shivers like a bowl full of jelly. Only one dime, ten cents, the tenth part of a dollar. Hurry, 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 stop right there. I read the past, the present, and the future. Learn your fortune, young man. I already know it, Grandmother. I'm destined to meet a tall, dark, and beautiful woman. I'll settle for nothing less. I see strange lines on your face, young man. I will tell your fortune without charge. Give me your hand. I see danger. Beware of a blonde young woman. She will bring you death. 
There are worse ways of dying, Grandmother. I see danger, much danger, for one with a halo about his head. Blood and death. Unless he travels, I see... <laughs> I think I'm beginning to get the idea. You might tell your um, crystal ball that I'm beginning to be interested. Goodbye, Grandmother, and may the saints bless you. Taxi, mister? Oh, thank you. Uh, say, do you suppose you can drive me somewhere that serves a good dinner? <laughs> sure. The Silver Dollar Hotel. Oh, fine. <laughs> you know, I was just sitting there communing with nature about how many guys there are who blow their wad to watch some dame do a hula but won't spend a dime on a hack. Do I detect a touch of Brooklyn? How could you miss? <laughs> <laughs> That's me, chum. Ziggy from Flatwood. I used to drive a hack in Brooklyn. Now I own the only hack in Headstone. It's like, huh? You know, I ain't seen the Brooklyn Bridge for ten years since I come out here for my health. <laughs> like I always say, it's a smart man who knows when it's healthy to get out of town. Meaning what? Does everything have to mean something? <laughs> Me, I mind my own business, I stay healthy. That's why I'm living in Headstone instead of under one. I see. But if you didn't mind your own business, I suppose you'd give me some advice about leaving Headstone. Is that it? No, no, no advice, Mac. That's part of minding my own business. Headstone is a great place for strangers to visit. If they paid up their insurance. <laughs> Here you are, waiter. Very nice dinner. My check, please. No, no, no. Thank you. Keep the change. Hello. Well, well, this is a surprising hotel. First a beautiful dinner, and then an even more beautiful blonde. May I sit down? Oh, by all means, Miss... Um... Uh, Betty Connolly. You're Simon Templer? Mm, I should have worn my dark glasses. But now that the truth is out... <laughs> You might as well call me Simon. All right, Simon. Now, how did you know who I am? Now, don't tell me that you were just passing and recognized me. Well, Ziggy told me that you were here. He owns and drives the taxi here uh, in Headstone. I know I shouldn't look a gift blonde in the hair, but why did Ziggy tell you I was in here? Well, Ziggy knows that I need help, and he thought, well, that is, since you're the saint, you might help me. Well, I have been known to help beautiful blondes on occasion. <laughs> But tell me why you should need help, Betty. Someone's been trying to kill me. Oh, there should be a law against that. Are you sure? I've been shot at twice. And, and everybody here has been very unfriendly, except Ziggy and a man named Harry Kelly. Huh. I've noticed the unfriendliness in this town. But being unfriendly towards you is obviously an indication of insanity. Oh, please don't joke about it. I'm, I'm frightened. All right, my dear. Now tell me about it. Well, uh, my father was known as Silver Slim Connolly. He lived here for years. But he sent me east to school when I was very young, and I didn't come back here until recently. My father died about a month ago. Oh, I'm sorry. He was broke, and all he left me was his old silver mine. It, he called it the Betty Mine, after me. And I take it somebody wants the mine. No, no, the mine is completely worthless. There hasn't been any silver in it for years. But, my dear, you were shot at twice. Have you any idea who did the shooting? No, but it might be the same man who told me to get out of town. Oh, who? Mike McCarthy. Ziggy says he's an eastern gangster who's been living out here for several months. Will you help me, Mr. Temp... Simon? Hmm. Well, I've never been able to say no to a pretty girl. You mentioned a man named Harry Kelly before. Just who is he? He knew my father. He's been very friendly to me. Although he thought I ought to leave town, too. I've met Mr. Kelly, and he intrigues me very much. I, um, I think we'll go see him. All right. Oh, uh, just a minute. Hmm? <laughs> there was some red dust on your coat. Oh, thank you. Ziggy apparently doesn't get enough passengers to keep his cab dusted. <laughs> uh, did you say Ziggy was parked outside in his chariot? Mm -hmm. He was when I came in. Oh, there he is. Yes, looking exactly as if he were back in Brooklyn. Hey, Ziggy! Oh, so she found you, huh? Uh, thanks to your bird dogging, which I must admit in this case has done much to overcome any natural prejudice against cab drivers that I might have. Uh, say, do you know where Harry Kelly lives? Sure. And let's go then. Huh? Hey, don't you ever clean out this hack? What's all this dust? Well, who knows? Maybe it was that redhead that hired me yesterday. 
Well, she had dandruff. Piggy, you missed your calling. You're as funny as an undertaker. Well, now, Ziggy, I don't suppose you'd care to tell me why you warned me to get out of Headstone. <laughs> Got me all wrong, Saint. I wasn't warning you. I was just talking about myself. And I don't suppose you'd care to tell me why somebody took pot shots at Miss Connolly here and told her to get out of town, too. Me, I don't know nothing. Like I was telling you, Saint, I mind my own business. Maybe you stay ignorant that way, but it's healthier, and I like it like that. Well, in that case, why did you send Miss Connolly in to see me? Well, like you can see, she's a pretty little pigeon. She needs to know some guy will help her. Now, it ain't no secret that the saint goes around mixing in other people's business, so I tell her to see you. And who told you I was the saint? I got eyes in my head, ain't I? Like I said, I used to hack in Brooklyn. I got around. Uh, what about this Mike McCarthy? Strictly smart money, saint. Huh? A lot of guys have crossed his path once. You get what I mean. What about uh, Harry Kelly? Eh, local stuff. A nice schmo, but no more. <laughs> You're doing all right for a guy that doesn't know anything. <laughs> you got me wrong, pal. Ziggy, he looks people over, but he don't see nothing except one guy is tough, another guy is a schmo, and maybe another guy is too nosy. I really don't think we should try to involve Ziggy, Simon. He's been very nice as it is. Yeah, she's got something, pal. I ain't really equipped for it, because uh, the way your head is, uh, only a saint could feel at home. Well, here we are, Saint. Kelly lives on the first floor in the room. Oh, thanks. Uh, wait for us, Diggy. We've got a couple of other calls to make after this. Don't worry, I'll wait. If you get in any trouble, just yell. Then I'll drive over and tell the sheriff I heard somebody yell for help. Oh, thanks, pal. Come on, Betty. Well, I hope our friend is in and that he talks. Yeah. Strange. Harry telling you to come and see him if you had any trouble. If he had any connection with me, then why hasn't he said something to me? Well, he sounded to me like a cautious man. Maybe he did know something but didn't want to say anything unless he felt sure something was going to be done. Well, we'll soon know. Yes, who is it? Simon Templer. Oh, the saint. Just a minute. Those shots were in that room. This is no time for conversation, darling. We're going in. Oh, but... Like this. Kelly. Uh, oh, Simon. Kelly. Uh, Kelly, this is Simon Templer. Saint? Yes, Kelly, the saint. Who shot you? The window. The mine. Kelly. Well, Betty, he isn't going to tell us anything now. This killer did a very thorough job. Hmm. Window open. Must have shot from here. There's a shell on the fireplace. But what was he saying? It sounded like like spin. <laughs> Come on, Betty. We're going to spread a little saintliness. And I think I know where to begin. But, Ziggy, didn't you hear anything? Well, I noticed some noise, but like I told I you... I know. You mind your own business. Uh, are we going to the sheriff's time? No, and... not yet. Ziggy, who's the estate in this town? Old man Matthews. The office is closed now, but he lives right ahead there. That, that big white house. Okay, stop there. But, Simon... I'd like to satisfy a little curiosity about that mine of yours. I'll be right back. You stay in here, Betty. Uh, what do you want? Mr. Matthews. Who else should be here? It's my house, ain't it? What do you want? Uh, my name is Simon Templer. I wanted to ask you if you know the Connolly Silver Mine. I know every mine within 200 miles of here, young fella. Hey, ain't that Betty Connolly sitting up there in that taxi? Yes. Then why can't she tell you about the mine? She owns it. Well, she has told me, but I just wanted to check about the possibility of a mistake. How much silver would you say there was in the Connolly mine? About enough to put in your eye and still leave room for your finger? Couldn't there be a hidden vein in it? Nope. 
There ain't been enough silver around here to make a dime for years and years. Could there be anything else of value in it? Mud and water, if you call that valuable. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Young fella, I've been here man and boy for 70 years, and I ain't got no time to stand around answering darn fool questions. Goodbye. Well, goodbye. And Betty, you may be right. Old man Matthew says the mine is worthless, too. So, Ziggy, take us to see Mike McCarthy. Are you sure you want to go there, sir? If I was you, I'd get on that plane. It's leaving pretty soon. No, Ziggy, I've decided not to leave Headstone just yet. Later, you can drive me over to Albuquerque, and I'll take the chief the rest of the way. Okay, Charm, it's your funeral. Please be careful. Don't you worry, Betty. The Halo Wearers Benevolent Association would be very upset if anything happened to me. I'll be right out. Yeah? I'm looking for Mike McCarthy. Well, you found him. Hmm, it's my Boy Scout training. It never fails. My name is Simon Templer. The Saint? I've been known by that name. So what? That's a very interesting question. I must try to think of an answer sometime. Meanwhile, I thought you might like to know that I heartily disapprove of your telling a certain Miss Betty Connolly that she ought to leave town. What's the girl to you? That's my business. I could make it mine. And if I do, your halo's going to slip down and start choking you. Hmm, I thought bullets were more in your line. Meaning what? Meaning the shots fired at Miss Connolly and a little gunning job only a few minutes ago. I didn't do any gunning. But I'm liable to if you don't beat it. You sound so sure of yourself, Michael. That's because I got more in my hand than an itching palm. Mm, that's a very pretty gun, Mike. <laughs> but I'm very much afraid that nothing will satisfy my curiosity short of knowing why you want to get Miss Connolly out of town. I got answers for nosy guys. Six of them. I just stand right there. Stay away from that desk, Saint, or Don't I'll... worry, Mike. I have no interest in the desk at all. But I do have an interest in Miss Connolly. <laughs> Michael, I'll bid you adieu. What happened, Simon? Oh, not much, I'm afraid. The conversation was just getting interesting when Mike had a sudden attack of dropsy. That's funny. I never heard of him being sick. Oh, that's because you mind your own business, Ziggy, like you tell me. Betty, where is that silver mine of yours? About two miles out of town. Is there any place in town where we can rent a car? Well, why, I have a car. Why? I feel a prospecting urge coming over me. Ziggy, take us to Miss Connolly's car, and then we can dispense with your valuable service. What's wrong with my car? Nothing, Ziggy. It's just that I don't like people looking over my shoulder, especially when I visit a lonely mine in the company of a beautiful girl. <laughs> Here's the Betty Mine, although I don't know why you want to see it. Frankly, I don't know either. But as long as I'm here, I might as well take the 40-cent tour. Certainly, sir. Right this way. This old cable car goes down into the mine. Mm. All we have to do is stand on the platform and pull the cable. It works with balanced weight. Clever, these 49ers. How far down? <laughs> on the 40-cent tour, we give the exact distance. 354 feet, 6 inches. Thank you. And, uh, thank you for having electric lights in a mine that hasn't been worked for years. Oh, the mine has its own battery. See? Here's a bulb on the car. Shall we go down? What are we waiting for? Let's go. Maybe the lights will go out. Just hold it like that. I've been waiting for you two. Well, Michael McCarthy, I was wondering if we were going to have your company. And this time, wise guy, don't try anything. Don't tell me, Michael, that you're going prospecting with us. I'm riding down with you, but I'm coming back alone. Start the car down, Saint, but don't try no tricks. You have a suspicious mind, Mike. Well, here we go. Call out your floors, please. Mezzanine, ladies' underwear, galoshes, and accessories. You'll be singing a different tune pretty soon, Saint. You both had your chance to leave town your way. Now you're going to leave my way. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, don't be, Betty. This is my first ride on an open cable car. And it'll be your last. I wouldn't be too sure. 
Unless that cable breaks before we get to the bottom. Hey, what are you talking about? Sucker! It's a little crowded here for a one-two, so I, I guess a one and a half will have to do it. Knocked you off the platform, too. It was the padded shoulders in my coat. I I felt them hit the side. Oh, look at your shoulders. They're covered with dirt from the sides of the shaft. Yeah. It's red dirt. Wait a minute. Well, we can go back up, Betty. Mike doesn't need our help, and I don't need anybody to answer questions anymore. I'll never understand you. Why did you look at the dirt on your coat and say you didn't need any more questions? Because that dirt was red sulfide, Betty. And it explains why Mike was so anxious to run you out of town. Well, I don't see how. Red sulfide is used in paint, but that doesn't make it valuable. Red sulfide is also cinnabar ore, from which we get mercury, and that is pretty valuable. Evidently, your mine is rich in cinnabar, so it's worth a lot of money, Betty. Oh, then that was what Kelly was trying to tell us when he said sin. Yes, he was trying to say cinnabar. How can I ever thank you, Simon? Well, I I have a couple of ideas on the subject. Oh, but now people would say I was chasing you for your money. So, I guess you can just see me off on the train. We'll stop in town and have Ziggy drive us to Albuquerque. Oh, but I'll drive you. Now, I insist on taking a cab. I don't want you coming back alone. I may want to change my mind about uh, fortune hunting. Well, like I said, Shane, I'm glad to see you leaving. This town is just funny about strangers, but I think you ought to take Miss Connolly with you. But she doesn't have to go now, Ziggy, and besides, she's rich. She's what? Yes, Ziggy, we found out that Dad's mine is valuable after all. You... You mean you found silver? No, mercury. Oh, the stuff they put in the mama? That's the stuff, Diggy. But it's used for a lot of other things, particularly in wartime, and it's worth a lot of money. Well, what do you know? So that's why Mike was trying to make you leave. Huh? That's it. Well, did you stop and tell the sheriff? We didn't have time, but I'll see him when we go back. Oh, that's pretty nice for you, ain't it, buddy? Oh, here we are. Just in time, too. And the chief's in already. Right. Very nice timing, Diggy. Thanks, Betty, for keeping my forced visit to Headstone from being dull. Oh, Simon, I... Well, why don't you stay in Headstone? I won't know how to run the mine or, or what to do with the money or, or anything. <laughs> You'll learn, Betty. You know what to do when you get back to town? Yes, but well, will the sheriff believe me? I mean, about Mike McCarthy killing Harry Kelly. I don't think he will, since Mike didn't kill Kelly. Oh, but Kelly was shot with an automatic. He ejected a shell on the fireplace, remember? But Mike McCarthy carried a revolver. You saw it. Yes, but will the sheriff... Oh, the sheriff will believe when you show him that the gun that killed Kelly is in Ziggy's pocket. What? What are you talking about? You knew about the cinnabar ore in the mine. You carried some of it away to be tested in your cab. And there was red dust in it, which you tried to explain with a corny gag. You're crazy. Harry Kelly had an idea of what was going on, so you slipped around to the back while we were at the front door and killed him. All right, wise guy, you're so smart. What about Mike? Mike was working for you. But, but Simon, Ziggy told me that you were in town. Sure, he couldn't be sure that I wasn't here to break up his little scheme. So the smartest thing to do was to get us together so he could watch both of us. <laughs> he thought I would use his cab as I did, and it would be easy. But he slipped up when he sent Mike out to the mine ahead of us. Ziggy was the only one who knew where we were going. Okay, pal, you ask for it. This time, sweetheart. <laughs> Like you said, Pad, you should have followed your own advice about minding your own business. Well, he's all yours, Betty. The gun that killed Kelly is now on the seat beside him. All you have to do is turn the body and the gun over to the sheriff, and from there on in, he'll mind Ziggy's business for him. But, Simon... Don't worry, Betty. I'll stop back someday to make sure that Venus is in conjunction with Mercury. <laughs> You 
have just heard another adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now, here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, how many times there have been men just like Ziggy, led into crime by insatiable greed, forgetting the simplest truth so aptly phrased by John Dryden. Murder may pass unpunished for a time, but tardy justice will overtake the crime. This is Vincent Price extending a personal invitation to all of you to join us again next week at this same time for another adventure of The Saint. Good night. Tonight's script of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. Our cast included Harry Bartell, Barney Phillips, Colleen Collins, Fred Howard, and Tony Barrett. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saint is a James L. Staffier Agency production and was transcribed and directed by Thomas A. McAvity. Don't forget that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, are known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime is now transcribed for radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. Hey, what's what going on doing? here? This is my car here. Uh, no, no, no. Hey. Stop it. Hey, cut it out. Stop it. What's the idea? Now let that man alone. Look, you keep out of this, buddy, or I'll... Well, it ain't the same. <laughs> it's euphonic, but slightly ungrammatical, Mac. Now, what's the disturbance? Uh, they drew up alongside of my car. Him and the other fella, they said, get out. We're taking your car. Why, Mac wouldn't do a thing like that, now would you, Mac? No. Nah. Of course not. The old man's nuts. What Mac would do if he coveted his neighbor's jalopy is slug him with a piece of lead pipe and drive off. Yeah, so good night. I get this. Now, wait, Mac. You could satisfy my curiosity a little. Why should you want to steal this gentleman's old automobile when you've got nicer, newer ones to choose from? Yes, sir. Uh, ask him, mister. Ask him. Yeah, ask me, son. Go ahead. And I'm going to satisfy a little curiosity of my own. I didn't think you had any, Mac. <laughs> what shape does it take? I always wondered how you'd look dead. Good night, all. Good night, man. Be seeing you. You, you let him go. Yes, he convinced me that I should for now. There's nothing like a thirty-two in the pocket of a known thug for winning an argument. Did you uh, say there was another fellow with him? Uh, yes, uh, run off when he heard you coming. It was the same fellow tried to buy my car yesterday. Someone tried to buy this <laughs> this car. Oh, sure. This fellow tried to buy it. And there was a woman made an offer, too. Did you mean you actually refused? I ain't selling until I find out why they want to buy it so bad. This fellow who tried to buy the car, do you know his name? No, he he looked like a gentleman until... Until you found him consorting with felonous intent with our just-departed friend, eh? <laughs> Tell me, was he a uh, well-dressed and annoying little mustache placed just over the sneer he wears for a mouth? Well, well yes. Say, how did you... That's easy. Our friend Mac does piecework for him. Fancy Dan Turner is his current alias. And But I see you don't keep up with such things. You're going to tell the police? Later, perhaps, when there's something to tell them. Right now, I've got a great thirst that needs quenching. A thirst for knowledge. Huh? Yeah, what's your name and where do you live? Uh, Collins. Uh, 302 East 8th Street. Mm-hmm. Now, put your car in cold storage, old time, and take care of yourself. Something tells me this is Rat's Night Out. Hmm. Hello, Smitty. Back making book, I see. You got the wrong joint, Saint. Take a look around. I run a pool room. 
You interested in a horse? No, no, a man. Well, like I said, Saint, you got the wrong joint. His name's Mac. He hangs out here. Now, where is he? In the back room? I'm the three monkeys, Saint. Deep, dumb, and blind. The only Mac I know is a truck. Oh, then if you don't mind, I'd like to look in your back room and see if he's parked there. I mind. But you won't even know, Smitty. You're deep, dumb, and blind. Oh, have a heart, Saint. I ain't got no back room. And besides, last time you dropped in my place, a, a lot of my customers started patronizing elsewhere. Including you, Smitty, remember? I've only been back from the gray place a week, and I ain't forgetting it. Oh, come on, Saint. Be a good guy. Beat it, huh? No, no, Smitty. Let him stay a while. Hello, Mac. I was hoping you were smart enough to go home and get some sleep. How could I sleep with you out roaming the streets, Mac? You know how I worry. Yeah, yeah, too much. What does he want, Smitty? You. Why, Saint? I want to talk with Fancy Dan Turner. What about... Now, let's not be coy, Mac. It doesn't become you. I want to ask Turner why he's trying to steal a jalopy from an old man. Well, what do you know? I got a surprise for you, Saint. I'll take it to him. I say you're looking for me, Saint. Mm, the boys are right. So you found me. So? I understand you're interested in a certain old car. So what? Probably the smiling Irishman is, too. A broken down 1929 sedan seems a little slow for a fast man like you, Fancy Dan. Well, maybe I like to go slow enough to read the billboards when I drive. What's it to you, Saint? It depends on what it is to you, Turner. What's on the fire? You are. There's a handle with care sign on this deal, and I don't want just anybody cutting in. You're a fouler upper. You've been stepping high and fancy free too long, Turner. You're beginning to irritate me. The feeling's likewise, Saint. Only I got more than fingers in my fist, and you haven't. Hmm, that's a nice gun you're so bravely wearing, Turner. It must be a pretty big pot to change a small time con artist like you into a fire breathing gunman. Big potatoes, huh? Yeah, plenty big, Saint. So big, I wouldn't hesitate to shoot at the slightest move. Am I clear? You couldn't be clearer if you were a day ordered by the Chamber of Commerce. Good. Now, it ain't a palace saint. It's just the back room of a pool parlor. But please stay and be my guest. Oh, very well. For a little while, anyway. Where are the boys? Out. And they're wasting their time. Collins won't sell his old wreck. Some old men are stubborn. And Collins seems like a hard man to intimidate. Well, that all depends on who's doing the intimidating, saint. Now, Max a chowderhead, and Smitty's even worse, but put the two boys together, and you'll get a job of work done. Dan, I've adopted old man Collins as a friend. Ah, oh, how big are you? Yes. And you know how I feel about people who push other people around, Turner? Especially when the guy getting the shoving is a friend. You know, if I had a glass of beer, I'd cry into it. Sit back and relax, Saint. The boys will be back with what they want after soon enough, and maybe then I'll let you go home. You mean they're coming back with a car? Well, maybe not the whole car. Sit back and relax. Hey, relax. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Sitting back with my chair to the wall, Turner. You want me to relax, don't you? Yeah, I... Hey, let go of that cue stick. <laughs> as my old grandmother used to say, Turner, there's nothing as relaxing as a game of pool. <laughs> Particularly with a hoodlum's head as the cue ball. <laughs> Collins, Collins, open up. You, uh, you wouldn't be from the police now, would you? No, no, I'm no more a policeman than you are, old man Collins. <laughs> Come in and be welcome, Dad. Oh. Where's Collins? The old man, he's here. Where? Behind the sofa. But if you're of a mind to look at him, make us a quick look. Dead? Very. How? Every way. Beaten, stabbed, and tortured. Maybe even shot, for all I know. Yes, and for all I know, maybe you've got a gun with an empty chamber, for all I know. Bless me, no. Me business doesn't allow it. <laughs> Just what sort of business are you in, Irish? The name's O'Brien. Ah. When a job is pulled, and the police go after the boys who pull it, I make an end run and go after the swag. Or at least part of it. Oh, I see. Uh, what's the swag here? Collins' wallet? Not unless there's 400 grand in it. 400? 
Oh, no, I'm afraid you'll find the old man a few cents short. Who killed him? Not I. How do I know? You don't. You're right. What brought you here? Why, I'm here about the old car, of course. You want to buy it? Certainly, don't you? Say, maybe you're not being cute. Maybe you really don't know about the... About what? Well, now, <laughs> I'm greatly relieved. When I first saw you come through that door, I said to myself, Oh, Brian, here comes some more competition. But I see you're not. I'm relieved, laddie. <laughs> greatly relieved. Turner is competition enough, eh? Yes, but Turner and his ugly ducklings are nothing compared to... Who? In time. I got here just a minute before you, laddie. The old man was dead when I arrived. Beyond that, I know nothing. Get down. Oh, oh Brian. Oh, Brian. Competition. Getting worse. All the time. Look, I'll call the doctor. No, no, no. Uh, thanks, laddie. Lay, lay off this frolic. He'll get you next. You're gonna die, mister. You're gonna... Oh, Brian. Oh, Brian, the old man's car, what... Well, I guess I'll have to try another angle. This one's pretty dead. I awakened Mr. Ritchie as you requested, Mr. Templer. He'll be right down. Oh, thank you. I hope the fire isn't too serious. Well, it's serious enough to awaken Mr. Ritchie. Oh, oh, here he is now, sir. Well, well, which plant is the fire in? Who's responsible? How big is the damage? Oh, the fire isn't in any plant, Mr. Ritchie. What's that, then? Then, then where... It's where, inside uh, of me. I'm burning up, and I need your help. How dare you sneak your way in here at three o'clock in the morning by telling me there's a fire? Look here, who are you? Simon Templer. Oh, oh yes, the saint. Hmm. I've heard of you. If you have business with me, Mr. Templer, I suggest you phone my secretary for an appointment. Meanwhile, there's no subject on earth can keep me from going back to bed. Not even the subject of $400,000, Mr. Ritchie? What do you know about it? Nothing other than that it was stolen from you, Mr. Ritchie. That happened seven years ago. The criminal, John Quayley, was caught, tried, and convicted. Now, if you'll pardon but me... Quayley I... worked for you, I believe. He was my head accountant. And the money was never found? No. Quayley drew 20 years in the penitentiary. He never revealed where the money was hidden. Until the day he died. Died? Yes. Two weeks ago in prison. <laughs> and uh, now, Mr. Templer, if you don't mind, I need my rest. I won't detain you much longer, Mr. Ritchie. Just one or two more questions. Well? Uh, did Quayley have a wife? Yes, he did. If he knew he were dying in prison, it's quite possible he made an attempt to get word to her, to tell her where the money was hidden. He may have made the attempt, but he couldn't possibly have succeeded. He was too closely watched. Oh. After all, $400,000 is a lot of money. A lot of money. Yes, you could almost buy a second-hand car with it. If I hadn't been fully covered by insurance, my firm would have gone under in the face of a loss that large. And uh, now, Mr. Templer, if I might ask a question... Certainly. Why this sudden urgency, this three o'clock in the morning business? An old man was tortured to death. Then a fellow named O'Brien, who came calling on the old man, was shot to death. But, but, but Before but... he was killed, O'Brien told me he was tracking down $400,000 that had been stolen. Oh, I see. Yeah, and some checking back over how many people have ever had that amount stolen from Led them. you to me? Yes. I wonder what I've led you to, Mr. Templer? I wonder, Mr. Ritchie. I wonder. <laughs> What is it? Mrs. Quayley? What do you want? Several things, Mrs. Quayley. Like what? A murderer. You've got the wrong apartment, mister. An old automobile. No sale. Anything else? Maybe you'll buy this, Mrs. Quayley. Collins was murdered a little while ago. Collins? Mm. Oh, the old man. Why? Someone wanted his car. Someone who evidently couldn't wait any longer for the newer models. So? So I saw Collins' car in your garage, Mrs. Quayley. Maybe you better come in after all, mister. But come in careful. Careful enough? Keep those hands high. Sure. I don't like you, mister. You're nailing together a frame and you're trying to put my picture into it. Colin sold me that car. When? Tonight. I could have bought a Cadillac for cheaper, mister, but I wasn't in any position to haggle. Yes, I know. What do you know? That's what I want to find out. 
I know that Collins' car is a car is worth about $20, but if something else is worth in the neighborhood of $400,000. And you know that's an awfully nice neighborhood. Nice and exclusive. Chiselers aren't invited to move in. Mm, I've been gathering that impression all evening. Well, what if we're here? You name it. An acetylene torch, welder's mask, a few chisels, a hammer, steel wire. <laughs> Either you've gone to work for Henry Kaiser or the hand that customarily rocks the cradle is going in for rocking a safe. I had to go into a hardware store to make a phone call and I just couldn't leave without buying a few things. How fortunate you didn't make your call in an establishment that sells steamrollers. Ah, I see you have a set of license plates. You see too much. From Collins Jalopy, aren't they? These license plates. <laughs> So that's how Quayley smuggled out his message. You're getting awfully close to a bullet in your head, mister. Give me those plates. Shh, there's someone at the door. Stay where you are. I'll see who it is. Better not take the license plates with you. Yes? Oh! Mrs. Quayley! Oh! Mrs. The devil! The devil! He... He got the plates! Yes, yes, he got them. Don't let him! Oh, where? Where? Where Johnny worked. Shaft. Top. Before six. Before... Mrs. Quayley. Uh, Collins, O'Brien, and now... Now I have three reasons for wanting to meet a certain party. <laughs> Taxi! Hey, hey, taxi, taxi! They, uh, don't stop sometimes when it's so early in the morning, Saint, because they're on the way back to the garage. Well, what brings you out so early, Mac? Looking for a drunk to roll? Just looking for you, Saint, just looking for you. See here what I got in my hand? Oh, there goes that coy streak in you again, Mac. All right, so it's a gun. Well, what does it want me to do? Come, go, turn handsprings, quote Shelley, play the bassoon? You have to speak for it, Mac. Very funny. Look out, it shouldn't speak for itself, Saint. I and the gun, one you should get in that there car. Yeah, you have a most persuasive way of offering a fellow a lift, Mac. Yeah, yeah, a lift. Right now, it's a lift. Later on, it may grow into a ride. Hm. Come on. Uh, where are we going, Mac? Back to our little gray home in the rear of the pool room, Saint. Fancy Dan Turner wants he should thank you for showing him a new trick. Oh, it really isn't necessary. He feels like it is, Saint. He feels like it is. He's got a couple of tricks he wants to show you. Sounds like fun. Oh, on, there's the car, Jim. Turner's waiting. He's got very little patience. Nice to have you back with us, Saint. I missed you. <laughs> From the looks of that bandage on your skull, Turner, I'll bet you wished I'd missed you. Not now, I don't, Saint. It's a nice feeling having you here, knowing that I owe you something. I pay my debts, Saint. I pay off. Yes, I know. O'Brien was paid off. So was Mrs. Quayley. Paid off with lead checks. They're dead? Oh, now save that innocent expression for the jury, Turner. You'll need everything you've got. Well... When were they killed, Saint? Okay, I'll stooge for you. They were killed an hour or two after I so abruptly left you before. Oh, well, I'll have to find another pigeon, Saint. My alibi's fat. How fat, Turner? City Hospital. Having remember the Saint embroidered where a cue stick hit me. And Smitty and Mac were there, too, to see me through it. Hospitals have records, Saint. We're clean. We're clean. Huh. Then you've got a competitor you don't know about, Turner. Yeah, looks that way. For a job that was supposed to be as simple as this one, I got too many competitors. I wonder how come. Who fingered the job for you, Turner? Who told you Quayley got word out to his wife about where the money was? I got nothing for you, Saint. Well, Smitty, wasn't it? Smitty just finished a stretch up the creek. My guess is he ran into Quayley, maybe he shared a cell with him. No. It was in the jail hospital they met. Smitty worked there. Quayley was dying off his nut. Smitty made him talk. Yeah. And Smitty, not being mentally suited for solo work, spilled the pitch to you, Turner, for a price, of course, for money on the line. Yeah. Ten G's to buy in on a 400,000 job. 
But what are you driving at? What are you picking Smitty's bones for? I was just wondering, Turner, how much O'Brien paid Smitty for his slice of this exclusive information and how much your other competitors shelled out. The one who happily goes around killing people. What do you mean? If you ask me, Turner, your pal Smitty is the sort of rat that even rats on rats. He sold Quayley's secret three times that we know of. Hey, thanks for handicapping it for me, Saint. Well, if you're really grateful, Turner, you can return the favor by telling me, uh, what time is it? It's, uh, 5.15 in the morning, Saint, but you ain't going nowhere. I have a date to keep before six, Turner, with your competitor. Yes, yeah, Saint, that's what you think. Maybe not, Turner. What do you say we play a little pool while we're waiting for the boys? Get away from that pool table. I ain't playing any games with you, Saint. Well, maybe pool was the wrong game. How about a game of pitch and catch? What? Yeah, I pitch like this. Ow! And you catch it like that. Hate to leave you all by yourself there in the side pocket, but like I said, I have a date to keep. Well, Mr. Ritchie, get enough sleep despite my interruption? <laughs> I wasn't really asleep when you called on me, Mr. Templer. I know, Mr. Ritchie. Your hair was a little too carefully combed for a man who's been suddenly awakened and told he's having a fire. You're very clever, Mr. Templer. But not clever enough to catch you before you committed three murders. So you're Smitty's silent partner, huh? See what low company's gotten you into, Ritchie? Yes, I see. Four hundred thousand dollars buried in the siding of this elevator shaft. And with the help of this acetylene torch, it'll be all mine. A very ingenious fellow, Quayley. And to think the money never left this building. Hmm. The place where Johnny worked. <laughs> yes, he was ingenious. It was very smart of him to use his prison job making automobile license plates as a means of smuggling out the information to his wife. How did he do it, Richie? Very simple, Templar. There's an extra piece of thin metal in this particular plate, forming a sort of pocket. And inside the pocket, a note on cigarette paper telling poor Mrs. Quayley how to get the money. Of course, once he managed to tell her the number of the license plate, well, the rest was easy, wasn't it? Yes. All poor Mrs. Quayley had to do was ask the motor vehicle bureau to whom the plate was assigned. Mr. Collins, in this instance. Poor old fellow. <sighs> Mr. Temple, would you mind joining me here in the shop, please? Hmm? Yes, right on top of the elevator. I'd like to keep an eye on you while I finish burning out this metal partition. You see, I've only until six o'clock when this elevator is switched on downstairs. Oh, well, I... I... Come, come, in the shaft, please. Well, really, I, I... I have a gun, Mr. Templer. Oh, well, that makes it official, then. There we are. Careful, Mr. Templer. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Anything accidental, that is. You know, it's funny. I've known you such a short time, and I have exactly the same sentiments towards you. I've never been astride the top of an elevator before, Richie. And we're right near the top of the shaft. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean to worry you, Templar. But when this elevator power turns on in a few minutes, it will rise to the top before it descends. How is your treasure hunt coming, Richie? Almost finished. One last strip of metal to cut away and the partition will come off. Then we'll decide your fate, Mr. Templar. Your future. Here goes. A last blow. It's there. It's there. I see it. $400,000 in currency, Templar. Think of it. Think of and it. You think of it, Richie, and also think of how much blood was spilled on it. Preaching, Templar? You? I never thought. What's that? The elevator, Richie. Maybe it came to work a little early today. My, my money. My money. Come on, Richie. Come on, get off. No, no, there's still some money left here. I want it. I want it all. All. Oh, come on. We've got to get off. Jump, Richie, jump. No, no, my money. I must save the money. Richie, you fool. All right, I got it. I... Ah! Oh, yes, Richie. You saved your money, and you saved the state some money, too. I'm sure you didn't plan on saving the cost of your execution. <laughs> You have been listening to another adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now, here is our star, Vincent Price. These immortal words of Ovid, translated from the Latin, express quite well indeed the justice of our Mr. Ritchie's fate. Nor is there any juster law than that the contrivers of death should perish by their own contrivances. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time 
for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. Tonight's script of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. Our cast included Laureen Tuttle, Barney Phillips, Tony Barrett, Fred Howard, and Dan O'Herlihy. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saints is a James L. Sapphire production and was transcribed and directed by Thomas A. McAvity. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Rudd. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Adventures of The Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charter and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor, Vincent Price, as The Saint. Isn't Randy Patterson? Oh, Templar, am I ever glad to see you. Just what the psychiatrist ordered. Sit down, old boy. Take a load of... Uh, <laughs> join me in a bowl of force. Oh, uh, thanks, but I... Ah, sirree, am I ever glad to see you. A sight for these bloodshot orbs. Yes, sirree. I realize I'm a very charming fellow and all that, Randy, but even though me thinks this greeting is just a wee bit over-enthusiastic, uh, could it be we're leading up to a touch? Oh, Templar, old boy, leave us not be mercenary. There's nothing I'd rather leave us not be. My heart goes out to you, son. But not my hand. <laughs> Say, not bad. I'll use that sometime. You just did. No, I mean in one of my books. You did. Did I? Yes, in the case of the hangman's rope, or there's bad news tonight. Say, that's right. So I did. What do you know? So, you read my books. I'm flattered. I read that one. Did you read my latest, uh, The Case of the Dead Man's Limp, or he died with his boots on and they were too tight? No, I missed that one. Oh, too bad. Well, that's why I'm glad to see you. Because I didn't read your book? No. Because maybe it can save my life. I could be killed on account of that book. Just that one? Oh, Templar, old boy, you cut me to the quick. The case of the cut-up author, or who hacked the hack. Oh, it's no joke, Templar. You've heard of Kid Waldo? The heavyweight? Yeah, I've heard of him. Well, when he was just a punk, Georgie Garnett signed him up to manage him. Lifetime contract. Now the kid is in the higher brackets, and he's still tied to Garnett on terms he no like. Well, can't he afford a lawyer? He's got a lawyer, but Garnett swings a mean pen, no loopholes. The contract is ironclad. And your heart bleeds for the kid, and you're afraid you'll bleed to death, I see. Not exactly. You see, the kid figures an angle. Garnett has a wife. Oh, a lovely tomato, any way you look at her. And, brother, you look at her. You mean the kid looks at her? Precisely, and vice versa. You see, the kid is no bad piece of merchandise himself. Six foot four of solid muscle. And what about his face? Well, his face retains much of its original shape in spite of coming in contact with some of the fanciest leather in the business. Mm-hmm. Soft music, two hearts in three-quarter time. I get the picture. Well, not all of it. Don't forget uh, Garnet, husband. Ah, yes, triangle. Three hearts in two-quarter right. time. <laughs> and that's the kid's angle. Play up to the missus while she goes for him. So he can use her to get better terms from Garnet, huh? Mm-hmm. Only the way I wrote it, the kid and the missus slipped the manager a dose of rap. The way you that. wrote it? Well, that's what I'm talking about. You wrote a book based on Kid Waldo's shenanigans with Mrs. Garnett, added murder, and put it on the newsstand? I did, so help me. And I do mean help. I see. One of your real-life characters has read the book. One of them, all of them. Uh Uh-oh. Garnett wants to know, are his wife and his fighter really giving them the business? And if so, how do I know? My wife wants to know, how do I know? And the kid wants to know, how do I know? Well, how do you know? Templar, please. A writer protects his sources. He'd better start protecting himself. Well, that's where you come in. Uh, how big did you say the kid is? 
Six four. That's where I go out. Oh, now wait a minute. I don't want any part of it, Randy. You deserve what you're getting. You should have known better than to use a real situation. Well, I didn't use their real names. You think I'm crazy? No comment. And I used a disclaimer. Any similarity except for you, know. Yeah. I don't know how they caught on. But I used a switcheroo. The kid is a top heavyweight contender, but not in the book. I changed all that. Oh, you changed all that. Yeah, in the book, he's a lightweight. (laughs) Now, that's what I call a switcheroo. Well, they're after my hide, so you've got to help me, Temple. Well, what do you want me to do? You expect me to tell the saint his business? Oh, he'll think of something. I already have. Oh, great, what? I'm out of shaving cream, so I better go right down to the Templar, I store. appeal to you in the name of our friendship. I'm not... You know, kidding. Randy, I'm beginning to think of a few names for our friendship that aren't exactly appealing. Oh, you wouldn't let me down. You couldn't. I could try. Is this Simon Templar speaking, my old pal, my buddy? Oh, the Simon Templar who oh, saw me through no. the darkest hours of deadly literary tea? Oh, Rand. Who stood by me when the critics descended upon my first poor, defenseless brainchild? Oh, who was the Stop it, hater? stop it, Randy. You're breaking my heart. I'll do what I can for you, Randy. Oh, good old Templar. I knew you'd come through. But I still don't know just what you want. Well, it's simple, old man. These jokers are sore, all of them. Maybe they're after my hide. Well, that's what I've got to find out. In other words, one and all would thoroughly be delighted to see you dead. And you want to know if any of them are making specific plans for such delight, huh? Exactly. If we know what they're planning, maybe we can stop it. If, if not... You have a feeling all of a sudden any resemblance between you and a living person will be strictly coincidental. Right. <laughs> Why don't you give that punching bag a rest? It's getting tired. Who are you? Simon Templer. I'm a friend of Randy Patterson. Oh? Oh, please, kid. I want to talk to you. I've got nothing to say. Well, then allow me. Look, mister. My lawyers are Smith and McCormick. It's in their hands. You want to talk, talk to them. Oh, lawyers. Yeah, lawyers. I've been libeled. I never did none of the things it says in that book. You didn't? No. Well, then how do you know that the book's about you? How do I know? How do I know? Yeah, how do you know? Why, everything that happens in that book is just exactly like a... Oh, go chase yourself, will you? Oh, kid, you're looking the wrong way. This is my head. That's the punching bag there, see? Yeah. So long, kid. Yes? My name is Simon Templer. I'm looking for George Garnett. I'm Garnett. Uh, do you always greet your guests with a gun? Lately. And Monk isn't around. Oh, who's Monk? Bodyguard. Templer, eh? I've heard that name. Well, um, uh, what do you want? Well, look, I'd like to talk to you, but not in the doorway with a gun in my ribs. All right. Come in. Come in. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Templer. Templer. Oh, seems I... Uh, oh, oh, sit down there. Oh, thanks. I uh, have to take these blamed indigestion pills... Nervous stomach. Been under a strain lately. Terrible strain. Uh, By Jove, the saint. Uh, Of course. That's right. Yes, sure, sure. Templar. Ah. Well, what brings you here, Templar? Randy Patterson asked me to... Patterson, that rat, that skunk, that murderer. Murderer? Accomplice, then. So, who's been murdered? Nobody yet. Then why... Well, but somebody may be. Any minute, any time. Who? Me. That's what he said in that blasted book, isn't it? Me! But that doesn't mean... Yeah, me, me, me! Well, I tell you, Temper, if I get murdered, I'll hold Patterson partly responsible. So help me, I will. Just because he said you might be killed, you have to thank him for the warning. But he won't tell me where he got the information so I can really protect myself. No, I can't sleep. I got... Where'd I put those pills? You swallow them. Oh, oh, oh. Do you know, Templer? Do you know where he got the information? No. If you knew, would you tell? (laughs) <laughs> oh, yes, you would. I'll just bet. Why'd you come here, Templar? I've been wondering what you plan to do, so Do! I... Do! What can I do? Look, I got a beautiful wife. We were... Ha- well, we got along. At least I thought we did. Then he says in the book... Well, you know. Yes, I know. Oh, confounded Templar, a thing like that. How can you be sure? Felice says it's a lot of eyewash. That's what she says, a lot of eyewash. But I've been watching her. Watching her and the kid. That's the trouble. Gets you suspicious. Mm -hmm. I've been watching. There's something between them. I know there is. But if only I could be certain. Uh, Are you sure I took those pills? I'm sure. I mustn't forget. Doc says I'm... Well, 
Anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, 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 what was I saying? You think there's something between Felice and the kid? Uh, yeah, yeah, think. If only I was... Oh, who's kidding who? I know. And if Patterson is right about that, if he's right about that... Well, don't you see? The what? The murder. Oh. He could be right about that, too. It comes next. Yeah, the murder comes next. Not necessarily. That's why I got Monk. Big guy. Used to be the kid's sparring partner. Where is he? He ought to be here. Uh, say, look, you still haven't told me what you're doing here, Templar. What do you want? Nothing more with you, Garnett, but I would like to see Felice. Is she at home? No, at the Hotel Bennett. Oh? Yes, after this business, she moved out. Said I was too suspicious. Who wouldn't be suspicious? But I love her, Templar. That's the trouble. Why did he have to... Say, do you suppose there's a chance? Oh, no. Why do I keep trying to kid myself? Get out of here, Templar, will you? Get out. I'm going, Garnett. Goodbye. Hey, wait a minute. Where do you think you're going, Mr. Oh. Monk! Monk! Oh, oh Mr. Garnett, I... I didn't know you was here. I seen this fellow come out of the living room. I didn't know who he well, was. you might have asked before you broke my jaw. Is it broke? In at least three places. Ah, you're kidding. Is she a friend of yours, Mr. Garnett? Friend? Is anyone a friend in this doggy dog world? I don't know. Help him up, Mark. I'll help myself up, thanks. Oh, oh. oh. All right, Monk, you want sparring practice? I'll be glad to accommodate you. Wait a minute. What's she doing here, Mr. Garnett? I'm not quite sure. What, shall I throw him out? Look, muscle brains, I'd already be out if you hadn't suddenly rushed to the rescue. He's right, Monk, and speaking of rushing to the rescue, where were you? Well, taking a nap. I've got to keep in condition. I might have needed you. Well, you got the Roscoe. In that case, why do I ever need you? Say, that's a thought. Perhaps a... Well, Zambler, what are you waiting for? I thought you were going. Well, this has been such a delightful get-together, I can hardly tear myself away. I can tear you away if you need any help. I doubt it, Monk. From the look of you, you don't do so good when the other fellow's in a position to fight back. Yeah, if you was in the ring as long as I was, you'd be kind of banged up, too. But I was plenty good, brother, plenty good. If you want to know, even Joe Lewis was scared of me. Yeah, yeah, he was scared to fight me. How do you like that? Lewis was scared to fight me. How do you know? Well, did he ever fight me? Not that I know. All I'll... right, then. I see what you mean. <laughs> Well, goodbye again, fellas. Come in. Mr. Templer? Well, look what I get, and I didn't even send in any box tops. What? I was expecting Randy Patterson, but he can wait. In fact, I hope he does. Come in, come in. Mr. Temple, you've got to help me. Well, in that case, you'd better call me Simon. All right. And what do I call you? Uh, Felice. Felice Garnett. Oh. Oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Felice. In fact, I've tried to reach you several times today. Really? Why? Well, you see, I'm a friend of Randy Patterson. I didn't know he had any friends. Well, live and learn. Yes, and I want to keep on living. That's why I came here. If you're a friend of Patterson's, maybe I made a mistake. Not necessarily. What brings you here? I heard you'd been to see my husband. I wondered what your interest in us was. I'm afraid I found out. You said you wanted me to help you. I did. When I heard you were involved, I thought you might be just the one to turn to. Well, that was before you told me about Patterson. Any friend of his is an enemy of mine. Of course, but Felice, I believe in the old saying, love your enemy. It's rather difficult. Apparently, you need someone to help you. Why not give me a try? Just, uh, what help do you need? Well, it... Well, it can't hurt to tell you. I'm being framed. For what? My husband's murder. Has he been murdered? Well, not yet, but... You know, it's funny how everyone seems to take it for granted that he will be. He will? How do you know? Well, that's what it's all about. What? Didn't you read the book? Look, just because Randy wrote a book... But that's why he wrote it, so my husband could be murdered. Is that a fact? Of course. Patterson wrote a book, thinly disguised, about me and my husband and Kid Waldo. In it, the kid and I plot to kill my husband. So George read it, got frightened. Now he suspects maybe we really are planning to kill him. He's even hired a bodyguard. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, don't you see? It's all a build-up. And George really is killed. Naturally, it'll look like the kid and I did it. That's the whole idea. And Randy's in on the plot. Of course. The real killer hired him to throw suspicion on us. Just who is the real killer? I don't know. That's what I wanted you to find out. Well, it's an interesting theory, Felice. Theory? I'll check to see if it's anything more than that. You will? But but if Patterson's your friend, I... If he's pocketing blood money, this is the end of a not-so-beautiful friendship. And then, Felice, you and I could be friends. Oh, Simon, if you help me, we'll be more than friends. Aren't you forgetting just one small little item? Am I? Oh, you don't mean the kid, do you? 
So you don't really believe there's anything between him and me? I perish the thought. Well, then. But isn't there anything else now? Think hard. Oh, I'm no good at guessing games, I'm. Uh, what about your husband? He isn't either. I mean, before you and I give way to mad rapture, shouldn't we think about him? Oh, Oh, so that's what's bothering you. But <laughs> well, we don't have to worry about him. He's going to be murdered. Now, don't look now, but isn't that what you want me to prevent? His murder? Heavens, no. I just want you to prove I had nothing to do with it. You'd better run along, police. So angry. No. Well, then why? I feel a previous engagement coming on. I don't tell me you're afraid of my husband. No, Felice. Then I don't understand. I'm afraid of you. I thought you were coming over here. Well, I've been detained, and uh, she didn't have a friend. But I'll be right over now if you've got something for me. Well, I can tell you over the phone. It seems each of your opposition has picked up reinforcements. How? Uh-huh. Well, the kid has a couple of lawyers. Uh-oh. I was afraid of that. And Garnett has a bodyguard. Mm-hmm. How about Mrs. Garnett? She has me. Oh, should have known. Why don't look at her and you... I'm know... still running. Huh? But I'm afraid you're going to have to tell me who did your research for you, Randy. Templar, I told you it was strictly confidential. Well, you can either tell me now or the police later. Police? Mm-hmm, because your character seemed determined to act out the finale of your opus. Garnett is already shopping for a coffin. What? I just made up that stuff about the murder. I, I don't think the kid and the gal would really knock him off. The consensus is that somebody would, so you'd better talk. But I gave my word. Did that ever stop you before? Templar. To think that you should say such a thing. You who've been so close. The trouble is, we've been too close. All right, all right. I'm a no good, a heel, a liar. I'd sell my soul for a mess of pottage. But at least Templar has always been the best pottage. Mm hmm. Now, will you please stop talking and talk? You want me to betray a confidence? I thought we'd agreed it's in character. How true. How very, very true. Well, the only. Randy! 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 believe in keeping him safe, don't you, kid? Huh? Oh, you again, Temple. Yeah. Look, why don't you get lost and take Patterson with you? And Patterson already got lost. That's why I'm here. I don't get it. I was talking to him on the phone. I heard shots. I called the police, and they called back from Patterson's place. He's dead. I'm not surprised. What do you know about it? He had it coming. From you? Maybe. Only somebody beat me to it. Is that so? I got nothing more to say. You want conversation? See my lawyer. Yeah, Smith and McCormick. I know. I may get around to it. Yeah, do that. Hello, police. Oh. Hello, Simon. I asked at the desk. They said I'd find you here in the bar. That's where I am. Here at the bar. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Very. Well, it isn't, and I'm most of Nobody's been here all afternoon except my friend, Tony. Tony's my favorite bartender. Tony. Hey, Mr. Templer. Hi, Mr. Templer. Charmed. Uh, uh, Felice. Simon, bartender. Tony hit me again. My friend's setting him up. Okay, Miss Garnett. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Go, 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 Simon, what are you doing? I'll just watch you. I know why you're here. Good. Suppose you tell me. I've been wondering. You want to know if I have an alibi? Well, I have. I came right here from your place, and I've been here ever since. I see. You hate me, don't you? No. Why do you keep spying on me? I simply can't keep myself away from you. <laughs> I believe that. If you believed it, I wouldn't say it. Huh? You're just trying to mix me up. You've already mixed me up. What's this alibi you were talking about? Oh, well, for the murder, silly. Oh, and how do you know about that? It's not in the papers yet. Uh, really, Simon, for a smart man, you're the kid phoned me. How else do you think I'd know? He didn't waste any time, did he? He knew I'd be interested. Nice of him to be so considerate. I thought there was nothing between you two. You are spying. I'm curious. Or maybe you're jealous. <laughs> I, uh, jealous, Simon? Terribly. <laughs> I wish I believed that. What's between you and the kid? I told you nothing. He phoned you. Well, he knew I'd be interested. Oh, this is getting us no place. You could get someplace, Simon. So I'm on the phone. He'd stop back to so sorry. So he could. Don't you like me? 
just a little bit. Yes, Felice, I like you. Simon. Just a little bit. Simon. Who do you think killed Randy Patterson, Felice? Must we talk about this? I'm beginning to think it's the safest subject. Don't you have any idea who might have done it? No. I'm afraid I don't know what you want, Simon. And I'm afraid know. I do know what you want. Well, get right. this. Isn't this cold? Oh, hello, kid. Oh, well, don't get the wrong idea, kid. We were just talking. Yeah, it looks like. Well, about the murder. You were making with the moon eyes. Well, kid, believe me, there's nothing between Simon and me, not a thing. <laughs> She's right, kid. There's nothing more between us than there is between her and, say, uh, you, for example. What? And she has assured me your relationship was strictly platonic. Police, you told him that. Well, I don't get the wrong idea. Wrong idea? I ain't got any idea. Well, what does it mean? Plato was a philosopher, a student of Socrates, who believed that if two people oh, got... a wise guy. Very. Kid, please don't be angry. No? You play around with this guy, and then he starts cracking smart. I ought to push your face in. Oh, oh, kid, never strike a lady. And you, too. Or a gentleman, <laughs> when the gentleman is me. Oh, yeah? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Felicity, miss. But not this time. Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. Well, it only takes one. Three strikes, you're out. Oh. Now, that's enough, kid. One more and maybe I'd be out, so I'd better be running. See you around. Oh, it's you. Mm-hmm. You greet me with a gun, too, Monk. That's what I like about this place. So friendly. You got no idea how friendly. Just the guy we want to see. Come in, pal. Come right in. Now, that's a switch. Last time you were all for throwing me out. Oh, that's before I learned what a sweet guy you was. Now, come on in. Oh, with such a hearty invitation, I don't see how I can refuse. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> you know, Monk, this is an unexpected pleasure. When I was here before, I got the impression Garnett was considering firing you. Oh, he couldn't do that. Where is he? In fact, you'll be in a minute. Now, you want to see why he couldn't fire me? Why? On account of there's some things I can do so much better. Like, for instance, this. Oh, you kick so beautifully, Monk. Your mother must have been a rocket. Ah, uh, don't try to hit back. This Roscoe's looking at your belly. All of a sudden, I'm everybody's target for tonight. What's the idea? Mr. Garnett wanted to know how much Patterson told you. He asked you nice, real nice. I don't ask so nice, but I get answers. Well, you want to talk now, or shall we dance? I have nothing to say. We'll see you about that. <laughs> You still got nothing to say? I'm beginning to think of a few things, but I have an idea you wouldn't care for them. <laughs> you kill me. Maybe I can do the same for you sometime, like right now, for instance, unless you're ready to talk. I'll think about it. Well, while you're thinking, put up your hands over your head. Hurry up. Don't forget the Roscoe. My old friend, how could I? That's it. And now, just to help you make up your mind, here's... Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Garnett. What's going on here? Uh, hello, Templar. Well, greetings, Mr. Garnett. You don't want to talk, Mr. Garnett. I've been trying to change his mind. I'll go right ahead. Don't let me stop you. I'm afraid it's no use. He's a stubborn type. Yes, so it would seem, Monk. So it would seem. Well, Templar, to what are we indebted for this return visitor? I've seen Felice. I thought you might like to know how she's getting along. Why should I care? Does she care about me? Does she ever even call? Don't stand there with your hands like that, Templar. It looks ridiculous. It's Monk's idea. You heard Mr. Garnett, Templar. Put him down. Well, if you insist. How is she, Templar? Who? Oh, oh, Felice. Fine. I was afraid of that. Afraid? I'd like to think she needed me. I've got to put her out of my mind, Templar, completely. Only answer. Tell me something, Garnett. What? Where were you this afternoon? Home. All afternoon? Yes. Why? Was anyone with you? I was. The whole time? Uh, yes, except for another nap. He likes to keep in condition. Only I didn't sleep so good. I was only gone a few minutes, just a few minutes. Half hour or so? Why, Templar? Did you try to reach me? Oh, no, couldn't have. I'd have heard the phone. If you were here. But I told so you... So you I... did. Just a minute. What are you going to do? Just this. <laughs> Templar! Why, you you knocked out Monk. Yeah, so it seems. Funny, I didn't hit him very hard. You aimed at his chin. Always was his weakness. Had a wicked right, but he could never take it. Round heels. That's his trouble. Ah, I could have made a champ out of him if it hadn't been for those... Ah, oh, but that's neither here nor there. Why'd you do it? He slugged me before when I wasn't looking this evens the account. And it gives me a chance to get his rascal. Oh? I, uh, want to point something out to you, Garnett. I didn't want Monk interfering. What? Randy Patterson doesn't live too far from here. I believe you could make it in 15 minutes. Perhaps so, perhaps so. What are you driving at? 15 there, 15 back. Half hour would have been long enough. For what? For you to have gone to his place and killed him. Killed him? But, but do you mean have somebody? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't pretend I'm not pleased. But surely you don't really think that I... Why, that's... Prepar 
That's absurd. Well, you could have while Monk was sleeping. No, no, you don't understand. It's at least 15 minutes to Patterson's place, at the very least. If you hurry, race like mad. How do you know? I've been there, but not today, not today. But you know, you said yourself. All right, 15 minutes, round trip in half an hour. That's all you needed. But, well, 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 that was just round figures. I'm sure Monk couldn't have been out of the room for, oh, well, 20 minutes at most. You'll see when he comes to, we'll ask him. 20 minutes at the most. Uh-huh. I'm sure he'll say whatever you want him to, but we'll see. Say, I just thought of something. What? Has uh, has there been any report about the murder yet? Uh, newspaper, radio? No, not so soon. Mm-hmm. Well, then, Mr. Templer, how come you happen to know about it? A nice point, Garnett, but notice what big ears I have, Grandpa. I overheard. Overheard? In telephone. Come on, Monk, wake up. Wake up. Mm. Come on. Come on. Hey, hey where is he? I... Oh, hey, 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 it was an accident. I, I slipped. I hit my head. You didn't... Sure, Monk, sure. What big ears you have, too, Monk. Genuine cauliflower. How did you hear about it? Hear about what? The murder. Who, me? I didn't... Obviously, Garnett didn't know about the murder, or he wouldn't have stuck his neck out by admitting you were out of the room. He didn't start crawling until I mentioned the murder. That's right, Templer. You noticed... But I also noticed that Monk was very busy trying to build the alibi before I mentioned the murder. Well, sure. I I was trying to protect Mr. Garnett. After all, I got a great sense of loyalty. No, Monk. You haven't got any sense of loyalty or any sense. How did you know he needed protection unless you knew about the murder? Of course. How did he know? Unless he was a murderer. Are you crazy? Maybe, Monk. But the alibi you were preparing for Garnett would have worked for you, too. If you were here with Garnett, you couldn't have committed the murder. Isn't that why you insisted you were gone only a few minutes? My head hurts. I got nothing to say. But, Templer, what motive would Monk have? There's one thing we've all been wondering about, Garnett. How did Randy find out about your wife and the kid? Must have been from someone who was close to the kid. Say, a sparring partner, for instance. Ha-ha, ha-ha, ha-ha! Templar, you've hit it! I think so. Monk gave Randy the information. Then when things got hot, Monk was afraid Randy might snitch, so he killed him to silence. That's it, Templar, that's it. Monk, you scoundrel, you villain, you... Ah, shut up. Monk, that's insubordination. Now, come on, Monk. You and I are going to police headquarters. Who says so? Ah, Monk, don't try to get tough. Maybe Joe Lewis is as scared of you, but I ain't. Come on, let's go. You have been listening to another adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, take a memo to the future. The date, make it 1958. The message, cash in your United States savings bonds. Take your savings plus the additional dollar for every three invested and, well, you finish the memo. Perhaps you'll end it with a home or a business of your own, with a college education for the children, with financial security. Whatever your dream for the future, you can make it come true with a program of regular saving. And there is no surer, more profitable way of saving than through the purchase of United States savings bonds. Remember these points. United States savings bonds are safe, they are profitable, they are convenient to buy, and they are redeemable at any time at the purchase price plus accumulated interest. If employed, you can buy United States savings bonds where you work by having your employer set aside an amount each week. If self-employed, buy your savings bonds through your bank on a -a bond-a-month basis. Make that dream come true. Remember, automatic saving is sure saving. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. Saint was written by Jerome Epstein. Our cast included Betty Lou Gerson, Barney Phillips, Stanley Farrar, Edmund McDonald, and Tom Brown. The music was composed and conducted by Vaughn Dexter. The Saints, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safia production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production, His Kind of Woman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Tomorrow night, here in Nightbeat, the story of Chicago after dark. Listen as Randy Stone searches the city for adventure and a story of mystery and intrigue. 
Nightbeat is another great action-packed program, so be sure to listen tomorrow night and every Monday night to Nightbeat. Next, Sam Spade cuts the caper. Then hear Dorothy Maynor on NBC. NBC.